Hi guys, I want to invite you to join the Patreon where you will get some benefits as well as audiobooks that will not be uploaded on YouTube. Chapter 51 the 30th and 35th floor's first achievement have been completed as well by the same hero from 1,500 years ago. How unfortunate, Shin Nim. Luckily, the next one is Oops. For a piece of information worth 50,000 gold, it made me feel nothing but emptiness. However, from Loretta's accidental follow-up, it seemed the 40th floor master's first had not been taken. That was enough. Until then, I.D. refrained from being too adventurous and focus on obtaining the Floor Master Slayer title. Afterwards, I could master the 40th Floor Master. The only problem left to solve now was to break through the 25th floor and join Elos and Paludia. As the 25th floor had a mix of zombies and ghouls just like the 24th floor, I could easily get through it. However, as it also had a Floor Master room, I could not obtain a title from clearing it. When I arrived in front of the floor master door, I stopped and contacted Elos. Elos, are you on the 25th floor? Mm, -hmm, yeah. I'm near the end. It'll be at the door soon. What about you? Can you really come here on your own? We can party with you if you want. I'm in front of the door. The 25th floors. Really? Really? Elos went silent for a while, then continued after laughing. I see. You are a hero after all. Ill hurry, see you in a bit. Yeah. I then contacted Paludia. Paludia, it's Kong Shin. What? I told you not to contact me before reaching the 25th floor. For someone who said that, she answered extremely quickly, as if she'd been waiting. As I didn't want get on her nerves, I only said what I wanted to say. I'm on the 25th floor. Really? I don't lie. Okay, good job. Hoo-hoo, Sheena you liar. As I thought, rather than you, he prefers. Hmm. I felt like I had heard a familiar name. However, Paludia said it was nothing. I've been on the 25th floor since two weeks ago. But because I was busy with my world's war, coincidentally, really coincidentally, I couldn't enter the dungeon for a while. My first time challenging the floor master will be with you. You should think of it as an honor. That reminds me of the first time we fought the orc lord. Don't bring that up. That was a long time ago. I'm no longer a little kid. If I looked at all the messages she sent me until now, she was undoubtedly still the same little kid. Of course, I didn't say that to her either. Elo says he'll be here in a bit. Let's wait for him and we can challenge the floor master together. Okay. Hey, I heard you stayed in the fifth floor for over three years. Are you sure your skills haven't turned rusty? Since you'll be in this Paludia Gren Awernim's raid party, I won't allow stupid, orc-like things. I also climbed to the twenty-fifth floor in under a year. Paludia, you've heard of my crown prince nickname, right? Pft. Paludia snorted. In that instant, I felt my blood boiling. Don't laugh. It's not funny. Owork is Crown Prince Pft, PFF. Eek. I'm not an orc anymore, you little kid. I'm not a little kid either. Boo, boo. It'll be the one to judge whether you're still an orc or not, so look forward to it. Fine. It'll also be the one to judge whether you're a little kid or not. Humph. In the end, we ended our conversation after a little argument. Ah, I forgot to ask why she wanted to party with me after so long. This childish crown princess really was unpredictable. She started an argument when we first met, she charged at the orc lord with just her staff because her friend was killed, and she added me to her friend list even though she seemed to hate me. I would find out soon enough. Since I promised Paludia, it felt wrong to fight the floor master before I met up with her and Elos. What should I do now? Upon thinking about it, the answer was clear. It was to use the event dungeon entrance ticket I got from the 24th floor and clear the dungeon. Event dungeon entrance ticket, giant zombies attack. An entrance ticket to an event dungeon. If ripped in half, it allows up to two people to enter the event dungeon. 
recommended level, 25 to 30. Looking at the description, I felt conflicted. Should I contact Polydia again? No, wait, was I high? Why would I enter a dungeon alone with that yappy little kid? With that, I erased the thought from my head. What other choice did I have? Ellos was still trying to get to the door what about Sheena? No, Sheena shouldn't even be at the 20th floor yet. In the end, father was the only choice I had. He was the only person I could fully trust to cover my back. Father. What's up, son? What floor are you on, father? I'm on the 25th. Why, do you want to party with your father? I refuse. My contribution will go down if I party with you. Since his reason for saying no was a roundabout way of praising me, I felt a bit embarrassed. Scratching my head, I continued. I have an event dungeon entrance ticket. Hurry up and invite me to the party. Father's attitude took a complete turn. What fervor, greed, and initiative. Though I didn't want to admit it, I took after him too much. After accepting my party request, father appeared. He was wearing the same clothes as when he was in Young Dumpo's event dungeon. The only difference was that he was wearing the bracelet he earned as reward on his right wrist. Oh, what an excellent spear. Where did you get it? Ah, uh, um, a named monster dropped it. I didn't think he'd ask that right away. Father's eyes sparkled at the word named monster. Named monsters, I love those guys. I wish they appeared more often. They have a nice tactile feeling too, when I hit them. You're probably the only one who wants to fight them because you like the feeling of hitting their flesh. Anyways, are you ready? Yeah. You see, I cleared the 24th floor pretty quick and got a one who dashes through graveyards title. It lets me deal 20% more damage to all undead monsters with physical bodies. Amazing, isn't it? Oh, it is, father. I didn't tell him I received a similar title as well as a god's true name. I knew how to care for father's pride. I was a filial son, unlike my childish father. After confirming that we were in a party, I ripped the entrance ticket in half. In an instant, the surrounding scenery melted. If Earth's event dungeons could be entered through gates, entering an event dungeon in the dungeon was like us being on TV and someone changing the TV channel with us still standing in place. Eventually, the surroundings stopped warping and we found ourselves on a plane with arrows raining down. You what? What's this? We quickly struck the arrows flying toward us and surveyed the area. It was a battlefield. Soldiers wearing different armor were stabbing each other with swords, while archers and magicians were attacking from long range even at the cost of hitting their allies. It was a place where humans slaughtered humans. When I realized this, I got a dull headache and my breathing became rough. Snap out of it, Kong Shin. Don't let something like this scare you. How can you become the world's strongest if you're so weak? No matter how I tried to regain my composure, it was true that I was in an incomprehensible situation. Shouldn't I be in an event dungeon? Who are you? I saw a soldier attacking me with his sword as he asked for my identity. As I couldn't kill another human being, I lightly parried his spear and sent it flying. The spear then landed about twenty meters away, piercing one of the corpses lying on the ground. At least, I hoped that it was a corpse. I entered an event dungeon, I didn't want to suddenly become a murderer. Father, let's get away from here for now. We'll be targeted if we stay here. I agree. Soldiers from both sides came after us like fire ants. We sent each of them flying as we ran. As we were like erasers making the part of the battlefield we were in empty, everyone on the battlefield began to eye us. Who are they? Kill them first. Attack, attack. Even if the soldiers hit me, they would not even be able to scratch me. However, the magicians were a different story. It was why I was quickly trying to escape this battlefield. Didn't the entrance ticket say giant zombies attack? Yes, it did. Then what's this? Are these people even real? Don't ask me, son. Your father isn't that bright either. Because I felt like I was getting stupider the more I talked with father, I stopped thinking altogether. If I knew this would happen, I would have asked Loretta more about event dungeons. 
Was my intelligence not done updating? Just how rarely did I use my brain ah, uh, a fireball. Father, dodge it. Ait. Father lightly swung his spear and shot out a shockwave the fireball collided with the shockwave and exploded, killing the nearby soldiers. Although a countless number of people were already dying in this battlefield, I became annoyed after finding out people had died from the fireball father exploded. I barely held in my desire to curse aloud. Although these soldiers were trying to kill us, I couldn't help myself from how I felt. At that moment, a message rang out. You obtained seventy gold. Father, these guys are monsters. I heard it too. At least, I did not know any human that dropped gold when they died. Although I had faced numerous humanoid monsters, I didn't think the dungeon would actually send humans as monsters. I suddenly felt that this event dungeon had a terrible personality. Son, they were created when we entered the event dungeon. They aren't actual humans, so you don't need to feel sorry. You don't need to worry about my mental health, father. I know fully well what they are. I just don't like the fact that I have to kill them, when they are so much like humans. Then do you want to get away from here first? Going by its name, a giant zombie should appear eventually. Yeah, let's thanks, father. Don't say that. It gives me goosebumps. Actually, I got goosebumps too from that. As we both scratched the goosebumps on our skin, we hurried off the battlefield. Although there were soldiers coming after us like flies, we took care of them softly as we made our escape. Eventually, we reached a place where the shouts of the battlefield became faint. It was only then that we realized how big the battlefield was. From the hill we were on, we could see the battlefield stretching out across the horizon. In the vast plain without even a single hint of greenery, the corpses of soldiers were piled up and blood flowed like a river. Although I had seen a lot of monster corpses, they couldn't match up to the cruel scene of humans killing other humans. We had escaped the battlefield, but the fight continued. It seemed it would not end until one side was completely eliminated. Just how many people would die here? 100,000. 200,000. After monsters appeared on earth, do you think the conflicts between different countries increased or decreased? When I was watching this scene blankly, Father asked me. After thinking about it for a little while, I answered. Wouldn't it have decreased? After all, we have to fight against the monsters. It increased. Countries that shared borders began fighting as they claimed that the other country should be responsible for cleaning up the monsters that appeared on their borders. Countries that had low military strength, but high-valued monsters, were invaded by stronger countries for their monsters, and the ability users of the weaker countries then joined to fight against the invaders. Although it did not lead to full-scale war in most cases, there are places where small conflicts expanded into much bigger ones. Father went silent for a bit, then continued. Human greed draws blood of other humans. This much hasn't changed. I won't tell you to do something stupid like trying to stop it, but become stronger. Otherwise, you'll be swept away by human greed one day. Of course. I plan on becoming the world's strongest. Your father will still be the world's strongest. It will be me. There, we had a minor battle. I had come to add another win to my name. Chapter, 52. It was only after about two hours that the situation changed. At that time, father and I were roasting some pork belly over a hot grill. Although the soldiers on the battlefield looked and acted like humans, after we realized they were monsters created by the dungeon, we stopped caring whether they killed or partied with each other. Father, why do you have pork belly in your inventory? Nom, nom. Gulp. Don't you know? If you put meat in your inventory, ITLL be fresher than if you stored it in the most high-tech refrigerator. You can store it right after you cut it for maximum freshness. Ah. Uh, I've tested that before too. I used the same principle when I bought you a, a hamburger. I see, so that's why father carried around meat in his inventory. Although I frequently ate my meals in the dungeon, I had never thought to bring meat. As expected of a dungeon explorer of 27 years. So he didn't just hunt orcs for 20 years. Here, have a drink. Oh, I should really be the one to fill your glass. 
After exchanging some soju, we joked around as we talked. Suddenly, however, I felt a gaze on me. Father, did you notice that? Eh? Notice what? I've thought this for a while, but father really did have weaker senses than me. I asked Pika who was sitting on my head drinking drops of alcohol from her mini elemental sized cup. Pika, can you go survey the area? Hmya. Master, what's a sumbe? Ah. That's not even a word I realized Pika was immobilized. I didn't know that elementals were weak to alcohol. It was my mistake. I had fallen for Pika's cute plea of asking me for a Jew's shed never seen before. While I was distracted by Pika's drunk appearance, the gaze watching us had disappeared. It seemed father had finally noticed something as he was looking around, but it was too late. Hmm, was it the zombie? Maybe it was an wild animal that wanted some meat. Mastir. What's a sumbe? Of course, I didn't think it was nothing. Even so, there was nothing we could do now except continue eating meat. As such, I decided to just let things be. Also, pika, sumbe isn't a word. The twilight had passed and night time approached. Father was the first to sleep, and I stood guard. After three hours, father got up and I slept. When I got up after three hours of sleep, it was still middle of the night. Under the dark, starless night sky, only a pale moon was lighting up the world. It seemed the soldiers didn't want to fight at night, as both sides had returned to their camps. However, the corpses of the dead soldiers were still on the battlefield. The nose-piercing stench of blood had permeated the battlefield and was even reaching where I was. It looks like those corpses will rise. Of course. Where else would zombies come from? Keeping our eyes on the cruel battlefield, we snacked on some instant ramen. I realized that partying with father kept making me eat things. Usually, people ate less as they aged, but father always had something in his mouth, saying that a martial artist must eat well. With this habit following him into the dungeon, his inventory was most likely filled with food. Once I started focusing on the dungeon, I didn't like to eat anything before I cleared a floor. As such, it was a bit hard to match father's style. Pika, on the other hand, seemed to like ramen noodles, as she happily ate the ramen one noodle strand at a time. This is yummy. It doesn't exist in the spirit realm. Eat lots. Master, I love you. When I patted Pika on the head as she slurped more ramen noodles, father interrupted. What have you been talking to since a while ago? I told you, I became an elementalist. Can I adopt one too? Elementals aren't pets. Ah, Free got up. Don't count elementals like what? Free got up. I turned to face the battlefield. Under the moonlight, the once dead were rising. We could notice because of our heightened senses from level ups. It would take a while before each camp found out. Father asked, what do you want to do? Hunt them, of course. I hate being backstabbed so. Answering father, I threw my spear into the darkness. I didn't have enough time to use spirit aura, but heroic strike was still activated. With its radiant white light, it flew through the air like lightning. It was much faster than before. I was surprised as I did not know the 15% speed increase applied to thrown weapons. Kook. You obtained 1,500 gold. Belden died. Those guys found out. Kill them before they kill us. Immediately afterwards, I pointed my hands toward where the voices came from and ordered Pika. It's already too late. Pika. Thunder blast. After gulping down the ramen noodle in her mouth, Pika shouted as she shone with a golden light. A bolt of lightning as thick as my arm shot out from her body, lighting up the darkness. The shield. Kook, the shield magic got broken. An elemental. Who are they? Immediately after I called Pika, I grabbed the silver spear from my inventory and charged forward. Thanks to Dash, my running speed was incomparably faster than before. My aim was the crowd in the distance whom I suspected were the ones responsible for making the zombies. Father and I had both noticed them at the same time we noticed the zombies. There were five no, four of them, since one of them had already died. 
They all had black hoods draped over their heads and were carrying small wooden staves. They were the extremely small kind that magicians would carry around to hide their identity. With all the clues in front of me, I figured they were black magicians. S shield isn't enough to stop him. Damn it, our run. We should have been under stealth magic. They might have been able to deal with us if they immediately used magic, but instead, they panicked and hesitated. It could just be that their chants were too long or that they didn't have the materials needed to cast magic. However, that was none of my business. W8. Even if you kill us, you can't stop what's happening. One of them shouted in a high pitched voice. It was a woman. However, since I had already decided to kill them, their sex did not matter. They were monsters. They were monsters. Right. They were monsters. If we don't kill you, what are you going to do to us? Of course, wed kill. Elemental Tempest. Kukuku, owner of a strong power, calls me. Destruction. Flowing blood amidst ear splitting screams. That is what I want. He tore apart the black magicians. He's just my type. Because of the place I was in, the elementals coming to assist me were all dark. Hopefully, they wouldn't be weaker because of it. My spear was shining with black light from the elementals. I thrust forward, and a storm swept through the entire area. Darkness arrow. Quiak. S shield. Kook. Elemental Tempest was a skill that gravely injured even the floor masters. Some random magicians couldn't possibly block it. Three of the black magicians failed in their attempts to block Elemental Tempest and were instantly torn to shreds. Although it was only for a moment, my eyes caught sight of a rather gruesome scene. Damn it. I had used Elemental Tempest to kill them quickly, but I ended up seeing something unsightly. It was a good thing that the monsters that died in the dungeon disappeared into thin air, only leaving behind their loot and not their remains. Kohak. Ha, ha damn it, so strong. Coincidentally, the black magician, who had talked to briefly, was the only one who managed to escape the range of Elemental Tempest. It seemed she gave up trying to block it with magic and instead gave her all in using her legs to run. Even so, she could not completely dodge it. Her hood was ripped apart and her back was severely injured. Coughing up a mouthful of blood, she opened her mouth with great difficulty. Cough, Odd Winged Raven's dream won't end in a place like this. Odd Winged Ravens? T that's right. From this war, we will make the world know of our exist. Ah, uh, okay. Well, goodbye. I cut off her head with my spear. I just had to beat the event dungeon. I didn't really care about the detailed lore. As if to prove she was a monster created by the dungeon, she became particles of light and scattered into the air. You obtained 2000 gold. You obtained Odd Winged Raven's journal. You succeeded in sweeping the mastermind. Points will be added to your final clear score. I picked up my black earthen spear as I spit on the ground. Nauseating things were nauseating no matter what I told myself. I feel disgusted. That's normal. They talk like humans too. But they're monsters, right? Yes, they're monsters. So don't worry about it, son. I felt much better with father's reassurance. Although I didn't expect much from him before entering the dungeon, I was thankful now that he was here. He truly was reliable. I didn't say my thoughts out loud. Between a father and son, it wasn't necessary. I had also realized something important. Event dungeons were cleared and their boss monsters were killed. However, we received a message saying that points were added to our final clear score. In other words, the event dungeon's clearing process was also important. I wondered if it would have been even higher if we went wild in the battlefield. However, I stopped thinking about it, as it was too late. Instead, I opened Odd Winged Raven's journal. It showed how much they hated their countries, the things they had done and what they planned to do in the future. I skimmed through most of the information and looked for the part that helped explain the current situation. With luck, I thought I might find a way to further increase the final clear score. Yes, it was there. There's only one thing left to do then. Hook. 
At the same time I tried to change the subject to alleviate the morbid mood, I turned my head to the battlefield and couldn't help but gasp seeing the zombies getting up one by one. Both armies had realized what was happening, but the number of zombies was increasing too quickly for them to properly respond. In the end, the commanding officers of both armies had led their soldiers into a night battle. Those bastards used black magic on our comrades in arm. Kill them. Let our comrades rest in peace. Goo. Oh no, it's too late. The magicians swept the zombies with a large-scale magic, and the foot soldiers began to fight afterwards. What were they thinking? Unless they were like me or father, they would become zombies the moment zombies even scratched them. The commanding generals who would send their soldiers out to battle in a situation like this couldn't be sane. It turned out, the commanding officers really weren't sane. After reading the journal a bit more, I found out that the black magicians had not used black magic on just the corpses. They had already made their moves on the commanding generals. Being able to affect the higher-ups of both countries meant there were spies infiltrating both governments. Surprisingly, this odd winged ravens might be a pretty large organization. Of course, I didn't really care about all this. I simply wondered if stopping their plans would net me more final clear score, but it seemed it was too late. The soldiers were fighting each other, and zombies interrupted and bit them. Slowly, the number of zombies on the battlefield was growing. I trembled as I watched what was taking place on the battlefield. What I was witnessing was surely worthy of making me feel fear. However, a fear-shattering voice then reached my ears. When is the giant zombie going to appear? Father, I really respect this side of you. Father was stretching his legs like he was unhappy he missed the chance to fight the black magicians. He was almost like a puppy waiting for someone to say catch. My tension died along with it. Wow, what are they, cockroaches? They sure are multiplying fast. They're seriously creepy. I feel like there are bugs crawling all over me. In the blink of an eye, the zombies were overwhelming the humans. The knights who knew how to wield mana and the magician seemed to have noticed something was wrong, as they had long since escaped the battlefield or had returned to complain to the higher-ups. However, the zombies were rising from their camps as well. Realizing that the commanding officers became zombies who could only make groaning noises, the knights and magicians blasted their mana and slaughtered the zombies. The problem was that there were just too many zombies. In the end, most of them ran away after realizing the situation they were in. Now, only ordinary soldiers were left on the battlefield. They were simply food for the zombies. By now, there were more than 100,000 of them. When I was feeling nervous about the sheer number of zombies, father spoke up. Let's see. Every two or so drop an average of 70 gold, so that's 35 gold per zombie. Since there's two of us, I divide that by two which means 17 gold per zombie. So if I kill them all, that's one. Seven million gold. That's 340 million one. That's an expensive necklace for wife and even solves you as marriage fund. Ooh, son. This place is a gold mine. That's what you're thinking of in this situation, father. I cancel what I said about him being reliable. This person didn't have a moral dilemma in the first place. Chapter, 53 We ran to the battlefield. Other than the black magicians we took care of, there didn't seem to be anyone hiding in the shadows. Although we ran into some of the knights escaping the battlefield, they became startled and ran away without talking to us. You obtained 80 gold. You obtained 72 gold. Mm, I really like the floors where zombies appear. There are more monsters than usual. Maybe I should grind a bit more on the 25th floor. While shouting things like you as education insurance or residential home loans father sliced the zombies apart. It seemed he was planning on buying a building in Gangnam 1. In any case, I also joined in. Even if there were 100,000 zombies, we were killing about 3 every second, meaning 360 zombies were disappearing every minute. I didn't exactly want to calculate how long it would take to kill all 100,000 zombies. I assumed it would take about 5 hours. Gu. Guo what? Gu. Like I said, Guo what? Son, is your head okay? This is just my habit. 
I can't do much about it after all these years. I responded to each zombie as I crushed their heads. Father and son, a spearman duo drew a future of hopes and dreams as they slaughtered their way forward. They were terrifying even in my eyes. Then, I realized I was one of them and despaired. Pika. Thunder bomb. A spherical ball of lightning that Pika casually threw out exploded dozens of zombies in an instant. Taking care of the remaining zombies, we ran through the path Pika created. It was toward the direction of one of the camps of the warring countries. I wanted to look for any remaining members of those odd winged bastards just in case, and father was following me. Tempest. Kayak. Shockwave. Qua. Even our weakest skills could easily destroy the zombies, so it did not take long until we took care of all the zombies in the camp. I then went inside the camp's largest tent, where I was able to find what I was looking for. It seemed the black magicians never thought their journal would be stolen, as they had recorded everything they had done to both camps in their journal. The commanding general of this camp apparently liked to drink red tea mixed with brandy. Thus, the spy they planted had gifted him a high-class brandy cursed with some black magic. Just by drinking it, the black magicians would be able to control him whenever they wanted. What I found was this cursed brandy. You retrieved an item of the odd-winged ravens. Points will be added to your final clear score. Let's go to the other camp as well. You're saying we should go through that battlefield infested with zombies? Of course. We took about 30 minutes to slaughter our way through the battlefield. In the process, we had killed about 10,000 zombies. Just like in the other camp, we cleaned up the zombies in this camp and found the cursed item. You retrieved all of Odd Winged Raven's items. Points will be added to your final clear score. Phew. HM, what was this mysterious feeling of accomplishment? I was wiping sweat off my forehead like a farmer that had just finished harvesting all his crops. It was then that father let out an exclamation of surprise. Oh. Look at that, son. Yes. Hook. In the middle of a hill that had become a battlefield for the zombies, something was rising. Just whose corpse was so big? Would the titan from the myths even be that big? In front of our eyes, a seven meter tall giant zombie was roaring. Geo. The boss monster of giant zombies attack, the giant zombie has appeared. Defeating it and clearing the dungeon will grant special rewards. When the giant zombie raised its huge arm and slammed down on the ground, the tremor even reached where father and I were. At the same time, the shockwave annihilated hundreds of zombies. I couldn't help but be touched by the sight. What an epic team kill. Damn. Let's hurry, son. He's going to steal all the gold. You're probably the only one who can say that after seeing what just happened, father. I was sad. I didn't like hunting monsters for the sole purpose of earning gold, but it was the opposite for father. I assume that's why he so easily registered as an ability user. Although he had not started being active, with his awakened ability and fame as a martial artist, he would become well known in no time. Geo. Uh, father, he's looking this way. Does he want to have a staring contest? Geo. He's picking up a few zombies. Is he going to eat them? Wrong. Instead of eating them, he threw them at us as if they were stones. With an incredible speed no less. Run, father. That crazy bastard is literally throwing gold away. Just dodge. Father and I were now the only living humans in this battlefield. The giant zombie seemed to like living people more than dead ones, as he ignored the zombies nearby and ran toward us. Thundering booms rang out as he took each step, and any zombies he grabbed on his way were thrown at us like stones. Then, in response to the giant zombies' attack, the tens of thousands of zombies left on the battlefield turned their attention toward us. However, that was not what I paid attention to. Wow, look at all the team kills he's doing while running here. Kook, 2100 gold just disappeared in his hands. Crack, crack. More zombies were crushed under the giant zombie's feet. No matter how slow it was, with its enormous size, almost a dozen zombies died every time it took a step. 
I instantly thought I could use the giant zombie to easily kill the zombies. Father, do you want to hunt the giant zombie and clear the event dungeon, or do you want to avoid it and hunt more zombies? Of course, we have to hunt more zombies. 100,000 or 200,000, it makes no difference to me. Alright, then I'll aggro the giant zombie. Father can go to the opposite side and hunt the normal zombies. Got it. Father and I split up. After confirming that he was running to the camp on the opposite side of the battlefield, I shouted as I ran toward the giant zombie. I'm here, you idiot. How can you catch me with that slow body of yours? You use the skill, provoke. You draw nearby enemies toward you. Along with the zombies near me, the giant zombie fixed its eyes on me. After sweeping through the normal zombies with my black earthen spear, I grinned. Humph, you think that's enough? To satisfy me, you'll have to bring at least three times as many zombies. You mastered low rank provoke. Your words become more effective in drawing enemies' hostility. You learned mid rank provoke. You can let your voice reach an even broader area, drawing even more enemies toward you. It becomes easier to provoke enemies with high intelligence. Provoke became mid rank. At the same time that Provoke's rank went up, the hostility of zombies piercing into me became completely different than before. The giant zombie was also running towards me without a shred of hesitation. Tremors rang out for each step the giant zombie took, which was like a human being running in slow motion. With each tremor, more zombies were killed. Good, good, keep coming. I started walking leisurely. The ordinary zombies couldn't even scratch me. When one of them stuck itself on me, I grabbed him and swung him around, sweeping away the incoming zombies. After a little while, the sky became darker, forcing me to look up. There, I saw the giant zombie looking down at me with its eyes full of maggots. The dungeon's genre was definitely horror. It was like seeing a 3D movie, but in real life, not in a theater. The giant zombie was also much more intimidating up close. That said, it was still a zombie. Catch me if you can. I know, I also wanted to do this with a cute girl, not some 7 meter tall giant zombie. But what other choice did I have? Father wanted to hunt more zombies, and I wanted to clean up this battlefield crawling with zombies. It was because I had a strong feeling that I would receive another bonus if I killed all the zombies. Killing the giant zombie would be easy, but the event dungeon would end if we did. I suspected that father and I were the only ones who would refuse to clear an event dungeon for such a reason. If you want to complain, do it after you catch me. Tempest. I had no intention of letting him off of his crime of using humans though they became zombies as weapons. I used Tempest after Tempest, as I gulped down lowest grade mana potions. After running around like that for two hours, I became exhausted. I must have killed at least 10,000 zombies by now. When I looked from above to check the current state, the battlefield had become quite clean. In the distance, I saw father gathering up and hunting zombies. I turned around and saw that not many zombies remained in the path the giant zombie was taking to run. It seemed it was time to end this game of tag. Pika, take care of the zombies that are still alive. I would need a lot of mana. Is that okay, master? Yeah, you can take it all. I gulped down a double mana potion, which restored my MP by 2000. It was worth 3 million won, so I couldn't help but shake my hands as I drank it. From another perspective, it was only worth around 100 zombies. Since growing as a dungeon explorer, I thought I became quite generous. I finished the 3 million won potion in an instant. It tasted like orange juice. Geo. At the same time, the giant zombie swept up the few dozen zombies that were left and put them in his mouth. It seemed he was also exhausted from chasing me around for so long. Once Pika began burning up the zombies, the giant zombie let out an angry growl and began looking for other zombies to eat. It was truly a stomach churning sight. For some reason, however, something felt off with the scene of the giant zombie eating the zombies. It didn't feel like something it did on impulse, but something that had been planned. Regardless, I took care of the zombies nearby quickly. The giant zombie tried to stomp on me in anger, but he was hopeless to catch me. 
Father, if you're done, come help me. I'm already on my way. Father was running toward me while blasting away the few zombies that remained with his shockwaves. I was slightly astonished by how much his skill had grown. However, I became frozen soon after from the message I received. Subquest complete. You exterminated all the zombies in the dungeon. Giant zombie absorbed 5.8% of the dungeon zombies. With low zombie absorption, giant zombie fails to evolve into giant ghoul. Giant zombie loses control and transforms into flesh golem. Ghoul. Wow. I let out a short exclamation of surprise. After it finished eating up the zombies in its vicinity, the giant zombie faced the sky and roared. Ah, a rotten tooth is falling off. I quickly dodged, and the tooth crashed down with a boom, forming a crater. Phew. I sighed internally as I realized I almost got crushed by a tooth. If Loretta asked how I died, I would have been too embarrassed to tell her. In the next moment, the giant zombie's other teeth fell off like raindrops. Not only that, its skin peeled off, its maggot-filled eyes, fingernails, and the few strands of hair all fell off. To me, there was no other disaster like it. Not only were they dirty, but if they were to hit me, I was sure I would take a huge amount of damage. I trembled and quickly escaped the premises. Ah, I wish I could blur it out. I'm back, master. What's next? That guy? Yeah, I don't want to be here anymore. I was tired and cold from the late night game of tag with a giant zombie. Infusing pika into the black earthen spear, I glanced at the giant zombie that had turned into a flesh golem. The slight resemblance to a human that it had before was now gone. Its outer skin had melted, revealing its veins and black rotten flesh. I felt an unprecedented appetite for destruction from its indescribably disgusting appearance. K.U.O. However, it was fast and strong. With speed that made it hard to believe it was once the giant zombie, it struck the ground with its fist. At the same time, the earth trembled and I received damage. Kook, it was the same as Lizard Knight's earthquake attack. With that in mind, I flew up. However, the other dungeon explorer here, my father, had a different reaction. Shock absorption, shock reflection. The hell is that? So cool. Father stood his ground and received the flesh golem's attack. Then, he thrust his spear forward, shooting out a shockwave that was on a completely different level from his usual shockwaves. The shockwave flew forward and struck the flesh golem's arm. Although it looked cool in a way, I couldn't help but frown at the sight of flesh golem's flesh exploding out and scattering about everywhere. K.U.O. I'm coming too. If I simply stood still, father would rack up contribution points. I couldn't let that happen. Resolved, I charged at the flesh golem with my lightning-clad black earthen spear. When it tried to lift the arm that had a huge crater from father's attack, I jumped above its forearm and shouted. Talaria. 1. A very affluent area in Seoul. Chapter, 54. You summon Talaria. For the next 10 minutes, you can freely fly or walk on air. If flying, you will receive an additional 100% increase to your movement speed. Remaining time, 9 hours 59 minutes 99 seconds. My boots let out a radiant white light for an instant. When it dissipated, small wings were attached to my boots. I kicked the air and shot up. From below, father's shout reached me. Whoa, that's super cool. Give me one too. I ignored him and shot up further. Of course, since the flesh golem was only 7 meters tall, I only needed to shoot up by one more kick. My eyes were now in line with the flesh golem's melting head. Startled, it raised its arm, but my heroic strike was faster. Die. Heroic strike. The black earthen spear left my hand and flew towards him like an arrow. Like lightning, it was radiating a brilliant light. Even if the boss monster was now a flesh golem, it could not dodge heroic strike, which even the fast ghouls could not avoid. Geo. The moment my black earthen spear penetrated the flesh golem's head, it exploded out, scattering its bones, flesh, and blood in all directions. 
I hurriedly flew up and maintained my balance. As it was my first time using Teleria, I couldn't stop myself from staggering when doing the same movements I was used to doing. Keiku. Hugh, as I thought, you won't die from just that. How great would it have been if a single heroic strike was enough to kill it? Even with its exploded head, the flesh golem seemed perfectly fine, as it tried to capture me with its two arms. Of course, with me flying in the air, there was no chance for it to succeed. Father, it looks like we need to pummel him after we make him fall. Yeah, I'm starting. After telling father my plan, I took out my silver spear and shot Tempest out toward its arms. Every time the small storm of mana struck, its flesh exploded out, causing it to stagger. Annoyed, it went wild trying to catch me. It even shot pieces of its body at me. I had to work diligently to dodge the flying lumps of flesh. Dirty. So dirty. Master, calm down. I shouldn't have come into an event dungeon like this. Regretting my actions, I continued to attack. While the flesh golem was completely focused on me, father used his skill. Take this. I call it the wave web shock. Web. When I looked down, something was tying down its two thick legs. Curious, I examined what it was and realized it was silk. Silk threads to be exact. It was connected to the bracelet father had on his wrist. Is that? K.U.A. The moment father flexed his arm, the silk threads tied to the flesh golem's legs reverberated violently. The next moment, I was utterly shocked. His thick legs had been severed. I understood that father transmitted shockwaves through the silk threads, but I didn't understand why it was so strong. The flesh golem was just as shocked as it let out a flustered roar and fell backwards. When its huge body hit the ground, a booming sound rang out. Watching this happen as I floated midair, I loudly shouted. That's a cheat, father. It goes really well with my ability, doesn't it? Damn, that was even more powerful than the spider webs Arachne shot out. I should have picked that. The black earthen spear I loved so much suddenly felt like a mortal enemy. However, I knew my priorities. I had to take care of the flesh golem first. With that, I hurriedly landed and picked up the black earthen spear that had fallen on the ground. Seeing Teleria, father's eyes sparkled. Son, do you really not have another one? The winged boots. How can there be another one of something so rare? What about you, father? How about gifting that accessory to your precious son? They'll trade it for the winged boots. If he wasn't my father, I would have thrown Raman in his face. How unfortunate. Let's just hurry and wrap this up. It was my dream to fly when I was young how cheap, son. My dream is to not be involved with you. I'd believe you more if you said your dream was to shoot down a flying pterodactyl with your spear. You defeated the event dungeon boss monster, Flesh Golem. 50,000 gold is distributed evenly among participants. You obtain 25,000 gold. After losing its legs, the flesh golem struggled, trying to regenerate them, but father and I didn't let that happen. In the end, it was burned, exploded, sliced, or stabbed until it was finally dead. The dungeon determined that father had the highest contribution. I suspected cutting its legs off was what did it. This was the first time anyone had stolen the first place in contribution from me. Of course, that time when I watched over Ren soloing the Lizard Knight didn't count. In any case, not knowing the full list of rewards didn't feel so bad. It gave a refreshing feeling of anticipation. What would come about? Since we completed a subquest, maybe a really good accessory would come out. While I was eagerly waiting in anticipation, father spoke. Hmm, son, between a finger and a toe, what do you want? Neither. Don't tell me that's what we got. Even though we cleared that subquest. Father, answer me. All right, he'll take the toe then. Father. Choose your reward. 1. Flesh Golem's second finger. Damn it. I was curious which toe father got, but that wasn't important right now. Still unable to believe that this was the reward, I picked the finger with an empty smile on my face. I mean, what was the point of killing the black magicians, collecting the cursed items, and eradicating the zombies? 
Don't tell me we would have gotten something else if we didn't clear the subquest. However, when the item appeared, my puffed up cheeks simmered down. It was called Finger, but it was really a black metallic ring that gave off a slightly eerie aura. Mm, my spirit of the collector worked. Feeling relieved, I checked the item description. Flesh Golem Second Finger Unique. Durability 6060. Equipment Limit 1 Who Defeated the Flesh Golem. Option Strength 7, Constitution 7. Skill Regeneration, Usable Once Per Week. Completely Regenerates All Damaged Areas. Nice, Good Options. In truth, the words damaged areas were a little vague. For dungeon explorers, if they were involved in battles where their limbs were cut off, they would die. It was because no matter how much one limb was focused, it would not get severed unless the explorer's HP was extremely low. That said, it was a bit different in the outside world. It seemed the ring would be perfect for when my limbs were damaged outside the dungeon. It would become a reliable insurance of sorts. Even without the regenerative ability, the ring was excellent. 7 Strength and 7 Constitution. That was almost 3 levels worth of stat bonuses. I was happy at the unexpected fortune. What about you, Fath Hook? Like I said, it's a toe. Father took out Flesh Golem's gigantic toe from his inventory and looked at me. It really was a toe. Apparently it's an install weapon. I can apparently install it near allies to raise their overall stats by 2%. That's a very subtle amount. I can also install it near enemies and make it explode. It says it does great damage. That's a one-time use item, then. If father had been the one to pick the finger, that toe would have been mine. I thanked my luck. Now that I thought about it, the black earthen spear and this ring to the items I needed seemed to be falling into my possession. Perhaps it was thanks to Skill Collector's passive skill, Spirit of the Collector. Son, let's switch. What's done is done, father. You cleared the event dungeon and gained one bonus stat point. You will now return. Right before we were about to start a deathmatch over our rewards, the scenery warped. We found ourselves back in the first dungeon. A raid boss had not appeared again. I couldn't hide my disappointment but I decided not to worry about it since I had already gotten great rewards. If you don't want to switch, just take it, son. No. This toe is creepy as hell. However, father threw the toe at me, left the party, and returned to the dungeon he came from. Left alone in front of the 25th floor door, I stood blankly with the flesh golem's toe. Ah should I just give this to Ellos? It was the start of first dungeon's version of a chain letter. The next day was the ninth manifestation of Pryuta. Deific manifestation originally had a cooldown of one month. With a day taken away, it was now 29 days. That said, it did not mean I had to wait 29 days before I could use Deific manifestation again. I didn't know whether it was because of some flow of mana or period of the moon, but I assumed there was something complicated involved that I didn't quite understand. In any case, if I used Deific Manifestation in a set period of time, I could use it again the next day if a new period began. Simply put, I could save Deific Manifestation in case a dangerous situation occurred, and use it on the 29th day if nothing happened. And of course, nothing dangerous had ever happened to me. Inside the dungeon, yes, but dying in the dungeon did not hurt even a single strand of my hair. As such, I never called Pryuta for situations that occurred in the dungeon. Pryuta seemed to dislike it, but I didn't want to concede when it came to this. I was climbing the dungeon to increase my strength. I believed that if I relied on Pryuta as an insurance, I could not really grow. Only, there was no next time if I died on earth. That was why I saved Deific Manifestation. No matter how much stronger I wanted to get, it would be the end if I died. So I spent 28 days doing my own thing, and always called Pryuta on the 29th day. Have you been well? Yes, Pryuta. How about you? It's dark where I am. I'm always silently meditating by myself. Because we were both talking from my mouth, anyone watching would feel weirded out. Although I had control over my body right now, I could hand it over to Pryuta at any time. Now, 
both my mana and constitution were much higher than when we first met. I could stay in this state for up to ten minutes. You see, I obtained Hermes' true name this time around. A god? It's a name I haven't heard of, but I can feel its holiness. So you've already obtained a god's true name. As expected of my disciple. Aha, thank you. But don't be conceited just because you obtained its power. Don't forget, the foundation of your strength lies in Pryuta circuit and spearmanship. What's their level? Pryuta circuit is level 4, high rank spear technique is still level 4. Pryuta rubbed his chin. It felt a bit weird. As I thought, the problem is that you don't have suitable opponents. I've asked others, but it seemed most dungeon explorers started learning high rank techniques after the 50th floor. After all, there's a limit to how high you can raise your skill alone. You could only raise yours so high because of how noble your spear technique is. Yes, so take good care of me today as well. With that I closed my eyes, giving Pryuta full control of my body. Then, let's start. Imagine world. Someone else listening on might think I had some 8th grade syndrome, but it was the only magic Pryuta could use when he was manifested in me. Perhaps it was a skill that came with deific manifestation itself. The moment Pryuta said imagine world, he and I were facing each other. We looked exactly alike. I don't have much time, so I'll hurry. Yes, thanks for the lesson. This, of course, wasn't the real me or the real Pryuta. The real me was sitting cross-legged on the ground with closed eyes. I was in an illusory, dreamlike world. I had heard I could enter this state freely if I reached the apex of self-introspection. Of course, I had no idea what to do to reach this state. All I was doing now was learning a spear technique from a spearman much stronger than myself. Every time we battled, I could feel my skill proficiency shooting up. As such, I couldn't help but be engrossed in the situation. I'm starting then. With a short sentence, Pryuta approached me. His spear reached for my forehead as if it was moving freely. I didn't know when he had thrust, nor when it would hit me. I hurriedly brought my spear forward and focused on blocking his attack. Your reaction speed is faster. It's thanks to Hermes Hot. Even as he complimented me, Pryuta made his spear much faster. Shoot, Hermes applied to him as well. Because I had shown him first hand the growth of my body, he had quickly adapted. You want win by avoiding alone. Hap. His spear seemed fast, yet not fast, and strong, yet not strong. That was why it was so scary. Before I even noticed, I felt like it would take my head or heart. Not to mention, when he started using mana, each and every attack would contain an aura of tempest. It made sense, as Pryuta circuit was a cultivation method that focused on bringing forth a strong rotational force. What was scary was that Pryuta's spear did not even shake as it carried all that energy. Since he possessed destructive power and that degree of precision, his attacks could only be strong. Against him, my spear technique only looked like a forced attempt to stab and slice. I'm still trying my best. Good, I like that spirit. Pryuta easily dodged the spear I sent forward with all my strength, using his spear to tap on my spear. I almost knelt from the sudden force of pressure, but I clenched my teeth and continued charging forward. Hap. You're welcome to come any time. Because I knew the difference in our strength, I acted as wildly as I wanted. I knew Pryuta would be the only one in this world who could receive my spear without even changing his expression. High rank spear technique became level 5. External mana will naturally flow into your attacks without use of own mana, making it stronger. You are walking towards the peak of spearmanship. More force is added to your thrusts. Let's stop here. Hugh okay. The moment Pryuta gave the signal, I closed my eyes and opened them again. The familiar sight of dungeon walls greeted me. However, deific manifestation had not ended yet. There was still a minute left. You became even more skilled. Hearing that from Pryuta doesn't really cheer me up. Although we spent about 90 minutes in the imagined world, only 9 minutes had passed in reality. During that time, he and I had exchanged a countless number of spears. Of course, it was my complete loss. 
Although we were using the same body, he was always the one who won. It showed how important the depth of a skill was. With father and Pryuta around, I couldn't stay conceited even if I wanted to. I'm not trying to brag, but my spear technique had once reached the peak. Being able to exchange spears with me proves your peerless talent. Keep devoting yourself to cultivating your techniques. Time will build up and become your strength. Yes. Pryuta Circuit Level 7, High Rank Spear Technique Master, right? Hoo-hoo, keep working hard. Today was fun, too. With that, Pryuta disappeared. Left alone, I closed my eyes and remembered the 90 minutes of battle I just experienced. High Rank Spear Technique Master that's quite a demanding task. However. With today's level up, there were only 5 levels to go. In just five levels, I could directly inherit his skills. Of course, skills became harder to level up the higher they were. Although it seemed far away now, I would eventually reach it. I was confident. I had never stopped. I always stepped forward, staring straight onward. That much, I was sure of. I stood up with my spear. The spear technique I saw and experienced. It was time to review it. Chapter, 55. How much time passed. When I noticed Elo's message that he arrived in front of the door, I was dripping with sweat. Thanks for waiting, friend. Nah, I didn't wait that long. It'll make a party right away. When I found the party Elo's made and tapped it with my finger, the scenery warped. In front of me was Elo's, who I now saw for the first time in four years. Elo's. Who are you? Ellos had grown a lot since the last time we met. His slightly frail body now had muscles, and his pretty boy face was a lot manlier. If I were to bring him to Earth, he could even debut as an actor straight away. However, Ellos was tilting his head as he was staring at me. Sorry, but this party is already full. Can you look for another? Im Kong Shin. What are you saying? Ha ha ha, you kid eh, you have the same voice. Elo's expression went stiff. The shield warrior behind him, who I believed was named Paul, stepped forward. No way, the monster from back then became this handsome. What did you pick up and eat? Well I did technically pick and eat things, but... Handsome. He was flattering me too much. It was simply a monster becoming human again. Taking out Flesh Golem's giant toe from my inventory, I placed it in Elo's hand and said, Hey race a reunion gift, Elo's. Ek. What's this, a toe? Eh, an install item. How creepy. I got the reaction I wanted and was satisfied. I then looked at Elo's companions. There was Paul who I met on the fifth floor and a woman I had not seen before. If my memory served correctly, there should a man named Seltine. He wasn't here. What happened to Seltine? He died. It was a heroic death in battle against dozens of invaders. Elo's calm expression while talking about the death of his comrade gave me chills. Elo's then showed a bitter smile and tapped my shoulder lightly. Don't worry about it. The moment we became warriors, we prepared ourselves for death. He used his life to protect everyone. Even though he's no longer here, he lives on in our hearts. I decided to honor his death by chasing the invaders away from our continent. If you're okay with it, I won't say anything. Yeah, thanks. Anyways, it's great meeting you again, Shin. The aura coming off of you surprised me. I had heard the rumors, but you really were a hero. Sorry, but I don't really know about that hero thing, though I've heard it a lot. I proceeded to shake hands with Paul, then faced the woman standing behind Elo's. It was my first time meeting her. She was a beautiful woman with deep violet hair which was tied down, and a pair of calm eyes matching her hair's color. She wore light clothing that made it easy to move, had a large bow in one hand, and wore a quiver on her back. Strangely, a silver ring on her ring finger stood out. I looked at Elo's. He was also wearing a ring on his ring finger. So this is your fiancé. Oh, you're unexpectedly not dense. Right, this is my fiancé, Barula Atuna. Isn't she pretty? Hello, I'm Barula Atuna. 
I've heard a lot about you from Ellos. Barula put her free hand sorry, but it looked frail on her chest and lightly bowed. At her formal greeting, I couldn't help but return the same greeting. We're both from the Resistance Army. Well done, Ellos. You managed to snatch up a beauty like her. At my words, Ellos made a dumbfounded expression. You're one to talk. You have the undivided attention of the Crown Princess, who's famous even throughout the first dungeon. If you're talking about Paludia, I can only be disappointed in your eye for people. At that moment, an area became warped and four dungeon explorers appeared. Ah, two of them were faces I'd seen before. One was the long-eared woman, who I now knew to be an elf, carrying a bow and quiver like Barula, and the other was the rapier warrior woman who said I had a cute face. Even after all these years, the two of them had the same faces. I knew elves lived for a long time and aged late, but I was shocked the rapier warrior didn't change at all. However, I had never seen the other two before. They were both extremely beautiful. One of them had a shield long enough to cover her body entirely, and was about 175 centimeters. She had pink hair that curled down her shoulders, and had moist, pink eyes that were strangely charming. However, the way she held her shield or the way she trembled like a baby deer unlike how mature she looked, both looked somewhat familiar. Where did I see her before? Ah. Ah, it's Miss Shuna. You became so pretty. H hello, Crown Prince Nim. I it's an honor. Crown Prince Nim is really handsome too. You you, what do I do, I talk to him. Ludia, I talk to Crown Prince Nim. Why do you only recognize Shuna? I'm the one you have friend. When I was exchanging greetings with Shuna, Paludia, who was standing next to her, hit me. Because it was within my expectations, I blocked her with my arm. Seeing Paludia rolling on the ground in pain, I felt very satisfied. Although I didn't recognize them, I realized who they were when I saw the other two. If four people from Luka continent were here, Paludia and Shuna would naturally be among them. I was simply embarrassed to face her. That's why I acted that way. Paludia got up, holding back her teary eyes. She was vastly different than before. Four years ago, she was a little kid who had not even been 140 centimeters, but she had now become a fairly tall, 170 centimeters lady. Her once childlike, twin-tailed blonde hair was now flowing down to her waistline, glistening a lustrous gold. Her sapphire eyes were deep, like they contained countless years. Furthermore, her white skin looked smooth enough that water droplets could flow down seamlessly. She had a not too large and not too small nose, which a sculptor seemed to have devoted his heart and soul to creating. Finally, her moist lips glowed with a peach-like light pink. Her appearance was terrifyingly beautiful, to the point that it seemed to suck in anyone that laid their eyes on her. It was the type of peerless beauty that I never would have imagined myself seeing. If anyone with a weak heart was watching, his heart would undoubtedly stop at this breathtaking beauty. Just what did she eat for four years to grow so much? I couldn't believe my eyes. Wait, no. I remembered Sheena saying that people from Luka continent had a sudden growth spurt. Although I had not paid much attention to it before, Shuna and Paludia were both from the Luka continent. I couldn't believe my stupidity. So that's why Paludia was saying she wasn't a little kid. That said, it was slightly iffy to say she was fully grown. As her robe that stuck to her figure showed, her chest area was more or less the same. Had they not fully grown yet? Or was that how they were when they were fully grown? If I were to make a hasty judgment, she was like Yua. Of course, even without much of a chest, her slender arms and legs, and elegant curves made her figure extremely charming. However, I did not say any of this out loud. Ahahaha, ah, you grew a lot. In height. Why is that the first thing you say, you o oh, or orc? Although her beauty made it hard for me to stare at her, I remembered the Paludia from four years ago and barely met her eyes. At the same time, Paludia, who was looking at me from head to toe, made a blank expression. Why you, are you really orc? No, I'm not orc, but I am Kong Shin. You still say rude things so easily. I it really is you. Paludia was frozen in place like she was hit by an ice magic. 
For some reason, Shuna, who was standing next to her, kept covering her face with her shield. I turned to face the rapier warrior, and asked. Did they eat something strange while growing up? Aha, Crown Princess S.I. is the bad one. I heard stories, but what happened to turn you into such a M.M., how fine. My eyes weren't wrong. Wow, look at this tone chest. Um, can you not approach me? Also, please stop touching me like that. When I asked her as I slowly backed away, the elf archer pulled the rapier warrior by her ears and pulled her away. As I thought, all elves except Loretta knew manners. W8. Don't you have anything else to say? To me. After finally snapping out of her frozen state, Paludia asked me. It seemed she only grew up in appearance, as her way of talking had not changed in the slightest. If she didn't open her mouth, she really was like a princess from a fairy tale. How unfortunate. Looking at her, I tilted my head. M.M. like what? A. A. lot. Like how much you wanted to see me, or how much prettier I became. M.M. Well, I did wonder how you were doing occasionally, and I do think you became really pretty. But what about it? Paludia became silent. Her face was bright red to the point I was afraid it would blow up. What should I do about this awkward atmosphere? Did I do something to irritate Paludia again? Then, I suddenly remembered. The headband of wisdom I got from the 19th floors named Lizard Woman. I had planned to give it to Paludia. Hoping it would ease her anger, I took out the headband of wisdom from my inventory. When she saw it, her eyes became wide as she asked. W what's this? An accessory. I happened to pick it up. I thought it'd suit you well. It's a gift. You know, a reunion gift. G gift? Paludia's face became redder than the headband of wisdom. Did I do something wrong again? Did she hate headbands? I thought it was perfect for her class, since it raised magic and intelligence. I didn't understand where I went wrong. Even so, when I put the headband in her hand, she calmly took it and slowly put it in her hair. Mm, it seemed she didn't hate it that much. When I smiled with satisfaction, Paludia covered her face with her hands. You you, why you're just, orc. Ellos, he. Don't say it, Paul. Don't say it. Eh. This was different from the reunion I imagined looking at Ellos and Paul shaking their heads as they looked at me in silent Paludia, who was still looking down while covering up her bright red face, my mind fell into chaos. This, did I need to use Orc Lord's war cry? Seeing that Barula SSI seemed fine, I went and talked to her. She simply covered her mouth with her hand as she snickered. After hearing what I said, the other party members looked at me with cold eyes and each said a word. Fool. Idiot. Crown Prince Nim is stupid. You 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 stupid orc. Hey, I'm not stupid anymore. My intelligence is above twenty now. I'm not an orc either. Unable to figure out just what I did wrong, my mind fell into chaos yet again. Edia's continent, Luca continent, and two more from Pilo's continent. A total of ten people including myself stood in front of the 25th floor's door. Other than Barola, who replaced Celtine, all nine members were the same as four years ago. It didn't feel different in particular. Ellos seemed to have thought the same thing, as he only made a short speech as the party leader. Don't think it will be as easy as it was four years ago. I'm sure you've all had your fair share of experiences as you climb to the 25th floor, but floor master battles only get harder. This was especially true for the 20th floor master, Lizard Knight. However, I believe that with the members present, it is fully possible to defeat the floor master within five tries. He was blabbering some weird things. Five tries. Wouldn't it be hard to succeed in five tries even if we know the strategy beforehand? An axe-carrying warrior from Pilo's continent said with a bitter smile. Although he wasn't that close to me, it seemed the two people from Pilo's continent kept in touch with Ellos. It was why they could meet us here today. However, he was blabbering even weirder things. Huh, but this time, we have Crown Prince. Ah, uh, right, Crown Prince. If we clear it within five tries, we can really jump ahead of others. Hoo-hoo, we are so bad ourselves. 
the other party members began blabbering. Everyone was only saying things with an overwhelming sense of defeat. I thought this was a dream team of sorts, but what was this feeling of helplessness? Ellos, is the 25th floor master hard? I hear it's a giant ghoul. So this is where he appears. Was he trying to vent his anger for being unable to appear in the event dungeon? At my shout, the other party members tilted their heads. I figured I would only receive looks of envy if I told them about the event dungeon, so I didn't. As you can expect from what you've been experiencing since the 21st floor, tons of zombies are said to appear. Since Miss Paludia, Mataris Priestess, is here, we won't have to worry about being infected, but be sure to have holy waters handy in case something goes wrong. Also, the zombies are known to act without set patterns so always stay on your guard and help each other out. Paul, Miss Shuna, can I trust you two to tank the giant ghoul? Leave it to me. Yes, blocking is one thing I'm confident in. I didn't know about Paul, but seeing Shuna, who was an untrustworthy little girl just four years ago, now nodding her head confidently with her slender figure and curly pink hair, I did feel rather touched. However, her eyes still had a hint of uncertainty ah. When she met my eyes, her face became red, and she dropped her head. It was rather hurtful. I thought I wasn't ugly enough to hurt anyone watching anymore what was it? My face? But mother said my face took after hers and was very handsome. Shin, you. It'll take care of the minions. I don't need support so you guys can focus on the giant ghoul. H how reassuring. Elo seemed a bit taken back by my confident speech. Everyone else showed signs of anxiety, but Paludia was silent unlike herself four years ago. Rather than having no complaints, it seemed she respected the name I had built up. There must be a reason you're called Crown Prince. You better do your job properly. You better heal people properly too. Humph. It'll be focusing on the tanks, so don't you get hurt while you're distracted. Miss Paludia, how cute. Hoo hoo. I agree. How cute. Cuckoo. W what? Why is everyone snickering? Look away. Just what was cute about Paludia there? I could only see her acting grumpy these guys, as I thought, they're all weird. Today, well focus on getting used to the giant ghoul's habits and skills. We want to avoid dying without any gains. Let's do our best. I believe in everyone's ability that helped us climb to the 25th floor. With that, Ellos looked at me. In response, I confidently nodded my head. I mean, I could kill it alone, so why wouldn't I be able to kill it with nine other people? Then, let's go in. Ellos opened the door to the floor master. What greeted us was a large graveyard. Chapter, 56 Kook, I heard fields get created from the 25th floor onward. It was true. Field. I'm talking about that graveyard. It's the optimal environment to power up undead monsters. The instant the words left Ello's mouth, dozens of hands began to pop up across the graveyard. These guys had clearly seen some horror movies before. Paludia didn't seem to want to let it happen, as she took in a deep breath and yelled. Oh Mataris of justice and love, shine out with holy brilliance in this evil place. The image of her holding her staff and chanting with her silvery voice complimented her appearance, making her look even more beautiful. As I was thinking this, the graveyard, which was darker than usual boss rooms, possibly from the effect of the so-called field, became brighter. The majority of the zombies popping up from the ground screamed like vampires that just saw sunlight and returned to the ground. Paludia looked at me and shrugged her shoulders. Hoo hoo, how was it? Um, um I don't know how to describe it but it was cool. You you, um. Paludia flinched at my compliment. Wasn't that what she expected? Girls were really complicated. The giant ghoul is appearing. Paul, Miss Shuna, please. We're going. Why yes. Paludia and the other magicians struggled to keep up with the dozens of zombies popping out of the ground like daisies, while a gurgling roar rang out from deep inside the graveyard. I first called Pika. Pika, we're going to take care of all the zombies. Can you do it? Leave it to me, master. I'm going to need a little mana, is that okay? Take it. 
Okay, chain lightning. Immediately afterwards, Pika's body shone and a nearby zombie was swept up in lightning. The lightning then bounced to another zombie near it, then bounced again to other zombies in its surroundings. Strangely, although the lightning was changing its target continuously, it was not losing energy, but gaining it. The chain of lightning continued endlessly. It finished off each zombie in just a few seconds and bounced to the next one, expanding further outward. It was like a huge net had been cast over the graveyard. It went without saying that it caught the party member's attention. W what's this? Is it lightning magic? But we don't have a lightning magician in our party. No, this is elemental magic. Crown Prince Nim has a lightning elemental. Oh right, the archer from Luca Continent was an elf. When I glanced at her, she gave me a courteous bow in return. Eh, wasn't she acting differently than before? She was courteous before, but I could feel awe and respect from her this time. Master, this won't harm allies. Allies won't be harmed, so charge at the ghoul. Ah, everyone, the zombies' feet are tied. Now is our chance. At my shout, Ellos directed the party members. Paul and Shuna were already heading towards the ghoul with their shields. Ellos and the other damage dealers followed soon after. The giant ghoul that was slowly making his appearance seemed to have become angry at his minions being slaughtered, as he let out another roar and fully revealed himself. Unlike the zombies, he had an entirely hardened body. His steel claws shone with a malicious gleam, and his two large eyes showed clear hostility. Slightly over four meters tall, the giant ghoul came off as incredibly intimidating. In truth, I only remembered ghouls as being frail crybabies. I hoped the floor master giant ghoul would be a bit different. Eite! You stupid monster, come attack me! It wasn't a line from a cartoon for little kids. It was Shuna using provoke. Eight, eight. The sight of Shuna pushing on the giant ghoul's legs with her large shield was slightly mismatched with her mature appearance. It was cute. However, the giant ghoul seemed to have thought differently, as he lifted his leg and tried to stomp on Shuna. In that instant, Shuna's eyes sparkled as she tilted her shield slightly. It looked like she had her own way of dealing with it. I then turned to face the zombies. Pika's lightning net had already killed several hundred of them, but more were coming out. Master, these guys keep popping up. I'm annoyed. They're really like cockroaches. Let's split the work, Pika. You protect the long-ranged damage dealers and healers. I playfully spun the spear in my hand twice, then aimed it forward. They'll protect the guys facing the ghoul. Tempest. Cool. Crown Prince Nim, do you not need any assistance? After I had turned dozens of zombies into pieces of flesh, the elf archer asked me respectfully. Behind her, Barula was also looking at me. I also saw Paludia glancing at me. You focus on healing Miss Shuna. I took out a low-grade mana potion and put it in my mouth. You can focus on the giant ghoul. Pika will protect you perfectly, and I won't let the zombies near the other party members. I understand. After asking Pika to protect them, I shot forward. Seeing the newly popped up zombies heading toward the damage dealers and tanks, I shouted. You half-rotten corpse bastards, come fight me. You use provoke. You draw nearby enemies toward you. Goo. Human, arrogant, human. Goo. Living, human. My mid-rank provoke succeeded in drawing the zombies' attention instantly. These cockroaches were crawling out of the ground even now. Letting out a deep breath, I charged straight forward. Hap! The zombies that collided with my spear and armor exploded and flew back. The unintelligent zombies continued to flock to me like moths to a flame, and subsequently were blasted into pieces. After I cleared the zombies in a straight line to the giant ghoul, the number of zombies seemed a lot lower. Amazing. It's not just his elemental. Crown Prince so that's why they call him Crown Prince. Oh Mitaris. The two archers were talking about me instead of shooting out their arrows, but when Paludia chanted her spell, they snapped out of it and began attacking the giant ghoul. Of course, I didn't really mind no matter what they did. 
The giant ghoul is attacking with his claws. I heard Ello's voice echo across the graveyard. At the same time, an air-severing swoosh rang out. When I turned to face the direction it was coming from, the giant ghoul was swiping in a cross with both his arms. Poison seeped out from the tips of his claws and tried to envelope the party members. With shocked expressions, they quickly ran around to dodge it. Nice, we dodged it. Hey, don't be so proud after dodging such an easy attack. Ah, a follow-up. Paul. Cough, he'll be going first. Saying the same thing he said four years ago, Paul disappeared. He was the first to die four years ago, too. What was this feeling of deja vu? That guy, wasn't he just weak? How could a tank be so slow? Also, why be a tank if you're going to die in one hit? Countless questions and annoyed screams resounded in my mind. Miss Shuna, will you be fine on your own? Don't kayak, worry. Although the scream worried me, Shuna was holding her ground, possibly thanks to that blessing by her family's guardian god. Since I couldn't run to help her at the moment, I set my worries aside. I decided to first focus on taking care of all the zombies. Ah, I'm using a lot of potions today. That said, the 300 gold double potions were truly delicious. While I was at it, I put one hand on my waist and made a refreshing expression like I was filming a sports drink ad. While I was having my fun, the nearby zombies jumped at me with their claws and teeth. The result was as expected. Their claws and teeth shattered without even leaving a scratch on me. Even so, I couldn't just forgive the perverted zombies for trying to bite my neck. I kicked the zombies here and there. Even my kicks could instantly kill these weaklings. Eh, was Crown Prince Nim a tank? He's so strong. He can fill all roles and even wields an elemental. He really is. It's because he's my master. Isn't he cool? Isn't he awesome? Pika had joined the party members before I noticed and was bragging about me. There was no problem since she turned the zombies around them into ashes, but it was embarrassing, so I hoped she'd stop. Oh benign Mataris, become one with my allies. Paludia's holy chants were especially effective against undead monsters, and had the effect of weakening them. More importantly, it healed Shuna, who was blocking the giant ghoul's attacks with difficulty, and even recovered her stamina. Thanks, Ludia. Focus on your opponent. Reinforcements are coming. Warriors, attack. The ghoul's attacks are blocked. Now's our chance. Cool. Being in a party raid felt refreshing. Warriors shouted, healers chanted, and party leaders endlessly gave orders. I even felt a bit nostalgic as I remembered our raid from the fifth floor. Of course, that was the past, and this was reality. Before I even noticed, two more people had died. It was the rapier warrior from Luca Continent and a swordsman from Pilos Continent. It was just shameful. Kook, the ghoul is too strong. We can't even let him scratch us. Miss Shuna, Miss Shuna. Yes, I'm blocking it. The surviving warriors dodged the ghoul's attacks with their lives on the line, and Shuna was running around, trying to block the attacks with her large shield. Although she tried her best to draw his aggro, the giant ghoul became enraged and changed his target once a damage dealer hit him even once. In that sense, it was more intelligent than any of the floor masters from before. He made it much harder for the tank to keep his aggro. I reached the conclusion that everyone except Shuna would die if this continued. Ellos, switch. Yeah, switch. Switch. I held up my black earthen spear and swung it horizontally with great force. With extending spear, the spear's range instantly reached 5 meters, and the zombies in the radius of 5 meters all died in a single swing. Everyone, go protect the long-range damage dealers. He'll handle the giant ghoul. What? Wait, Shin. Make use of what you can. Level up takes priority over your pride, right? At my words, Ellos shut his mouth. He must have realized that I was extremely disappointed in my party members. Chapter 57 I didn't expect an overwhelming victory, but I at least expected them to be strong enough to be considered elites. In truth, 
they were only slightly better than ordinary explorers. Elos was the only one strong enough to be called an elite. Shuna had high defense and was passionate, but she was lacking in all other aspects, and Poludia well, I didn't really know how to judge a priestess ability. However, the explorers from Pelos Continent, Luca Continent's rapier warrior, and Paul, who had died, were extremely lacking. They acted like they were playing a game, waiting for the right time to strike, and backing out right after to avoid danger. It might have been necessary to survive until now, but with over 30% of the party members acting that way, it was only obvious that the floor master would make use of the openings they created. As a result, they all died. If I remembered correctly, didn't they say they were fighting the demon race that invaded their continent? How could they be so full of leisure? Why weren't they more desperate to survive? Not to mention, they were explorers of the first dungeon, not the third or fourth. They should be their continent's best in terms of potential. I really could not understand. It was one thing to be lacking in ability, but they were also lacking in their mindset. At least Paul was a bit more fierce. Although he died right away from being overzealous, he was much better than the ones attacking occasionally, or the ones only using skills when their mana allowed it. Another thing I didn't like was that everyone expected defeat before we even challenged the floor master. However, I let that one slide. What was important was that it annoyed me and made me want to vent this frustration with action. This is what a real warrior would do. Pika, make a path for me. Okay, master. Ite. Over 20% of my mana drained out of me in an instant, as Pika put her hands out and let out a cute shout. Immediately afterwards, a laser-like lightning thicker than her own body shot out toward the ghoul, destroying all zombies in its path. Numerous messages of me receiving gold rang out, but I ignored them. I made the path, so everyone take care. Pika, you come to me. Okay. Well follow Shin's orders. Miss Shuna, let's go. Be but, if we just leave everything to Crown Prince Nim, it won't be a raid. This isn't a raid, Miss Shuna. Elo said with a hint of bitterness. It's a fight for our continent's survival. After absorbing Pika, my black earthen spear flickered with threatening sparks. I ignored the zombies running towards me. I knew they wouldn't hinder me in the slightest. Goo. Hey, giant ghoul. It's a great day to die, isn't it? When I stopped the giant ghoul from chasing after Elos and the others, who were running back, he glared at me as if he was extremely annoyed. However, he wasn't scary in the slightest. While taking care of the zombies, I had already learned its movement patterns. I'm starting. I didn't plan on using Teleria. I didn't need to use it. The spear in my hand and Pika. Just the two of them would be enough. Goo. Hot. I jumped to the side and dodged his claws easily. At the same time, I stabbed my spear into the back of his hand. He was certainly different from the ordinary ghouls, as his defense was overwhelmingly stronger. My spear could only stab into his skin lightly. It was within my expectations. I stabbed with my spear a few more times. As a result, the spear broke through his skin and blood spurted out. Qua. Ha. It's going to sting a little. In truth, stabbing consecutively was hard to do with a spear, and would have been hard even if I had a sword. I didn't know about others, but my stabbing movement concentrated my bodice energy into one point and thrust out. If an ordinary person did such movements consecutively, their muscles and bones would shatter. However, it was a different story for explorers like myself, whose bodies could grow endlessly. We could protect and strengthen our bodies with the power of mana. Even among dungeon explorers, I, who compressed my bones, muscles, and skin, could easily perform consecutive stabs. I could even do it as I cooked myself some pork belly to eat. This was what it meant to truly become strong. It was not using the same techniques as always, just with increased strength and dexterity. It was using techniques that could only be done with increased strength and dexterity. Qua. The enraged giant ghoul failed in trying to kick me. Then, he swung his claws at me. The attack swiped up from below and even had a wide range, making it hard to avoid. However, it also served as a good chance. 
a good chance for me to dig into his chest. Because of his swiping movement, his face and chest were both lowered to the point where they were within my reach without me having to jump. Hap. Another consecutive stabbing. Using the time it would take for his claws to reach me, I stabbed my spear into his face multiple times. Every time my spear collided with his face, it burned with a frightening sound from my spirit aura. After receiving a huge injury, the giant ghoul became startled and stepped backwards, trying to stomp on me. Qua. Am not done yet. I concentrated my energy on the black earthen spear. Mana flowed into it following Puryuta circuit's pathway. In addition, the Bodhis pure strength that I could control also flowed into it. Gathering in the tip of Black Earth and Spear, they both became concentrated at a single point. This process, which would have taken a longer time without the blessing of a skill, only took an instant to complete, as if a god's power had guided it. As always, a radiant white light spiraled out. Together with Spirit Aura, it became a spiral of white lightning. My Black Earth and Spear took the form of Zeus Lightning, as it radiated out with a brilliant white light. The giant ghoul was clearly uncomfortable. Undead monsters were naturally weak to light. It wanted to stomp and kill me, but Heroic Strike only took a moment to complete. Heroic Strike. Qua. I shot my spear out with all my strength. It pierced the same area on his face that I had attacked before. At the same time, his wild thrashing stopped. All the zombies stopped their movements as well. In that instant, a cold silence hung in the graveyard. Is he dead? Ellos whispered quietly. I believed he was dead, but Ellos' words made me raise my guard. As if to answer my suspicion, the giant ghoul got up after a bit of struggle. Bottom. The sound of a heartbeat rang out from a place I couldn't point out. In the next moment, the injuries he received on his face and in other places were disappearing. It was as if time was flowing backwards. Giant Ghoul uses Die Hard. He completely recovers from all injuries, and regains 50% of his max HP. Goo. You sure sound excited. Damn it, I thought we won. So even with Crown Prince, this is how far we go. Kook, but it was still a good experience. Who knew we'd go so far on our first try? Just knowing that skill exists is a great help. We'll have to find a way to stop it from being used next time. The party members started talking helplessly again. It made me depressed just listening to them. However, I still had some moves left in me. I didn't plan on giving up in the slightest. Paludia, do you have attack chance, too? I I do. Orc are you going for it? Don't call me Orc. Lightly answering her, I tapped on my chest where my pocket watch was always hanging. Have you seen an orc this strong and cool? Although it was embarrassing, I had to exaggerate a bit to lighten up this depressing mood of death and defeat. Confirming that the cooldown time on my double potion had ended, I gulped down another double potion. The black earthen spear had pierced through his head and flown to some unknown area of the graveyard, but I didn't necessarily need black earthen spear right now. Paludia, attack him however you can. This goes for the archers too. Close range damage dealers, stay back and protect them. At my command, Paludia nodded her head and began to chant. Barula and the elf archer both seemed to be using a skill as they mumbled something and aimed their bows at the giant ghoul. Meanwhile, the fully recovered giant ghoul charged towards me as he glared angrily. How annoying. If he was smaller, I would have smacked him away. It was truly a shame. Don't think you're the only one with skills. I was going to end it with a bang, but you ruined my plan with that cheaty skill. I won't forgive you for that. I could use my spear again like an adult, but I wanted to let this ghoul understand the depressing feeling I had. With a deep breath, I shouted. You whack. You used Orc Lord's war cry. All party members are cleansed of negative status effects. All party members' attack power increases by 50% for the duration. All party members become super armored, unfazed by enemy attacks. W. Watt. This is Orc Lord's war cry. I, I've heard of it before. That Crown Prince uses Floor Master's skills. Geo. 
The giant ghoul roared as it faced me, then swung his claws at me. I shouted before he could reach me. Dragon skin. Cack. The giant ghoul howled. His claws had hit my chest and shattered. As expected, dragon skin worked even against floor masters. I lifted my hand, which was slower because of dragon skin, and tightly gripped the giant ghoul's arm. Now that it was within my grasp, I would not let go. Cool. You're dead. You ever hear of pay to win? This is skill to win. Everyone, he can't move, so attack. Oh, oh Mataris. Use your subject's body and bring down the iron mace on thy enemy who disrupts the world's justice. Sniping shot. Arrow bomb. The three girls' attacks bombarded the giant ghoul. Although he shook his body in an attempt to dodge them, his resistance subsided when I grabbed another one of his claws and broke it. Immediately afterwards, a silver mace appeared in the air. A sharp arrow and an arrow imbued with black aura flew toward the giant ghoul, and all three weapons struck the giant ghoul. The black aura arrow even exploded upon contact, leaving behind a black trace on his face. The giant ghoul screamed and used his free hand to scour the ground below. I realized he was looking for zombies to eat. Elo seemed to have noticed it as well. Kill the zombies near his hands. Understood. The elf archer and Barola crazily shot their arrows the moment Elo's words left his mouth. The zombies rising from the ground fell and crumbled. Unable to recover his wounds, the giant ghoul let out an angry roar. KIA. As always, the final blow should be done by the main character. I jumped on his arm. Yua. I was extremely slow from Dragon Skin's effect. Even so, I focused and tightly gripped on his body, crawling slowly toward his face. Although I thought it looked a bit unsightly, I didn't pay any attention to it. After the short, yet long, climb, I stood on the giant ghoul's shoulder. Although it struggled, trying to make me fall, I tightly grabbed onto his ear. Then, I shouted. Dark Thunder Explosion. Chapter, 58. Hook, he can even use that skill. Just what is a hero? Look, the ghoul. Dark Thunder Explosion attacked all targets in its area of effect. Even though the giant ghoul was huge, his entire body was within Dark Thunder Explosion's range. He had essentially received the entire force of the attack, which would usually be spread out across dozens of enemies. Plus, at the same time I used the skill, I punched my fist in his head. Die. 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 Quiak. By the time Dark Thunder Explosion came to an end, the giant ghoul looked no different than before he used Die Hard. I wasn't done yet. I called Pika. Since I had cancelled Spirit Aura after throwing the spear, she answered immediately to my call. Pika, come inside my gauntlet. You you, you're using that again. Please, Pika. Okay but you have to listen to one wish, master. With a bit of complaint, Pika infused herself into my gauntlet. Thinking that her wish was probably for me to play with her later, I shouted. Thunder Beast. Seeing lightning shoot out from my body, Elo seemed exhausted as he said, I'm too tired to even be surprised. Of course, I didn't pay him any attention. I simply put my first through the giant ghoul's uselessly large head. Not long afterwards, he collapsed. He was burnt to a crisp, but let out a disgusting smell that anyone would run away from. You became level 26 and obtained the qualification to climb to the 26th floor. You obtained 5 bonus stats. 30,000 gold is distributed evenly among party members. You received 4,286 gold. Rewards will be distributed in order of contribution. Kong Shin Nim's contribution is the highest. Choose your reward. 1. Giant Ghoul's Pants. 2. Double Potion. 3. 10,000 Gold. 4. Skin Strengthening Elixir. 5. Giant Ghoul's Boots. 6. Rotten Ebony Staff. 7. Giant Ghoul's Shoulder Blade. Hoping that Giant Ghoul's shoulder blade wasn't part of the set equipment, I chose the skin strengthening elixir. 
I was glad it wasn't like the muscle strengthening elixir, where it would only appear with two people. Since the skin strengthening elixir came out this time, I suspected one of the floor masters would soon have bone strengthening elixirs. While I was picking my reward, the party members were going crazy. We did it. I can't believe we cleared it on our first try. This is a miracle. Crown Prince Nim, you really are amazing you single-handedly brought us victory. I can't help but be jealous. Just four years ago, he couldn't even advance to the sixth floor as he lacked mana. He's a hero. This is his destiny. I got annoyed, as it felt like she was saying I got stronger only because I was a hero. I didn't even know what a hero was. When I snapped my head at them, they all looked away, pretending not to have said anything. I smirked and swallowed the skin-strengthening elixir. I wasn't planning on continuing with them anyways, and I only knew them through Elos and Polydia. I wasn't motivated to argue with them in the slightest. By consuming the skin-strengthening elixir, your skin becomes tougher and more resilient. Constitution and charm both increase by one. Since my defense went up, it made sense that constitution went up, but why did charm go up as well? Could this skin-strengthening elixir be used as a beauty product? Mother would go crazy if she knew. All right, he'll let father grind them. It was his wife becoming more beautiful, so I'm sure he'd do it on his own. Yua. My Yua's skin was and would always be perfect. I turned around. Perhaps it was coincidental, but all the party members were staring at me. It seemed they already finished choosing their rewards. Crown Prince Nim, thank you. He'll be going ahead. With just that, the surviving member from the Pelos Continents party left. I was slightly lost for words at his lightning fast exit, but I wasn't concerned with him. Elos approached me, handing me my black earthen spear that he likely picked up while I was busy. Friend, we won because of you. Just like four years ago. No, you could have won without me, though most people would have been kicked out of the dungeon in the process. I'm going to fight him again. I have to help Paul get through. I won't help you with that. I joined this party to raid with you, not to help you pass through I only helped today because I didn't want to see people dying in front of me for no reason. Of course. Elos smiled bitterly. Had made only one miscalculation, and that was my strength. He must be thinking our difference in ability made this laughable result. However, I thought differently. I didn't like the mindsets they had showed since the beginning. In attitude during battle or anything else, they could not even compare to Ren, not even Elos. Why is everyone so conservative? It's not like they'll really die, so why can't they be a little more daring? I've realized this as I watched different dungeon explorers, but that's just how you guys look today. Like people that didn't want to advance to higher floors. At my words, the people remaining flinched slightly. What, was that true? My mouth half opened from the shock. Of course, Elos was the only one who would answer my suspicions. In truth you might be right. After becoming dungeon explorers, they received the highest treatment from their respective countries. Although it is to be used as tools for battle against the invaders, the good treatment comes before that. After reaching a certain level that is, after becoming silver rank, they're treated almost like royalty. Until they're sent to the battlefield, that is. So. When their level goes up, their countries would treat them better, but they would also be sent to more dangerous places all dungeon explorers want to avoid that to a certain extent. And this sentiment might have been reflected as being conservative in floor master battles. If they died in the process, they would be safer and they can use the excuse that they did their best, while fully enjoying the benefits of being a dungeon explorer. It's probably the same in other worlds. For dungeon explorers, their initial ambition of wanting to protect their worlds becomes fainter as they climb. After hearing this, I remembered. At the fifth and tenth floors, the explorers were happy and excited at the prospect of advancing forward. But starting from the fifteenth floor, people were more surprised and shocked than happy. Perhaps that party leader from my first Dark Rat Man raid wanted to lead the party to its death on purpose. In the one raid party I had on the twentieth floor, the party members became angry at Ren for making their friends die. They should have been happy first, or thanked me for my work. 
In other words, they might not have been happy to advance past the 20th floor. Of course, that wasn't to say they weren't happy in the slightest, but they must have felt equal or greater pressure from having to advance onward. It was absurd. Stupid. That weakness of theirs is going to lead to their deaths one day. That's simply in the present. I know. I know full well. Why dungeon explorers didn't adventure. I finally understood a bit of what Loretta and I talked about. These so-called first dungeon explorers. Even if they were chosen by other explorers and not by the dungeon itself, how could they be so shameful? But not everyone is like that, Shin. I hope you aren't too disillusioned about dungeon explorers. I know. If the dungeon only had people like them, their worlds would have been ruined already. And I don't think you're someone like that either. Thanks, but in truth, I'm not that different. Both in terms of ability and bravery, I'm no match for you. I learned a lot from you today. For years ago, I came to admire you and aspired to become like you. I remembered that feeling today. I hesitated. Elo's eyes were sincere. At least in my eyes, his willpower was there. Orc Kong Shin. I, am the same. Don't misunderstand. I'm only trying to grow stronger so I can fight the demon race. Yeah, Paludia, I know. You were a lot different than four years ago. Your performance today was dazzling. Hike. I meant to compliment her, but Paludia let out a strange squeal and shrunk back with a bright red face. She really was weird. Shuna was standing next to her stealing glances at me from behind her shield. I didn't know why, so I just let her be. Instead, I looked at Elos. Elos, how about you come with me for a little while? Climb the dungeon with me. Of course, I didn't mean I'd continue with him forever. It was just temporary, until he learned something from me. However, in a way, I already knew how he would respond. It was better to say I was going out of my way to sever the lingering attachment he would have. As expected, Elos shook his head. Sorry, Shin. But I have to lead my party members. I see. Well, you are a leader before you are a warrior. That was enough. Elos didn't need to change drastically. Rather, it was his party members that had to change. Both Paul and Barula had the right mindset. It was their skills that were lacking. But there wasn't much they could do about it. They could only keep working hard. If that wasn't enough, although it was a bit cruel, that was the extent of their talent. You're not going to change your party, right? Yeah. I want to keep going with them until the end. I believe I can. Then that's good enough. Good luck. You'll all need to change a lot. I'm off. Yeah, thanks. I'll contact you again. Today was a great experience. Kong Shin, wait. After saying my goodbye to Elos and even turning to Barula and bowing goodbye to her, I wanted to return to the dungeon I came from, but Paludia grabbed onto me. When I looked at her, she seemed to be lost for words as she her lips trembled without making a sound. When I urged her on with my gaze, she finally managed to open her mouth. Arezi residential area, have you been there? Not yet. I if you come contact me. Hmm. Why? Just do it. For some reason, Paludia looked like she was about to cry. Plus, her face was bright red like it was about to blow up. She looked dejected, yet also happy. I didn't know what her face was trying to say. Next to her, Shuna glanced back and forth between my face and Paludia's as if she knew what Paludia meant. Ludia. You how? Shuna, be quiet. I have no other choice. But that's not what you said before. Liar. Just admit that you just fell in love. Oop. Paludia covered Shuna's mouth with her hands, and dealt a knee kick to her waist. With her high defense, Shuna didn't seem to be in pain, but seeing two grown-up women in such an active posture made me feel slightly embarrassed. I'll contact you. Can I go now? H hurry up and leave. Crown Prince Naim. I turned my eyes away from Shuna, who was trying to tell me something even as Paludia was trying to stop her. My eyes then met the elf archers, 
who gave me a respectful bow. I still didn't know why she was acting that way. Then I left the party. Although a lot of confusing things had happened, the raid had finished successfully. Chapter, 59 Warriors needed rest. If I said so myself, not signing up for any classes on Friday was a godly move. Sprawled on the living room couch, I blanked out. I'd been staying too busy lately. I needed some rest. A month had passed since the midterms ended. It was that time of the school season when professors reveled in the complaints of students as they bombarded them with assignments. However, that had nothing to do with me. Unless it was an absolutely important assignment, I boldly skipped them all. I was busy being a dungeon explorer. How was I supposed to find the time to do assignments? As such, I was resting. Since I was fighting the giant ghoul three times a day, I believed I had the right. It was why I got up so early in the morning to quickly do my daily floor master battles. Until the 25th floor, there was no shortage of people to join my party. Even if there weren't a lot of people, I could easily find four or five people to join my party. But the 25th floor was different. There were people who refused to participate unless it was a full party of 10, and there weren't that many challengers either. 20th floor and below was the so-called beginner's area. There were a lot of apprentice explorers who wanted to challenge the boss raid, but things were different starting from the 25th floor. Those with ability had already gone up and those without ability couldn't make it here in the first place. As such, the number of explorers between the 25th and 40th floor was apparently quite small. It's also said that the dungeon's difficulty shot up from the 40th floor, resulting in many explorers who were forced to make meaningless challenges without being able to climb up. Of course, that was not important to me right now. In a way, since the number of first dungeon explorers was less than 40,000, it was surprising that I could easily find people to raid with. No matter how famous my crown prince name was, there wasn't much I could do with how few people actually wanted to climb. However, if I didn't find at least one person to join my party, I couldn't obtain skin-strengthening elixirs. When I explained my frustration to Loretta, she made a dumbfounded smile, and took out an item to help with my problem. This is a party member scarecrow. It increases the number of rewards by one. Ah, you can still only pick one though. Don't be surprised, this miraculous item is only 10,000 gold apiece. Loretta, your sales results have been skyrocketing thanks to me, right? I, it'll make it 8,000 gold apiece. I love you, Loretta. You you five five thousand apiece. It'll make it 5,000 gold. Eh. Why did you lower it again? Eh. Ah, ah. See cancel. Cancel what I just said. A woman's words are worth a thousand gold. 1. I didn't understand why Loretta lowered the cost again from 8,000 gold, but thanks to the party member scarecrows I got for just 5,000 gold each, I was able to get skin strengthening elixirs by doing floor master raids alone. My giant ghoul grind was nearing its end. My strength and charm had already gone up by 9 each, and it seemed the skin strengthening elixir's effect was quite noticeable on my skin, as mother gave me stinging glares. It was the kind of glare that said, if you have good things, don't keep them to yourself and fork some over. Sorry, mother, but I wasn't using them as beauty products. As I was thinking all these things while sprawled on the couch like a lion after its meal, the sound of footsteps coming down the stairs reached my ears. It was Yua. Ah, uh, Yua, are you going to school? Appa, today is a national holiday. When I turned around, she was in her casual clothes. I thought I was looking at an angel for a second, but it really was Yua. Phew, I almost got confused. Yua wasn't an angel, but a reincarnated angel. I had to remember. You should rest then. Even students need to let their brains rest once in a while. Ah, that's Appa, you're not busy today, right? Yua asked carefully after a bit of hesitation. I nodded my head. Yeah, I don't have classes today, so I'm resting. Um, Appa. You can just say it. I if it's okay do you want to go to the movies with me? I shot up from the couch immediately. Staying sprawled on the couch or going to movies with Yua. It was clear which was a better way to spend my rest day. 
Of course, Appa is free. Let's go to the movies. But Appa, don't you have to go to the dungeon today? You seemed busy lately. Not at all. I already finished what I had to do today, so I was bored. I'm thankful you asked. He he thanks, Appa. Then he'll get changed and get ready. Okay, he'll get ready too. Just like that, Yua and I were at the movie theater 30 minutes later. I could feel the gazes of surrounding people when we were walking with our arms linked, but I paid them no mind. It was because Yua was too pretty. What movie are we watching? This one here. My friend said it was fun, but I didn't have anyone to watch it with since they already watched it. I see. But Yua, if a boy ever invites you to the movies, I'd like you to discuss it with me first. I can't leave just anyone to escort Yua. My eyes were genuine and serious. At least, that's what I thought. Ah, uh, um I'm scared of boys, so I'm not really friends with them. Really? That's okay then. Remember, all men are evil. Except father and appa, of course. Kai, that's what you always say. It's true. Men are evil. Yua wouldn't even believe how evil they are. It was true, especially teenage boys. As someone who had been one before, I could attest to it. Yua could only enjoy her student life without knowing the ferociousness of teenage boys because of the safety device father and I put in without her knowledge. What about Appa? Men like Appa are rare. Appa will carefully pick out suitable candidates for Yua, so Yua can just choose among them. If you want, you don't have to choose anyone. Appa will support you your entire life. I accidentally went a little too wild. I carefully glanced at Yua, hoping she wasn't looking at me in contempt. Thankfully, she was laughing adorably. Okay, Appa. I'll believe in Appa's word and live off Appa forever. I'll be a mean sister-in-law too. Of course. Yua is Appa's first priority. That, I could swear on the heavens. I mean, I doubted anyone would want to marry me in the first place. After watching the movie, Yua and I headed to a nearby fast food restaurant. Although I wanted to bring her to somewhere more expensive, or even buy her the entire restaurant, Yua was a girl who knew how to find happiness in small things. Perhaps she wasn't the reincarnation of an angel, but the reincarnation of an archangel. These fries are great. But don't eat too much. You might end up like someone I know. Who? Potato witch. I retorted as I sipped on my cup of coke. It was then that I heard the sound of a tray falling on the ground. When I turned around, the potato witch was there. With a pale face, she was shaking. For the record, the fallen tray didn't have a hamburger, only piles of fries. As always, her actions weren't really hiding her presence, though she was covering herself with a hoodie. Shin. Is there a monster nearby? Why are you shaking so much? Appa? With Yua calling me, I turned back around. She had a very kind smile on her face. Something was strange. It was undoubtedly a kind smile, but it also felt chilling. Something had to be wrong with my eyes. What's wrong, Yua? Who is that? Shin. Is this your GGGGG girlfriend? Unlike Yua's calm smiling face, Su Yiyun was almost tearing up. Was she that sad about dropping her fries? I wasn't surprised. With a helpless sigh, I let Su Yiyun sit down. After all, just letting her stand there would only lead to more bothersome things. Hello, I'm Appa's younger sister, Yua. Ah, hello. I'm Su Yiyun. After I introduced them to each other, the chill I was getting from Yua disappeared. Su Yiyun stopped crying, but was still noticeably tense. At the same time, I felt a bit uneasy. Something always happened when I met Su Yiyun outside school. Was today going to be the same? You said you were Appa's college classmate? Ah, uh, yes. My relationship with Shin has been healthy without anything for you to worry about, yet. Yet? Relationship? Hike. Yua made a beaming smile, but for some reason, Su Yiyun started to sweat and was unable to meet Yua's eyes. You're his college classmate, right? 
Why yes. You're not dating him, but just classmates. Why yes, that's right. Then relationship wasn't the right word, hoo hoo. I worried for nothing. Dimples appeared on Yua's face. Eh. A chill swept over me again. Did Yua awaken? When I was seriously contemplating the possibility that Yua became an ability user, Yua interrupted. Take good care of Appa, Yi Ununi. As you can see, Appa is very pure and unwavering. If a bad woman approaches him, he'll easily get entangled. I hope you can take care of Appa, purely as a friend. And I'm younger, so you don't have to talk so politely. Why ye okay? While Yua and Su Yiyun exchanged words I couldn't comprehend, I simply ate my hamburger. Girls really talked in some secret code. I couldn't understand a thing. However, I did understand two things. One was that Su Yiyun was powerless against Yua for some reason, and another was that Yua might have an ability to control cold. By the time their conversation ended, I was crumpling up my hamburger wrapper. Do you want to go back, Yua? Is there anything you want to buy? Mm Appa, can we go window shopping for clothes? Sure, of course we can. When we left the restaurant after throwing away our trash, Su Yiyun was silently following us. With her stealth ability that would make even government top secret agencies want to scout her, it was no surprise. Yua gave her a glance, but only made a small smile. Soon after, the uneasy feeling I had from seeing Su Yiyun came true. When we were passing by a store with a TV by the window, a breaking news came on. Breaking news. The gate located in China's Guangzhou City shopping mall disappeared, and a giant boar over 50 meters tall appeared. The Chinese government has already deployed guardians to stop the boar's rampage, but there have already been over a thousand confirmed casualties. Giant monsters likewise appeared at the gates in Shanghai and Beijing, causing massive civilian casualties. The Chinese government has explained that this incident was caused by rogues who sneaked into the gate without their permission. However, given that all five gates located in China disappeared within a short period of time, and that large number of guardians were gathered at the gate locations, their words are likely untrue. I stopped walking. On TV, I saw a giant boar the size of a building running around in Guangzhou City. Several buildings had already fallen, making the scene look like something from the movies. The giant boar's relentless running was causing buildings to collapse and the asphalt road to tremor. In front of it were small dots, which I assumed were Chinese guardians. Of course, they weren't a match for the giant boar. Civilian casualties. It would probably be easier to count the number of people that survived. Immediately afterwards, three messages rang in my ear. An event raid has broken out. Sea rank 500 man raid, giant boar. Any dungeon explorers from Earth may participate. Would you like to participate? The moment you express your desire to participate, you will be teleported to the corresponding location. You will return to your original location after clearing the event raid. An event raid has broken out. Sea rank 1000 man raid, mini kraken wave. Any dungeon explorers from Earth may participate. Would you like to participate? The moment you express your desire to participate, you will be teleported to the corresponding location. You will return to your original location after clearing the event raid. An event raid has broken out. Sea rank 300 man, giant sword tiger. Any dungeon explorers from Earth may participate. Would you like to participate? The moment you express your desire to participate, you will be teleported to the corresponding location. You will return to your original location after clearing the event raid. 1. A modified version of the Korean proverb, a man's words are worth a thousand gold. Chapter, 60. China really was unlucky. Of the five dungeons they had, boss monsters appeared in two of the C-ranked ones. Not to mention, all of them were large-scale raids with over 300 people. Just who gave the orders to clear all five dungeons at once? Even after Mastiford warned them about the danger. Did they look down on raid bosses? Of course, if they cleared the dungeons one by one, the international community would have given them stinging glares. Even so, they cleared all five at once. I almost wanted to knock their heads to check if their brains were there. 
Did they need a giant don't touch sign? Did they want to serve as an example for other countries? Did they really want to kill a raid boss? Did they want monster corpses and bluestones that badly? What about all the civilians and tourists that were swept up? Countless questions swam through my head as I felt enraged. I opened the Dungeon Explorer's communication channel. As always, Masterford was the first to step up and talk. With the situation being as it is, she was rather serious. You guys heard, right? Heard and saw. Walker answered Masterford. At the same time, all five of us let out a deep sigh. I really want to burn up all those government bastards. Boonie. Masterford SSI, calm down. China is too big for Masterford SSI to take on alone. I'm sure the Chinese government will be content with this situation. When those giant monsters die, they will naturally leave huge rewards. Imagine if a blue stone appeared. If they were aiming for the raid bosses in the first place, they should have prepared for it properly. Why didn't they evacuate the civilians? Other countries would have found out if they did. They probably didn't explain things fully to the ability users either. I doubt even they expected such huge monsters to appear. I mean, even I'm surprised by their size. The mini krakens are small, but look at the sheer number of them. What a bunch of human trash. What do they think human lives are? But Masterford, isn't what you did in Young Dumpo the same? What if a raid monster as big as China's appeared? Not to mention, if a raid boss from an A-rank dungeon appeared in the middle of Seoul, the damage would have been much more too. Please, I'm an SS-rank ability user and dungeon explorer. Even if an A-rank 500-man raid broke out and a giant monster appeared, I could have taken care of it without any civilian casualties. I wouldn't have suggested it otherwise. If this was the first time I talked to Masterford, I would have snorted at her claim, calling it absurd. Now that I had partied with her, I could nod my head and agree. Her animal kingdom. Anyone that saw her army of flames would agree. I didn't think that was her full power either. Appa, what's wrong? Do you have someone you know in China? Shin, are you okay? At that moment, I realized my friend and younger sister were looking at me with worried eyes. I replied with a bitter smile. Sorry, let's go back for today. I'm a bit worried now after hearing that news about China. Okay, Appa. Let's go home. Yua simply agreed and linked her arms with mine. I thought this side of Yua was very admirable. On the other hand, Su Yiun made a very unhappy expression and glared back and forth between me and Yua. She then opened her mouth as if to say something, but closed it silently as she glanced at the disastrous scene being shown on TV. Thankfully, she had a sense of emergency. I'll see you later. Yeah, see you at school. After parting with Su Yiun, I headed home with Yua. All the while, the conversation among dungeon explorers was still going on. Uni, what are you going to do? I talked to my country's guardian, but it seems the Chinese government is refusing any offers of assistance. They're saying the Chinese guardian and freedom wing can take care of it by themselves. Participating in the raid on our own accord is a violation of China's right to monster subjugation. So you're saying we can only suck on our thumbs and wait? At Walker's words, everyone became silent. I asked. But China has many strong ability users, right? I heard they even have an SS rank. They do. It's a Juma named Xian Xiaomei. That sounds like a name from a drama or movie. The problem is that this Ajuma is a special type ability user. She can cast a debuff that significantly lowers the enemy's ability. That's it. Her body is weaker than a deer rank, and she can't do anything else. She calls herself a curse magician. China should have at least 20 S rank ability users. Although half of them are outside of the country, the other half are still there. Even if the monsters are massive types, the strongest is still C rank. If they team up with Xi and Xiaomei, they should be able to easily take care of one. But there are three boss monsters. What are the other two places supposed to do? I suppose A and B rank ability users will take care of those. They should have a large number of them. I took out my cell phone and checked China's current situation. 
I found a live stream footage of Shanghai, where the mini krakens had appeared. There, a bewitching beauty in a luxurious violet dress was being protected by countless ability users. Masterford SSI, can you confirm for me? Is the ability user in Shanghai the SS ranked ability user? Yep, that's Xian Xiaomei. It seems a lot of the S ranked ability users are there too. Ah, some of them seem to have gone to Beijing. It must be because they're bigger cities than Guangzhou. What about Guangzhou then? Look. There are ability users there. China did indeed have a large population. Countless ability users were also in Guangzhou, fighting the giant boar that had appeared. However, the giant boar was easily pushing back the ability users with its massive size. The ability users, who did not want to get close to it, used their abilities to attack it or tie it down. However, none of them succeeded in dealing any damage. In fact, the boar seemed to be getting stronger instead. Wait, it was clearly getting bigger. It's a man eater type. Can you explain what you mean, Walker SSI? It's simple. There are raid bosses that get stronger as they absorb mana. Rather than using purely magical attacks, you have to use melee attacks that are imbued with mana. However, if you fail to notice that and continue pouring magic at them from a distance, then the raid boss evolves. Giant Boar evolves to be ranked Giant Iron Boar. That happens. Thanks for letting me know. On TV, the Giant Boar, no, the Giant Iron Boar, went through a massive change. Its short mane grew longer and its hooves became tougher. Its red eyes turned black, yet still reflected sunlight as if they were metallic. The ability users that were throwing long-ranged attacks became frightened by the sudden change and fell back. Free from the barrage of attacks, the giant iron boar let out a happy roar and trampled on the nearby buildings, along with the civilians and ability users who could not get away in time. Their futile deaths almost made me laugh. I have to go. Appa. Shoot, I let my thoughts slip out. Watching the startled Yua grab onto me, I became flustered. In the communication channel, Mastaford and Walker were both making a fuss. The request for assistance isn't coming. Those idiots, they want to continue by themselves. They're doing quite well with Shanghai's mini krakens. As expected of an SS rank ability user, the mini krakens can't do a thing against her. Since Beijing is their capital, most of their elite forces seem to be there. It might take some time, but they won't have any problem killing the giant sword tiger. Walker, can you go to Guangzhou? Why would I go to that dangerous place? It's not even my country. How can you be so selfish? There are a countless number of people dying even as we speak. Then what about you, Masterford? You're SS ranked. Even though that boar is a mana eater, I doubt ITLL be able to withstand your mana. Of course I want to go. I really do. But. My face and ability are too well known. Masterford sounded like she was crying. She was right. If she went to Guangzhou, China won't just let it be. They'd accuse Britain of looking down on them, aiming for their resources, or boasting the fact they had two SS ranked ability users. It was sure to become an international problem. Even if Britain had two SS rank ability users, they could not ignore China's power. After all, with their large population, China had many S rank ability users. Although they only had one SS rank ability users, with her debuff ability, they wouldn't be afraid of two SS rank ability users. Appa, you're kidding, right? Tell me you didn't mean it. Uh, you see, Yua. Appa is actually really strong. The people around us looked our way. Yua was surprised by her own shout as she covered her mouth. With a bitter smile, I placed my hands on Yua's shoulders. Yua, I'm not kidding. Appa really is strong. He'll take care of it in a jiff and come back. But Appa, if something goes wrong, he'll escape right away if it becomes too dangerous. Don't worry. I had the return skill. No matter what situation I was in, I could run away if it became too dangerous. I knew what was important to me. Appa. Really, don't worry. Have I ever lied to you before? No. But still. 
Come on, don't cry. We're home now, let's go in. Appa, can you really come back right away if it becomes dangerous? Of course. Yua and I entered our home. There, father was waiting for me. He was wearing a full black set of armor that I had never seen before. Because his helmet covered his face entirely, I thought it was someone else at first. I assumed he had his luck in the dungeon. Perhaps, a named monster or two. I didn't believe it was better than a floor master set, but I was jealous about how it looked. He looked like a black knight. Son, are you going? What about you, father? Don't ask such an obvious question, son. I always wanted to fight against an opponent that big. Dad's going too. After the painstaking effort I put into calming her, Yua looked like she was about to cry again. However, father was much more skilled in calming a child. Yua, tonight's dinner is going to be boar meat soup, just wait. Make sure you watch how cool daddy is on TV. Hying, dad. Although it was useless, seeing that Yua's target had changed to father, I slowly went into my room and equipped the lizard knight set. With my silver set of armor, I equipped a face-covering helmet like father's. No one would know that I was Kong Shin or even that I was Yun Wawu. Yun Wawu, Yung Gung Ajushi. Are the two of you going? Will you? Please. No, of course I won't. Sorry, lass. My family is my priority. UK, be but. Although I found it slightly creepy, it seemed father and I had an invisible connection between us. Even without saying anything, our coordination was perfect. Of course, even as I said that, I sent Masterford a private message. In going to Guangzhou. Young Gong Ajushi said head come too. We just don't want to let Walker know. Yun Wa Wu. Thanks, you really are a nice guy. Yeah, yeah. Keep it a secret in the communication channel. You can tell me Nami SSI privately. Leave it to me. When I went outside my room, Yua was hanging on father with teary eyes and father seemed to be at a loss for what to do. With my armor fully equipped, I opened my phone to confirm the current situation. I was calm to the point where I could leisurely think about how supernatural ID look with my armor. I think we're done then. The Chinese Awakened will take care of this problem, though at the cost of civilian casualties. I understood, so shut up, Walker. Whoa, don't be so sensitive, flame witch. It'll be leaving then. Uni, I can go in your place. I can do it. No, Samire. That won't change the fact that I can't go to China. I know how strong Sumire's defense is, but Sumire's still lacking in offensive power. Although I don't want to admit it, we'll have to listen to Walker. Let's just be patient. Soon, he'll make an organization strong enough that things like this won't happen. Uni. Sorry, if only I was stronger. Yu Yu, Sumari. Masterford, excellent acting skills. He'll leave it to you to explain things to Minami. In truth, it would have been better for them to not know, but no matter how dense they were, they would find out once they saw our abilities or equipment. It would be impossible to prevent them from finding out. Since the scene of us going wild will undoubtedly be caught on camera, I let Masterford know beforehand. Not to mention, they were both quite trustworthy. I didn't know about Walker, yet. He seemed logical and cold, but I didn't know much else. That's why I didn't want to tell Masterford in the communication channel. Hoping Masterford would spin it well for Minami, I checked the current situation. The mini Krakens had suddenly divided and increased in number. Instead of Walker who went silent, Masterford explained the situation. Those guys are man-eaters too. They divided in response to the debuff magic. Geez, what's wrong with China? Is it some cursed land? They aren't hard to deal with individually, but ITLL take a long time for them to completely disappear. Father, what are you going to do? Ill fight with my fists. I've got a nice toy, too. No one will notice it was me from this battle. Showing the bracelet he had on his gauntlet, father grinned. Of course, I knew his martial arts skill wasn't any worse than mine. With his bracelet that shot out spider webs, I knew he'd do a great job. 
use your spear if it gets dangerous. No, if it gets dangerous, just run away with me. You remember how my return skill works, right? Yes, don't worry. Your father's high rank martial arts skill is already level 4. Mine was only high rank level 2. It seemed I was worried for nothing. Plus, if I thought it was too dangerous, I wouldn't have said I was going. No matter how precious people's lives are, they can't be more important than mine. You really think the same way I do. I lowered my helmet's visor to cover my face completely. I even had Otta's secret equipped just in case. With my silver hair, people wouldn't suspect that I was Korean even if my helmet came off. Let's quickly take care of those weaklings and claim the rewards. Us father and son duo had no intention of giving up such massive rewards to the Chinese guardians. Especially given that they showed no concern for their own citizens. Human lives were one thing, but our goal was the raid itself. We could save human lives and even claim the rewards. We wouldn't let such an opportunity go. Appa, make sure to run away if it gets dangerous. Don't worry, we'll come back soon. Yua still seemed worried, so I relieved her anxiety with a loud voice. Then, father and I declared our intention of fighting in the Burank 500-man raid at Guangzhou. The next moment, we found ourselves at Guangzhou's scene of destruction. It was an abrupt teleportation just like when I used return. Chapter, 61 What? Who are they? As I didn't know Chinese, I had no idea what they were saying. The only Chinese I knew was have you eaten. This sentence, if said in Korea, would cause you to get a beating. One even if you said you were pronouncing it wrong or that actual Chinese people wouldn't understand, it didn't matter. You would get beaten without doubt. In any case, since my words couldn't get through to them, I simply ignored the awakened present. They weren't worthy of my attention, as they were at a loss for what to do against the giant iron boar. Soon, they wouldn't really care about us anyways. K.U.O. The boar. Run. Damn it, it's coming here. As I thought, it only took a moment before the Awakens formation broke down. Magician-type Awakened, who had weak constitutions, would be killed in an instant if the boar got to them. As such, they were hastily running away. It didn't look like there were any S-rank ability users on this battlefield, as no one dared to face the boar head-on. Really, Guangzhou was a big city too. They should be more concerned. With how many people they had, did they not mind ordinary civilians or weak ability users dying? There was almost no resistance against Guangzhou's boar. There must have been a fair number of tourists too. Although the Chinese government was holding their ground for now, the international community's voice would only get louder as time went on. When the talk reached the point where they discussed why they refused foreign ability users offer to help, their malicious intent would be revealed fully. I didn't understand why they did something they couldn't handle. Sometimes, adults were surprisingly immature and simple. Yet, they were also cruel. Son, it's coming. I'm ready, father. The boar roaring out happily as it received magical attacks from all sides was finally about to reach us. As it charged forward, it felled all buildings and trees, and destroyed roads. It was almost as if an earthquake had struck. However, Father cast his spider web between all the debris and grabbed on to the one end. When the giant boar was right in front of the threads, he sent out the strongest shockwave he could muster. I would never forget what happened afterwards. The moment the boar was caught in a spider web, it couldn't win against its own forward momentum. Its back legs floated up, followed by his body and front legs, while its face was leaning down. It was truly a moment where a pig though it was upside down flew. I was shocked by father's ability. Just by sending a shockwave into his spider web, he lifted a massive raid boss meant for 500 people to defeat into the air. I didn't know whether it was his ability, his spider web, or the timing, but it was impressive nonetheless. The boar's legs squirmed around mid-air, but in this situation where things with wings were falling out of the sky, a wingless pig could not stay afloat. I did not really mind the boar falling down, but I did mind the shockwave that would result from the several thousand ton boar falling down from dozens of meters in the sky. Father. Don't worry. Shock absorption. 
Immediately afterwards, the boar fell on the ground. However, the shockwave that might have caused a second disaster did not happen. Father's armor simply made a creaking sound. It seemed the massive force took a toll on father's body. Even so, father held on safely, which was what surprised me the most. He then let out a spirited shout. Shock reflection. I covered my ears. A ear-shattering sound wave shook my eardrums. Father's extra-large shockwave, which even affected his own son, shot out in a line and completely destroyed one of the boar's hind legs. For the first time since it made its appearance, the boar received a clear blow. Not to mention, it was a fatal blow that robbed it of one of its limbs. Well done, father. Kuong. The boar let out a hollow groan. Just its groan caused the earth to tremor and windows on faraway buildings to shatter. I hope no one died from that. I mean, what idiot would stay in a building with all that's happening? Thinking rather useless things, I made my move as well. Teleria. You summon Teleria. For the next ten minutes, you can freely fly or walk on air. If flying, you will receive an additional 100% increase to your movement speed. Remaining time, 9 hours 59 minutes 99 seconds. I kicked off the ground. While I was soaring through the air, I called Pika and infused her into my gauntlet. Master, are we hunting that giant thing? That's right, Pika. Tonight's dinner is boar pork belly. I accelerated and charged towards the boar. When it saw me soaring through the air towards it, it stopped crying out in pain and limped up, glaring at me in rage. Father's excellent focus fire had already caused it to lose its ability to charge. Even so, it was still raging with spirit. It then opened its mouth wide. In the middle of charging towards him, I stopped. Thinking no way, I hastily changed my direction just in case. Immediately afterwards, it let out a horrible screech. Young. A shockwave similar to father's shout came out from its mouth and flashed by below my feet. When I turned around, a building was crumbling down after receiving the shockwave. Father, is this your disciple? Don't say stupid things and look forward. Father shouted as he ran towards me. I also regathered my focus and charged towards the boar. Although it continued to shoot out shockwaves from its mouth, I had nothing to be afraid of after finding out it only flew out in a straight line. I flew even faster. My aim was its left eye. Hap. Die. I really need to do something about my habit of shouting out. Murmuring in my mind, I extended my right hand forward and shot into its left eye. Critical hit. KUA. Its blood splashed onto my armor. My gauntlet imbued with spirit aura continued to dig into its eye, flickering with countless lightning. However, a mysterious power prevented me from digging past a certain point in its eye. Was this the barrier I heard raid bosses possessed? Just as I was thinking that, an alert rang out. You mastered low-rank spirit mastery. The spiritual quality of all beings connected to your soul improves, increasing your affinity to them. You learned mid-rank spirit mastery. You become more specialized in handling spiritual power. Souls connected to you by strong bonds become stronger and easier to bring forth. In an instant, my spirit aura became stronger. I poured my mana into my gauntlet and strengthened spirit aura. Pika, who was infused into my gauntlet, shouted. Thunder bomb. Boom. The lightning energy concentrated on my gauntlet exploded out, dyeing the scenery in front of my eyes in a radiant gold. At the same time, the boar's unpleasant roar rang out. Kayak. Even if you're a mana eater, it looks like you can't eat mana transposed with elemental power. Pika really is the best. In an instant, Pika and I succeeded in breaking through its barrier and bursting its left eye. Even while feeling disgusted by the remains of its eye that splashed onto me, I crawled out of its eye socket. From the shock and pain of losing its eye, the boar was raving in fury. With just three legs, it stumbled about, unable to find its balance. I, on the other hand, could fly using Teleria. Grabbing onto its hair tightly, I landed on its forehead area. Then, a strange scene reflected into my eyes. Father was running this way while avoiding several Chinese awakened. 
kill them. Not only are they trespassers, they're thieves who are here to steal China's resources. Son, these crazy bastards are attacking me instead of the boar. They really were crazy bastards. I couldn't give them points for their actions, but I understood where they came from. The boar had lost a leg and eye. They probably thought they could take it on as it was now. They were trying to take care of father and me who drove the boar to this state so they could claim the boar for themselves. I was dumbfounded. It wasn't like I could attack them no, how did they even think to attack foreign ability users who came to help them? Why don't they help evacuate civilians who couldn't escape? Then, the boar turned to the direction where many people were gathered even as it writhed in pain. I gripped onto its hair tightly so that I wouldn't be shaken off. Father, I think it's going your way. Ha ha ha. Father continued running towards me as he laughed. Facing the boar's charge, the Chinese awakened gave up their chase and scattered in all directions. However, ability users that seemed high ranked didn't run away, but pointed stick like things toward the boar. I liked their backbones, but were they trying to use magic? Fireball. Flame wave. Freezing lance. Idiots, stop using magic. Just when I was about to yell at them to stop, I blanked out. No matter how I looked at it, that magic they were targeting me. My back was stinging. They were targeting me for sure. I was so dumbfounded, I couldn't help but laugh. These idiots. They didn't think to help us who saved them from brink of death, and instead tried to kill us. They weren't even human. Dragon skin. My armor shone red. Although I didn't get faster by three times, my defense went up by over three times. However, even after I took the trouble to strengthen my defense, their attacks didn't even glaze me as they exploded near the boar's nose. The enraged boar opened its mouth and threw out a shockwave. Kuong. Kwayak. Kook. The magicians weren't able to dodge its shockwave, which traveled faster than bullets. Without even keeping their human appearance, they shattered into pieces and died. They had to be at least B-rank ability users. I suspected they were more likely A-rank ability users, considered high-ranked amongst all ability users. They died such futile deaths. Even so, I didn't pity them in the slightest. It was the result of them trying to kill another human being. That said, I did feel slightly unpleasant. That's enough from you. I grabbed onto its hair one by one, using them like ice picks as I climbed its head like a mountain. When I reached the top of its head, I lay down. The boar was going completely wild, charging through the streets of Guangzhou, which no longer even had anything to be broken. Even as it staggered about without a leg, it did not fall and shook its body as it tried to send me flying. The scenery around me constantly changed. Were there still civilians who couldn't escape? Was father fine? Then, I caught sight of the scenery below. While awakened gathered in one place were escaping in all directions like scattering ants, father shot out spider webs from his bracelet and stuck it to the boar's back. He then used it like a rope to climb the boar. Oh, father, your rope climbing skills are excellent. But sorry, your chance to shine is over. With that, I shouted. Kwong. You used Orc Lord's war cry. All party members are cleansed of negative status effects. All party members' attack power increases by 50% for the duration. All party members become super armored, unfazed by enemy attacks. Then, I continued. Dark Thunder Explosion. 1. Have you eaten? Is Ni Chi Fan Lo Ma, which in a Korean Chinese accent, sounds like you fucker. It's a well known joke in Korea. Chapter. 62. Spirit aura subsided for an instant, and black lightning flashed from my body. Dark thunder explosion's initial lightning struck the boar's body just as I had planned. It was then that I noticed that its body seemed to have a metallic property, just like the name Iron Boar suggested. Its whole body flinched as it was hit by the first hint of lightning energy. This was a big deal. A giant monster that was over 70 meters in length and 50 meters in height flinched from just a weak lightning energy coming from a 2 meter tall human. It should have felt like a mosquito bite for most monsters of this size. Dark Thunder Explosion's initial lightning had little meaning. 
even humans didn't take much damage from it. Wait, what about the magician from before that used lightning magic? If it absorbed that magic with its man eater property, then was there something special about Dark Thunder Explosion? Then again, floor masters wouldn't use ordinary magic. After reasoning up to that point, I closed my eyes as the black lightning started exploding out from my body. I loved this skill, but because the lightning exploded out from my body, it hurt to look at it. Go wild. PZZT. KUA. Dark Thunder Explosion seemed to be much more potent than usual. Was it because I was against Iron Boar? The giant Iron Boar stopped charging for an instant. However, the Dark Thunder Explosion was only now starting. BB Boom. Kwong. The boar couldn't withstand the pain and rolled on the ground. Rolled. This crazy bastard. Thankfully, I was safe as its head was still hanging in the air. Still, I was almost crushed to death by its weight of several thousand tons. I wouldn't even have had time to escape using Teleria. No matter how great Dragon Skin was as a defensive skill, it would not have mattered. I would not have just been hit by the force of several thousand tons, but I also would have been crushed between it and the ground. I would have ended up exactly like the Lizard Knight who faced my jujitsu skills. Swallowing my spit, I felt relieved knowing that I had just escaped certain death. Kuong. Opening my eyes as I still tightly held on to its hair, I gasped. Its hair, which was once shining with a black luster, was now dyed gray and losing strength. When I pulled on it with a bit of strength, it came out. It wasn't only the hair in Dark Thunder Explosion's range. The hair on its entire body was the same. His body really had a metallic property, and had conducted Dark Thunder Explosion's shock throughout its body. With that, it was understandable that even the 500-man raid-scaled massive boss monster could not withstand the shock and rolled on the ground. The boar looked like a pig struck by lightning as its three legs trembled uncontrollably. The melee ranged awakened, who had only been watching, finally started to approach the boar. From what I could see, there were a quite a few A-ranked ones as well. The A-ranked ones could have helped out previously, but it seemed they just let the boar be so that they could avoid danger. They really were selfish. You people won't get a chance. Thunder Beast. Master, you can do it. With Pika cheering me on, my body became enveloped in golden lightning. Surprisingly, my mana was almost entirely full. Because Dark Thunder Explosion didn't use up my mana, it had filled up in the meantime. Even so, Thunder Beast would only last 100 seconds max. I lifted my hands up and struck down at the boar's head. Die. 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 Boom. 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 Every time I struck down at its head, the lightning in my fists flowed freely down from its head to toes. I didn't know why, but each of my lightning attacks damaged its entire body. Sun, in being electrocuted too. Just run. Die. Die. Of course, father was joking. My lightning would not damage my party members. However, the awakened, who were picking on the boar with their swords or spears, weren't so fortunate. Shocked by the lightning, they trembled and fainted while standing. It served them right. KUA. The giant iron boar roared and made a final struggle for survival. However, Teleria's ten-minute time limit was not over yet. No matter how much the boar struggled, how much the road sunk beneath it, or how many Chinese awakened joined in or were forced to give up attacking, I didn't pay them any mind and continued to pummel one area. Then, the lightning energy exploding out from my hands became stronger. Thunder Beast becomes level 2. Using the skill will further strengthen your Bodhis physical ability and lightning power. This skill uses 0. 9% of your mana and health per second, and uses 0. 9% of HP and MP per second when used inside the dungeon. Great, the time went up. Excited, I punched with more spirit. I loved watching the giant boar twitch every time my fist struck its body. The monster that threatened a large city like Guangzhou was screaming in pain at my fists. This fact acted as a huge catharsis and boost for my spirit. Boom. 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 Crack. 
a cracking sound rang out for a moment. I would be finished soon. I accelerated my attacks and struck down incessantly. I could feel the boar's resistance growing fainter. Eventually, its whole body convulsed one last time. Cool. After what clearly was its death throes, the boar went limp, the weight crushing the ground even further. It seemed the repair work would take some effort. I quickly deactivated Thunder Beast. Immediately afterwards, a fanfare rang out. Event raid complete. With just two members, you succeeded in the event raid. This grand achievement increases the rewards by an enormous amount. Your vastly superior rank to the raid boss decreases the rewards by an enormous amount. So there's no difference. Just don't say it then. You succeeded in the event raid, granting one bonus stat. You are the first to succeed in an event raid on Earth. You obtained one skill point. Current skill points, 10. The raid rewards will be distributed in order of contribution. Kong Shin Nim's contribution is the highest. Choose your reward. 1. Rage Rush Boots. 2. Shockwave Belt. You can return to your previous location at any time. Would you like to return? Ha, I knew even without seeing. The Rage Rush Boots were likely related to the boar's charging, and the Shockwave Belt was likely related to the shockwaves it shot out from its mouth. Although I liked the shockwave more than the charge. There was the black earthen spear and the ring I got from the giant zombies attack. Not to mention, father would be better at utilizing the effects of the belt. As such, I decided to yield the belt to father. After I chose the rage rush boots and put them into my inventory, father made an extremely satisfied expression as he looked at the reward. No, I couldn't see his expression with the visor he had on, but I assumed that's the expression he had. After seeing that father was unhurt, I checked the surroundings. A large army of Chinese awakened were encircling us from a distance. Don't move. You are under arrest for violation of the international law. I didn't know what they were saying, but their expression seemed to say they wanted to kill us. I smirked. The real world was different the dungeon. That is, the corpse of the raid boss had not disappeared into tiny particles. Their goal was likely this. The product of humans' dirty, ugly greed. Look at the result. The boar you all wanted was here, but countless human lives and the cityscape had been ruined. They would want the boar even more as a tangible result. If a blue stone appeared from this boar, there would be money left over after covering the loss from Guangzhou's destroyed city. Father, go back first. All right, they'll see you at home. Father shouted that had returned to his previous location, and disappeared instantly. When the Chinese awakened saw this, they became shocked and rushed towards me, who was standing on the boar's head. Those bastards. Capture him. Right now. I smirked once again and placed my hand on the boar's head. Then, I imagined. I imagined the boar going into my inventory. Hook. The boar disappeared. It's that fucker's doing. Capture him right now. Magic, use magic. Sorry, it's too late. Even though it took 240 slots out of my 260 total inventory slots, I successfully managed to store the massive boar into my inventory. I was thankful I didn't have random things stored in there like father. Although they wouldn't be able to see my smirk through my visor, I made an even bigger one just to show my dominance. The magic attacks, which were used to strengthen the boar, attack us who came to help them, and attempt to steal the boar's corpse, could not reach me. I declared my intention of going back. Immediately afterwards, I found myself at home. Appa. Wait, Appa is dirty right now. Yua seemed to have been waiting for my return, as she jumped at me straight away. I wanted to stop her as the boar's blood, flesh, and other filthy parts were all over me, but I failed to stop Yua. Plus, because I was wearing my armor, I couldn't even feel Yua's embrace. Appa, hick, I was so worried. I almost died from worrying too much. Yua didn't mind that I was wearing armor or how dirty I was, as she buried her face near my helmet and cried. I wanted to console her in some way, but I felt like I would be scolded no matter what I said, so I stayed silent. Behind Yua, 
I could see father shaking his head. He was looking at Yua disappointedly with his helmet in one hand. Yua didn't hug daddy. Appa, Appa. It's because I ran a more dangerous circus on top of the boar's head. Although I wanted to tell him that, I just swallowed the words. Without father's help, it would have been much more difficult to kill the boar. Father played a big role in today's success, as he absorbed the boar's shockwaves and even destroyed one of its legs. Yua, Appa is okay, so calm down. Appa wants to wash up, okay? Um, okay. Hick. Even after saying that, Yua stayed glued to my body for another five minutes. It was only after father childishly complained about not getting attention that she let me go. As Yua became dirty from hugging me, father made a shocking offer for all three of us to go into the bath together. I stopped his dangerous suggestion and made Yua enter the bath by the living room, as father and I made our way to the upstairs bathroom. You did well today, son. Same for you, father. After cleaning the filth off of our bodies, we sat in the large bathtub and exchanged praise. Then, we silently relieved our exhaustion in the bath. We experienced many things today in less than an hour. However, we decided not to say much about it. Our strange silence was interrupted by a message that rang out in my ear. Yun Wawu, thank you so much. Thanks to you, only Guangzhou's central region has been partially destroyed. Chapter 63. Ah, Master Ford SSI. Even with all the effort I put in, the city was still half destroyed. I didn't know whether to be happy or sad. However, the fact that civilian casualties had not spread was a relief. If father and I didn't kill it, the boar would have kept charging through Guangzhou and destroyed the entire city. If that happened, millions of people would have died. You were even stronger than before, at least as strong as S rank. Ah, uh, of course, I'm still much stronger. Oh, if you're with young Gunga Jushi, tell him that he looked cool today. We went our way right after the raid. You should tell him yourself, I'm sure he'll be happy. Yeah, I will. Ah, uh, um thanks. I was touched. I thought you were selfish and mean, but you're really a good guy. A cool guy. I, why a Mastaford, can guarantee it. I didn't go just to save people. I went because I knew I could win. Even so. Mastaford's good mood was clear from the excitement in her voice. Then, she suddenly became quieter. Sorry for putting you through all that danger I hope something like this doesn't happen again, but if it does, they'll be sure to go with you. I wasn't alone. Young Gung Jushi was there too. Ah, uh, ah, uh, why yeah. Mastaford's voice shook a little. I shook my head at father who was asking what was up. Then, I returned to my conversation with her. But yes, we should come up with a plan to deal with something like this. We can't let another event raid break out and have a country greedily say they'll take care of it on their own. Guangzhou had tourists from other countries too. We should leverage that fact and create a guideline or procedure for foreign ability user assistance in dealing with giant monster appearances. Don't worry, they'll take care of it. This time, they'll show you the weight that an SS rank's words have. I'm done sitting still and shaking my legs while I fully know others are dying. Mastaford's voice was filled with rage and confidence. Thinking how she was fiery like flames, I laughed. What about Beijing and Shanghai? The monsters there were successfully suppressed. Because the Chinese government deployed high-ranking ability users to both Shanghai and Beijing, their civilian casualties and materialistic damage were lower than Guangzhou's. Two S-rank ability users died in the process, though. Died. S-ranks? Yep. It was from the mini Kraken's poison. Perhaps because the cursed magician was there, they didn't send any healers above A-rank. Stupid. Because of their manator property, the mini Krakens evolved to near B rank, making their venom highly lethal. Two magicians without any resistance against them died. I think even the Chinese ability users were shocked. TSK. Inside the bath, I closed my eyes and pondered. They really died in vain. Less than zero. One percent of ability users were S ranked, making them elites amongst elites. However, they died in a C rank boss raid. 
It was the result of recklessly attacking the enemy without knowing their special property. Thinking how they died so stupidly while enjoying luxurious lives, a sense of emptiness swept over me. Reality was this unpredictable and cold-hearted. Everyone had to realize that the change that came with the second moon was not some gift from God. When I was bitterly thinking about the people that died, Masterford called me. Um Yun Wa Wu. Yeah. When are you going to stop calling me Masterford SSI? It feels stiff. You don't talk so formally otherwise. Hmm. When it's just the two of us talking, call me Waya. That's easier and simpler, right? Okay, that's that. Thanks for today. With that, she disappeared. I forgot the serious things I was pondering and became flustered. Eh. Ah. Uh. Is she saying we should be friends? What do you mean, son? Ah, uh, it's nothing. It felt a bit weird to tell father about it. I didn't know why, but I found my heart pounding slightly why was it pounding? Was something wrong with me? Ah, it must be because I made a new friend. I was satisfied with the answer I came up with. I had finally obtained the qualification to face Waya Eleni Mastaford eye to eye. From herself, no less. She didn't ask me to work under her either. She thanked me, and said she'd join me in the future. It meant no one would be under anyone's orders, and that we would stand on equal footing. As friends. I thought my heart was pounding at the excitement of being acknowledged as a friend by an SS rank ability user like herself. That was probably it. Yep, probably. That day, what happened at Guangzhou was broadcasted to the whole world. A knight in a black suit of armor and a knight in a silver suit of armor suddenly appeared out of nowhere and disappeared along with the giant iron boar after defeating it. The Chinese government treated them as international criminals and declared that they'd capture them as they gritted their teeth. On the other hand, almost all other nations publicly denounced China, saying that they attacked this year as true knights. Not to mention, they attacked China for ignoring the safety of their citizens and foreign citizens that were there for tourism and business, all in their greed for monster remains. Countless international lawsuits barraged them, the Chinese government sweated to take care of them all. In the end, through a joint public negotiation between Guardian and Freedom Wing, an international law was created to outline the procedure of Guardian, Freedom Wing, and rogue ability users when another massive monster outbreak occurred. Although a similar law already existed, what happened with China today emphasized the importance of such laws, repealing and reinstituting a completely new, strengthened law. In the case that civilian evacuation was not prioritized, or the monsters were not taken care of within a fixed amount of time, there would be no problem even if foreign countries' ability users appeared to help out. There was already a law that said any ability users counter-attacking in self-defense in case of a monster outbreak would not be held responsible for damages. As such, the ability users that were in the area would automatically be eligible to fight any monsters. This new law allowed combat units of each country's guardians and freedom wings to act more freely. When an event raid occurred in a country, these combat units of neighboring countries could be deployed as soon as a fixed amount of time passed. Of course, the law worked differently for dungeon explorers. We could teleport to target locations as soon as the fixed time passed. Rather interesting rumors are going around. Two people in a full suit of armor suddenly teleported in, an ability user that could teleport people teleported two strong melee ability users into battle, etc. It would seem that the characters from these rumors are among us. That's an interesting story, but rumors are rumors. You aren't wrong, but it's clear that these aren't just rumors. Not to mention, I've seen what happened at Guangzhou. Masterford couldn't have been there, especially since I already know her ability. That would mean the culprit is among the three of you. I could say the same about you, Walker. Not that I think you'd be the type to do something so admirable. You're right, I wouldn't do something like that I'll let this conversation rest here. Of the two armored knights that appeared in Guangzhou, the media began to call the one in black suit of armor, Dark Knight, while the one who freely controlled lightning was called Thunder Knight. These nicknames spread to other media platforms and became universal. Every time I heard the media call us Dark Knight and Thunder Knight, I couldn't help but cringe. My Thunder Knight, bring your father some water. Dark Knight Nim, why don't you get it yourself? 
Ho ho, you must be itching for battle, Thunder Knight. You must be quite bored yourself, Dark Knight Nim. After a few battles with our honor on the line, we negotiated by agreeing to never call each other by our nicknames. Rage Rush Boots Unique. Durability 170170. Defense 240. Equipment Limit Level 35, 100 Dexterity, 80 Constitution. Option Strength 5, Dexterity 10 increases the effectiveness of all rush type skills by 50%. The boots I got from the giant iron boar was incomparably stronger than the lizard knight set in terms of defense. Not to mention, the boots looked extremely fancy as it let out a black luster. Unfortunately, my level and stats weren't high enough to equip it. Plus, equipping it would break my set effect, though it would technically be made up for by rage rush boots options. As I didn't have any rush type skills, the boots didn't have much effect on me either. As such, it was trapped in my inventory for now. Of course, not having these boots didn't mean I couldn't hunt the giant ghoul by myself. Even today, I easily hunted a giant ghoul and consumed skin strengthening elixirs. Your skin becomes strengthened to the limit, becoming tough enough to withstand spears and swords without armor. All blemishes on your skin disappear, making it even smoother and clear. Your constitution and charm both increase by three. It seems consuming more of this item will have no further effect. Nice, this was the last one. As expected, the skin strengthening elixir increased my constitution and charm by 12 each. Looking at myself in the mirror, I noticed that my skin was much smoother and cleaner than before. Even I thought I looked good. I felt how important having good skin was. Are you close to completely conquering the 25th floor? Yes, there's only one equipment part one didn't get. I hope it appears next time, and not some other part or skin strengthening elixir. I used another party member Scarecrow as I answered Loretta. Nodding her head, Loretta calmly replied. In that case Shin Nim, they'll see you after your next raid. Don't forget to visit me afterwards. Understood. After casually answering Loretta, I turned my back from her. I could hear her letting out a light sigh from behind, but I didn't look back. Who knew if she'd try to sell something to me again? Goo. All of you, come at me. You use the skill, provoke. You draw nearby enemies towards you. Giant Ghoul's solo raid was extremely simple. First, I just had to repeatedly use provoke to gather the zombies towards me. Then, I didn't even need to use Elemental Tempest, as just a few normal tempests were enough to completely wipe out most of the zombies, opening a path to the giant ghoul. Tempest. Tempest. Human. Back to darkness. As zombies continued rising from the ground, I just ignored them after I opened up the path. I ran towards the giant ghoul, at the same time the giant ghoul ran towards me, enraged by the fact that I killed so many zombies. Geo. Hugh, Hap. Raids in real life were good, but the dungeon's raids also had their charm. Being able to fight against opponents this strong and feeling myself getting stronger in the process, there was no better feeling. Ha! I leaped up diagonally and extended black earthen spears reach with my mana. Slashing through the back of giant ghoul's hand, I lightly landed while breaking a few tombstones on my way. With luck, the giant ghoul was immediately poisoned. Blood was flowing down from his mouth. I loved Black Earth and Spear's poison. Not only did it deal continuous damage over time, it also slowed the enemy's movements and made him more vulnerable to fatal attacks. Jiuo, human. I swear, it'll change my race one day. Then I won't have to listen to that line again hot. The giant ghoul reached toward me on all fours. Dodging his steel claws, I swung my spear at his face and shot out a thunder bomb. After my spirit mastery became mid-ranked, it became easier to use Pika's elemental magic while maintaining spirit or a state. Kuo, being sturdy is your strong point. Come on, be more aggressive. Floor master battles were so difficult because of the boss's cheat-like skills, strong attacks, and boundless health and defense. In other words, if you could avoid their attacks and pierce through their defense and deal damage, you could easily kill the floor master alone. 
Of course, most people would not even have a chance as they would be kicked out after taking a blow. The floor master's attacks had a wide reach and could easily be fatal to anyone that was hit. To shave down their boundless health while fighting them alone, the challenger would need to stay tense and alert the entire fight. Chapter 64 The giant ghoul was big even among floor masters. His claws were imbued with a mana of death, and when he rampaged, you took mild damage just from being in contact with the ground. Not to mention, he endlessly spawned hordes of zombies, forcing you to stay wary at all times. However, I could already easily dodge its attacks, had immense attack power, and had defensive power that mere zombies could not break through. When I obtained a certain skill on top of all that, the giant ghoul raid simply became too easy. It was the reward I received from solo clearing the giant ghoul raid. Death counter passive you will not get intimidated against the undead. Against the undead, all attack skills become 50% stronger and you cannot become an undead. This skill has no skill level. I found it quite ironic that a skill perfect for fighting against the undead only appeared after defeating the giant ghoul solo, but there wasn't much I could do about it. The part about not being intimidated by the undead was a strong effect. It was only after I obtained the skill that I realized my attacks were unnatural when fighting the undead compared to when I was fighting other monsters. Not only were my attacks unnatural, my defensive or evasive maneuvers all had strange, unnecessary movements mixed into them. When I asked Loretta about it, she said living beings instinctively became weaker in face of the undead, who defied death and desired the living. I felt that skills really were amazing, being able to defy something instinctive. Plus, the 50% attack boost when using attack skills was the main charm. Geo. It'll return you to hell soon. I slowly disabled the giant ghoul. When a target was this big, it was best to gradually make parts of its body incapable of fighting. First, I worked on the giant ghoul's left arm. Starting from the back of the hand to the wrist, forearm, and shoulder, I precisely pierced target locations with my spear. The giant ghoul then became unable to move his arm. Hap. I then continued to his left leg. It only took about 10 minutes to completely render half of his body useless. At this point, the giant ghoul began to look for zombies to consume in order to recover his injuries. The problem was that since he could only use half of his body, only his right hand could help him in this task. The giant ghoul was truly too predictable. The giant ghoul quickly dragged his body to where the zombies were. Before he could grab any, I shot a tempest forward. Cool. And take this. When the giant ghoul missed his targets and let out an annoyed roar, I shot forward and stabbed my black earthen spear into its right forearm. Then, I exploded my spirit aura. Critical hit. KUA. Perfect. The giant ghoul screamed and tried to shake me off of his right arm. Before I could fall on the ground, I pulled out my black earthen spear and jumped off. I had grown too used to fighting large monsters lately. I found myself getting on and off their bodies with familiarity. What are you going to do now without your arms? Want to try using your mouth directly? KIA. It went without saying that he tried to do exactly that. However, his target was no longer the zombies, but me. As if to devour me along with all the zombies slowly approaching me, the giant ghoul opened his mouth wide and shot forward. This was also the moment I was waiting for. Eat this. Heroic strike. I threw my black earthen spear imbued with a generous amount of spirit aura. It shot forward like lightning and accurately hit the giant ghoul's face, piercing through his skull. The giant ghoul's head exploded, scattering rotten blood and other substances into the air. With his defense being so easily broken, I didn't understand all the complaining other explorers did about it having impenetrable skin. The giant ghoul eked out a cry with its possibly broken vocal cords as it thrashed about. His health was likely reaching its bottom. He would soon use Die Hard and try to recover his health and restore his injuries. Of course, I wouldn't just sit still and let it happen. I took out my silver spear and aimed at his heart. Hey race another one. Divine speed, heroic strike. The silver spear combined with spirit aura and let out a dazzling light. In truth, 
I thought that the silver spear looked cooler than the black earthen spear. Thinking rather useless things while divine speed's time was ticking, I shot the silver spear toward the heart of the giant ghoul, who had just used diehard and was in the process of recovering. Goo. Of course, my attack hit its target perfectly. The silver spear pierced the giant ghoul's heart, which was strangely pumping out cold, rotten blood, and exploded it. After finding out Die Hard activated using the heart as its basis, I always killed the giant ghoul without giving it time to complete Die Hard. You obtain 30,000 gold. Rewards will be distributed in order of contribution. Kong Shin Nim's contribution is the highest. Choose your reward. 1. Skin Strengthening Elixir. 2. Giant Ghoul's Shirt. Seeing the Giant Ghoul's Shirt on the reward list, I let out a sigh of relief. When I used a party member Scarecrow, the dungeon didn't consider the fight as a solo raid. As such, neither the special equipment piece nor the death counter magic book dropped. There were two normal rewards to choose from, one of which was the Giant Ghoul's Shirt I had been waiting for. In truth, I didn't know what material the Giant Ghoul set was made out of, and I didn't want to wear them because they felt dirty. Even so, I had to equip them once to confirm the set skill. With a frown, I equipped the giant ghoul set. You equip the giant ghoul set. Your strength and dexterity increase by 12. When the giant ghoul set is equipped, you can use diehard once per day. As expected, diehard was the skill I received. I quickly stored it in my pocket watch's 5 o'clock position and threw off the giant ghoul set. Then, I closely examined Diehard's skill description. Diehard, usable once per day. Automatically activates when HP falls below 3%, restoring all injuries and filling up your HP to 50% of its maximum. Ama. Amazing. This skill. What a cheat. As long as I didn't die in a single hit, I could recover up to 50% of my max HP even from 1% HP. Realizing once again that all Floor Master's skills were cheats, I rubbed the pocket watch on my cheek. I couldn't be reckless just because I got this skill, but I could at least be more daring in the way I moved. Just that fact made this skill valuable. Just like that, I obtained a skill that would later give me the name Undying Crown Prince. Name, Kong Shin Race, Human Sex, Male. Class, Elementalist Sub Skill Collector Title, Giant Ghoul Slayer Rank. Silver 7. Level, 26. HP 10, 12010, 120 MP 6, 2306, 230. Strength 80, 35, Dexterity 74, 21, Constitution 78, 28. Intelligence 2011, Magic 79, 11, Charm 57, 11, Luck 21, 11. Normal Skill High Rank Martial Arts LV2, High Rank Spear Technique LV5, Midrank Heroic Strike LV4, Midrank Provoke LV3, Divine Speed LV3, Return LV1, Low Rank Dash LV9, Peruta Circuit LV4, Deific Manifestation, Death Counter. Class Skill Midrank Spirit Mastery LV1, Low Rank Spirit Aura LV8, Low Rank Elemental Control LV8, Low Rank Elemental Contract LV8, Low Rank Elemental Tempest LV9, Thunder Beast LV2. Subclass Skill Endow Skill, Spirit of the Collector. Equipment. Power Earring Strength 2. Flesh Golem Second Finger Strength 7, Constitution 7. Lizard Knight Set Strength 10, Dexterity 10. Arachne's Black Earthen Spear Strength 5, Dexterity 10, Poison Damage on All Basic Attacks, Inflicts Poison Status Effect. Collector's Pocket Watch. 1 o'clock, Orc Lord's War Cry. 2 o'clock, Vengeful Spirits Wail. 3 o'clock, Dark Thunder Explosion. 4 o'clock, Dragon Skin. 5 o'clock, Die Hard. 2 event Dungeon Clears, 1 event Raid Clear, Accumulated Bonus Stats, 3. Current Skill Points, 10. 6 Title Effects, Orc Lord Slayer, Wraith Queen Slayer, Dark Ratman Slayer, Giant Ghoul Slayer, Lizard Knight Master, Hermes. Accumulated effects, all stats 11, 15% speed increase, increased affinity to all elements, affinity to wind element greatly increased, can summon Talaria once per day. With an extremely satisfied expression, I headed towards Loretta, 
who greeted me with a smile. Looks like you got it, Shin Nim. Yep. It was a much better skill than I expected and looking forward to the future. Hoo, seeing you get stronger makes me all happy. Good luck going forward as well. Mmm, -mm, thanks. Eh. Didn't she seem closer just now? When I tilted my head and pondered, Loretta interrupted like a thunderbolt from a clear sky. It looks like we want meat at the floor shop for a while. What? Why? It's my resting period, one that lasts for one year every one hundred years. I'm operating countless floor shops with my consciousness split into puppets. I sometimes need rest too, don't you think? Ah, uh, yes. Um, mm, I'll miss you. You really will miss me. Loretta suddenly put her face close to mine and blinked. Although I was a little flustered, I answered her honestly. Of course, I've always been with Loretta. I had fun these past five years and even received a lot of help. Will you miss me that much? Well, of course you you, how embarrassing. Don't worry, Shin Nim I'm embarrassed too. With that, Loretta smiled bashfully. For an instant, I fell into a trance at her beautiful expression, and had to make an active effort to snap myself out of my daze. Then, Loretta put her hands in her shop apron pocket and took something out after rummaging through. Since you say that, this here is perfect for customer. Eck. Are you selling something again in this timing? Ah. Erm, well I it's not being sold. Loretta shrunk back after shouting out full of spirit. She wasn't selling it. I looked at the object in her hand. It was a light blue crystal shaped like a small key. It was a truly elaborate and beautiful key. What's this? Um, you know, Shin Nim. Shin Nim will become the owner of a mansion called Marianas Garden. Ah, uh, I remember from last time. You said Marianas Garden was the only special mansion without an owner. Loretta nodded her head silently and seriously. Special mansions aren't something you can buy with money. They're a sort of special reward given out to explorers who made important achievements in the dungeon. When people realize Shin Nim is the owner of Marianas Garden, all other dungeon explorers will come to look at Shin Nim with admiration. Ah, uh, not that I think someone would go out of their way make trouble, but it's best that you don't go around telling everyone you meet that you're an owner of a special mansion. Claim it silently and enter it silently. The residential area has marketplaces and even adult entertainment districts, but residents have to use a special method to enter their houses. Unless they reveal where they live and lead others to it, no one can find out. That makes me even more curious. You'll receive something that looks like this key. You can use it to enter Marianas Garden. I see. Then what about this key? Loretta became silent. Her cheeks flushed red. J. Just like its name suggests, Marianas Garden comes with a beautiful garden. In the center of that garden, there is a spring called Fairy Spring. It's not only Marianas Garden. Other special mansions also have special devices like the Fairy Spring. This key reacts to those devices and operates. Operates? You'll find out when you bring this key to Fairy Spring. T. Take it as a goodbye present. Loretta handed the crystal key to me. As I accepted it, I tilted my head. Operates? Will a giant robot pop out from the spring or something? Or will a door to a new world open? Although I wanted to ask Loretta, it didn't look like she would answer. And make sure you do it. Okay, Shin Nim. I, I got it. I got it so don't look at me with those teary eyes. Loretta was a bit strange today. When I looked at her, I felt stuffy and my heart pounded faster. I felt a bit hot, but I didn't think anything was different than usual. Did I catch a cold? T then you should head up. I also have to get ready and scrap the puppets. I understand. Thank you for everything until now, Loretta. I'll see you in a year. It might not take a full year. Really? That'd be great. When I gave her my wholehearted smile, Loretta smiled wholeheartedly in return. It was a beautiful smile without a single blemish. She then said. How about you buy 100 bottles of holy water to say goodbye? If you buy all 100 bottles now, 
it'll give you a one-time 15% discount. That's only 1,275 gold. The 26th floor is undead too, huh? With that, I parted with Loretta. Because I felt like I lost a friend of five years, I felt extremely sad. Of course, at this point, I did not know where and how I would come to reunite with her. Chapter, 65 When someone heard the word undead, what were the monsters people would usually think of? Right, first were the zombies. The wraiths that appeared on the dungeon's sixth floor also counted as undead. The ones people would think of second were of course. Human. Human with juicy ribs. Splint bone is mine. Screw off, I can't even make beef bone soup with you guys. Skeletons. They were undead creatures without a single bit of flesh and were made of white or black bones. Lightning doesn't work well on bones, master. Don't be sad, Pika. We just have to thoroughly crush them to make up for it. Using my spear like a club, I shattered the incoming skeletons. They were much tougher and had much stronger attacks compared to the zombies or the ghouls. Even so, they were much weaker than me. Their attacks were only strong to the point that they could scratch my armor if I just let them freely attack. In other words, they could just barely break through my defense to deal a tiny bit of damage. Of course, they were embarrassingly weak. However, their defensive power was quite good, and they were more troublesome than zombies or ghouls in terms of their regenerative powers. If I broke them without pouring mana into my spear, they regenerated, so I had to go through the trouble of destroying them with my spear imbued with a mix of lightning elemental power and mana. Although they didn't smell as bad without rotting flesh, they were still extremely dirty and annoying to deal with. Just the way they moved irked me. For mere skeletons, they moved with dance steps as they tried to attack me with their swords. It really wanted to make me crush them. Plus, these guys loved bones too much. His skull looks good. I like his third cervical vertebrae. Every time they saw me, they charged towards me as they complimented my bone structure. I wondered if this floor was designed to irritate me. Perhaps it was a common feature of undead type monsters, but their attainment in martial arts was pitifully low. I simply put one spear in each hand and flowed spirit aura into them to use them as electric beating clubs. Just like that, I crushed the skeleton skulls as I made my way forward. T the bones I spent my entire life polishing up. He breaks skulls. S skull breaker. Run away, it's the skull breaker. Shut it. These guys. For monsters without brains, they sure were smarter than the zombies. I should have known when they said something like third cervical vertebrae. Thunder bomb. It's the skull breaker. The skull breaker is coming. Now you're calling me skull breaker no matter where I attack you. They called me skull breaker when I broke their ribs. They called me skull breaker when I crushed their arms. I didn't understand. I couldn't just charge forward like I did in the 21st floor. Thus, I took a fast walking pace, swinging my two spears and shooting out thunder bombs until I reached the 26th floor. The time it took to accomplish that was about 7 hours. After confirming that my level had gone up to level 27 and confirming that there were no more skeletons nearby, I put away the spears and sighed. Loretta, im he ah. On the 26th floor shop, I couldn't find Loretta. Instead, there was a young man resting his chin on the shop desk as he smoked a cigarette. Discovering me, he looked around and muttered as he chewed on his cigarette. Eh. Oh, right. It was from today. Welcome. Hello, are you Loretta's replacement? HM, you really do look like Nunim's one taste what, a hero. Nunim's quite skilled. The young man glanced over me with sparkling crimson eyes. Although he sounded mumbly as he was still chewing on his cigarette, his voice was still extremely pleasant to listen to. He had snow white skin and was pretty enough to be mistaken for a girl. However, there was something else that caught my attention. Ah, um, on your head there are horns. Yeah, I'm a draconian. After answering me casually, he puffed out the cigarette smoke. Then, he put the cigarette back in his mouth. Don't tell me he thought that was enough of an explanation. Dumbfounded, I stared at him smoking his cigarette. 
His hair was black just like mine. However, his hair was extremely long, which was tied at the top of his head in a ponytail. On each of his temples, a curly silver horn was protruding out, forming a symmetry. Finally, his eyes were a bit dirty. He had a black garment draped over his body, which didn't seem to have any muscles. I then noticed the area behind his butt, where a scaled tail dozens of times larger than a lizard's tail swayed gently. It was then that I remembered something. Um, are you perhaps a beast man? Beast man? Mm -hmm, no. Beast men are beings blessed by God to take animals' traits. On the other hand, draconians get their traits from their draconic bloodline. Dragons? Ah, that's all you need to know. It's nothing important. He seemed too lazy to explain further as he waved the smoke away with his hands. Although there was a mountain load of questions I wanted to ask, I decided to just let it go. However, he seemed to have his own questions. After finishing his cigarette, he glanced at me and asked. So, you're Kong Shin, right? Earth's hero. I don't really like being called hero. Really? Mm hmm, then just Kong Shin. Know this. Nunim pestered me quite a bit to take good care of you. She pestered you. Loretta Nunim was in charge of almost 4,000 explorers. Don't think my real body will be at all those places. Oh, so you aren't a puppet, but the real one. What, she even told you about the puppets? She fell deep, that person. What did he mean Loretta fell deep? This new floor shop owner was unfriendly and liked to talk to himself. When I was already starting to miss Loretta, he blurted out as if he had just remembered something. Lin. You can call me Lin. Okay, Lin. Take good care of me for a while. Mm -hmm, yeah. I'm curious as to how many floors you can climb during this one year. According to Nunim, you're a real one that hasn't been seen for a while. I can expect at least five floors, right? He glanced over me with narrow eyes as he spoke arrogantly. Oh, you're provoking me. I, Kong Shin, manliest of men, will take on that challenge. Lin, do you like betting? Kukuku, I love it. Lin and I exchanged smiles. As expected of Loretta's replacement. He was walking the same path Loretta once walked. I had to rein in my laughter from bursting out. Lin, on the other hand, was looking at me like I was a naive child. I was already looking forward to the day his expression would change. Kong Shin, let's decide on our bet. There's what Nunim said, so I doubt you won't make it to the 30th floor in one year. Right, if you defeat the 35th floor master by yourself within one year, I will make a gauntlet suitable for you. If you even defeat the 40th floor master by yourself within one year, I will make you a weapon that contains my essence. Lin, you're a blacksmith. Yep. I'm the Red Dragon's descendant, so I have close affinity to fire. In any case, if you can't break through the 35th floor within one year, I will take the pocket watch back from you. Along with your subclass of course. I'll also take away the pocket watch if you party with other people to clear the 35th floor master, though, I doubt you have many skills in there anyways. I already had five. Not that ID tell him, of course. Is it possible to take away someone's class? I wouldn't have said it otherwise. Though, not anyone can do it. Indeed, it was a scary penalty. The pocket watch was a treasure that made up quite a bit of my overall strength. That said, this person was too soft. Did he think I couldn't climb 14 floors in one year? I asked with a bashful smile. Then, what if I break through the 40th floor even earlier? What? Earlier than one year. Pew hat. The draconian snorted. There's no record of such a thing happening. Don't look down on the 40th floor master. He forced countless first dungeon challengers to their knees. The legend says that he's even stronger than the 45th floor master. You think you can reach the 40th floor and defeat him within one year? Don't kid. But a man should dream big. If there's a bigger reward, wouldn't I be more motivated to try? You aren't wrong. Right, explorers these days really lack that sort of attitude. Hmm. Lin started a second cigarette. He didn't take out a lighter, 
but the cigarette was set on fire on its own. It seemed the power of the red dragon was used to set cigarettes on fire. While I nodded my head in appreciation of gaining new knowledge, Lin murmured with the cigarette in his mouth. If you can do it within nine months, it'll make you a helmet along with the weapon. If you do it within eight months, it'll add in the gauntlet. Seven months, it'll add in boots. Ah, I already have boots to wear though. If you manage to succeed, you can give me your boots. It'll do some work on them. Ah, got it. Finally, though I think it's completely impossible, if you succeed within six months ha, huh, I can't even say it with a straight face. Anyways, if you succeed in breaking through the 40th floor within six months, it'll make you a full plate armor set. Along with a weapon, of course. Wow, you really are generous. Pull ha ha. Climbing 14 floors in half a year, I think you're a lot more generous than I am. Koo, kukukuk. I know you're a hero, but your liver is so big that it's hanging outside your belly too. Ack, my sides. I understand a little bit why Loretta Nunim likes you so much. Ek, but I'm into women. I'm into women too, you bastard. Because he suddenly emphasized his words with sharp eyes, I flinched a little. Well, do your best, Kong Shin. Don't give up in the middle. I hate people that give up the most. What a coincidence. After getting ample rest, I stretched and loosened my body. Holding up my black earthen spear, I shouted at Lin as I took a step on the stair to the 27th floor. I hate giving up the most too. 1. Nunim is a more formal version of Nuna. 2. Korean proverb meaning you've got a lot of nerve. Chapter, 66. About five hours after that, I was pouring holy water over my silver spear and black earthen spear, humming happily in front of the 27th floor shop. To cover the spear all the way to the spear handle, it took five bottles of holy water per spear. Even so, once finished, the spears would deal bonus damage to undead monsters for a full day. Plus, I felt like I wouldn't drop my equipment even if I died. Though, dying in the dungeon didn't drop your equipment anyways. Lin was looking at me with a wry expression. You bugged bastard. I'm happy. I was even faster than when I broke through the 26th floor. Bets really encourage people to try harder. Let's cancel that. A man's words are worth a thousand gold. Kook then let's make the time limit shorter. Half a year. Fine, but you have to make the rewards better. See cape. It'll even make a cape made from my ancestor's leather. But if you want to obtain that too, you'll have to do it within three months. Three months, understand. Call. Your quest has been renewed. A cape made out of dragon leather. My eyes sparkled as I agreed to his new terms. Since I planned to break through past the 40th floor within six months, I wouldn't lose out on anything. If I succeeded within three months, I would obtain an even greater treasure. Now that things had come to this, I had to try even harder. Then I'm going to run a bit faster. What, how have you been running until now? But I wonder, why didn't I get a title for clearing the 26th floor quickly? Was it because I already have Hermes? H. Hermes. You bastard, you even have a god's true name. UK, my back. Though a bit ridiculous, the skeleton's classes became a bit more diverse from the 28th floor on. There were the skeleton warriors who attacked with swords or iron maces, skeleton archers who shot out arrows made of bones, and the skeleton magicians who incessantly shot out trivial and annoying magic attacks. Without Pika, it would have been impossible. Gel Gel, make sure not to hurt his bones. He'll shoot arrows. I pierced my spear through the wrist of a skeleton striking down at me with its iron mace. The skeleton then dropped its iron mace along with its wrist. I grabbed it by its skull and threw it at the skeleton archer. When they collided, they both shattered. The other skeletons flinched upon seeing it, and began to back away. S Skull Breaker It's the Skull Breaker. How do you guys even know about that? Tempest Kia Skull Break here. After being swept up by Tempest, the skeletons all shattered together, creating a pleasant clicking sound. 
With the 50% attack power boost from Death Counter, just a single Tempest was enough to destroy the skeletons. I broke all the skeletons trying to use magic. Good job, Pika. Then let's run. Okay. While Pika soared through the air, taking care of magic using skeletons with thunder bombs and thunder spears, I cleanly took care of the skeleton warriors in front of me as I ran. At first, I used and maintained spirit aura, but I soon realized it was unnecessary. It was better to let Pika to do her own thing. Pika, 11 o'clock, Skeleton Magicians. I circulated per Yuta circuit as I ran and always had mana potions in my mouth to make up for the huge drain on my mana. In my hands were my two spears, which I swung around like baseball bats. I may have seemed a bit unsightly, but I didn't care. Although I thought drinking mana potions was wasting money, upon thinking about it, I realized it was the same thing as investing money to raise my skill proficiency. After I realized that, I no longer hesitated to use them. In truth, I was overflowing with gold. I didn't need to use gold outside of purchasing floor master battle tickets and party member scarecrows. Thus, I started buying mana potions. I didn't need health potions. While going through normal floors, I had never been gravely injured. When I was just about to break through the 28th floor, messages that always made me happy rang out. Midrank Spirit Mastery becomes level 2. Your eyesight for soul strengthens and you will gain a favorable impression from spiritual beings more easily. Low rank spirit aura becomes level 9. You can more strongly draw out elemental's potential. Low rank elemental control becomes level 9. Elementals will more actively listen to your plea for help. Low rank elemental contract becomes level 9. You can feel your soul's container growing more mature. The bond of contract to your elemental becomes firmer. Oh, ooh. I got a little stronger again. Pika and I both yelled out in happiness. Soon, my skills as an elementalist would reach mid-rank. I was starting to worry because my elementalist skills were much lower rank than my spear technique skill and martial arts skill, but it seems my worry was for nothing. Once the skills became mid-rank I would be able to grow much stronger. Once I obtained mid-rank elemental contract, not only would Pika's strength grow, but I could also form a contract with another elemental. Lin was watching me with rotten eyes. Three and a half hours crazy. See you later. Just like always, I put two points into strength and dexterity, and one into constitution. Then, I ran up to the 29th floor. Update. It was a waste of time to wait around for my body to finish updating. That was something that would automatically happen as I fought. Skull Breaker. Skull Breaker crushes us skeletons. We will crush your spine and make you unable to move. Stop his advance. The skeletons on the 29th floor wore a few pieces of armor. There were also some skeletons mixed in that weren't wearing any armor. Regardless, the moment I yelled commence exploration on the 29th floor, the skeletons had me surrounded, as if they were waiting for me to appear. I knew instinctively that I couldn't kill them with Tempest. Although just one or two might have been fine, what I saw seemed to be the 29th floor's elite skeletons, as they wore proper armor and carried swords and shields. They slowly tightened the encirclement, and I pondered as I took a step back. How was something like this possible? These guys really were much more intelligent than the zombies. Plus, I could feel a strong presence from behind them. It seemed there was a named monster controlling them. Taking another step back, I put a mana potion in my mouth. Then, I shouted while thrusting forward with my black earthen spear. Elemental Tempest. First. Hurry, hurry. Spin. Kogagaga. Let's go break skeletons. In front of the armored skeletons approaching me, my spear enveloped by an elemental storm exploded. Queek. My bones. Too strong. Hugh, skill to win is the best. Even the armored skeletons could not withstand my elemental tempest, which was made using 50% of my mana, and shattered. It was then that my field of view finally cleared up. The ordinary skeletons warriors that were on standby behind the frontline forces yelled with flustered voices. General. General died. They were generals. Tempest. 
Since I cleared out the skeletons equipped with armor and shields, I could use Tempest to take care of the rest. These bastards dared to make a defensive formation. I felt satisfied now that the skeletons encircling me with their shields were taken care of. Pika. Got it. Chain lightning. Although their bony bodies were supposed to be strong against lightning, they didn't seem strong enough to handle Pika's chain lightning. One by one, the encircling skeletons fell from the lightning that started from Pika's finger. However, chain lightning, that was spreading like fire on a wheat field, suddenly disappeared. Although most of the skeletons had already died, it was an abrupt end, given how rapidly it had been spreading. Qua. The one who swung his sword to interrupt chain lightning stared at me fixedly. He was at least two. Three meters tall and was twice as big as me. Destroy Skull Breaker. A deep imposing voice. He was undoubtedly the instigator who had gathered up the skeletons into a battle formation from the start of the 29th floor. Two will-o'-wisps blazed in its eyes. Unlike the weakling skeletons, he wore a full set of armor. On one hand was a shield, and on the other was a large sword made of bones. I gulped down a mouthful of saliva and asked. Are you the skeleton knight? The one who's said to be the strongest among skeletons? I am a skeleton champion. Ah, never mind then. I got nervous for nothing. He was just a weakling after all. Skullbreaker, I will kill you. Ha, you. Yo. Just like that, I successfully provoked the skeleton champion without even using the provoke skill. The two will-o'-wisps in his eyes showed his rage by burning even more fiercely. At the same time, he charged towards me. He lightly leaped off the ground and struck down at me with his bone sword. I dodged his attack and made him stumble backwards by tackling the part of his body unprotected by his shield. As I had even used skin-strengthening elixirs to strengthen my constitution, my HP didn't decrease for just tackling a named monster's body. Even I had to admit that my body was incredibly tough. Kook. Your lower body is weak. That's why just tackling can make you fall. As I gave him advice, I stabbed my spear into his head consecutively. After allowing three strong blows to hit him, he got up. By then, there was already a huge crack in his helmet. As expected of Skullbreaker. However, I, Edos, will not lose. Don't call me Skullbreaker. Also, a mere undead shouldn't appeal his name. A named monster had a name, of course, but I didn't know what I was supposed to do with it. If he wanted me to write his name down on a notebook and kill him, he visited the wrong series. If you defeat me, I will acknowledge you as a true Skullbreaker. I don't need you to acknowledge that. Annoyed, I once again performed consecutive stabs. Surprisingly, he seemed to have predicted when I would stab forward, as he jumped back and dodged my attack. Then he kicked a stone on the ground and aimed it towards me. The stone itself was crushed by Pika, but his style of fighting still made me tilt my head. Did he learn how to dodge my attacks after being hit before? This guy might be pretty useful. Useful. Too bad he's an undead sorry, Edos. If you reincarnate, come visit our dojo. It'll give you a 20% discount. Stop saying things I can't understand, Skullbreaker. Edos shouted furiously and charged at me once more. His bone sword cut through the air with a bone-chilling sound, clearly aiming for my neck. Mm, it was the clearest attack out of all the monsters I had faced recently. However, his defense was still lacking. Use your shield to hold off your opponent. Is your shield just for looks? I dug into his embrace using the gap he left wide open and thrust out my spear. Divine speed, heroic strike. Quiak. Of course, my heroic strike boosted by divine speed easily shattered his cracked helmet and destroyed his skull. Poor Edos died without even a chance to leave behind a final word. You defeated the named monster, Edos. You obtained a residential area entrance ticket as reward. You obtained the title, Skullbreaker. When fighting skeleton type undead, your critical hit chance doubles and you can more quickly intimidate your enemy. Your critical damage increases by 50% when fighting all enemies with bones. I really became a skullbreaker, the hell not to mention, 
for a title using the word skull, it specialized in breaking bones. Blaming Edos, I looked at the surrounding skeletons. The skeletons that were encircling me from before I even fought Edos trembled and started to back away. S Skull Breaker. My skull will get broken. Run. But we can't run from Skull Breaker. Was this the intimidation effect? Just my existence could intimidate monsters. It was quite fun. Wait, with this, wouldn't it be a piece of cake to break through the dungeon? With a smirk, I fixed my grip on my spear. In truth, I really wanted to visit the residential area, but since I was under a three-month time restraint, I wouldn't be able to fully enjoy myself even if I went. I decided to think about it after I broke through the thirtieth floor. What I had to worry about right now was the red dragon cape I mean, fast dungeon breakthroughs. Chapter, 67 I succeeded in breaking through the twenty-fifth floor by myself. Oh, that was fast. It was all thanks to your training and the muscle strengthening elixirs. I was in the middle of dashing through the 30th floor pathway when Ren contacted me. While completely crushing the skeleton warriors that were running at me, I answered Ren. There really weren't a lot of people on the 25th floor. If you're having trouble finding party members, ask the floor shop owner for an item called Party Member Scarecrow. You can start grinding with them. Eh. I'm not doing it with Crown Prince. I already finished grinding. Kook, so fast. As expected of my master. Ren is fast too. The giant ghoul was easy, right? If there's one thing I learned from sparring with you, it's dodging attacks. I can somehow dodge the zombie's attacks or the giant ghoul's claws, but. His diehard skill annoys me greatly. Because of it, I had to spend five hours to defeat him. If you blow up his heart while he's using the skill, he'll die. Crown Prince is the only one who can do such a strange thing. Regardless, since I obtained the death counter skill, solo raids should be somewhat doable. While using Heroic Strike boosted by Divine Speed to take care of two named monsters, Skeleton Warmage and Skeleton Scout, I answered Ren. I really like Ren's attitude for these things. Good luck. Don't let something like the giant ghoul kill you. Crown Prince is probably the only one who can call the 25th floor master as something like. Ah, but Ren can't store skills like I do. You'll have to choose between Die Hard and Dragon Skin. He'll recommend Dragon Skin. The giant ghoul said isn't something a person should wear. Can I buy Crown Prince's pocket watch from somewhere? You can try asking your floor shop owner. I already did, but he only asked how I heard about such an ancient artifact. That Loretta woman, just who is she? While cursing at the skeleton warmage for only dropping 5,000 gold and curiously examining the silver bone crossbow the skeleton scout dropped, I answered Ren. A kind and pretty shop Nuna. She's only kind to crown prince. Oh, this crossbow was pretty good. If there were crossbow bolts in my inventory, it reloaded automatically and shot out consecutively. Wasn't this a machine gun? For a completely plain looking crossbow other than the fact that it was made of silver bones, it sure had excellent functions. Oh. It even dealt bonus damage if the bolts were made from ground skeleton bones. I had finally found a better use for the bone skeletons occasionally dropped other than selling them to Lin. Although it didn't seem usable against boss monsters, it seemed useful for cleaning up trash mobs. I was greatly satisfied by the unexpected lucky drop. Regardless, good luck, Ren. We can raid together around the 50th floor. There are people who can't ever climb to that 50th floor. Ren can do it. I retorted as I hung the crossbow by my waist. Because Ren is my disciple. That. Are you acknowledging me? To tell you the truth, I want to train you for at least a year more. I won't be your disciple. I'm kidding. You're doing great. Keep it up. Goodbye. Ah, uh, ah, uh, wait. What's up? As the skeletons kept running away because of my skull breaker title, I used provoke to draw them towards me. I then used tempest to destroy them while I asked Ren. Do. Do you know the name Labique Van Dion Granaris? No, I don't. No, you see. I know it's impossible as well, but. 
Am asking just in case. Like I said, I don't know. If you ever hear about La Beek Van Dion Granaris. Do tell me. I beg you. Since Ren's voice was unusually tense, I also became serious as I answered him. As I saw the door to the 30th floor master up ahead, I became even more serious. Since I'm always climbing the dungeon by myself, I doubt I'll hear much of other people's names. But sure. I'll tell you if I hear about him. Thank you. I didn't know you were so concerned about the man who turned you into a dungeon explorer. I'm not concerned. Crown Prince really has a dirty personality. In the past, Ren had mentioned it was Sir Labique who chose him to become a dungeon explorer among numerous other young talents. Since he couldn't forget about him, it seemed he was a special person to Ren. I'm a bit curious too. He was your first master, right? I wonder how strong he is. PFT, I know fully well how competitive you are, but I doubt you will be his match. If Sir Le Beak is alive, he should at least be gold rank. Ah. I'm in front of the 30th floor master door. He'll talk to you later. Mm, -hmm, I see. Then. He'll talk to you later. I ended my conversation with Ren. Although I didn't mean to, I felt like I had asked leading questions. Ren was the one at fault for being stupid, it wasn't my fault. Alright, now that I had rationalized it to myself, I should go into the boss fight. The 30th floor's first was already taken by someone else. Although it would have been safer to challenge the floor master with a full party of 10. I now knew how much stronger I was compared to the other explorers. I was confident that I could handle the 30th floor master by myself, especially since I had my skills as an elementalist and a pocket watch. Plus, since Lin had set his quest's clear condition to breaking through the dungeon without party play, I couldn't do so anyways. Fight me. With a spirited shout, I slammed open the door. The field was surprisingly a vast wilderness, where only a pale blue moon shone the dark night sky. In the area, which was much larger than the 25th floor's graveyard, about 200 or so skeletons were lined up. Each and every one of them wore a sturdy suit of armor and were armed with weapons. I could also see skeleton mages and skeleton archers amongst their ranks. However, their straight-line formation broke down the moment I entered the field. Keek, it's the Skull Breaker. Don't be intimidated, Captain will punish you. S. Skull Breaker. We have nowhere to run. Ah, uh, what if we stay still and just leave it to Captain? That's it. All of you shut up. A thundering voice rang out from the back, which straightened up the skeleton's slack and discipline. When I laid my eyes on the owner of the voice, I was incredibly surprised. My god. A skeleton mount. I'm jealous. It's been a while since a challenger who knows his stuff appeared. The 30th floor master was a skeleton wearing full plate armor and carrying a large sword made of bones. As his armor covered his entire body and his helmet covered his face, his appearance was just like a knight's. A huge knight over two. Five meters in size. He spoke with a ghastly voice that seemed to flow out from the pit of hell. I am the skeleton knight. Remember my face. I am the one who will send you into endless despair. Yeah, I really should remember the face of a coward who calls himself a knight but attempts to fight me with his army. Kill that bastard who's full of talk. Captain, we can't. I don't know about Captain, but our bones will get crushed in a single hit. Can we just tie up Captain and offer him? Then, we can surrender. You bastards. The skeleton's downfall was their overly high intelligence. They figured out the difference in our leagues and thought to surrender. It was the first time I had faced such monsters in the dungeon. The Skullbreaker title was more amazing than I ever imagined. Fight him. Now. TSK, big talk for someone who's going to stay hidden until the end. This is why knights suck. Ehu, let's just go fight. Hey, if we're going to die anyways, let's not bother resisting. If Skullbreaker gets tired and loses to Captain, that would be infuriating. I will murder you all. As all the skeletons were drowning in their sense of defeat, I attacked the mages and archers hidden in their midst. Pika, I'll leave it to you. I got it, master. 
Thunder arrow. With that, close to a hundred lightning arrows appeared in the sky. The skeletons that were looking at each other and talking all turned to face the arrows. In that instant, the lightning arrows soared through the sky. An elementalist. Kogagagaga. We didn't even do anything yet. Gigagagaga. Not good enough. While the skeletons were panicking, only the skeleton knight protected himself by swinging his large sword. However, the lightning arrows he blocked were only to stop him from protecting his skeleton minions. It was a feint, per se. While he was blocking the lightning arrows coming towards him, dozens of other lightning arrows completed their duty. The lightning arrows that were focused on the few mages and archers all pierced their targets and exploded them into pieces. Uguk. The magicians and archers were all killed. Thank God I'm not an archer. Ah, if we want to survive, we just have to arm Captain with a bow. That's. Kugak. The skeleton knight swung his sword and cut down a few of his skeleton minions. The wilderness that was full of the clicking sounds of their bones and their voices became completely silent for a moment. What are you doing with your enemy right in front of you, you fools? Well said, skeleton knight. I was starting to get annoyed too. Agreeing with skeleton knight, I bent my knees and slightly pulled my body backwards. Instead of the black earthen spear, I held my silver spear as I pulled my arm back. Pika went into the silver spear on her own accord. But. Someone who cuts down his own soldiers annoys me even more. Everyone charge. Crush him. Those that refuse will have their bones crushed by my sword. Gijiljil, follow captain's command. We are only alive because of this cursed body. Let's go set it ablaze. Our lives already ended a long time ago. I want to put an end to my days, forced to live as a soldier even in death. I pulled my arms back as much as I could and concentrated my strength into it. The silver spear in my grip radiated a brilliant white light and flickered with lightning. My eyes were fixed, not at the skeletons running towards me, but the skeleton knight sitting on his skeleton mount. Block his attack. Destroy him. Try it if you. Can. The moment I finished my retort, I threw my spear forward with all the strength I could muster. Although I didn't shout heroic strike or divine speed, both skills were undoubtedly activated. It was because the speed I threw my spear was unusually fast. I remembered something similar happening in the past. If I was extremely focused, skills would be activated without saying it out loud. Chapter, 68 Kogagaga Kak. The skeletons followed the skeleton knight's command and attacked me. However, my spear had already left my hand, and the skeletons in its path could not even die meaningful deaths, as their blows scattered in all directions without slowing down the spear in the slightest. Naturally, the skeleton knight didn't have the time to dodge it. He hurriedly raised his sword, but the spear was already at his face. His sword bounced off into the air, while my spear pierced through his helmet perfectly and exploded with lightning. Critical hit. Kahak. Human. The skeleton knight let out a short scream. His helmet broke into pieces and his skeleton skull was revealed. The silver spear was still stuck in along the crack in his forehead as it flickered with lightning. Then, the willow wisps in the skeleton knight's eyes burned more violently. He let out an enraged roar, pulling out the silver spear and slamming it down on the ground. He then shook his head vehemently and brushed off the pieces of his helmet. At the same time, Pika came out of the silver spear and yelled angrily. Kayak. Treating a lady like this, you're the worst. Pika, come back. Okay. Gulping down a middle potion, I took out the black earthen spear. You cowardly skeletons. Stop being scared and come fight me. You use provoke. Almost all nearby enemies become hostile toward you. Kugeljil kill Skullbreaker. It'll show him how hard my bones are. Understanding danger and withdrawing is not cowardice, but bravery. While most of the reluctant skeletons started charging towards me with hostility, there was one skeleton that threw out a wise saying as it backed away. Regardless, I use Tempest to take care of them all at once. The sound of dozens of skeletons shattering filled the area. 
Rise again and kill the enemy. Skeleton rise. Hey, when are you going to fight? Kill him. That son of a bitch, he ignored me. Watching the skeletons rise back up like time had just gone backwards, I felt a headache coming. Unlike the zombies, the skeletons could deal damage to me. It meant that I couldn't just ignore them and go for the skeleton knight. In that case. Tempest. After using a few tempests to make most of the skeletons incapable of battle, I kicked off the ground where I was standing and charged towards the skeleton knight. Shooting away the skeletons getting in the way with my spear, I arrived in front of the skeleton knight before he could chant another skeleton rise. Fight me one on one. Rise again in cack. I said, fight me one on one. This bastard, he shuts up when things get disadvantageous for him. I cut off the skeleton mount's legs, forcing it to kneel. I then stabbed out with my spear consecutively. The skeleton knight received my spears with his sword and shouted. Rise again and kill the cack. Let's see how long you can chant for. Every time he swung his sword once, I stabbed with my spear three times. Once at the skeleton mount's head, once at the skeleton knight's sword, and once at his face. After some time, the skeleton mount, who was unable to withstand the flurry of attacks, scattered into pieces. The skeleton knight became speechless as he finally set his foot on the ground. Of course, because of the over 60 centimeters difference in our height, I was like a little kid looking up at an adult. Rise again Kohuk. I'm tired of hearing it, you son of a bitch. Even while he was chanting, he managed to block my heroic strike with his sword. Perhaps because it was a floor master's weapon, there wasn't a single crack on his weapon. Even so, he had to take a few steps back from the vast force he had to withstand. Fine, just keep chanting. There was probably no one who deserved to get his knighthood revoked more than him. I gritted my teeth and assaulted the skeleton knight, who was irritating me from the very beginning. Unlike the 25th floor master, his skills had a certain depth to them. Even so, he couldn't win against me with his mindset. Kayak. You, skull break here. The skeleton knight's armor quickly began to crumble. It was the result of him being unable to completely block my attacks. If it wasn't for his skeleton body that never grew tired, he would have been knocked out from the exhaustion already. Hap. Kayak, kayak. It was then. Unable to finish chanting skeleton rise, the skeleton knight, whose breastplate shattered completely, let out a scream like he could no longer endure it. Immediately afterwards, my movement stopped. I wondered if it was a time-stopping ability the world won, but that wasn't it. It was just that my movements were slowed to the extreme. Skeleton Knight uses Undead Roar. Those with living bodies are slowed to 5% of their maximum speed. Or. Arg, even my talking speed got slower. Being relieved that I just now learned how to activate skills without saying their names, I activated Divine Speed. When I noticed it had succeeded, my next action was clear. You whack. You used Orc Lord's war cry. All party members are cleansed of negative status effects. All party members' attack power increases by 50% for the duration. All party members become super armored, unfazed by enemy attacks. The sense of weakness that enveloped me disappeared. It was a suffocating moment I didn't even want to think about. I released the tension I felt in my shoulders and aimed my spear at the skeleton knight. You're dead. H. How. My undead roar. Die. From then on, I simply beat him up, again and again until his skull shattered. This time, I was completely silent so as to prevent him from doing anything strange. The few skeletons that had remained alive also backed away in order to not get in my way. I just want to quietly commit suicide. Don't even breathe. Hell notice. I don't want to be beaten to death by him let's just kill each other. That's it. A grand achievement. You defeated the floor master, skeleton knight, alone. Amazing. You became level 31. You obtained the qualification to advance to the 31st floor. You obtained 5 bonus stats. You obtained the title, skeleton knight slayer. All stats permanently increase by 1. 
This effect will apply even if the title is not equipped. You became Silver Rank 6. Congratulations. You defeated the Skeleton Knight alone. You obtained the special reward, Skeleton Knight's Plate Armor Top. You obtained 50,000 gold. Choose your reward. 1. Writing Magic Book. I looked around and placed the silent wilderness scenery in my eyes. All the skeletons had disappeared and everything was still in the moonlit wilderness. Hugh letting out a sigh, I checked the solo raid reward. Riding magic book. You learned riding. You can ride and battle on horses, elephants, pegasi, cars, tanks, etc. And all disadvantages from riding them disappears. It was an amazing magic. It covered animal riding and even tank piloting. It made sense that it was considered magic rather than a technique. All knowledge and techniques pertaining to riding were engraved into my mind. As long as it was rideable, I knew the way of doing so. Unfortunately, there wasn't a method of riding a Gundam. Realizing that there were no Gundams in the world, I became slightly disappointed. The solo raid rewards are really all special let's go back now. Master, Spear. Oh yeah. With Pika's reminder, I picked up the silver spear I threw out. Then, I opened the door standing unnaturally in one corner of the wilderness. The floor shop was only a few steps away. Lin who was there batted his eyes after seeing me come out. When I closed the door, his mouth opened wide. The cigarette that was in his mouth fell to the ground. Why you? You forgot my name? You, Pa, passed? In one try. Yep. Oh one. One. Lin almost seemed out of breath as he opened and closed his mouth repeatedly. His thick lizard tail was spinning around as well. How many? How many people passed? No, it must have been ten. How did you gather a full party in just one day? It usually takes four days for ten people to gather. Eh? What are you talking about? I really did wonder what he was talking about. You said to clear the dungeon alone. Don't you remember? When I said clear the dungeon, I, of course, meant the ordinary floors. How would you clear the boss raid aloe alone? Lin shut his mouth tightly. I tilted my head, distributed my level up bonus stats, and stretched my body to challenge the boss again. Then, Lin suddenly asked. Until the 25th floor. Did you do solo raids? How that means the number of skills in your pocket watch is? 5. Lin took out a new cigarette and put it in his mouth. That woman, she put me with you on purpose. Loretta did? Why? She probably expected me to pick a fight with you. Then I'd undoubtedly make a bet and. I thought he was overthinking it and simply laughed it off. Lin, on the other hand, had a rotten expression. He wasn't even smoking the cigarette in his mouth, only gnawing on it. Finally, he let out a deep sigh. It's been a while since I suffered such a blow. I'm the one at fault for being tricked but you're not bad yourself, Earth's hero. I said don't call me that. I don't even know anymore. Just go as far as you want. This Lin Nim will watch over you. Wow, that was almost exactly the same thing Loretta said. Ah is that so? I thought that was it, but Lin's expression became even worse. Although I really wanted to take a before and after photo of Lin's pretty face, I unfortunately didn't have a camera. After all, there was no reason to carry around a camera in my inventory. Come to think of it, this bore that was filling up 240 spaces in my inventory, I had to take care of it somehow. If I brought it out on earth, people would notice it instantly, and it wouldn't fit on the dungeon floor. E.I., you'll have to keep it for now. 1. Jojo referenced Dio's time-stopping ability. Chapter, 69. The 30th Floor Master, Skeleton Knight's Undead Roar was an extremely annoying skill. Although Orc Lord's war cry countered it perfectly, the fact that I could only use it once a day held me down. Was there an alternative? Of course, there was. I could use Dark Thunder Explosion. 
The Skeleton Knight wouldn't be able to dodge Dark Thunder Explosion at such a close range, and I could last throughout the Undead Roar's 10 second duration using Dark Thunder Explosion's duration. Although Dark Thunder Explosion wouldn't be as potent because the Skeleton Knight was made out of bones, he would at least be paralyzed for the duration. As Dark Thunder Explosion could also only be used once per day, I could rely on Dragon Skin for the third raid. If I succeeded in using Dragon Skin, I could last for the 10 seconds no matter what kind of attacks the Skeleton Knight used. At the very least, I wouldn't die. If possible, I wanted to do it without using the limited Floor Master skills. However, unless I brought in a priest who could use status effect defense magic, I couldn't think of a way to resist the Skeleton Knight's skill. I tried asking Lin, but he said equipment that could block Undead Roar were only sold past the 60th floor. Although I shouldn't be the one to say this, but all Floor Master skills really were cheats. They'll show you what a true knight looks like. However, the Skeleton Knight that appeared on the second raid said rather interesting things. Could Floor Master's personalities change too? As Floor Masters until now had simple and brutish personalities, so there wasn't a need to consider their personalities. But here on the 30th Floor Master, the change in the Floor Master's personality and his Skeleton Minion's personalities were clear. Everyone, charge. Make the one who dares to invade the dungeon pay with his life. Kohaha. He'll change my skull today. His shinbone is mine. His armor looks sturdy. He'll get myself a new armor. The skeleton minions made their desire to ransack me clear, as if they were pirates. As the armored skeletons attacked, the skeleton mages and archers also shot their magic attacks and arrows. They couldn't be more ready for battle if they tried. It looks like ITLL be harder than last time. Pika. Thunder Arrow. Pika's elemental magic activated and the mages quickly cast defensive magic, while the melee skeletons rushed towards me with the skeleton knight taking charge. Surprisingly, half of the thunder arrows dissipated without being able to break through their defense. Of course, the remaining half wiped out the skeleton mages beautifully. Master, should I go again? No, it's fine. The archers aren't as dangerous as the mages. Although I could consume mana potions, they had a cooldown time, meaning drinking other potions would have no effect during that time. My mana wasn't bountiful to the point I could freely use elemental magic yet. Slowly circulating per Yuta circuit, I thrust my spear forward. I was facing an army of skeletons over 200 large. Although it was a different sight compared to the disorderly first floor master battle, I preferred the difficulty to be set on high than easy. Everyone come fight me. You use provoke. All enemies will attack you with great hostility. Walk. Let's trample him. Take his rib bones. Take his skull. The skeleton's footsteps became faster. With a grin, I shot out my spear. The current of mana spiraling through the spear stormed to the skeletons, wanting to rip them to shreds. Tempest. Uguk. Quayak. The skeletons and the arrows shot by skeleton archers all bounced off of Tempest's strength. Death counter made the attack 50% stronger and Skullbreaker's effect increased the critical hit rate and damage. All the skeletons that were struck by critical hits had no other choice but to die. Skullbreaker, you wield elementals. The skeleton knight became enraged and charged towards me on his skeleton mount. His terrifying appearance and large sword gave off an imposing aura. Very satisfied at his appearance, I shouted as I ran to meet him. Sorry, but that wasn't an elemental magic. Cool. His sword came from an odd direction and aimed for my neck. Since it was easy to dodge it knowing where it was aiming for, I slid toward Skeleton Mount's legs with my spear in hand. As the Skeleton Mount lost its balance and staggered, the Skeleton Knight's sword naturally lost its trajectory and failed to even glaze me. Skull Breaker. Yeah, it'll crush your head. First, get off of your cool horse. Damn, his skeleton mount really was too cool. My shout full of jealousy was returned with a counterattack. Just like before, I slid down the skeleton mount's legs and disrupted his balance. The furious skeleton knight then shouted. Kill skull breaker. Everyone charge. His seventh cervical vertebrae is mine. 
Stop with that cervical vertebrae talk. You obtained 50,000 gold. Rewards will be distributed in order of contribution. 1. Bone Strengthening Elixir. 2. Skeleton Knight's Helmet. It was here, the Bone Strengthening Elixir. I felt my excitement from battle continuing to the reward picking stage. As expected, the 30th floor master dropped the bone strengthening elixir. After all, skeletons appeared from the 26th floor. I chose the bone strengthening elixir and swallowed it without hesitation. Your bones are transformed to become tougher and stronger. Strength and constitution both increase by one. Ooh. I already expected constitution to increase, but strength increased as well. I did an uppercut into the air and reveled in my happiness. I soon snapped out of it. I had no more business in this wilderness. Just when I was about to leave, I received a message. It was a from Waya. Wayan Wawu. Yeah, Mas Waya. What's up? TV are you watching TV? I'm in the dungeon, why? Then, I received a katok. When I opened it up, father had uncharacteristically sent me a picture. There was no Wi-Fi in the dungeon. How mean. When I looked at the picture with that in mind. Since when did Osaka Castle have swirling dark red cloud effects? Most of the event dungeons left uncleared turned into field dungeons. The question that popped into my head was quickly answered by Waya. Now that I thought about it, a bunch of messages did ring out in the middle of battle. I quickly asked the message Nuna to bring up the message log. S rank event dungeon, Wyvern's Nest, turned into a field dungeon. When the boss monster isn't periodically subjugated, monsters might break out of the dungeon. B-rank event dungeon, General's Honor, turned into a field dungeon. When the boss monster isn't periodically subjugated, monsters might break out of the dungeon. A-rank event dungeon, Graveyard Over the Lake, turned into a field dungeon. When the boss monster isn't periodically subjugated, monsters might break out of the dungeon. B rank event dungeon, ghoul's resting place, turned into a field dungeon. When the boss monster isn't periodically subjugated, monsters might break out of the dungeon. D rank event dungeon, goblin's den, turned into a field dungeon. When the boss monster isn't periodically subjugated, monsters might break out of the dungeon. C rank event dungeon. Why, uh, do you know what a field dungeon is? I'm not sure but the dungeons that were only accessible through the gate seem to have moved to earth. Not to mention it looks like these dungeons won't go away even if you clear them. I'm sure some people will be happy about that. Of course, the world was already overflowing with monsters. There were places where entire countries were felled by monsters and turned into their nests, and places that were specifically given to monsters. Even small village side mountains were now off limits. For anyone looking to hunt monsters, there were more than enough of them. However, monster group colonies were extremely dangerous. No one knew where they would pop out from. Not even satellites could determine their location. Monsters constantly moved, transformed, and became fully grown at the most unexpected times. It really made one angry. It was also the reason Guardians and Freedom Wings traveled in large units. This fact also caused the high death rate of rogues. On the other hand, dungeons had many of the same type of monsters. Once the initial exploration was finished, it was possible to estimate the monster's level of danger. Plus, as they were limited areas, it was possible to optimize the explorers that went in. Overall, it was much easier to hunt in the dungeons than in the wild. Yep, for dungeons with moderate difficulty, hunters would gather, so there would be no problem subjugating them. However, for dungeons that had a rank or above difficulty. Guardians, who are obligated to go protect the citizens, would die. Guardian will surely ask Freedom Wing for help. They wouldn't be able to ignore the public outcry. Why, uh, will you be fine? You're Britain's guardian. I'm not. You know about it, right? The A-rank event dungeon turned into a A-rank field dungeon. All Guardians S rank and above were summoned to assess its danger. You have it rough. Well, if it's you, you'll be fine. Thanks for the compliment, but Hugh. Waya's voice was filled with annoyance. I first got out of the wilderness and left the dungeon as well. 
I had to see what was happening on earth with my own eyes. You're here, son. You're not changing the channel, right? Let me see. Go ahead. HM, it's a good thing we took care of young Dunpo's dungeon so quickly. Really? Father was sitting on the couch in a casual clothing, while eating popcorn and watching TV. It seemed he didn't care much about other countries' problems. Although he was my father, I was jealous of his simple way of thinking. Looking at father from the corner of my eyes, I continued my conversation with Waya. You know Britain has another SS rank other than me, right? Yeah. I heard it's a man. Joshua Brightman. He's called the world's toughest man. Joshua Brightman, huh? Eh. I've heard his name before. He's a Chabel. The owner of a famous clothing enterprise. A Chabel awakening as an SS rank? Why did I feel like that was as cheaty as a dungeon explorer awakening as an ability user? However, since I was also a cheaty person by that reasoning, I couldn't really complain. He's 37 this year. He's in his late 30s. He proposed to me. That's something to congratulate. Wouldn't he be the world's number one suitor? He already has a wife. He probably has multiple girlfriends as well. Oh, so he's a bastard. I'd rather die, that pervert. You too. Don't congratulate me. Worry. Ah, uh, well, yeah. I'm worried. You refused, right? Of course. I utterly spit on his proposal, but he just won't give up. I ran away to Korea because I didn't want to face him, but I'll have to see him when I go back ha. Huh? Even with the distance we were separated by, I could clearly picture her frowning face from her side filled with despair. Although I almost laughed, I held it in. Don't worry about it. It's normal for men to hit on girls as beautiful as you. Since you're strong, you can strike him down. Say that again. Hmm. Since you're strong, you can strike him down. Before that. It's normal for men to hit on girls. In between. On girls as beautiful as you. M M okay, I'll try my best. I don't know which part of that cheered you up. As soon as I take care of this field dungeon problem, I'll invite you to Britain. You've never visited, right? Come visit with Samayar and young Gona Jushi. Oh, sure. Good. I'll contact you later. I'll gladly go if there's an invite. I wanted to see Big Ben, Westminster Abbey, and Buckingham Palace. Even while training with father, we strangely never visited Britain. Waya's sudden change in tone did bother me slightly, but it was too late to ask her now. There's no need for us to move this time. It's not something we have to urgently take care of, and other countries have awakened too. Of course. But the increased chance of an event raid breaking out at places that turned into field dungeons bothers me. Well, we'll find out when the time comes. When I retorted to comments father made naturally and glanced at him, he lay down on the couch like he didn't really care. I went over the conversation with Waya with my head tilted. Then, father turned his head toward me and casually proclaimed. By the way, I'm currently in the middle of breaking through the 37th floor. Yeah, yeah. I bet you were itching to brag. Unlike father, I'm taking my time collecting all the things I need. You're so scared of losing, you don't even ask me to spar. Chapter, 70 After event dungeons turned into field dungeons, small countries without enough awakened to properly maintain them were practically robbed of their money by the Guardian Association. Who deployed their awakened under the pretense of maintenance fees? They could more safely hunt monsters in the field dungeons than in the wild, and they even received additional money from the small countries. It was truly a clever money making tactic. Many countries' freedom wing branches also participated in field dungeon subjugations using the same pretense. The problem were the dungeons with comparatively higher ranks. Japan's B rank field dungeon, General's Honor, and Britain's Lake District's Windermere Lake A rank field dungeon, Graveyard Over the Lake were especially of concern due to their large area, the high number of named monsters, and the high intelligence of their monsters. Finally, Arizona State's Antelope Canyon, which once boasted beautiful scenery, 
was now the object of people's fears after turning into the S-rank field dungeon, Wyvern's Nest. These three dungeons were the ones people were having trouble subjugating. I'm so annoyed. He bothers me at least once every hour. Just set him on fire. Oh, I tried. When I told him to screw off before I burnt all his hair up, he laughed and said, what a cute kitten. He'll come back when you're feeling better. You sure have it rough, having to clear dungeons with someone like him. Graveyard over the lake, which the two SS rank ability users, Waya and Joshua Brightman, and four other S rank ability users were exploring, was the world's largest dungeon, stretching over 16 square kilometers. As its monsters were A rank, it seemed that it would take a long time to completely explore the area. According to Waya, she and the other ability users explored the dungeon on a modified cruise ship. That sounds fun. I always wanted to go on a Windermere cruise ship. After Windermere turned into a dungeon, it's no longer a good tourist location you don't know how many people are sad about it. Plus, since it's so high-ranked, ordinary ability users can't do anything about it. Not to mention, field dungeons don't disappear after being cleared. I'm worried ITLL come back to bite me even after I clean it up once. Aren't there people blaming you? After all, you had a huge influence on countries' decisions to leave the event dungeons alone. Because of what happened in China, no one is really blaming me. Ah well, that's good to hear. Although Waya might be thankful that China took care of her worry, I didn't want to admit that whoever was in charge of China's disaster had a positive impact on someone's life. Aren't you messaging me too often these days? It's because I'm stressed if you had to talk to that self-proclaimed gentleman, you'd want to relieve your stress too. Look at the beautiful Windermere Lake and cheer up. Ah, that tuna came out again. Good luck. Being inwardly happy that Giant Botgung Palace 1 didn't turn into an event dungeon, I ended my conversation with her. In front of my eyes was Lin, who was smoking on his cigarette as always. Are doing boss raids and talking with your friend the only things you do? Can't you think about my scorching heart after being tricked into betting with you? Lin, does the residential area entrance ticket disappear once you use it? If a draconian is talking to you, listen to him. Lin flicked his cigarette ash towards me as he fretted. I swung my spear and returned the ashes back to him. I'm asking Lin so I could find better things to do. Don't just skip out on parts of the conversation. All right, what? Residential area? You got a ticket? Yes. Puffing out cigarette smoke, Lin thought for a brief moment, then gave an exclamation of surprise. Obviously, the entrance ticket will disappear once you use it. But if you somehow manage to buy a residence at the residential area, you'll be able to travel back and forth whenever you want. You just have to install a mana stone and get authorized. Wait, can you repeat that part about the mana stone? Don't you know what a mana stone is? You know, the thing that comes out from monsters' heads. It's the reason for the monsters' strong and strange biology. The reason they're distinguished from humans. The difference is being able to control mana or being controlled by mana. Hearing this, I remembered something. A story from long time ago, when I first heard about dungeon explorers from father. In the dungeon, there are lots of precious things. Mana stones, magical weapons heck, even orc skin would be treated as new material never before seen on earth. That's right, mana stones. I remembered now. But now that I thought about it, I had never even seen a mana stone even though I was on the 30th floor. As for magical weapons, the automatic silver crossbow in my inventory could count as one. I had only gotten one when I was on the 30th floor. Not to mention, the orc skins were just trash items rather than a new material. If I sold it anywhere, I would have had to talk to the police. I couldn't help but tremble as I was reminiscing about the past. I became a dungeon explorer after being tricked by father's words. Of course, I didn't regret it in the slightest now, but I did resent father for tricking me when he had never owned mana stones or magical weapons. I vowed to get my revenge. I've never seen a mana stone. Huh. Well, that's a given. Monsters that appear below the 20th floor of the first dungeon are weaklings who don't have mana stones, and since the 21st through 40th floors all have undead monsters, they don't have mana stones. 
You'll have to get to the 41st floor to see some. Kook. Don't worry. If you go to the residential areas market, you'll meet other explorers selling some. Just buy one randomly and buy a house randomly too. Once you can install the mana stone at the house and go through the authorization process, you can freely go back and forth between your house and the dungeon. Just like how you can go back and forth between the dungeon and earth. That that sounds like I can live in the dungeon without ever having to go back to earth. When I said what I was thinking aloud, Lin sneered for a moment. When I noticed it, he changed his expression to a big smile. For a man, he had a very womanly charm, which made me take a step back. It was undoubtedly charming, but it was the kind of charm that made a chill run down one's spine. Of course. That's possible, Earth's hero. You'll find out when you get there, but it'll tell you in advance. The word escapee is forbidden. If you don't want to become a common enemy at the residential area, don't say that word. Escapee? I said it's forbidden. Understood? Why yes. Hugh. He took out another cigarette and put it in his mouth while lighting it up. When I looked at him cautiously, he grinned and advised me. By the way, since any residence at the residential area will be too expensive for a soloing explorer to buy, you won't be able to do anything even if you go. You'll only end up wasting the entrance ticket you worked so hard to get. Since he kindly advised me, I decided to tell him the truth. Because of an achievement I made, I got a special mansion free purchase ticket. You make me angry. As I thought, an angry expression suited Lin the best. Since I knew I could freely go back and forth between the dungeon and the residential area once I installed a mana stone, I just had to go there and buy one. Excited, I used my residential area entrance ticket on the spot. Ah, uh, wait. If it's a special mansion, you need a mana stone matching its league. Because I already used the entrance ticket, I couldn't hear Lin very well. Just like when I entered event dungeons, my surroundings began to melt. Like removing the rust, the dungeon was slowly getting erased. Then, a new world appeared in front of my eyes. You entered the residential area. Arg, I died again. On the 55th floor. Kukuku, the 55th is hard to cross, I know. Let's just go for a drink. Damn it, the king's going to say something again. While I was dazed by the sudden change in scenery, two middle-aged men brushed past me. I first slapped away his hand trying to grab the spear behind my back. I won't say much, so just go drink. Kook, I thought you were a newbie, but you're quite skilled. All right, well leave consider it a welcome ceremony. Aiming for a martial artist's weapon, he was lucky I didn't cut off his wrist. Since I knew directly fights between explorers were forbidden, I could tell him off after hearing him speak about the 55th floor. Though, to be explorers on the 55th floor, they looked too weak. They were most likely lying. Because I was standing in a daze on my first time entering the residential area, they were trying to stomp on my spirit by talking about the 55th floor and steal my weapon. Although it was true that I was in a daze, my training wasn't so loose that I wouldn't notice someone stealing my weapon from right under my nose. After seeing the two explorers off, I looked around. I instantly knew how to describe the scenery. It was like the vibrant streets of medieval Europe. The buildings built with colorful bricks were incredibly beautiful, while the pretty stones making up the floor were clean and without gaps. There was one thing I didn't quite understand. It was that this place, which should be somewhere in the dungeon, had a sky full of clouds. Other than this mystery, this place was certainly wonderful. The sight of so many dungeons explorers walking around with their weapons was almost dreamlike. Everything fit well with the area. Hey, handsome young man over there. Would you like a slice of Diragonu, the tastiest fruit in all of Silent Continent? Since Silent Continent is already ruined, you can't find Diragonu anywhere else. This place had fruit sellers who sold fruit I had never heard of before. That spear doesn't look so good. Do you want to look around World Pyresia's high-ranking weapons? It had weapon shops that sold weapons from worlds I had never heard of before. It's only noon and you're drinking, you losers. If you got kicked out of the dungeon, quietly go back to your world. That world is ruined already. 
There was even a foul-mouthed beauty serving alcohol and curses at her customers. Hmm, it's not that big. It's probably about the size of a small town. The city didn't have any residences belonging to explorers. To be exact, this place wasn't the residential area, but an intermediate area to get to the residential area. It was a public space created for the residential area's explorers to interact. Since just the intermediate area was this size, it was perhaps a little rude of me to call it small. However, since I was used to living in Korea's capital, this place could only be small in comparison. That said, I didn't dislike this place filled with lively explorers. It was fun looking at each of the shops the explorers were running, and the fountain plaza I was summoned to was also incredibly beautiful. All right then, the place where I could buy the special mansion is no, wait. Someone had told me to contact her when I came to the residential area. Paludia, are you in the dungeon? Kong Shin. Yeah, you told me to contact you when I came to the residential area, remember? Wa well, wait. Jay just one moment. Then, in the three hours that I was looking around the residential area, I didn't receive any messages from Paludia. A girl's words really weren't something you could trust. 1. Considered the most beautiful and grandest palace in Korea. Chapter, 71. During that time, I leisurely walked around the residential area's marketplace, checking the market value of the items here and which stores were where. I met two more people who tried to steal my weapon. One was an old man who acted feeble and begged for money, then tried to take my spear and run. I grabbed him by his arm and held him with a leg lock. The next one was an explorer exposing much of her voluptuous figure, who approached me with a friendly smile. While I was shyly responding to her, she tried to sneakily take my spear and run with a stealth skill. Of course, she couldn't trick my senses. I twisted her wrist and got my spear back. I grabbed her by the edge of her dress and threw her over my shoulder not being able to feel her skin because of my armor would forever remain a regret. She then threw out all sorts of curses as she ran away. Realizing that my black earthen spear looked like a great weapon to other people, I stopped foolishly carrying it around. I usually stored it in my inventory, but I didn't have the time to put it away, since I came to the residential area right after speaking to Lin. Then, I finally found a place where I could purchase a residence. The place I arrived at, after asking several people, was called the First Dungeon Official Trading Center. Also known as the market, it was a place where explorers auctioned off items found in the dungeon, bought houses, or even event dungeon entrance tickets. The manager of the trading center was not human. When I noticed him, he noticed me as well and quickly spoke. I'm going to say this beforehand, don't take out your weapon. Well both get tired. A hobgoblin, right? Instead of taking out my weapon, I guessed his identity. The green-skinned hobgoblin, who was sitting on a chair looking over documents, clapped after hearing my guess. His black uniform was one thing, but his white silk gloves did not suit him in the slightest. How did you notice right away? Amazing. Normal goblins aren't as tall as you, nor are they as intelligent. At my words, a smile bloomed on the hobgoblin's wrinkly face. In truth, he looked quite silly. Elves, hobgoblins, and fairies were all the same race, but how could there be such an unfortunate difference? Hmm, um, good, good. It's been a while since I've seen a newcomer with some common sense. What business do you have? Are you trying to auction an item? Alright, although there's usually a 10% fee, well make it 5% since this is your first time. You just have to fill out this form with the auction duration, lowest amount, and item description. Ah, uh, no. I'm trying to claim a house. House. The hobgoblin then scanned me from head to toe and made a surprised expression. Twentieth floor's lizard night set, right? Right. Amazing. I didn't think there would be an explorer that completed set equipment nowadays. I'm happy to have met a young man with a bright future. My name is Meladel. You can call me Hyung Won. The sense of distance shorted greatly. Im Kong Shin. Take good care of me, Meladel. Tisk, is it that hard to call me Hyung? Well, whatever. Kong Shin, I fully understand your ability. Being able to defeat a floor master by yourself, you should be proud. However. 
He continued as he stamped on documents he pulled out of nowhere with his stamp that he also pulled out of nowhere. In the residential area, residences have a great significance. This place is full of people wanting to escape their worlds that are heading to ruin and secure safe spaces for themselves. There are also people who wish to form interdimensional organizations through guilds. Not to mention, it is required for dimension mercenaries to own residences in the residential area. When I heard Melodel's words, I finally understood what Lin meant. That is, if I was understanding Melodel correctly. Escaping their worlds that are heading to ruin you mean, if you have a residence in the dungeon, you don't have to go back to your own world. Right. After you install a mana stone and get authorized, even if your vitality becomes zero while exploring the dungeon, you'll return to your home in the residential area rather than the world you came from. Of course, you still won't be able to continue exploring the dungeon for a week, but you'll still be able to escape the world you came from. I see. So that's why they were called escapees. It was truly fitting. Dungeon explorers' worlds were all in huge or fatal trouble. The Luka continent had the demon race and the Edia's continent had the invaders. Although Rin didn't say what happened to the Panin continent, it seemed more hopeless than any of the other worlds. If that was the case, it was perfectly normal for people to want to escape from their worlds. They could either die while fighting against a danger they couldn't fight off alone, or they could survive by running away to the dungeon. The choice was clear. I also understood why the word escapee was forbidden. The ones who abandoned their worlds would undoubtedly have a sense of guilt in their hearts. Whether they were chosen by the dungeon or chosen by an explorer, they would have received a certain amount of expectations the moment they became dungeon explorers. As the one who will be their world savior, as the one who will fight against the danger. However, they ran away. In face of the danger their worlds faced, they cowered in fear and ran. Or, they were burdened by the expectations the people of their worlds placed on them. I couldn't blame them. I didn't want to call them escapees. As someone who had yet to face any serious danger and did not even have the courage to reveal himself to his world as an awakened, I didn't have the right. As such, I stopped this line of thinking, and began to ask Maladel about words I had not heard about before. What are dimension mercenaries? They're mercenaries that go out to aid other worlds. When a world's explorer requests them, they can travel to that world's dimension. They're explorers whose main jobs are completing these requests and getting compensated. They're incredibly strong. None of them are weak. The requirement to become a dimension mercenary is also complicated. You need to have a high enough level, the return skill, which you can only get through a few special ways, the dimensional travel skill, which lets you travel to other worlds, and be in a certain league of existence. And since they can't be tied to one world, they have to own their own houses in the residential area. Wow, that sounded so cool. So they were specialists even amongst dungeon explorers. It also seemed you could get the return skills in places other than the 15th floor. That was the extent of my impression. Unfortunately, there is a finite number of houses in the residential area. Five special mansions, 20 first grade mansions, 200 second grade mansions, 500 first grade houses, 2000 second grade houses, 5000 third grade houses, and finally 500 tenement houses that each fit about 10 families. You got that? That's 12,725 families in total. Unless explorers marry each other, less than a third of first dungeon's dungeon explorers can occupy them. Hobgoblin Melodel solemnly nodded his head and continued. That's right. And to buy a room in a tenement house, you need 10 million gold. You need 10 million gold to buy a room in a tenement house. Then are there rooms available? Although 10 million was certainly an enormous amount, I asked Melodel, thinking it actually might not take too long to collect that much. Melodel then smirked and explained further. No. With how long the dungeon's been around, do you think there would be any empty rooms? What I meant was, there might be explorers who would give up their rooms for 10 million gold. They'd throw away their homes for 10 million gold. They can enter guilds instead. It seemed I would need to bother Melodel for a little longer. Can I ask a few more things? I know you must be busy, but I'm curious about what guilds are. Time is gold, and just like you said, I'm a busy hobgoblin. 
But you're an explorer with a bright future, and my golden intuition as a hobgoblin is telling me that building a closer relationship with you will be incredibly beneficial for me. Plus, I'm an excellent hobgoblin that can do my work while talking with others. If there's one thing I understood, it was that he was a goblin with eloquent speech and high self-esteem. I explained a bit before, but a guild refers to an organization built around one incredibly strong leader and explorers from all dimensions who have similar goals. They live together in something called the Guild House, and its members might form small parties to explore together, or the entire guild might come together to clear an event dungeon or an event raid. With strong trust between its members, a guild becomes stronger. There's a reason why so many explorers want to become guild masters. I assume there are requirements to becoming a guild master. Melodel put down his stamp and picked up his pen. He then continued as he filled out more documents. First, someone who wishes to become a guild master must be at least be a gold rank explorer. In other words, a guild master has to at least be level 50. I see. He must also own a mansion. Normal houses cannot be used as guild houses. Ah, so he needs to own a guild house as well. So you would at least need a second grade mansion. That's exactly right. In other words, at any time, the first dungeon cannot have more than 225 guilds. However, mansions aren't something you can just buy with money. Achievements, right? He took his eyes off his documents and looked at me. Right. Achievements. He needs to complete an achievement that anyone will acknowledge. If he does, he would obtain the qualification to buy a mansion. That qualification is called the purchase ticket. Depending on the quality and type of achievement he completed, the different kinds of mansions he can buy and how cheap he can buy them for would be determined. Although this might sound a bit strange, the worth of an uncompleted achievement increases as time goes on. The highest level of achievements are the first achievements. In other words, the way to complete a great achievement right now would be to become the first to complete an achievement that has never been completed before. An achievement that has never been completed in the long history of the dungeon you understand how valuable that would be, right? When I heard his explanation, I finally understood why succeeding in the Lizard Knight solo raid in my first challenge was such an amazing achievement. An achievement never before completed in the long history of the dungeon I had succeeded in exactly that. Succeeding in the Lizard Knight first challenge solo raid. That's why the mansions are a bit more open compared to the houses. There are still several ownerless second-grade mansions and three ownerless first-grade mansions. One of the only five special mansions in the entire residential area, Marianas Garden, is also awaiting its owner, which has never appeared since the founding of the dungeon. There are quite a lot of explorers that are curious about the one that will become the owner of Marianas Garden. With that, he looked at me. But it seems that curiosity won't last long. Don't you agree, owner? As I thought, you noticed. Humph, I noticed it when you said you would claim a house rather than purchase. Although I didn't think it would be the special mansion. He really was smart. With a smile, I took out the special mansion free purchase ticket and gave it to him. He put his reading glasses and carefully examined the ticket. Then, he let out a deep sigh. Lord made a big decision. All right, congratulations. Kong Shin, from today, you are the owner of the special mansion, Marianas Garden. I, Hobgoblin Melodel, Elder of the Fairy Garden, acknowledge it with my name. You became the owner of the special mansion, Marianas Garden. The key to the mansion is vested upon you. You can find it in your inventory. I opened my inventory and examined the key. It was slightly different than the light blue crystal key Loretta gave me, as it seemed to be carved from a jewel radiating a five-colored brilliance. Although it had less cuts than the crystal key, it was bigger and more beautiful. When I reached inside my inventory to grab it, I received a message. Your friend, Paludia Gren Awer, has invited you to her residence. Would you like to accept? What an impeccable timing. Hmm. What's wrong? Ah, my friend invited me to her place. She told me to contact her I guess she wanted to invite me to her home. Thank you, they'll be going now. She invited you to her home, huh? Um, I see. Melodel's voice trembled slightly. He stared at me fixedly, 
then let out a dry cough. Kohame girl, right? Yes. Yes. Die. What? Nothing. Hurry up and go. Tui. I didn't know why he suddenly spit on the ground. I turned my back to the hobgoblin, and answered the message as I glanced at the items being sold and the trading center's employees busily running around. I accept. 1. Older Brother. Chapter, 72. You will be moved. The same phenomenon as when I arrived at the residential area happened. When I closed my eyes and opened them, there was a two-story house in front of me. It was an ordinary house with a red brick roof. On it, there was a sign that read Second Grade House. When I looked around, I saw lines of houses that looked exactly the same as this one. When I tried to walk towards one of them, I found myself in the same place I started out. It seemed I couldn't go to the other houses. Paludia. See come in. I opened the front door and walked in. The house, which was built using bricks, was exceedingly ordinary, and its inside was incredibly clean. In truth, it wasn't a place where a girl could live by herself. Paludia wasn't wearing her usual priestess uniform, but a light blue dress. It perfectly suited her slender arms and legs. For a moment, I was stunned by her beauty. Plus hmm. Something felt different about her face. What was it? Ah, I could smell perfume. Why you came? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Though, I didn't really know why she called me. Do you want something to drink? All right. Tea. On top of her clothes and perfume, she was noticeably acting strange. Her clumsy movements were cute, but that wasn't important. Can I sit? Yeah. On the table. She probably meant on the chair by the table. With that, I went and sat down on the chair by the teahouse table. Then, I watched Paludia prepare tea. Even though she was in her own house, she made very awkward movements, like her arms and legs moving in the same direction, or spilling water because her hands were shaking uncontrollably. From then, it took twenty minutes for Paludia to calm down and finish brewing her tea. It took another ten minutes for her to sit down at the table and drink tea while facing me. Drinking the lukewarm red tea, I asked Paludia. So, what's the reason you invited me over? A amazing, right? I already have a second grade house. Ah, that actually is amazing. This girl, she changed the subject. Of course, it wasn't by my strength alone. Many people supported me with their gold. You might not know, but I'm equivalent to the representative of my continent. A mere second grade house, it's nothing against this Paludia Gren Awernim. Ah, yeah. Congratulations, Paludia. For her mental health, I decided not to tell her about my special mansion. Call me Ludia. T that's what everyone calls me. Is it? Okay, Ludia. Shuna did call her Ludia. I thought it was a nickname between close friends. When did Paludia start considering me her friend? Because I didn't think we'd had a chance to become such close friends, I was quite bewildered. However, the real bewilderment had yet to happen. So you see they're the reason I called you. Paludia, no, Ludia's face was incredibly red. After taking a sip of red tea, she barely managed to continue her words. There's something I need to explain to you. Okay. And my family. I it's a our royal family. Yeah. I would never forget her words that followed for the rest of my life. We were born with eyes that can discern our fated partners. I, I mean, if I marry this person and have children, the royal family would be destined to prosper. Yeah. A chill suddenly ran down my back. Apparently it's because of my bloodline my ancestor's blood has a divine race's blood mixed in or so they say. Hmm. When we first met. For some reason, I didn't want to hear what she had to say. Remember when I was mean to you? Why yeah. I hoped it wasn't true. I knew at the moment I saw you. Really? A girl this pretty, with me? Although I wanted to tell her not to joke around and laugh it off, Lydia's expression was too serious. In truth, I didn't like it. Why did I have to marry a man I didn't even know, 
who even came from another world. That's why I was so mean to you I didn't even think you were an orc. I thought you had an admirable body of a martial artist. I didn't hate you. As she spoke, her voice was getting calmer. She was getting more and more collected. I hated my eyes. I hated my royal bloodline. I hated that I had to marry someone that was chosen without my knowledge. I hated that I was connected to someone that couldn't even live with me in my world. That's why I stayed silent. But I didn't hate you. You saved me twice. You helped me, even when I wasn't kind to you. In fact, I treated you harshly. When I said I didn't like you as a person, that was a lie. I, I see. Is that why you added me to your friend list? Yeah. I didn't think about marriage, but I didn't want the connection between us to be severed. Maybe, back then, I was already in no. Ill continue. She caught her breath, then asked with a quiet voice. Sheena Gren Awir. Do you know her? I did. I know Sheena. Ah, Sheena Gren Awir. I see, she's your younger sister. Yeah, she's the second royal princess. Even as a princess, she bravely fights on the front lines as a knight. But it's the same for you. M. Me. I'm a priestess. So it's not as dangerous. Why yeah? I can't, this girl. I had to do something. Although she looked calm, she wasn't calm at all. She got startled whenever I said something, and the tone of her voice randomly changed as she spoke. It was clear she was incredibly nervous. I understood. I was incredibly nervous too. She she said she'd marry you, so I got scared. Ha. Huh. This was the first time I heard about it. Today, there were many things I was hearing for the first time. She also said her fated partner was you. She kept bragging about how close she was with you, almost as if to taunt me. My eyebrows trembled. Scary. Even though we exchanged greetings from time to time, I never even imagined Sheena was thinking like that. Even if I die, I won't let Sheena have I mean. I thought I should meet you because of this problem. I didn't have any ulterior motives. I just thought it was weird that both sisters picked the same person as their fated partner. I just wanted to confirm, but mom found out and... Found out? As she found out you were another world's hero. Her face reddened as she drooped her head and waved her hand in the air. Although she looked extremely adorable, I understood what she meant in an instant. Lydia, tea this house. Yeah. Mom and Dad arranged it. The Emperor and Empress did. As a wedding gift. Tea thanks for the tea. Hey. When I tried to get up from my seat, Lydia hastily grabbed my arm. I, am just saying. Don't jump to conclusions. What, were you worried that I was going to propose to you? You're not that narcissistic, are you? I understand, so calm down, Paludia. I said call me Lydia. Okay, Lydia. Breathe in. Breathe out. Hoo-ha. She obediently followed my words and inhaled in and out. Even as she was being feisty, doing what I told her made her look extremely lova hook. I needed to calm down too. After recomposing herself, she glared at me with teary eyes and spoke. I calmed down. So. I'm just letting you know. Got it? Yeah, I got it. Well, hey race my thought. Marriage should be done between two people that love each other, right? Being able to tell one's fated partner, there's no guarantee it's 100% right. So you don't have to worry, Lydia. Stupid. You're so dense. It's nothing. I wondered why. She seemed calmer, but she also looked angrier. Unable to figure out why, I panicked. Ah, uh, I was also feeling fluttery. In truth, Lydia was the most beautiful of all the girls I'd met. Although I was doing my best to lower my evaluation of her looks by thinking about her younger self, I couldn't deny that she was beautiful. But to think her fated partner was me. My heart had no other choice but to pound. Of course, Lydia didn't like me at all and was angry about that. Even so, I couldn't help myself from thinking what if. But this wasn't right. 
something like fate, there was no need to consider it. Anyone that would try to do something with Ludia because of it would be the lowest scum. Ludia trusted me and told me about it honestly. Even if I couldn't act dignified, I had to at least lessen her burden. I'd like you to meet the person you like and be happy with him. You don't have to worry about something like a faded partner. How about you? You don't care at all. Not even a little. Ludia, who was listening to me, returned with a question. Her eyes were teary like she was about to burst into tears. I felt like I couldn't lie in front of such eyes and said with a bitter smile. Sorry. I shouldn't mind, but I actually do. A lot. You're incredibly beautiful, and even if you don't act like it, I know you're kind. If a girl like that tells me that I'm her fated partner of course my heart would race. Sorry, I know I shouldn't, but. Yes. Like I said, it's nothing. Lydia hastily flapped her hands, but for some reason, her mood seemed to have become much brighter. With a face that was barely holding in a smile, she seemed to be pulling back the corners of her mouth. I didn't know why, but I felt it was a good thing. So, M.M. Don't listen to Sheena no matter what she says, okay? Engrave it in your mind. It seemed that was all she planned to say for today. While sipping on the red tea that went cold, I answered. Yeah, sure. Even if Sheena says you have to marry her because you're her fated partner, don't listen to her. That girl only likes you because you're strong, so don't think she really likes you. Got it, Kong Shin. Yeah, I got it. And. When I answered her with an exhausted voice, she doodled on the table using the tea water, and continued with a quiet murmuring voice. Contact me more often I'll forget your voice. Oh, okay. You can come by again whenever, too. I'm usually bored. Okay. You can go now. I'm going to rest. All right, it was fun today. After saying goodbye to Lydia, I left her house. Although I heard Lydia letting out a weird sound and falling, I decided to ignore it. After all, she must have had a lot in her mind before telling me. I was happy that several questions I had regarding Lydia were solved. Thinking that I could continue being good friends with her, the corners of my mouth went up. All right, now let's go look at my own house. When I touched the key in my inventory, a message rang out in my ear. Would you like to move to Marianna's garden? Yes. When I closed my eyes and opened them, I was in front of a huge mansion. It's too big. The garden spread out past the front gate was filled with colorful flowers, and further back were several trees forming a beautiful scenery. I stepped past the iron gate opening slowly in response to my key, and leisurely walked through the stone path while looking around the mansion's land. It really was incredibly large. Plus, there were so many fruit trees that I could smell their sweet, subtle fragrance. When I plucked one off and took a bite, an overwhelming sweetness and coolness danced in my mouth. A bit away from the stone path, amongst the trees, I saw what seemed like a spring, but I ignored it for now. The mansion ah, I see it now. The mansion was also enormous. It had a blue roof and was made of ivory-colored bricks. Without exaggeration, it was as big as a few giant iron bores. Its sheer size almost felt exhausting. Right in front of the mansion was a fountain, and a wide, open space around it. Right. I could leave the giant iron boar here. In the future when I needed to dismantle the giant iron boar, I could do it by the fountain. Not to mention, the water would be close by for me to drink. After looking around the fountain and the open area, I turned my attention to the inside of the mansion. I climbed the stairs, and another door appeared, which reacted to the key I had and opened. You entered Marianna's garden. The mana stone required for authorization has been confirmed. Would you like to be authorized as the mansion's owner? While I was overwhelmed by the sight of the wide hall that appeared past the door, the messages rang out. I couldn't help but be confused. Mana stone? When did I get a mana stone? But since it said it would authorize me, there was no reason for me to decline. When I accepted the message's offer, my inventory suddenly opened in midair. W what? When did I open my inventory? While I was confused, something was falling out of my inventory. 
It was the giant iron boar's nose. Chapter, 73 Hook Even while I stepped back, almost frightened out of my mind, my inventory was slowly, but surely, sending the giant iron boar out of it. The inventory freely soared through the air, hovering over a spot in the open area I had just walked by as it spewed out the giant iron boar. Along with a thud, its massive body made the mansion's open ground its home. Although I had expected it to a certain degree, it really ruined the mansion's mystical atmosphere. After it finished spitting out the entire giant iron boar, my inventory automatically closed itself, as if to say it never acted on its own accord. Hopefully, something so surprising would not happen again. While I was pondering why the boar even popped out, the boar's head began to crack with a thunderous sound. Ah, uh, that's it. The answer was obvious. Blue stone. The mana stone I had was the boar's blue stone. I watched the scene with a dumbfounded expression. Soon, a blue stone, no, mana stone, bigger than my own body, popped out from its head. This boar really did have one, a mana stone. If China found out about this, they were sure to be painfully jealous. Just how expensive would that thing be if it were sold? Such a thought was useless, as the mana stone flew towards me while becoming smaller. The light it radiated also became stronger. When it arrived in front of my eyes, it had become the size of my thumb, while it shone with a dazzling light. It was almost as if it had compressed itself to increase its purity. Place a drop of your blood. Kook. After making a light cut on my finger with my spear, I let a drop of blood fall onto the mana stone. Then, the mana stone let out an almost blinding light and flew into the mansion. I tried to follow its trajectory, but it had disappeared into the hall's central area in the blink of an eye. Boom! Immediately afterwards, the entire mansion rumbled. You were successfully authorized as the mansion's owner. You can return to the dungeon using your key at any time, and likewise, you can return to the mansion from the dungeon. When your vitality becomes zero, you can return to the mansion, in which case you will still not be able to re-enter the dungeon for a week. When my vitality became zero. It meant when I was kicked out of the dungeon after my HP became zero. Although I hadn't died lately, I was glad I could return to the mansion if I did, since I wouldn't want father to find out. Plus, the fact that I could go back and forth between the dungeon and the residential area was the real benefit. I was looking forward to selling things in the residential area as well. Not to mention, there were street vendors and bars that were only available here. Just like that, I became the owner of a mansion I had never even dreamed about. All hail the dungeon. In truth, it had not sunken in yet. With the mana stone installed in the mansion, ventilation, temperature management, cleaning, and other maintenance will be automatically done. However, it is recommended that you appoint another mansion administrator. I mean, since it's so big just looking around the mansion will be a chore. You will be guided. Mm no. Before that. Holding off on the message known as unusually generous service, I turned around and stared at the boar, which had its head cracked open. Now that was a chore. I have to take care of it. I gave up after two hours. He was too big. There should be a limit to how big a monster could be. If I wanted to dismantle him completely by myself, even four full days would not be enough. Should I put it back in my inventory? Wait, if I just leave it like this, will it rot? I murmured as I stood on his head and knocked on it a few times. Then, a semi-transparent window that explained its status automatically appeared in front of my eyes. Giant Iron Boar's Corpse Unique The corpse of a Birank Massive Raid Boss its meat is in a class of its own compared to the taste of other monster meats. If handled well and used in medicine, it can permanently increase your stats. Its bones and leather can be used to craft up to A rank items. It might be better used as a sacrifice for black magic. Even as a corpse, because of the bountiful mana it holds, it will not rot, even if left alone. Mm. I learned a few things. First, eating raid boss meat increased stats. Second, raid boss corpses could be used to craft defensive equipment or weapons that were a rank higher than the boss. Third, I wanted to see the boar become an undead one day. 
most importantly, the fourth, it would not rot even if I left it alone like this. All right, that's its home for now. I nodded my head imperiously and jumped down from its back. Since it wouldn't rot even if I left it here, there was no need to put it back in my inventory. When I examined it from below, it really was enormous. However, even if I used it to make defensive equipment or weapons, they would only be A rank at the highest. Judging by the Black Earthen Spear, which was a reward from an A rank event dungeon, even the best crafted item would only be comparable to the Black Earthen Spear. That said, I would be able to make quite a lot of them. Although it would be perfect to sell them to other awakened, there was no need to go to that extent to earn money. Not to mention, China might take notice. Now, what should I do? Since I finished being authorized as the mansion's owner, I felt relaxed. Should I look around the mansion first? Or should I look for the spring Loretta talked about? Although I pondered for a long time, the decision was made in an instant. Since it was on my mind, I decided to just visit the spring first. I left the garden and walked into the forested area, while thinking just how absurd it was that a mansion had a forest in its boundaries. After about fifteen minutes, I heard the sound of water. When I hastened my steps towards where the direction of the sound was coming from with joy, the fairy spring was there. Ooh! It was truly a picturesque scene. In the spring that wasn't big or small, a stream of water was shooting out. Inside, small fish were swimming in the almost transparent water. In addition, numerous flowers surrounded the spring, as if to envelope it in their embrace, and a small tree cast its shadow next to it, creating the perfect resting spot. Although the small area didn't quite fit in with the enormity of the mansion, it was just my style. Just like the name Loretta called it, I felt like fairies would pop out of the spring at any time. You have the key to the fairy garden's entrance. Would you like to use the key? What? What did it say? I took out the light blue crystal key from my inventory. What? Fairy garden. Didn't I hear that name somewhere? It shouldn't have been too long ago, but I couldn't remember. After thinking about it for a bit, I gave up. Since there was no chance that Loretta would get angry, I decided to open the entrance. Yes. The gate opens. Something like the spring splitting in half didn't happen. Instead, the spring's water shot up into the sky and spun in a donut shape. The donut became bigger as more and more water shot up, until it became big enough for a person to fit through. I wouldn't end up underwater after jumping through it, right? Deciding to trust Loretta, I jumped into the gate. The scenery warped and a strong headache swept over me. For a moment, I couldn't withstand the dizziness and closed my eyes. When I awoke, I was already in the fairy garden. Look, it's the prince. Elemental Tempest. I loved that. Spin. I want to form a contract with him. His lightning elemental was so beautiful. Voices of elementals were something I always heard, both in the dungeon and on earth. However, there was an overwhelming number of elementals in this place. My surroundings were full of their colorful lights. If an elf was here to see them it would be like an amusement park. Plus, this place didn't just have elementals. There were also fairies, which, unlike elementals, even ordinary people could see. They were spinning around me along with the elementals. In truth, they were quite distracting. Queen Nim wanted to see him. I was beaten by the guild master for saying it. Beaten. Beaten. Queen Nim got beaten. Thieving cat. Pika. You called, master. I called Pika who I had unsummoned after entering the residential area. When Pika appeared, even more elementals and fairies gathered. Pretty elemental. Come play with us. W8, go away. Looking at Pika acting flustered, I lightly smiled and spoke. Go play with the elementals for a little bit. Though, if you don't want to, it can't be helped. I if it's master's request. Okay, what do you guys want to play? Let's play tag. Tag. I like spin spin. You probably can't spin spin without me, probably. With that, I left the elementals and fairies to Pika, then walked forward to the inside of the garden, which seemed to be an enlarged version of my mansion's garden. 
fairies and balls of light were floating about the area. There I found a pavilion where a few members of the fairy race were gathered. There was water flowing around the pavilion, and they sat in the pavilion in a circle, drinking tea. As there was a stack of papers next to them, they didn't look like they were just playing around. Amongst them was a hobgoblin, an elf, and a beast man with cat ears and tail. Wait, a beast man shouldn't be part of the fairy race, right? There was also a short human-like man. He was most likely a dwarf, which was a member of the fairy race. I'm him. Who are you, Nyan? Amongst them, the cat-eared beast man girl was the first to notice me. She didn't try to hide the furry triangular ears that protruded out of her brown bobbed hair. Her eyes shone with a yellow light similar to gold, while cat-like vertical pupils glared at me. Because of her excellent figure that contrasted with her baby face, I was instantly reminded of Yua. Why are you even asking, you Nyan cat? Master said a human will come by soon, remember? The hobgoblin that was drinking tea next to her noticed me in response to the beast man girl's words, and spoke as he smacked her head with the teacup plate. The beast man girl growled and threatened the hobgoblin, but went quiet after more teacup plates struck her head. The dwarf then turned to face me. I, who was expecting a bearded face like the dwarves described in novels, was surprised after seeing the dwarf was a handsome young man. Humans, really. You thought I'd have scraggly beard and muscular body, right? Kook, you're right. Sorry. Im Kong Shin. You are. Latong de Flama. As you know, I'm a dwarf. Nice to meet you, human. I'm the Hobgoblin Aladdil. I heard from Meladel that the owner of the Marianus Garden appeared. That must be you. Yes, it's me. Hobgoblins were said to be able to communicate with others of their race through their minds. Elatil must have heard about me from Meladel. After hearing the word Marianus Garden, the beast man girl that was sniffling with her head down raised her head. Marianus Garden, Nyan. How did a human who looks so weak become a special mansion owner, Nyan? Strength doesn't matter, you Nyan cat. What matters is how Lord judged his achievement. Hello, boy. In Shikatra. You must be an elf. Nice to meet you. The one who introduced herself last was an incredibly beautiful woman. She had grey silver. Hair, emerald colored eyes, and a certain mature charm. With her teacup in hand, she looked like she came out of a painting. If the teacup plate from her hand hadn't hit the beast man girl's head, she would have looked even more beautiful. I see, your master's hoo hoo, nice to meet you. Take good care of master. Um, I'm asking just to be sure, but is the master you're referring to Loretta? That's right. Shikatra nodded her head like it was nothing. So it was true. A mere floor shop owner was being called master. If I took into account the similarity between the crystal key to the fairy garden and the mansion key. Is Loretta the master of the guild, fairy garden? That's exactly right, human. Though, Fairy Garden is a bit different from the guilds created by explorers. In fact, it's a guild for those who manage the dungeon, right? Yes. The first dungeon has a total of five administrative guilds, and Fairy Garden is one of them. It's named after this area we're in. The dwarf, Latong, nodded his head with satisfaction. It was as I thought. Administrators who managed the floor shops and parts of the residential area although I was curious about their identities, I did not ask since they did most likely would not answer. The beast man girl's initial hostility seemed to have subsided as she scanned me and said, My name is Loka, Nyan. Nice to meet you, Locanyan. It's not Locanyan, Nyan. It's just Loka, Nyan. Of course, I was just joking. Her reaction was exactly what I wanted as well. Watching me nod my head in satisfaction, the hobgoblin Aladdil spoke as he stared at me fixedly. I assume you're here to meet Master. No, Loretta just said something good will happen if I use the key at the spring. But since I'm here, I do want to meet Loretta. What was Master embarrassed about, even after handing him the key? While Aladdil was murmuring to himself, the elf Shikatra explained in his stead. You see the path there, right? Don't stray off the path and keep going. 
Remember, you have to think of master as you walk. If you follow where the fairies lead you, you might not be able to come back. Just what is this place? Hmm, it's not the material realm. It's closer to the fairy realm. So make sure you stay on your guard, young man. With your dazed face, the fairies will trick you, Nyan. Be careful, Nyan. Did they not know about my ability? I was an elementalist, and had skills that let all spirits see me in favorable light. The fairies I met on my way didn't try to trick me. Loka's worry was probably for nothing. While I was following the path, I suddenly remembered about Pika. She disappeared after being dragged off by the elementals and fairies. Um, well, I could always unsummon her, so I guess I can just leave her be. Thinking casually, I walked deeper and deeper into this garden of the fairies. Chapter, 74 As I walked onward thinking about Loretta, the trees became denser and the number of elementals decreased. The sound of birds chirping rang out along with the cries of other animals. It was truly a mystical place. In an instant, the forest's atmosphere changed again. The warm, peaceful atmosphere became more uneasy. In here. Thinking like that instinctively and pushing myself through the trees, I found a small log cabin in the woods. It was almost as if it popped out of a fairy tale. I approached the cabin and knocked on its door. Loretta's answer was swift and concise. Not working. Im resting. Go away, and don't come back. Loretta. Kayak. Crashing and clattering sounds rang out from the inside, followed by an absolute silence. I was lost for words as the silence continued, before the door quietly and slowly opened. From inside, two golden eyes peeked out. So Loretta had golden eyes. They were truly big and beautiful. Uh, mm, shin nim. Hello, Loretta. You you, you you pretend you didn't hear what I said. That would depend on Loretta's reception. Come in. The inside of the cabin was exceedingly normal. Although the living room was too small to even be called a living room, it was extremely clean. Other than a teacup on a table, there was nothing inside that seemed like decorations. I could see two rooms, but they couldn't have been big considering the size of the cabin from the outside. Unlike the grandiose title of Fairy Garden's master, the house was humble. Loretta was the only special part about it. Perhaps realizing that I was staring at her, Loretta blinked her big eyes and asked. Um, do I look that different? Loretta from the floor shop was an extremely lively girl. However, other than her voice, Loretta's real self did not share any similarities with the Loretta I knew. The Loretta I was looking at right now was a beauty exuding nobility and elegance. And no, that's. She was an incredibly beautiful elf with snow-white skin, and was tall enough to look me in the eye. Considering that my height was over 190 centimeters, she was also just as tall. However, her perfect body proportions did not make her height stand out. In fact, it added to her mystical appearance. Her slender waist, her arms, her legs, and her voluptuous chest all seemed to suggest that she wasn't human. After all, a human couldn't have a figure of such proportions. Her big, golden eyes, shapely nose, and pink-colored full lips made her look like a piece of art. Her flushed cheeks made her look healthy, and her long ears added a magical charm to her otherworldly atmosphere. Her long, soft black hair flowed down to her waist, tied loosely by a ribbon, revealing its abundance. She looked like she just woke up, as she was wearing a see-through nightgown. Because of it, I didn't know where to direct my gaze. Her figure was shown fully, and her half-opened gown revealed her UU. El Loretta, can you wear some proper clothes? Yes. Kayak. After hearing what I said, Loretta looked down at herself and screamed. She then hastily ran into her room. Before I could talk with her, wearing her usual clothes, a bit more time had to pass. I, I apologize, Shin Nim. I've shown you a shameful sight. No, not at all. In fact, I would have wanted to see more of Hike. That will be ten million gold, customer. Sorry. Because she had an incredibly embarrassed expression, I had no choice but to apologize. The reason I invited Shin Nim to this place is. 
Like I said, I'm sorry. The reason I invited Shin Nim to this place is. Loretta didn't seem to want to accept my apology, as she continued without facing me. I was at a loss for what to do. Although she looked completely different on the outside, because the way she acted was the same, I couldn't help but smile as I watched her. As you know, it will be convenient to find a place to stay in the dungeon's residential area. At the residential area, you can sell equipment or consumables, or buy items you need from other explorers. There are places where you can relieve fatigue built up from the dungeon as well. She picked up the teacup in front of her and took a sip. Although she looked graceful, her head was still turned away from me. She was very cute. Although Shin Nim had no problem climbing alone thus far, it won't stay like that forever. There is no place like the residential area to get closer to other world's explorers. When you make friends here, even though you might not party with them as you climb the dungeon, they might invite you to event dungeons or raids, or vice versa. I see. But Shin Nim should know, if you entered the mansion. Unless Shin Nim gets authorized using a mana stone, Shin Nim cannot freely go back and forth between the dungeon and the residential area. Right. But finding a mana stone that's suitable for a special mansion like Mariana's garden probably will not be possible for a while. So. Loretta hesitated slightly, then continued. So if Shin Nim is okay with it, I'd like to invite Shin Nim as Fairy Garden's temporary guild member. Yes. Temporary guild member. She faced me. From the front, her explosive beauty came into view once again and made me flustered. Pointy ears, thin facial lines, a sharp nose and long neck. Such features made her look non-human, but they only added to her charm. Her sparkling golden eyes shone as if something was lighting it up from inside. I felt like staring into it would suck me in. A temporary guild member is Shin Nim. Ah, uh, yeah. Continue your explanation. Hoo hoo. Loretta's expression became slightly haughty. Damn, this elf found out. Why were you staring at me so fixedly, Shin Nim? It's nothing, nothing at all. Hong Hoo Hoo. Why were you looking at me so much? Why? Loretta's eyes darted around my face as she spoke with a humming voice. Even if you do that, I won't tell you honestly. Saying that I was too enchanted by her beautiful eyes unless I wanted to confess to her and get rejected, I couldn't say it out loud. She continued making fun of me, trying to get me to confess, but because she lost her mystical beauty the more she did so, I was able to regain my composure. Eventually, she clicked her tongue and continued. A temporary guild member isn't anything special. It's just someone who's registered with Fairy Garden's guild area and can thus stay here. Ah, uh, so that's why. Yes. Although you can't become a full-fledged guild member because of your status as an explorer, it can at least help you go back and forth between the dungeon and the mansion since Shin Nim cannot get authorized for now. Of course, it won't be for free. In exchange for becoming a temporary guild member, Shin Nim will have to help with the paperwork of Fairy Garden's master. M.M. But Loretta. Loretta stopped her explanation in the middle and blinked her eyes as she looked at me. Since she already looked so excited to put me to work, I delivered the fatal blow. I already got authorized. For Marianas Garden. Yes. I got authorized. There was an event raid on Earth. I got the entire corpse of an event raid boss, and it had a mana stone. Ah is that so? Loretta's shoulders drooped. I didn't know for sure, but her long ears seemed to have drooped as well. With a slightly disappointed expression, she spoke. Then, that's good. Yep, it's good stupid Shin Nim. I definitely heard it. She called me stupid. It wasn't like obtaining a mana stone was my fault. I answered Loretta with a bitter smile. You must have a lot of work to do. So much that you need an assistant. No, that was just a pre-10 ah, uh, nothing. Yeah, I have lots. There's not much I can do if you're busy with work, but if you have time, come visit my mansion. I haven't even looked around it yet, but I'm sure there's at least a tea house where Loretta and I can drink tea. Loretta's ears perked up. As she blinked her golden eyes, she asked. I can go visit. T then can you add me to your friend list? 
That's possible. I shot up from my seat in surprise. Loretta covered her mouth with her hands and snickered. Of course. We also belong to the dungeon. Really, what exactly is Loretta's identity? That's a secret, for now. But I hope I can tell you one day. Will you? At my question, Loretta smiled lightly and nodded her head. Placing her index finger on my mouth, she quietly whispered. Although her fingers were tickling me, I couldn't open my mouth. Her golden eyes, which seemed to suck me in, were staring right at me. One day, to you only. ITLL be a secret to anyone else. I left Loretta's log cabin. Loretta saw me off at the door. Take care, Shin Nim. Make sure to answer me when I message you. Don't worry. I'm off then. Ah, uh, um, Shin Nim. When I was about to turn away, Loretta stopped me. She held both of my hands, while her eyes wandered around me without being able to look at me directly. My real appearance. Is it strange? You're saying that now? B but you didn't say it properly before. She really was a cute Nuna. For someone who had a noble charm on top of incredible beauty, she really should be more confident in herself. I thought she knew that by the way she acted, but I didn't think she'd waver all the way at the end. Of course, I felt that this made her even more charming. As such, I decided to tell her how I felt without a hint of deceit. Not at all. You're incredibly beautiful. I was almost entranced. Hick. Loretta made a strange sound and plunked down on the ground. Girls really were weak to compliments. At her picture-like reaction, I snickered and turned away. I'm going. Message me. Why yes. I'll message you, I'll definitely message you. Even tomorrow. I thought you were busy I should call Pika too eh? Strange. When I tried to pass on my intent through our mental connection, it was severed in the middle. Thinking our contract had been severed, my heart skipped a beat, but that wasn't it. The contract was still there. What was wrong? Why couldn't I communicate with her? When I tried to unsummon her in confusion, a series of messages rang out in my ear. Your contracted elemental, Pika, and the fairies she was playing with discovered a hidden area of fairy garden. An event dungeon, Frozen Elemental's prison, has been created. As it was discovered by a contracted elemental, the contracted master will automatically receive the right to enter the dungeon. Would you like to enter the dungeon? This dungeon can only be entered by you. A quest has appeared. Quest save the contracted elemental. Description while playing with the fairies and elementals at your request, your contracted elemental opened the entrance to Fairy Garden's sealed hidden area, almost as if guided by fate. The moment the hidden area was opened, the contracted elemental was sucked into the hidden area along with other fairies and elementals. Quickly save her. Otherwise, the mad ice elemental may freeze your elemental along with the other elementals and fairies. What? Chapter, 75 Cold Protection Robe, Return Magic Scroll, Flame Enchant Magic Scroll No, I don't need a Return Magic Scroll. I already have the return skill. Loretta, who began to take out all sorts of items seemingly out of nowhere, put away the return magic scroll after hearing what I said. Although I was watching her with my own eyes, I couldn't see where she put away the scroll. Looking over the items she picked out, she nodded her head, then shook it again. She then took out a book and a small chest from the pile. You said you had a crossbow, right? This is crossbow marksmanship. This item is sold starting from the 30th floor, and if you learn crossbow marksmanship with this skill book, it will be easier to shoot down any enemies. This is flame bolt cartridge. The bolts placed inside it receive the fire attribute and explode when they collide with something this is a limited item sold from the 47th floor and above. And only to those who completed a particular achievement, so make sure you keep it a secret from others. Remember, it's a secret. It turns out that floor master battle vouchers and party member scarecrows that I'd been buying were also items only those who completed a particular achievement could buy. Although I had the qualifications to buy them, it seemed I had stretched it a bit when I let Ren purchase them. Though, Ren also obtained the qualifications after succeeding in a solo raid. I understand. So, 
How much is it for the cold protection robe and the flame enchant magic scroll? Yes, it's 600 no, 450,000 gold. It was an enormous discount. Although I sent Loretta an inquisitive, will that be fine? Glance, she simply held out her hands, asking me for my money. In the end, Loretta was helping me in various ways. Here, 450,000 gold. Yes, thank you for the purchase, customer. Loretta, can you really sell them for this price? Shin Nim, this place is my area, where no prying eyes can reach. Plus, if the hidden area that just opened is what I think it is, it really is a dangerous place that I'd love to prevent you from going to. If it's just this much, I'm sure the oldie, I mean, Lord, would allow it too. Although I felt a little uneasy, I decided to accept her help. Pika was in danger. I didn't have time to loiter around. I first learned the crossbow marksmanship skill. You learned crossbow marksmanship. You can properly handle crossbows to damage the enemy. As the skill level increases, your aim and critical hit rate will increase. Shin Nim, if things get difficult, you have to find Elemental Nim and use Return. If Shin Nim dies, it will be the same thing as Shin Nim's vitality becoming zero, but the Elemental Nim won't be unsummoned and will completely perish. Loretta warned me as I put on the cold protection robe. As her golden eyes staring at me emphasized the seriousness of her words, I could only nod my head. Be careful. A crazed elemental is extremely dangerous. Although I wasn't present at the time, even the fairy garden's elementalist didn't have the confidence to subdue the crazed elemental without killing her. And could only seal her in that place even Shin Nim might not be strong enough to do anything against her. Remember, if Shin Nim's vitality becomes zero, elemental Nim will perish. I know. I don't want to lose Pika either. Im off, then. Come back safely with Elemental Nim. And. I poured the skeleton bone bolts first into the cartridge I just bought and then put them all in my inventory. As long as there were bolts in my inventory, my crossbow would automatically reload itself. When I finished checking over my equipment and raised my head, Loretta was almost right in front of my face. Seeing her frighteningly perfect face up close, my body became stiff on its own. A pathetic sound came out of my mouth. H. Hook. D. Don't misunderstand, okay? Don't misunderstand. With that, she placed her hand on my left cheek, and pressed her lips against my other cheek. You received the Queen Elf's blessing. For the next five hours, you receive the following effects, you are protected against all low-rank and mid-rank status effects. You can maintain your consciousness for five minutes after falling into a half-dead state. Your luck increases by 100. All members of the fairy race will see you favorably. WWWWW. Be blessing, it's a blessing. I gave you a blessing to wish you safe return. So don't misunderstand. Loretta's cheeks became bright red. However, she couldn't be redder than me who had just gotten kissed. I could feel my cheeks burning, and I was frozen stiff as if Loretta's silvery fragrance consumed my body. Just when I was thinking I might suffocate from being unable to let out my breath, I barely managed to exhale. Queen Elf it said you were married. Second bullet of destruction. Kahak. With a burning sensation in my stomach, I collapsed. I'm still a young maiden. Queen just refers to my status. How can Shin Nim say that to me? Why you could have just said that? Shin Nim. Shin Nim Shin Nim. My vitality almost became zero before I could even go to Pika's rescue. You entered an event dungeon. The moment I entered the event dungeon, a tremendous cold swept over me. Even with the cold protection robe, the chill that reached my skin seemed to want to rip me to pieces. Coo, it's so cold here is this a snow field? How could the warm fairy garden have an area this cold? I took out my spear and gasped as I felt the metallic handle of my spear turn cold. I could feel the chill even through my gauntlet. I should use flame enchant first. When I brought the flame enchant scroll I bought from Loretta to the black earthen spear, the scroll instantly burned up, and, at the same time, made my spear glow with a reddish aura. I could feel the heat emanating off from it. With the warmth coming from the spear, I felt much better. 
By rubbing my cheeks on the spear shaft, I could forget the cold for a moment. With my improved condition from flame enchant, I tightly grabbed the spear with my hands and looked around. There was snow as far as my eyes could see, and the trees that I saw here and there had snow flowers instead of leaves. Although I was worried about Pika and wanted to hurry, I knew rushing things would only make it worse. I closed my eyes and focused. Thankfully, after I came into this space, the connection between Pika and me had re-established itself. However, I still couldn't unsummon her or recall her. Pika, can you hear me? Master. You came to find me. Phew. It seemed she was okay. Feeling relieved, I asked. How's the situation? Are you in danger? It's so cold. I'm fine, but the kids I came with might freeze to death. Master, hurry up. You didn't meet any other elementals. Um, um. No, but I found lots of strange monsters. Be careful, master. Strange monsters. When I opened my mouth to ask her for more details, I felt a bone-chilling feeling and rolled forward. Tui. Arg, snow. Kuhung. As I complained while spitting out the snow that had gotten in my mouth, someone, or something, had replied. To secure my safety, I first rolled forward once more before I got up and turned around. There, an almost three meter tall humanoid monster was looking down on me. Its entire body was covered with white fur, while a small horn protruded from its head. Kau. HM, you're quite big. I casually complimented it and strengthened my grip on my spear. If it was a sociable creature, I hoped it would become bashful and compliment my helmet or spear. Unfortunately, it swung its black claws, the only non-white part of its body, towards me. Kuhong. Kuwang. Although I had expected as much, there really was another one. At the same time the one facing me attacked me, the other monster suddenly popped up behind me, aiming for my back. Without a shred of hesitation, I charged towards the one I was facing. Although I normally would have spent more time to feel it out, I was currently facing two mysterious enemies. I had to take care of one first. Ha! Kuhak! The heroic strike, which I thrust out with a spirited shout, drew a trajectory of white light as it pierced through the monster's neck. Because of flame enchant, the moment the spear went into its neck, its whole body burned up in flames. As they were monsters living in the snowy fields, it seemed fire damage was especially effective against them. The heroic strike just now took about 15% of my HP and MP, but managed to finish the monster off. If that was the case, I could fight the remaining monster without having to use heroic strike. Kuhong. Hugh Hap. Right now, I didn't have Pika, nor could I call upon other elementals. In short, I couldn't use my power as an elementalist. I had to rely on my spearmanship and martial arts techniques. However, I became more spirited the more dangerous the situation was. A few strands of my hair left unprotected by the cover of my robe froze. With this, I found out the monster's attacks had the power to freeze its opponent. I lowered my posture and charged towards it. It seemed to be wary of my spear, as it backed away, but it was too slow. By the time it found a weakness in its defense, my spear was already cutting off its left arm. Ka. About a third of its arm became severed, dripping blue blood on the snowy field, which instantly froze. For an instant, I doubted my eyes. It wasn't because the snow was cold. It was its blood's low temperature that caused it to crystallize. In other words, I had to be wary of its blood as well. Just what are these things? Hap. In my eyes, the damage I might take from the cold was more dangerous than direct attacks. Especially its left arm that kept spewing out blue blood, it was the most annoying thing to deal with. I had to completely sever it and use the flame energy in my spear to scorch it. So that's exactly what I did. Kia. The spear I thrust out with an ample amount of mana made its left arm drop on the ground, which then disappeared into particles. I held my spear a bit closer to the tip and charged towards it, hitting away the fluttering droplets of blood. Then, I smacked the severed area of its left arm with my spear. Kayak. Die. 
I heard the sizzle of my spearhead scorching its wound. It made me a bit hungry. It even smelled nice. Hook, I can't. Cool. Using its cry as a background music, I heightened my concentration and managed to completely scorch its wound. Using the moment where it stumbled after losing its arm, I shot my spear forward. As if my spear was being sucked in, it stabbed at the monster's neck and managed to deal damage by penetrating its thick skin. Who, you're almost dead. After five minutes of carefully stabbing its neck, I managed to completely pierce through its neck. With a strange roaring sound, the monster collapsed. You obtained Yeti's blood. You obtained 5,500 gold. Hugh so this guy is a Yeti. Yeti. Although my fight with them had ended, the fight wasn't perfectly clean, nor was it satisfying. I was in my worst condition and my opponents were the worst as well. The Yeti's entire body and blood were weapons, and they even had high defense. Not to mention, the snowy field environment and its harsh, cold winds made it hard for me to even open my eyes and maintain my balance. My feet also kept sinking into the snow. The moment I lost my focus, I could receive a fatal blow. This was truly the worst environment for battle. However, it also was the best place to grow myself. I was in similar situations when I was training with father as well. The sense of accomplishment was higher the harsher the environment was for practicing martial arts. Yup, I d think of this as training. Otherwise, I wouldn't have the will to continue on in this place. Alright let's go. After resolving myself, I stepped forward, holding my warm black earthen spear in my embrace. The connection between Pika and me was telling me where to go. However there was something strange. What is it? Besides Pika, there's another. In the same direction Pika was in, something that wasn't Pika seemed to be calling me. Something connected to me by a deep bond, something that had to be with me. Led on by the unknown calling, I walked onward with a small suspicion in my heart. I knew the answer to my suspicion would be at the end of this snowy plain. Chapter, 76 Kuhong Hap About twenty minutes after that. While walking through this harsh event dungeon, there was one important thing I learned. It was that rather than using five minutes to fight with the yetis, it was better to use heroic strike to kill it in one blow, then recover my mana while walking with Peruta circuit. As strong as the yetis were, they didn't appear all too often. However, when they did, they would never appear alone. Regardless, if I used heroic strike to kill the yetis I encountered, I found that I would not encounter more until my mana was already filled up. In addition, as Peruta circuit took in mana from the atmosphere and circulated it inside me, I was less affected by the surrounding temperature. In order to block the cold that even the cold protection robe could not fully guard against, I desperately circulated Peruta circuit. Peruta circuit became level 5. Circulating Peruta circuit will collect more mana, and its speed of circulation increases. Ooh. My theory that training was best done in desperate situations was proven to be true. Slightly frustrated, but happy, I continued to frantically circulate Peruta circuit. In my hand was a crossbow. Since Pika wasn't around to deal long-ranged attacks, I had to use the crossbow to fill her role. At the same time, I saw a yeti standing in the distance. Kia. Alright, I might as well train my crossbow marksmanship skill. I was practically overflowing with skeleton bones, and the yeti's large body was the perfect practice target. I held the crossbow up and aimed it at its eye. The crossbow reloaded automatically and shot out, emanating a red aura. It hit the yeti's arm and exploded. My aim had been off. This is hard. They'll have to learn how to aim better. That said, as the weapon, dropped by a thirtieth floor named Monster, and the flame bolt cartridge were both the highest ranked items I owned, the damage they dealt was certainly higher than the swing of my spears. Although the damage couldn't compare to when I focused and stabbed with my spear, the yeti would undoubtedly hit me if I tried. After finding out that the bolt worked on the yetis, I opened my inventory and counted the number of bolts in the cartridge. It seemed the cartridge had a space expansion magic as it fit all 1577 of the bone bolts. Eat this and die. I instantly started to infinitely shoot with my silver bone crossbow. 
the bone bolts flew out with close to no delay in between each shot, and exploded on the Yeti, who was unable to dodge them. Feeling the continuous recoil as the bolts flew out, I felt like I was using a machine gun. This weapon was even better than I thought. Low rank crossbow marksmanship became level 2. Your precision and critical hit chance increase. Ooh, skill level rose too. Dangerous. I was about to forget about my original goal and just keep shooting arrows. The Yeti, whose fur was scorched and bled profusely, let out an enraged roar as it charged at me. On its way, it woke up two more Yetis. These Yetis really were never alone. I don't think I can kill you with just the crossbow yet but your friends can take some bolts too. I held up my crossbow. No matter how strong they were or how they had the power to freeze their opponents, that didn't change the fact that they were still living creatures. It seemed easy to take care of the one bleeding profusely, especially since the bolt's fire attribute scorched its leather, making it easy for arrows to pierce through. This must have been why Loretta sold me the flame bolt cartridge. You obtained Yeti's horn. You obtained 5,800 gold. These guys sure drop various items. Yeti's blood, Yeti's leather, Yeti's horn. These were the three items the Yetis dropped after they were killed. Thinking they couldn't be just trash items, I checked their descriptions, which only labeled them as materials. For now, I decided to hold on to them. Master, it's getting colder. I feel like something is getting closer. I'm almost there, Pika. Wait just a bit more. I quickened my pace. With my crossbow in hand, I stayed ready to attack. Not to brag, but I was a quick learner when it came to things that used my body. After a few battles with the crossbow, I was beginning to understand how to aim to properly hit my targets. The skill level also easily rose to low rank level 3. Cool, it really is getting colder damn, and this strange feeling is getting stronger too. Something was calling me, looking for me desperately. But almost as if something was blocking our communication, the link between us was cut. Even I was getting more and more annoyed. Guang. Shut it. Just when I wanted to cry, a yeti popped up and attacked me with its claws. I shot two bolts, hitting its left eye and mouth perfectly. The yeti fell and twitched in pain. I didn't understand. My attacks with level 3 low rank crossbow marksmanship were this strong but why were the archers I met all so weak? Was it the difference in the quality of our weapons? Silver Bone Crossbow It was a much better weapon than I initially thought. The fact that it reloaded automatically made it no different than an automatic rifle. Go back. I hear it. It was the voice of an elemental. I quickened my pace. The wind got harsher, and less and less yetis appeared. Before I noticed, Two hours had passed since I entered the dungeon. I wanted to find Pika and quickly go home. Master, it's an elemental. An elemental appeared. Damn it. Talaria. You summon Talaria. For the next ten minutes, you can freely fly or walk on air. If flying, you will receive an additional 100% increase to your movement speed. Remaining time, 9 hours 59 minutes 99 seconds. Although I didn't want to use it because it might freeze me to death, I had no choice now that Pika was in danger. After using Talaria and flying into the air, I flew as fast as possible in the direction of Pika. The wind blew against my face and tried to pick apart my nose and ears, but I withstood it and went on. I had the cold protection robe and was embracing the black earthen spear. With the added warmth from Queen Elf's blessing, I could somewhat manage. Sha. Not only elementals, but even a human has come in. This place is the frozen elementals prison. It's not a place a human can enter. How far did I fly? Crystals of ice that had started appearing in the air talked to me as they crashed into me. Although my HP didn't go down by much, the places in my cold protection robe where the ice crystals crashed became white and frozen. Elementals, these crystals were elementals. Listen to me. I have to save my elemental. Elementalist. Don't listen to him. His words are too sweet. Don't listen, don't listen. Don't attack me. I have no intention of attacking elementals. I like him. 
I said don't listen. Thankfully, Loretta's blessing helped one of the elementals quickly come to my side. I carefully touched the ice crystal that came near my hand. Perhaps because it was no longer hostile towards me, I didn't feel cold from touching it. He's warm. I feel like I'm melting. He's from the outside. The traitor's bloodline. I don't know what you mean by traitor, but I'm not him. Please, everyone, stop attacking. If I don't attack you, will you get me out of here? Yes, I will. As long as you don't hurt others. I won't. I won't hurt anyone. He's going to betray us. Just like everyone else has in the past. But he isn't them. I didn't really care. Even as they talked amongst themselves, I was flying through the air as fast as I could. Before I noticed, another ice crystal came next to me. Although more ice crystals appeared in my surroundings, none of them blindly attacked me like before. This person is an elementalist, a person who cares for elementals. The person who trapped that child was also an elementalist. He had no qualification. He had no qualification. He was the one at fault, but he trapped that child here with the rest of us. He locked the door so no one can come in. But why did the door open? I found her. Pika. Master. Master. After seeing me, Pika let out shouts of joy. However, I couldn't be entirely happy. Although Pika was unhurt, there were fairies and elementals hiding behind her, who were shaking because of the harsh environment. Not to mention, Pika was currently fighting something. Because my mana wasn't being drained, it had taken me a while to notice. So that was it. This place was the spirit realm, a place where Pika could freely use mana without having to rely on my own. Although Pika's lightning ripped apart the freezing winds, a breath mixed with ice equally blocked her lightning from continuing. The enemy was strong. I can't do it alone, master. Wait. I instantly descended to her location. At the same time, the thing that was attacking Pika with its breath looked back at me. My heart dropped for a moment. A body bigger than humans, mane that let out silver light, a face that frowned as if it was in pain, and crimson madness that ruled its eyes. A crazed elemental. That silver wolf was the owner of this space and the core of the ceiling, a crazed elemental. It was an elemental that had developed enough to materialize. Even Pika couldn't materialize yet. Pika, come here. No, I have to protect these children. Guys, can you help me? They're elementals just like you, and fairies who are also of the same race. Can you protect them? The fairies only watched us as we were sealed. The elementals thoughtlessly flew around the fairy garden. But they're still our kind. I don't like you, but I will help them. While a few of the ice crystals sparkled and flew toward the fairies and elementals, I landed next to Pika. As Talaria was still active, my feet weren't buried under the snow. Rather, they were standing on the air above the snow. K.R.R. I see, you're a special elemental. Just like Pika. There were elementals with special powers, elementals who were acknowledged as unique, permitted eternal life, and given the ability to grow. Although elementalists wanted to form contracts with such elementals, the rule that they could only form contracts with elementals their souls were connected to was always valid. Just because they discovered a special elemental, it didn't mean they could form contracts with them. Even so, there were elementalists that employed all sorts of different methods to try and form contracts with them. Not one of them managed to succeed throughout long history of elementalists, and everyone knew what would happen to the elementals when they failed. They would always go mad. Although it was the elementalists that were at fault, the elementals paid the price. It was unfair. K.R.R. Looking at the wolf crouching as it revealed its silver teeth, I pulled out my spear. The ice crystals then flew toward me. Will you kill this poor child? Don't. You can't kill this child. It's dangerous. It'll protect you. Don't worry. I'm just going to play with it until it regains its sanity. I confidently proclaimed my intention to the ice crystals and aimed my spear at the wolf. I didn't like punishment. It was the same for my father. Although he had thrown me into all sorts of dangerous situations, 
he had never beaten in mercilessly. Although he had almost killed me during our spars, he had never beaten me because I did something wrong. As such, I never forgot father's teaching method, because I vowed to get my revenge on him the same way. That said, it was true that beating was the best medicine for the crazy. K.R.R. Kwang. All right, come. I'll play with you until you're satisfied. Pika, assist me. Ice Elementals, you guys help me too. Okay, master. I'm going to trust him. If you kill that child, I will kill you. At the same time the elementals gathered around me, Pika floated into the air and shot out lightning with her body. She opened her folding fan and covered her mouth. Her black hair fluttering in the wind was incredibly beautiful. You better get ready, you mutt. What should we do? Simple. Just protect me from the freezing energy. We aren't strong enough. It'll give you strength. I popped open a mana potion. Because the liquid inside started to freeze, I quickly gulped it down. I ended up drinking a slushy it was actually quite tasty. I closed my eyes and shared my mana with the elementals around me. Elemental control. It was the skill necessary for me to use Elemental Tempest, and also allowed an Elementalist without his contracted Elemental to use an Elementalist's abilities. It allowed me to employ free Elementals that existed in the world in exchange for my mana. I'm getting stronger. How mystical, he's an amazing Elementalist. He's a hero. He's a hero. Goo. Master, it's coming. I'm ready. I gripped my spear tightly. Thanks to flame enchant, the flame energy coming from the black earthen spear seemed to be heating up my entire body. I continued with this vigor, and shouted out. Let's start by beating you once. Chapter, 77 The spear I thrust out vigorously missed its mark rather simply. I could only confirm that the elemental was extremely fast. After dodging my spear thrust, the elemental opened its mouth and exhaled freezing energy. I'll leave it to you guys. We can block it. It's possible now. It seemed to want to make me back off, but with the protection of dozens of ice elementals, I charged forward. Then, I thrust my spear at the elemental's open mouth. Kia. Kook. Block. Even if it was materialized, as it was a spiritual being, it seemed it had no problem using its ability with a mouth injury. Even though blue blood flowed down from its mouth, the freezing energy from its breath got stronger and swept over me, past the protection of the ice elementals. However, Pika came to help before I was turned into an ice statue. Thunder Arrow Kia Pika's lightning arrows struck the elemental wolf's body. The crazed elemental was an ice elemental, which had a base property of water. Pika, who controlled lightning, was naturally stronger against its element. Even if her strength was weaker than a crazed elemental, she could still deal a great amount of damage. Meanwhile, I took out my crossbow and shot my bolts out consecutively. When they hit its mouth, they exploded, causing it to stagger backwards. Strong. Lightning elemental is so pretty. I want to make her my bride. Stop chattering and protect me properly. With my low rank crossbow marksmanship, I couldn't deal a fatal blow. After shooting out a round of bolts, I hung the crossbow back on my waist, and pouring bountiful mana into my black earthen spear, I thrust forward with its extended spear blade. Receiving Pika's endless lightning arrows and my spear thrust at the same time, the crazed elemental's eyes burned even redder. Human elemental. Eh. The sudden voice made my heart thump. In the brief moment that my attack became loose, the elemental pounced on me. Its sharp teeth shone with a silver light. Ah, it's dangerous. We can't block physical attacks. Run. Kook. Dragon skin ah, I already used it. Something was wrong. I couldn't move my body properly. My body wouldn't listen to my commands. Unfortunately, I had already used Orc Lord's war cry, dragon skin, and dark thunder explosion in the three boss raids I ran today. As such, there wasn't much I could do. I urgently poured as much mana as I could into the elementals protecting me, strengthening them. 
The light shining from the elementals became brighter and an armor of ice covered the armor I was already wearing. You mastered low rank spirit aura. You can infuse elementals into your defensive equipment, not just your weapon, granting a reinforcing aura. You learned mid rank spirit aura. Your spirit aura will be reinforced by a strengthened attribute of your elemental. While using spirit aura, the elementalist will be able to wield low rank elemental magic. I shouted out instinctively. Ice shackles. Kwong. The crazed elemental froze while bearing its fangs at me. From the earth, several hands made of ice had popped up and stopped her movements. Of course, as it was low rank elemental magic, it would not last long. You, do you like judo? You do. Got it. Kwong. Helmet, boots, armor, gauntlet. The ice elementals had dyed my equipment white. I reached forward with my gauntlet, which could now freeze people by just glazing them, and grabbed its front leg. At the same time, the crazed elemental broke out of the ice shackles. I jumped toward it and threw it on the ground. Kwang. Now, thunder spear. Pika's sharp scream created a two-meter-long thick lightning. Without a shred of hesitation, Pika threw the lightning at the elemental that I had thrown down. Kwang. With a roar, it let out an enormous amount of freezing energy from its body. The ice elementals that were infused in my armor screamed. Too cold. I feel like you'll perish. I gritted my teeth and poured more mana into them. However, my mana had reached its limit as well. Damn, did I have to run away using Teleria? However, just when I was thinking that, Teleria had become unsummoned. I was in danger. Since it's come to this, I can use Die Hard and. Bracing myself for my HP falling below 3%, I tightly gripped my spear and circulated Peruta circuit to give the elementals some mana. It was then that the lights emitted by the ice elementals became brighter and my HP, which was falling from the freezing energy, stopped. You mastered low rank elemental control. All elementals in existence will see you in favorable light and will listen to you well. You learned mid rank elemental control. It becomes easier to draw out the potential of your contracted elemental. You can more easily control free elementals. Leave it to me, master. Above my head, Pika let out a radiant light. I could feel her presence growing, and even the crazed elemental stopped attacking for a moment. A change I had not expected was happening. Unable to resist, I looked up. As my heart beat faster, I could tell she had gone through a qualitative change. Golden crystals floated down from the sky like snow, while Pika slowly floated above the earth. Pika had succeeded in materializing. You mastered low rank elemental contract. You can draw out more of your contracted elemental's original power. You learned mid rank elemental contract. Your contracted elementals with the ability to materialize can do so, but use more mana while materialized. The strength of all skills that use elementals increases greatly. The number of elementals you can form a contract with increases by one. You dare try to make my master into an ice statue, you're going to get a beating, you doggy. The folding fan she always held in her hand had transformed into a lightning whip. Pika, who had materialized as a girl about ten years old, swung the whip down at the elemental. Like a lightning bolt, the whip cut through the air and slashed the elemental's abdomen. In that instant, a voice rang out. It hurts. Wait. I yelled hurriedly. Pika looked back at me with a curiously. Unlike her normal 20 centimeter self, she looked much more charming after having materialized as a human girl. However, now wasn't the time to admire her looks. I urgently ran in front of Pika and checked the elemental's appearance. Its eyes were still dyed red, but I had not misheard it. That was a young girl's voice. You, did you say that? It hurts. It hurts, it hurts. The elemental shot up and pounced on me. I raised my hand and stopped Pika from lashing out with her whip again. With our strengthened contract, Pika understood what I was thinking. I concentrated the ice elementals in my gauntlet and reached forward to the elemental. The elemental then opened its mouth and chomped down on my gauntlet. Kayak, it hurts. What are you doing? We protected you. 
Why are you trying to kill us, Elementalist? Calm down, no one is going to die. All right, look at me. It hurts. It'll make it stop hurting, so look at me. At first, I wanted to beat the Elemental until it snapped out of its madness. If it didn't, I would have had no choice but to kill it. But now, things were a bit different. I had finally found the answer. After Pika materialized and I obtained mid-rank elemental contract, things became much clearer. This child was an elemental that could form a contract with me. I had felt it. When I had first entered this place, a feeling like something was calling out to me. The voice of an elemental before I reached Pika. Above all, this strong link connecting me with this elemental. You won't hurt me anymore. I want. Calm down, and look at me. Queen Elf's blessing was extremely effective. With just my strength alone, I doubted I could calm this elemental. Now that it was exhausted, my power as an elementalist and Loretta's blessing could suppress its madness. Everyone is a liar. You're a liar, too. I'm not lying. The wolf's mouth slowly opened up, and I took out my gauntlet from inside. It was crushed, making me want to take it to be repaired, but I ignored it for now. Instead, I slowly placed my hand on her head. Although the elemental growled as if she would go berserk again, her red eyes were slowly getting lighter. He tried to tie me against my will. I want. I don't need to do it forcefully. He abandoned me and sealed me. I want. You don't have to be sealed anymore. I slowly rubbed her head, and the elemental became calmer. The ice elementals, on the other hand, chattered loudly. Is this elementalist her partner? Wow. That's why he could enter this place. Their wavelengths matched. It's been a while since I've seen an elementalist, but it's one that can form contracts with two elementals amazing. Um, I want to beat her more. I ignored the ice elementals, along with Pika who was murmuring disappointedly. Warm are you my contractor? Sorry for making you wait so long. Ah uh, my consciousness is coming back. Letting out a low growl, she approached me. Although Pika stepped forward slightly tensely, I didn't think it would be necessary. The red aura in her eyes had disappeared, and was replaced with light blue eyes like the color of the winter sky. I remembered my name. Imriwe. Daughter of ice and snow, Ryue. You got your name back. That's great. When elementals went mad, they would first lose their names. Then, no one would be able to remember their names. The moment they strayed off the spirit realm's order, they would lose the guide that ascertained their identities. However, she had just recovered her name. By meeting me, her contractor, she had escaped the madness. I spoke, relieved. Im Kong Shin. Ryue, will you form a contract with me? We can get out of here together. Really? You'll form a contract with me? I want to get out I want to be with warmth. I want to be with Kong Shin. Come with me. We can be together, forever. Let's form a contract. Okay. Let's form a contract. Then, just like always, a fanfare rang out. You formed a contract with the Ice Elemental Ryue. Your affinity and resistance to the Ice Element greatly increases. List of Contracted Elementals 1. Pika Lightning Elemental Unique Elemental Materialized Locked First Awakening 2. Ryue Ice Elemental Unique Elemental Materialized Locked First Awakening Mid-rank elemental contract became level 2. The amount of mana required to maintain two elemental summons decreases. Mid-rank spirit mastery became level 4. The abilities of all souls connected to you grow stronger. Quest success. You obtained one skill point. Current skill points, 11. Event dungeon clear. You satisfied and even shocked the fairy garden's fairies who hate hurting elementals, by completely resolving their conflict. You obtained three bonus stat points. I completed the quest and also cleared the event dungeon. Although I didn't receive a reward for killing the boss, it was fine. After all, I obtained the boss herself. 
looking at the scenery melting down around me, I tightly hugged Ryue in my embrace. Ryue also closed her eyes and buried her face in my embrace. I slowly rubbed her fur, and suddenly realized something. The freezing energy that seemed to want to devour me was no longer cold. Chapter, 78 PFT Did you climb the Himalayas or something? As soon as I returned, Loretta's snickering greeted me. Setting aside how Loretta knew about the Himalayas, I sullenly turned my back to her. I'm going. Ah, uh, wait. I'm sorry, wait. I'll wipe your hair. Loretta quickly took out a towel, took off my hood, and wiped my hair that was hanging like icicles off the eaves. In the process of her wiping my hair, her body naturally grew closer to my own. In order to ignore the flowery fragrance tickling my nose, I frantically sang the national anthem in my head. Hugh there, all done. After she finished wiping my head, Loretta backed off with a slightly flushed face. Her breathing was a bit rough too. Just how little did she move, that this much exercise made her gasp for breath. She seemed to hesitate in that state, then asked me carefully. Why you'll catch a cold would you like to come in? You'll feel better once you take a warm bath. I can get you a change of clothes. Ah uh, that's. Something felt strange. Although I couldn't explain it, I felt like I shouldn't do as she suggested. Even though there couldn't be anything dangerous in her house, I felt my body was in danger. With a worrying feeling that something I had been protecting would be lost, I shook my head. No, I'm fine. I might as well take this opportunity to check out my house. I'll return to the dungeon afterwards. It can't be helped then tisk. Loretta clicked her tongue. It was very scary. Putting the towel back in her bosom, she changed the subject and spoke with a brighter expression. Congratulations on forming a contract with a new elemental. I didn't even imagine that the elemental would have matching wavelengths with Shin Nim. Do you know what happened to the elementalist that made Ryue go mad? This was something I wanted to confirm for certain. Even if it wasn't now, I wanted to make him pay for it somehow. He was the elementalist who was an owner of one of the other special mansions. He obtained the qualification to enter Fairy Garden from a quest reward, but he was punished for making an elemental go mad, losing his qualification to be a dungeon explorer. The answer was something I didn't even consider. This was the first time I heard one could lose his qualification as a dungeon explorer. I asked again. Then. He died. Along with him, his world completely fell to ruin. Because Loretta's voice was too light, I felt fear from it. It was different than when Ellos was talking about his lost comrade. Loretta's voice was completely emotionless, as if what she described was completely normal. Something that she had seen many times, something that was happening even now, and something that would continue to happen many times. She seemed to be describing everyday happenings. Because I felt like I would come to fear Loretta if she continued, I tried to say something. But no matter what I wanted to say, I couldn't say it, because I was afraid of how Loretta would respond. In the end, this was what I chose to say. If if I couldn't see Loretta again for whatever reason, I think I'd be really sad. Loretta screamed. Wait, wait. Why do you always say important things like that when I'm not ready to record you? Yes. All right, say that again. Now. While hugging a strange crystal ball she took out of nowhere, Loretta requested while flapping her long ears. Could all elves move their ears freely? Or was it a special right as a queen elf? The answer didn't matter. Thanks to her reaction, I felt much more lighthearted. At the moment, she wasn't scary at all. It was the usual Loretta. Then I'm off, Loretta. Thanks for everything. Ah. You have to repeat what you said before you go, Shin Nim. It'll give you ten million gold. Ten million gold. Inside the mansion, the bath was the first place I visited. It's huge. Huge. Although only one person needed to go in, it was as big as a swimming pool. Not to mention, it was full of all sorts of decorations. Across from its large window, I could see the mansion's garden, letting me enjoy its scenery while taking a bath. When I got in the hot bath, my body that had grown cold from the event dungeon instantly loosened up. 
As I would get electrocuted if Pika went in the water, she held back for today, and only the materialized Ryue, who was big enough for a person to ride on, had followed me into the bath. It's warm. Yep, who says an ice elemental can't take a bath? It's not like your body is made of ice. I feel like you'll melt. Try not to. After washing my body, I picked one of the bedrooms in the mansion and slept soundly. As even the bed was enormous, I couldn't relax. Thankfully, I was able to relax with Ryue and Pika with me. Only then did Ryue become stable. Perhaps because she had stayed materialized for so long, she instinctively refused to dematerialize herself. After taking ample rest and relieving the built-up tension, she dematerialized before I noticed. In truth, I was troubled, since she had been draining my mana since we left the event dungeon. Although it wasn't an overwhelming amount, having a materialized elemental did drain more mana. I couldn't be freely leaking mana like that. Well stay like this for a day, Ryue. Starting from tomorrow, we can fight together. Just like the dematerialized Pika, the 20 centimeters Ryue was very cute. Because she was too cute, I kept patting her, and because Pika sulked, I had to pat her as well. Now that I had two elementals, fighting the skeleton knight became even easier. After each of us destroyed a group of skeletons, we charged at the skeleton knight and crushed him before he could summon more skeletons. When Ryue materialized, I could ride her into battle, and thus was no longer jealous of the skeleton knight's skeleton mount. Ryue, let's go. Ao. Ryue answered with vigor and kicked off the ground. I felt sorry for Pika who only just learned to materialize, but when fighting the skeleton knight, it was better to infuse her into my spear with spirit aura than to materialize her. It seemed elementals liked to materialize, as Pika's dissatisfaction with the newcomer Ryue was growing. Die, skull break here. Ryue, ice breath. Kwa. A breath that froze everything came out of Ryu's mouth. While the skeleton knight hurriedly blocked it with his sword, the skeleton mount, who was fully exposed to ice breath, couldn't move as the frost filled up its bones. In that instant, I struck my spear down vertically. When I pushed my spear in from the frozen skeleton mount's head to its groin, then pulled out, the skeleton mount crumbled and disappeared into particles. After falling on the ground, the skeleton knight held up his sword and shouted predictably. Qua, Skull Breaker. Skeleton Knight uses Undead Roar. Those with living bodies are slowed to 5% of their maximum speed. Kwang. The moment he activated Undead Roar, Ryue roared and struck down his sword from his hand. Even if materialized, elementals were spiritual. Undead Roar did not affect them. Meanwhile, I used Divine Speed and Orc Lord's Warcry to cancel the Undead Roar. Holding my spear on Ryu's back, I grinned as I aimed it at the skeleton knight's head. Let's see how many blows you'll withstand today. Kook, 2 vs 1. It's unfair. I don't want to hear that from you who had 200 skeletons. After eating the third heroic strike, the skeleton knight shattered. Just like always, it disappeared into particles. You got yourself another elemental. That one isn't the elemental you usually have with you, right? Your elemental wasn't visible before. Lin said as he stared at Ryue who I was riding on. After rubbing her head softly, I answered Lin. Pika can materialize too now, but this child came from a hidden area in Fairy Garden. Her name is Ryue. Ah, that sealed amazing, really. A draconian. I can smell Fairy Garden scent from him. Eh. Did that child say something? I can only hear barks. So you can't hear her voice even if she's materialized. Lin, you're a fairy garden member. Yeah, I'm the vice guild master. Vice guild master. What are you doing here? At my inquisitive eyes, Lin answered half-heartedly. Well, whatever position with the word vice is always the most leisurely. Vice chairman, vice class president, vice representative, vice president while enjoying my no-working happy life, I tried to take some water from the elemental spring to ferment some snake wine, when Nunim caught me. So here I am. Wouldn't a draconian fermenting snake wine be considered killing one's own kind? Lin ignored my worry and asked. By the way, 
Why do you keep repeating the 30th floor master raid? Haven't you finished collecting the skeleton knight set by now? It drops bone strengthening elixirs. I've collected them all from the fifth floor on, so I can't skimp out of them now. At my words, Lin froze. Did you just say strengthening elixir? Yeah, strengthening elixirs. Ha. I see. With just a single party member scarecrow, of course a strengthening elixir will appear. Ha 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 ha. Lin laughed wholeheartedly and left his seat. Where are you going, Lin? Mm -hmm. Ah, just wait a bit. Just going to shake Nunim by the throat a little. Don't go. Lin's going to get beaten up instead. Thanks for stopping me. As I had personally experienced Loretta's second bullet of destruction, I advised Lin against his actions. Lin simply sat back down. Poor Lin. It seemed he had been hit before. A sense of shared pain flashed between our eyes. We, who were only connected by our bets, began to feel a sense of camaraderie. Three weeks after that, I completed my skeleton night grinding. You consumed a bone-strengthening elixir, strengthening your bones to the peak. Your strength and constitution both increase by three. It seems consuming more of this item will have no further effect. You equipped the skeleton night set. Your strength and constitution increase by 15. When the skeleton knight set is equipped, you can use undead roar once per day. Of course, I instantly extracted undead roar and stored it in the 6 o'clock position. Although I wondered if I would ever need to use this skill, I realized I could use it in urgent situations. Then, I could use orc lord's warcry to get out of the status effect, or use dragon skin to endure hits while leaving the battle to my two elementals. As such, I decided to store the skill into the pocket watch. Name, Kong Shin Race, Human Sex, Male. Class, Elementalist Sub Skill Collector Title, Skeleton Knight Slayer Rank, Silver 6. Level, 31. HP 12, 54012, 540 MP 7, 1507, 150. Strength 10641 Dexterity 8722 Constitution 9034 Intelligence 2012 Magic 8112 Charm 5812 Luck 2112 Normal Skills High Rank Martial Arts LV3, High Rank Spear Technique LV5, Low Rank Crossbow Marksmanship LV5, Mid Rank Heroic Strike LV5 Mid Rank Provoke LV4, Divine Speed LV3 Return LV2, Mid Rank Dash LV2, Peruta Circuit LV5, Deific Manifestation, Death Counter, Riding. Class Skills Mid Rank Spirit Mastery LV4, Mid Rank Spirit Aura LV2, Mid Rank Elemental Control LV2, Mid Rank Elemental Contract LV2, Mid Rank Elemental Tempest LV1, Thunder Beast LV2. Subclass Skill Endow Skill, Spirit of the Collector. Equipment. Power Earring Strength 2. Flesh Golem Second Finger Strength 7, Constitution 7. Skeleton Knight Set Strength 15, Constitution 15. Arachne's Black Earthen Spear Strength 5, Dexterity 10, Poison Damage on All Basic Attacks, Inflicts Poison Status Effect. Collector's Pocket Watch. 1 o'clock, Orc Lord's War Cry. 2 o'clock, Vengeful Spirit's Wail. 3 o'clock, Dark Thunder Explosion. 4 o'clock, Dragon Skin. 5 o'clock, Die Hard. 6 o'clock, Undead Roar. 3 event Dungeon Clears, 1 event Raid Clear, Accumulated Bonus Stats, 6. Current Skill Points, 11. 7 Title Effects, Orc Lord Slayer, Wraith Queen Slayer, Dark Ratman Slayer, Giant Ghoul Slayer, Skeleton Knight Slayer, Lizard Knight Master, Hermes. Accumulated Effects, All Stats 12, 15% speed increase, increased affinity to all elements, affinity to wind element greatly increased, can summon Talaria once per day. Contracted Elementals 1. Lightning Elemental Pika 2. Ice Elemental Ryue While I was grinning as I looked at my stats, Lin severed the cigarette in his mouth as if his appetite had fallen. You tenacious dog, this is the first time in 900 years that I've seen someone consume strengthening elixirs to the limit. You're a lot older than I thought, Lin. Uh, what? 
If you look at Loretta Nunem no, no. Forget I said that. When I stared at Lin fixedly, he dodged my gaze and spoke. Hey, don't tell her I said something about her age Nunem will kill me. Really? Lin. Hurry up and go to the 31st floor. Damn, there's only a bit over two months left. If you want the cape, you better hurry. Lin shouted as if he had already given up. I smiled lightly and answered him. If someone was watching, he'd think you really wanted to give it to me. Regardless, I'm not going to the 31st floor right now. I have dinner soon, so we'll come back tonight. Um, um. You aren't going to the 31st floor now? Ah, uh, you see. Putting my spear back in my inventory, I continued with a trembling voice. Today, I would have to face someone more fearsome than the skeleton knight. Today's the day my tests end. My friend will probably ask me to go out for fries and beer please wish me a safe return, Lin. Eh. You said friend just now, didn't you? The only friend I made in college, Su Yiyun. I was scared of what would happen when I met her this time. Chapter, 79 It didn't feel like a long time had passed since the midterms, but the finals had ended today. Resolved to score at least A-B, I crammed with my textbooks the day before the test. My base intelligence was 20, which became 32 after receiving 12 bonus stats from various effects. Although I suspected that it was still updating, my memorization and comprehension abilities were noticeably high. In other words, it wasn't hard to get the questions right on my tests. Hugh, I feel like I'm not really a college student, just pretending to be one. A lot of college students feel that way. When I murmured, Watching the teaching assistant leave after collecting the tests, Su Yiyun replied as sprawled on her desk. Her face showed how happy she was to be finally free. Even though she must have less work than me, her grades weren't as good as mine. It was probably the result of me raising my intelligence to 20. With today's test, the finals were over. It seemed there wouldn't be any more tests in this lecture room for the day, as groups of students stayed after the teaching assistant left and chatted. Shin. Yeah. Absently watching the trajectory of the camera following the students loitering in the front of the lecture room, I replied to Su Yiyun. She then asked. It's winter break now. What are your plans? It'll be in the dungeon. Kai. You. In my room, playing games. I think I'm better off than you. In any case, I was now done with my tests. I stretched and started packing my bags. Su Yiyun tried to say something, but hesitated. There was only one situation where she couldn't get her words out. I turned around. There were three people, two girls and one guy. They were all pretty or handsome. Hey, you're Kong Shin, right? Ah, we're freshmen too, so you don't have to be polite. Um, you came straight from high school, right? Yeah. Su Yiyun, did you fail your entrance exam and have to take a gap year? Do you want me to hit you? They asked with more relaxed expressions. There's a department MT1. All the freshmen are coming. All of them. The entire business department. There's over 400 of us. Yep. It's to celebrate the end of finals for first semester. We're all going from this Friday to Saturday. That's tomorrow. Pass. I shouldered my bag. Then, the guy stepped forward and stopped me. Neither of you guys really hang out with others. From what I hear, you guys didn't come to the freshman opening party nor to the MT in the beginning of the semester. No one even knows your phone numbers. Because I didn't tell anyone. I don't really know why you want a loner like me to come to the MT. I really was curious. My social circle. I was content with the one I built with the people from the dungeon. As for college, I had my hands full with just Su Yiyun. Because I didn't want to get involved with others, I didn't talk to anyone and only politely responded to whoever talked to me first. As for group projects, I just skipped them. Who had time for that? I had to run the dungeon. This time, one of the girls stepped forward. There are a lot of people who want to get close to you guys. You're both famous. Su Yiyun, she says you're famous. Good for you. 
She said you are too. Anyways. You guys have to come to this MT. We're leaving from school at 3 p.m., so be there. The other girl looked at me and emphasized. Then, she even managed to get my phone number. She was undoubtedly going to call me if I didn't come. Watching the three people leave like the wind after coming like the wind, I asked Su Yiyun. Don't people usually leave outsiders alone? They don't go this far, right? Let's go. Su Yiyun completely ignored what I said and kept going, her eyes sparkling. It sounds fun. Have fun. Let's go together. Please. Let's go. Hugh. I became immersed in thought. If I could get to the 35th floor by the end of today then yeah, if I finished my three-floor master battles tomorrow morning, then I could go to the MT without losing out on much. Plus, going to the MT didn't sound all that bad. Since they went through the trouble of inviting me, I would feel bad if I didn't go. Alright, sure, it'll go. Who? Just the two of us I mean, the MT's going to be fun. Are you saying ITLL be fun because it won't be just the two of us? Auu, no. I punished Su Yiyun by flicking her forehead. Just think about all the times you made me get fries with you. I'm not going with you for fries today. Why? You wanted me to go to the MT. I have to go to the dungeon if I want to go to the MT. Kai, you always say dungeon this dungeon that what's so fun about fighting scary monsters. Isn't it more fun hanging out with me? I poked Su Yiyun's puffed up cheeks and advised her. If you don't fix your attitude, you're going to be in danger one day. But. If you want to fix it, tell me. It'll help you. Su Yiyun had monster phobia, but monster phobia could be fixed. You just had to drive the fear out of your heart. It wasn't incurable, and if she didn't fix it, Su Yiyun will undoubtedly come to regret it. At my serious advice, Su Yiyun nodded her head meekly. Yeah one day. Alright, I'm off. I said my goodbye to Su Yiyun and turned my back to her. For some reason, however, I felt the gazes of other students on my back. As I left, I tried my best to ignore their gazes and their whispers. Are they really not going out? They said they aren't. In any case, he said he's going to the MT. Arg, I want to make him mine. Yeah, keep dreaming. The 31st floor was extremely quiet. Even when I yelled commence exploration, no monsters appeared. Thinking something strange was going on, I walked onward. The pathway was the same as always. The only difference was that there were sets of medieval armor here and there. They each held their own weapons like cleavers, claymores, and rapiers up into the air. Although they weren't moving at all, their appearances were very solemn and suspicious. They must be it, right? You guys weren't here until now. You thought I wouldn't notice if you stood still. I charged at the nearest armor. When I got close, the armor creaked and began to move. Although the cleaver in its hand looked heavy and sharp, it didn't matter as long as I wasn't hit. Ruyue. Auu. With me riding her, Ruyue let out a lively howl and collided with the armor with her body. The part of the armor she contacted froze up and fell on the ground. Using the spear giving off golden lightning from Pika, I stabbed the frozen part of the armor. At that moment, a blinding light exploded. The armor shattered. The ownerless cleaver struck the ground with a thud, and soon disappeared into particles. I was quite surprised by how well Pika and Ryue worked together. The armor could not have had bones, meaning my skull breaker effect didn't apply. Even so, the armor shattered in a single critical hit. No, were these guys just weak to begin with? For testing purposes, I put Ryue on standby for the next armor and only used my spear clad with spirit aura. I had to stab four times for the armor to break. Oh, amazing, Ryue. Did I do well? Did I do well? Yeah, you did very well. It seemed having Ryue did more than just give me one more elemental, as she showed synergistic effects. Master doesn't praise me. No. Of course, Pika is doing well too. We wouldn't be doing so well without you either. Really? Ehe, thanks master. 
Although I didn't really feel it when I only had one elemental, but now that I had two, it felt like I was traveling with two children. Not that I minded with how cute they were. To an elementalist, communicating with his elementals was a very special and happy thing to do. Compared to when I was a normal dungeon explorer though I suspected I was never normal to begin with, I was sometimes surprised by the new facts I knew and acted upon after becoming an elementalist. Even so, I did not regret becoming an elementalist and being able to meet my elementals. After I finished praising my elementals and looked up, the armors that were lined up along the pathway like decorations were closing in on me with their weapons in hand. Those guys, would Tempest send them flying? I immediately gave it a go, but they didn't budge. As I thought, they were heavy. I corrected my posture on Ryu's back, leaning forward slightly and aiming my spear to the front. I lessened the amount of mana I put into spirit aura and transferred the focus to Ryue. As a result, the amount of freezing energy coming from Ryu's body increased. It was as if dry ice was placed all around Ryu's feet. I patted Ryu's head and spoke. Ryue, let's run. Go. Auu. Ryue howled at the top of her voice and kicked off the ground. The moment she began to run, her incredibly fast speed made the scenery flash by like movie films. The armors, the so-called living armors, each swung their weapons at Ryue and me and blocked our path. However, Ryue wasn't a normal wolf. Before any of the weapons could touch us, we became clad in an armor of ice, which blocked their weapons and froze the living armors. I then shattered their frozen bodies with my spear of lightning. You obtained 400 gold. You obtained 420 gold. You obtained a fragment of living armor. You obtained 430 gold. Kohat, this is fun. Ryue, let's go faster. She really did speed up. Without the riding skill, I would have been knocked off her back a long time ago. Now that we were incredibly fast, the living armors from far into the 31st floor pathway woke up and swarmed us. As expected, these guys were also only strong in numbers. Whoosh! Whoosh! Hap! With more than five weapons attacking me from the front, I put more strength into my arms and struck them down. Ryu's freezing energy then froze them in place. The only sound the living armors made was the creaking of their armor, but now that they were frozen quiet, they really looked like ordinary armors. Even while I ran forward on Ryu's back, I fished the frozen armors with my spear and sent them crashing against the wall. Stupid armor cosplayers. You obtained 410 gold. You obtained 440 gold. At this rate, I would be able to make it to the end of 31st floor within a few hours. With a violent smile on my face, I encouraged Ryue. Ryue, run. Faster. Auu. Come at me all at once, you leftover canned food. How were they similar? They were both empty on the inside. Just like that, Ryue and I swept through the 31st floor. Until now, I had used my dash skill to speed up running through the floors, during which I had to watch out for my stamina and the enemy's attacks. Now that I had Ryue, who ran much faster than me and even blocked the incoming attacks, my dungeon clearing speed shortened drastically. Just like that, I could see Lin's rotten expression in just three hours. It was a secret that I enjoyed his expression very much. 1. School Outing at Korean Colleges Chapter, 80 From the first through fifth floors of the dungeon, each floor had different monsters. However, from the sixth floor and above, the monsters that appeared had a set pattern to them. The second floor was the same as the first floor, only there were more of them. The monsters on the third floor were slightly different, like a new type of monster being added or the same monsters using different skills. Regardless, once the first floor was cleared with ease, the second floor would also be easy. The living armors on the 32nd floor weren't much different from the living armors on the 31st floor, other than the fact that their attacks were stronger and that there were more of them. However, because the pathway had become longer, it took me five hours to pass through the 32nd floor, even though I was already used to dealing with them. It was already midnight at this point, but after my constitution broke through a certain point, I only needed three hours of sleep to wipe away the fatigue I had built up during the day. 
Plus, I could go for about four days without sleep and be perfectly fine. Although mother kept saying I wouldn't get taller if I didn't sleep, would be troubled if I grew taller. I had to be at school by three, and it took me about an hour to get there. Because mother believed I would collapse from hunger if I skipped breakfast, I had to be in the kitchen at nine in the morning. After that, I planned to wash up, get three hours of sleep, wake up, and do floor master battles before leaving for school around two. The only problem was that I would have to clear the 33rd, 34th, and 35th floor and fight the floor master at least once in nine hours. Ruyue, let's hurry up a bit more. Okay. I'm feeling great. Of course. This appa was drinking a mana potion worth 10 million won per bottle for you. After emptying a mid-high grade mana potion, which had a 10 minute cooldown time and filled up 3000 mana, I adjusted my posture on Ryu's back and pointed my spear forward, just like I had done when I broke through the 32nd floor. When Ryu noticed that I was ready, she began to run. The living armors on the 33rd floor did not attempt to hide themselves and actively attacked me from all directions. Spinning the spear in my hand, I continuously smashed them. Hap. Although my aim was more to stop them from approaching me than to kill them, I struck down with my spear and destroyed them whenever I saw an opening. Just by being on Ryue, I was naturally above the living armors. The destructive power from striking down with my spear clad with spirit aura was nothing to scoff at. The living armors did not die until their armors were completely shattered, meaning half-baked stabs were not effective. It was why I came to enjoy striking down from above. However, after I broke the fifth armor and was about to keep going, something smacked me. Cough. Ao. Clang clang. After realizing that I had been hit, Ryue hurriedly created a wall of ice around us, blocking the follow-up attacks and giving me a chance to regain my composure. After looking at my shoulder where I had been hit, I confirmed that it wasn't a serious injury and let out a sigh of relief. Then, I checked my HP. With just one hit, my HP had decreased by 10%. What was it? I saw an iron mace for a second, but I definitely destroyed the living armor carrying an iron mace. I saw it disappear into particles, so I couldn't have been mistaken. In that case, the answer was obvious. Whoosh! Whoosh! The iron mace moved by itself and attacked me. Seeing the iron mace fly above the ice wall and strike down at me, I fiercely struck it down with my spear. As expected, no one was holding the iron mace. My spirit aura exploded for an instant and shattered the iron mace. Of course, I had known its identity. Flying weapon. Just like the living armors that moved by themselves, flying weapons also moved by themselves, as if they were possessed by ghosts. I should have expected it the moment I saw living armors, but I didn't think living armors would attack me with flying weapons. They had tricked me well. Does it hurt? Sorry, I didn't think it would move. Master got hurt. You stupid. It's fine, I didn't know either. Everyone makes mistakes. We just have to not make the same mistake again. After comforting Ryue, who was apologizing, and Pika, who growled at Ryue, I fixed my posture. Although my shoulder still throbbed from the Iron Mace's heavy impact, my HP had only gone down by 10%. I wasn't a dungeon explorer for five years for looks. I had long since grown used to pain. From now, let's break the weapons as we go too. It'll be better this time. Ryue can keep doing the same thing. I picked up my spear again. The moment Ryu's ice wall crumbled under the continued attacks from the living armors, I lightly kicked Ryu's thigh. With a howl, Ryue started running forward. Auu! Stop hiding and come fight me, you empty rice cakes. You used provoke, drawing all nearby enemies' attentions. The living armors that were scattered here and there ran toward me with creaking sounds. Running around on Ryu's back, I went to gather them up in one spot. While running, when living armors blocked Ryu's path, she skillfully jumped over them, changing direction and gathering them all together. Although I would end up facing a large number of living armors if I continued, I stopped after a certain point and ran circles with Ryue in a wide area of the pathway. There, the living armors became confused and even accidentally attacked each other. I then went around to the outside, 
hitting away the living armors and flying weapons on my way, then aimed my spear at the gathered living armors and shouted. Elemental Tempest. We were waiting. Who, it's the spin spin. Hey. I'm first. For some reason, it seemed my name had begun to spread amongst the elementals. It felt strange. Regardless, thanks to the elementals' overflowing motivation, I could activate Elemental Tempest with a shorter charge-up time than normal. As a skill that used half of my mana, its effect was clear. A storm of elementals created by the combined effort of all types of elementals. I had never regretted using this skill. As elemental storms swept over the living armors and shattered them, the combined creaking noise seemed to make an orchestral symphony. You obtained 500 gold. You obtained 450 gold. You obtained a fragment of flying weapon. You obtained a fragment of living armor. I waved my hand and shooed away the flurry of messages. With so many monsters disappearing at once, the pathway was now wide open, making it pleasing to look at. I opened another 10 million one mana potion. Although it was possible to hunt without using mana potions, once someone used one, it was impossible to continue without using them. After finding out the incoming money exceeded the expenditure, there was no reason to hold back. Just like that, I became a man that used 10 million one every 10 minutes. However, every two or so living armors dropped around 500 gold, meaning just 20 of them would be enough to make up for it. Dungeon explorers rocked. Cool, that felt great. Ruyua, let's go. Auu. The 33rd floor was thus cleared by the combined effort of me and other elementals in just three hours. Starting from the 34th floor however, there were mummies mixed in with living armors and flying weapons. Mummies were monsters wrapped in bandages, who shot out their bandages to shackle their enemies. The living armors and flying weapons would then easily crush the shackled enemies. It was easy to understand why so many people would be troubled by their combined attack. I could understand the smile Lin had on his face, watching me advance to the 34th floor without buying anything at the 33rd floor shop. Of course, the mummies were of no danger to me whatsoever. Human. A living human. I want his body. Take this. When I ran into three mummies while running through the 34th floor, they each shot three streams of bandages toward me. Although they looked like frail pieces of cloth, their defense was quite tough, so much so that I could not cut them with my spear in one swing. The moment the nine strands of cloth flew over me, I held up my spear in their path. The bandages wrapped around my spear, connecting the mummies to my weapon. Holding on to my spear tightly, I began to spin it around. Eh. I can't pull it away. He's too strong. My precious bandages. You shouldn't have sent them all out in the same attack. I strongly pulled on my spear wrapped by nine strands of cloth, and the mummies closed in on me as if they couldn't elongate their bandages further. Watching this, I realized how strong I had gotten. I could win against three monsters my level in pure strength. I wasn't even a beast man. Chain lightning. When I poured mana into my spear and shouted Pika's name, Pika swiftly used the elemental magic I was thinking of. The lightning energy that started to flow into my spear traveled through the cloth and cooked the three mummies to crisp. The heaven has been enraged. I shall go back to heaven. And I shall say it was beautiful. How do you guys know that poem? 1. No, maybe there was a similar poem in the world they came from. I murmured as I took off the burnt bandages from my spear. Then, I looked at the living armors and flying weapons that were happily flying toward me thinking I was captured, and grinned. What happened next was obvious. You became level 35. You obtained the qualification to challenge the floor master. You obtained 5 bonus stats. Crazy. You really are a crazy bastard. How do you do in a few hours what takes other people in parties two or three months to do? Lin, I've been having similar thoughts recently. Though, at first, I thought other explorers were weird for being so slow and even dying while going through these easy floors. When I checked the time after reaching the 34th floor shop, it was 6 in the morning. It took me exactly 6 hours to climb two floors from the 32nd floor shop. However, 
I didn't understand how others took two or three months to do the same thing. Even if I took out all the buffs from strengthening and compressing elixirs, took out the effects from various titles, took out elemental magic, and lowered my skill levels to what other explorers my level would have I still didn't think it would take me that long. Though, of course, having the writing skill in Ryue also helped boost my clearing time. In any case, someone who was skilled enough to climb to the 30th floor on his own would undoubtedly have collected some titles and self-defining skills on his way. As such, my supposition was useless. Lin, what did you say you would do if I broke through the 35th floor in one year? You haven't broken through the 35th floor, nor have you defeated its floor master. You might lose to the floor master, have you thought of that? Lin chewed on his cigarette as he retorted with an unhappy expression. I grinned and lightly stretched my body after distributing my level up bonus stats. Because I rode Ryue non stop for six hours and wrestled with mummies, fatigue had built up in my body. I bought a 100 gold fatigue recovery juice and proclaimed to Lin after I was done with it. I'll see you in three hours. I think you mean one week. Bay. Well, see how it goes. Bay. 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 I stuck my tongue out at Lin and turned away. Pika and Ryue also stuck their tongues out at Lin. How cute. Unfortunately, because Pika wasn't in her material form, Lin wouldn't be able to see her cute appearance. Hey, that dog I mean, elemental. Did it just stick its tongue out at me? I didn't answer him. My head was already filled with thoughts of the 35th floor master, who would be waiting for me in the next floor. Hey, I asked if it just made fun of me. Hey, hey. I didn't hear Lin's voice. Nope, not at all. I raised my hand above my head to say goodbye, and headed past the floor shop. My heart beat at the thought of battle against the floor master I knew nothing about. Hey, hey. A mere elemental should not ignore a draconian. 1. Lines from the Poem Back to Heaven by Chion Sangbyong. Chapter 81. Right now, there was only one question in my mind, what was the identity of the 35th floor master? Giant living armor. After saying it, I was 100% sure that wasn't it. Then what? Ghost knight? No matter what, I couldn't be sure. The best solution was to experience it for myself. Although I was more careful in the past, after realizing how strong I was lately, I began to act more boldly. Mm, self control, self control. Otherwise, I'll regret it later. Hubris was the greatest enemy to growth. I was only on the dungeon's 35th floor. There were many monsters, humans, and other races that were stronger than me. I had to get stronger. I wanted to become the world's strongest. If I was satisfied by my current strength and became arrogant, I could stop dreaming about growing stronger. Mm, good. Let's snap out of it, and get going. Although I couldn't be arrogant, being able to objectively understand my strength was also important. Between my stats strengthened by elixirs and titles, and my two partner elementals, I was confident that I had enough strength to deal with the 35th floor master alone. After exhaling, I opened the door in front of me. Fight me. A deep voice rang out. I looked around the room. It was neither a wilderness nor a graveyard. I was inside a slightly dark cavern. Unlike my expectations, there were no living armors or flying weapons scattered everywhere. Inside the cavern, there was only one opponent. He was riding a black horse and his every breath expelled a blue gas. His black horse had a body that seemed big enough to swallow an ordinary horse whole, while he himself had a build large enough to suit his horse's size. A large axe leaned against his shoulder, while he carried a helmet in one hand. His black steel armor had sharp spikes coming out of its joints, looking extremely intimidating. More importantly, he did not have a head. It was then that I realized that the helmet he was carrying was his head. He was the headless undead knight, Dullahan. You are a warrior. That posture, Aura. You are not lacking to be my opponent. Who? I held my black earthen spear in hand and aimed it at him. As Ryue was smaller than his horse, my spear was naturally angled up, but it wasn't to the point that it would be a disadvantage when fighting him. 
I was once again glad that I contracted Ryue. What a coincidence. I'm happy that for the first time since I came into the dungeon, I met a proper opponent. Kukuku, there won't be anyone that would be unsatisfied with a warrior like yourself. Dullahan also gripped his large axe. Just from his posture, I could tell he was different than anyone I had faced thus far. Although he seemed lacking in the arts, I could not underestimate the strength I sensed from his size and spirit. In regard to floor masters, I once wondered, if someone born with such physical ability honed his techniques, how strong would he be? I would finally have my answer today. Of course, I was confident that my physical ability and techniques had also grown a lot since then. Luckily, we're in a wide open space. Let's enjoy this battle to our heart's content. Right, let's go. Dullahan and I both charged at each other. His black horse was faster. The large axe in Dullahan's hand chopped down at my head like lightning. However, I ignored the axe and thrust my spear out at his head, which his hand was carefully holding. Dullahan quickly changed the trajectory of his axe and blocked my attack. Good, so he defended when his head was attacked. Don't be conceited with just this much. When did I act conceited? I pulled my spear back quickly and attacked his wrist. With an incredible speed unfit for someone with such large build and weapon, Dullahan pulled back his axe and defended my attack once again. The resistance I felt from his defense was like an iron wall. I realized that ordinary attacks wouldn't be able to injure him. Weak, weak. Show me your strength. Hugh. Hap. He wasn't someone I could fight while cracking jokes. I focused on the enemy in front of me, and the axe he was holding. If I received it directly, my strength unfortunately fell short. I parried his attack before his strength reached its peak. When I quickened my parrying timing, his stance was ruined. Before he even noticed, his stance was slowly broken and I delivered a blow. It was the technique I used against opponents that vastly surpassed me in raw strength. Ha! Kook, you! When the time was just right, I sent three consecutive stabs forward, making Dullahan fall back. At that moment, Ryue bit the neck of Dullahan's black horse. Kwang! Haiing! Even though the black horse was a floor master's mount, it was no match for the materialized Ryue. When Ryue let out her ice breath while the black horse's neck was in her mouth, the black horse screamed and jumped. Dullahan, whose stance was already ruined to a certain extent, became flustered at his black horse's wild movements. Even so, he struck down at Ryu's neck with his axe. In that instant, my eyes flashed. Heroic strike. Kohuk. As my attack reached him in the perfect moment, Dullahan fell off his black horse. After realizing that its master had fallen off, the black horse's movements became even wilder. I shot my spear, clad with ample amount of spirit aura, at the black horse's half-frozen neck. I had extended my spear's reach with mana. Kuhing. Kuk, as I thought, it was impossible to kill a floor master's beloved mount with a single hit. Although half of the black horse's neck blew up and disappeared into black smoke, the black horse seemed fine, even with what seemed like a fatal injury. While I made Ryue fall back for a moment, Dullahan, who had fallen off his horse, also got back up and remounted. He seemed to be enraged as he swung his axe toward me. From the bottom to top, his large axe slashed up with a threatening appearance. Ruyue. Auu. Ruyue poured out freezing energy towards the axe as she threw herself to the side quickly. My cutie Ruyue was an all-purpose wolf that could go forward, backwards, and sideways. At Dullahan's normal speed, Ruyue would not be able to dodge his attack but the ice breath she had breathed out had formed frost on his axe and slowed it down drastically. Elemental. You notice too late. Tempest. Making Ryue charge towards him once more, I shot out a harsh spiral of mana with my spear. I didn't think a single tempest could make him falter. As such, I shot out five consecutive tempests. Rather than Dullahan, his black horse staggered and stepped back. Kook, then how about this? Hook. In an instant, something incredibly startling happened. Dullahan had thrown his axe. It wasn't just the axe that flew towards me. A black aura was imbued in the axe's double-edged blades. 
just looking at it gave me chills. Although I fell back on Ryue, the axe even had a homing function. When Ryue created an ice wall with her elemental magic, the axe easily shattered the wall and continued forward. Behind it, Dullahan rushed forward, following his axe. I gritted my teeth and glared at the axe. I had to smack it down. Both of them. It's the second time today. We, fun. It's true. You can ride amusement park rides if you follow Crown Prince. A five-colored whirlpool raged around the spear I held up. In the trajectory Elemental Tempest drew, I included both Dullahan and his axe, and shot it out. The axe directly clashed with Elemental Tempest, but soon lost its black aura and bounced up. Dullahan coming from behind then faced the storm head-on. All right, it's time for counterattack. I hurriedly took out a mana potion and stuck it in my mouth. My goal was to deliver a blow before Dullahan recovered his axe. Ryue kicked off the ground with vigor. However, before I could thrust my spear into his head. You dare. UK. In an instant, I ducked on Ryu's back at the sense of unease I felt. As if to prove my decision was correct, Dullahan's axe flew past where my head was with a bone-chilling whoosh. I thought it had lost its energy, but Dullahan was controlling it the entire time. Although I then picked myself up and thrust out my spear, Dullahan easily blocked the attack with his axe. However, his black horse was bitten Ryue again. While the master couldn't do his job, the elemental was racking up contribution. Hying. You horse. Endure the pain. Ku, he'll make it so that it doesn't have to. Extend spear. In an instant, my spear severed the black horse's head. Would it continue running without its head like Dullahan? Although I tensed up and put more strength into my grip, what I was worried about thankfully did not happen. After losing its head, the black horse disappeared into black smoke without a sound and Dullahan fell to the ground. Thunder Spear When I shouted while thrusting my spear forward, Pika created a spear of lightning in midair and shot it in Dullahan's head. Paralyzed by the shock from Pika's lightning spear, Dullahan could not get up. Ryue then freely stepped on his body. Auu. Good job, Ryue. I didn't stay still either. I stabbed my spear at the bracelet on his wrist, which was protecting his head. After a moment, the bracelet exploded and his rotting bare arm revealed its appearance. Quiak. My mana was now dangerously low. Not even half the cooldown time of the last potion I drank passed, but my mana had fallen below 30%. As a result, I was feeling slightly dizzy. However, because the heroic strike went in successfully, the left arm protecting his head broke completely. At the same time, his head fell and rolled away from his body. With this, I thought I had ascertained my victory. What followed immediately after instantly changed my mind. Kwong. At his roar that stung my ears, I instantly fell back on Ryu's back. The place I was standing was then struck by his axe, creating a fissure in the ground. Without even thinking about recovering his head, Dullahan staggered as he got up. I could not understand why. With his head away from his body, I thought it would have a negative effect on him, but the aura he was emitting seemed to be getting stronger. Holding the large axe with one hand, he held it up high. Because I felt uneasy, I immediately ordered Ryue. Cancel materialization. The moment Ryue cancelled her materialization, I shot a heroic strike at his right arm. Surprisingly, he was in a super-armored state. After taking my spear, which contained all of my mana, without batting an eye, Dullahan stuck his axe into ground. Once again, I instinctively yelled out. Dragon skin. Immediately afterwards, the ground tremored and countless shards of rocks stormed towards me. Chapter, 82 Dullahan uses outburst. D d d d d d d do. Without kidding, I felt like I would die of pain. There was no way to dodge this. Shards of rocks completely surrounded me. Just because Dullahan struck his axe into the ground, the rock shards had begun to fly towards me like bombshells. If I hadn't used dragon skin on time, I would have died on the spot. Enduring the rock shards, I moved my body slowed from dragon skin, took out a health potion and gulped it down. Master, recover mana. 
I can't use ice wall. I can't recover my mana right now. He'll just have to endure it. Although I resolved myself to hold on until his skill ended, it lasted for quite some time. Gritting my teeth, I slowly moved my body. There was only one way to escape from this situation. I found it, damn it. Even as I was getting beaten with the rock shards, I found Dullahan's head that was littered on the ground. His terrifying skill seemed to be a defense mechanism, to prevent someone from taking his head when it separated from his body. Although I gritted my teeth at the actions that resulted in such an atrocity, I was certain breaking his head would end this situation. Just. Die. Putting what little mana I had left into my spear, I thrust my spear forward. However, as if the head was made out of steel, the spear only made a small hole. Instead, my hand went numb. I checked my HP and MP. Thanks to Dragon Skin, I had about 50% of my HP, and I only had about 10% MP left. 10% if that was the case, then. Ruyue, I'm going to unsummon you for a bit. Pika, come into my gauntlet. Master. This might be better using my spear. Stabbing focused on one point. However, stabbing with just 10% of my mana, I would not be able to pierce Dullahan's head. In that case, it could be better to expand that hole by punching it for 11 seconds. Since my spear didn't work, I would be using my fists. Plus, stabbing required me to concentrate, but all the rock shards flying at me disrupted my concentration. Ryu's body became faint, then disappeared. Pika also came out of my spear and infused herself into my gauntlet. Striking down at Dullahan's head, I shouted. Thunder Beast. Kayak. Dullahan's screaming became louder, and the number of rock shards flying at me also increased. My HP began to fall at a scary rate. Clenching my fists tightly, I crazily struck down at its head. Wah! It'll give my all during this 11 seconds of attack. As I was in a super armored state, being hit by the rock shards did not affect my movements in the slightest. Right now, I didn't need any fancy skills. I just focused the lightning energy in my fists and struck down again and again. My HP fell below 20%. Master, we're almost out of time. Just a bit more. Wah! I struck down again and again. Before I noticed, Thunder Beast was cancelled and Pika was unsummoned as well. However, Orc Lord's Warcry and Dragon Skin were still in effect. Resolved to use Die Hard, I continued bashing Dullahan's head. Then, as if it were a joke, his head exploded. Kayak. A grand achievement. You defeated the Floor Master, Dullahan, alone. Amazing. You became level 36. You obtained the qualification to advance to the 36th floor. You obtained the title, Dullahan Slayer. All stats permanently increase by one. This effect will apply even if the title is not equipped. You became Silver Rank 5. Congratulations. You defeated Dullahan alone. You obtained the special reward, Dullahan's Helm. You obtained 100,000 gold. Choose your reward. 1. Heavy Armor Mastery Magic Book. As soon as Dullahan's death throes ended, the barrage of rock shards also ended. I turned around. His body was scattering into the air. In the end, I managed to win without using Die Hard. Ah, what a disaster. Sprawled on the ground, I muttered. Until the middle, I had felt great, as if we were both exchanging pointers. Of course, as we were both using our skills, it was hard to say it was a pure fight of techniques. Even so, I was having fun. I had even thought I could defeat his axe technique and make him drop his weapon. But just because I separated his head from his body, everything had changed. No matter how I thought about it, that skill was a cheat. I could see what would happen to normal parties. They'd think his head was his weakness and try their best to get it separated from the body. Then, they'd be showered by his rock shards. I then became worried for Ren, but was slightly relieved when I remembered he could endure it with dragon skin. Really, none of the floor masters are normal. Although I wanted to stay sprawled on the ground to rest, I couldn't. 
I had to review my battle with him and think of a strategy that didn't use Warcry or Dragon Skin. Then, I needed to try it once to make sure it worked. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to go to the MT in peace. So you ended up using Die Hard? Yes, damn it. It was 1.30 in the afternoon. After eating breakfast and sleeping for three hours, I finally finished my third battle with Dullahan. In the second battle, I crushed his hand holding the axe first. I then attacked his head, successfully preventing him from using Outburst. In the third battle, however, I accidentally hit his head with Heroic Strike. Enraged, Dullahan promptly used Outburst. Because I didn't have Dragon Skin, I used Teleria to try to crush his head while avoiding the Rock Shards, but my HP fell below 3%, and Die Hard activated. The moment Die Hard activated, I hugged Dullahan's head and used Dark Thunder Explosion, exploding his head and the Rock Shards before my vitality reached zero. If I didn't save Dark Thunder Explosion, I might have been able to end it before he used Die Hard. It was my fault for failing to realize I could use Dark Thunder Explosion the moment I caught his head. However, Lin seemed to be thinking differently. I'm more surprised you managed to defeat the Dullahan alone. Are you really human? Tell me honestly. You're some other race I don't know about, right? Enough with the nonsense. By the way, Lin. What? You should stop playing dumb and start making that gauntlet. Within the two months I have left, they'll finish grinding the 35th floor and conquer the 40th floor too. The bet between Lin and me said that he would take back my pocket watch and subclass if I couldn't break through the 35th floor in half a year. If I could, he would make me a gauntlet, and if I even broke through the 40th floor, he said he'd make me a weapon and defensive equipment set. If I managed to do it in three months, he would even add a dragon leather cape. In other words, I had already won the bet. I just had to work towards the bonuses. Looking deathly pale, Lin took out a portable anvil. Ite, damn it. Because of my damn guild master, I had to meet this damn rookie and do damn blacksmithing damn work. Damn it. See you tomorrow then, Lin. Screw off. While Lin said his goodbye by sticking his middle finger out at me, I said mine with a smile. Then, I left the dungeon. MTs were considered as highlights of any college student's college life. As I would finally be experiencing one after a semester, I was looking forward to it quite a bit. Though, I had a strong suspicion that I would be together with Su Yiyun even at the MT. He's here. Where's Su Yiyun? Huh. She was just here a second ago. Ooh, it seemed this MT was supported by the professors. Right, since over 400 students were going to this MT, it wouldn't make sense if the professors weren't involved. There were probably sunbays going 2-1. Looking at the tour buses lined up against the school's hillside road, I blanked out. Before I noticed, Su Yiyun had appeared and was glued to my side. Shin, you're late. I came just on time. You were in stealth again, weren't you? I, I want to get closer, but I'm scared. I'm surprised you thought about going to the freshman opening party then. I suspected that she was the same in high school and wanted to try for a fresh start at college. Unfortunately, habits were hard to kill, and one's nature was even harder to change. In the end, she ended up as a loner without a single friend. I'm your friend, Su Yiyun. What, so suddenly? Like we aren't close. I teased Su Yiyun as I waited. Suddenly, the surrounding people's murmuring became more severe. I asked Su Yiyun. What's up with them? There's apparently a goddess in our department. Really? I wonder what items a goddess would drop. It's probably not possible at my current level my eyes had a distant look, and Su Yiyun was looking at me with an even more distant look. Kuhum. With a dry cough, I asked her again. So that goddess just appeared? Yeah. She's apparently an international student from France. Really? There are so many international students at our college. Though, most of them are Chinese. More than 20% of our department was Chinese. When doing group projects, there was at least one Chinese international student in each group. Most of them weren't enthusiastic. There were, of course, ones that were, 
but because of the language barrier, it was better to think of the international students in group projects as non-existent. Though, since I didn't participate in group projects, I didn't have the qualifications to say anything about them. Other than China, there were quite a few American, Japanese, British, and French international students. For a school that bragged about cultural pride, it accepted way too many international students. We're going. Get on the buses. As expected, I could see the sunbays leading the MT. With Su Yiyun who grabbed onto me in order to not get lost, I got on a bus. Can I take the window seat? Sure. After leaving Su Yiyun to take the window seat, I sat up straight, circulated Pryuta circuit, and summoned Pika and Ryue. There are lots of people. Master, what are they doing? Are we hunting them? Hoo hoo. Please don't, Pika. Ruyue, come here. I talked so only my elementals could hear me, then hugged them. Although they struggled for a little bit, they seemed to have found their comfortable spots as they sat still and looked around. We're going to rest today. It's warm. I like it. I like it too. Holding the calmed elementals in my embrace, I quietly closed my eyes and focused on Pryuta circuit. I had withdrawn my focus to my inner self to only concentrate on my mana traveling through the pathway engraved in my body. Since I usually circulated Pryuta circuit while I was running the dungeon, it wasn't bad to devote my time to circulating Pryuta circuit like this. Soon, I fell into a trance observing and concentrating on my mana, to the point that I no longer heard the sounds around me. Auu, he looks like a painting even while he's asleep. Take a picture, hurry. I want to hug him. Mm. D don't take a picture of Shin. When we arrived at the pension too where the MT was held, it was about 5.30. When I opened my eyes realizing that the bus had stopped, Su Yiun's face was hovering in front of my own. Because of her well-defined facial features, I sometimes thought she was a foreigner. Close up, it was even more obvious. It was especially the case for her sharp nose bridge and big, manhwa character-like eyes. What are you doing? I was trying to wake you up. I wasn't even sleeping whatever, let's go. With my two elementals on my shoulders, I went outside with Su Yiyun, still circulating Pryuta circuit. The surrounding environment was clean, and there were no signs of civilization besides the pension in front of us. For a pension in the vicinity of Seoul, I was quite surprised by how nice it was. First, I looked around. We were far from the city and there was a mountain nearby. After two moon, the environment to watch out for the most was the mountains, followed by areas near mountains. By that standard, the place we were in was quite dangerous. This place a monster might appear here. Not funny. Even if something happens, we can just alert guardian, so don't worry. A female student that had approached me without me noticing laughed and answered my monologue. I nodded my head with an evasive mm. Next to me, Su Yiyun pulled on my sleeve. Let's go together, Shin. TSK. The female student clicked her tongue. I tilted my head, wondering why, and at the same time, caught sight of a female student stepping out of another bus. Blonde hair and blue eyes, she possessed a dazzling beauty that made those around her look a league below her. She was undoubtedly the international student called Goddess or whatnot. She also saw me, and winked. I winked back, thinking I should respond the same way. She seemed startled for a moment, but soon laughed and lightly waved her hand at me before going into the pension first. The male students that had gathered around her glared at me with scary expressions. It was truly laughable. Although Su Yiyun kept pulling on my sleeve with an uneasy expression, I only shook my head, unable to understand why. The way she was shaking was making me uneasy as well. Just what was she uneasy about? I pulled Su Yiyun toward me. Let's go. Even if a monster appears, it'll protect you. Kayak. Unable to understand why other girls were happy with what I said, the curtains were raised to my first MT. Read more here, HTTPS N. Wikipedia. Orgwiki membership training in Korea. 1. Sunbei Senpai Senior at Schoolwork Placid. 2. Pension is not meant to be mansion or a retirement plan, it's a large boarding house you can rent out. 
Chapter, 83. MT aren't all that special. That was what I felt. I just listened to some board professors talk and the 400 or so people were split into 20 groups. These groups were called classes, and it seemed these classes were formed at the freshman opening party. Did you know about this? No. Damn, to think a community like this was formed from the start of school. Watching the people separate into their classes, we looked pitiful. Of course, we weren't the only ones who didn't go to the freshman opening party, so with the help of our sunbase, we were able to join a class. Of the twenty classes, Su Yiun and I were in the same class. He he, we're in the same class. Ah, Kung Shin is in this class. Shit. Su Yiun followed him even here. We then grilled some meat and watched the talent show that others in our class prepared. I, of course, kept circulating per Yuta circuit, and realized that I wasn't fit for the campus life. Twenty people fiddling around with just two grills irritated me, and watching the people's amateurish dances made me want to trip them with my feet. After that, people went to the rooms assigned to their classes for drinks. People from other rooms sometimes barged in for drinking games, but I got tired of it all in exactly seventeen minutes. I didn't understand why they needed to play a game to drink alcohol. If they wanted to chug it that badly, that should just drink it by the bottle. As expected, college social life didn't really fit me. Although there must be more to it than just this, I had a strong feeling that whatever I was missing out on wasn't right for me anyways. Next time, I won't come. Why? Let's go to an MT with just our class. ITLL be fun. A girl drinking nearby asserted as she approached me. Class MT. I looked around at the 18 people besides Su Yiun and me. There were two Chinese international students. Both were male, and were talking to girls with rather obvious intentions. Su Yiun then screamed and hid behind my back, making them glare at me. Other than them, there was a male and female student who looked awkward around each other as if they just broke up. Group of guys that were planning on going to other rooms to pick up girls, and girls that strangely liked to give me more drinks. Wondering if they knew my identity and were trying to threaten me, I became nervous. Going to another MT with these people. I would rather die. After losing a few rounds of the drink games and drinking the special penalty drink, Su Yiun stuck herself on my back with a frown. Of course, I had to take more guys' glares because of it. Even though Su Yiun covered herself with her hoodie, it seemed people had found out how pretty she was. Hey, Shin. Uh, yeah. Ina. Barely remembering the name of the girl that called out to me, we exchanged drinks. After Su Yiun became too intoxicated to continue, the drinking game stopped, and everyone sat in a large circle and began talking about interesting things that had happened over the semester. Like general gossip or stories with famous Guardian or Freedom Wing members. Young and good-looking Guardian and Freedom Wing members became famous through appearances on TV networks, regardless of their abilities. It was the government's attempt to make the citizens feel familiar toward the awakened. I suspected that the government would eventually have TV shows where awakened hunted monsters. Are you really not going out with Yiyun? The girl pointed at Su Yiyun stuck to my back. Like a sloth, she had her arms on my back and was dozing off. She really didn't know shame. I'm not. We're just friends. But Yiyun likes you. She just doesn't have the courage to make friends other than me. It's definitely not just that. The girl sighed and looked at Su Yiyun with a look of pity. The girl, who I only knew as Ina, then asked. So. You don't have a girlfriend? Ooh. She's doing it. Go, go. The girls around me got louder. Pika and Ryue, who each sat on my shoulder, made growling noises. Thinking that this drinking party would continue for a while, I unsummoned them. Then, I answered her. I don't. Ooh. He says he doesn't. While others were talking excitedly, I suddenly smelled something strange. Something foul. I put my nose to the drink in my hand. It was a perfectly normal whiskey. Then where was the smell coming from? It smelled a bit like iron. I was definitely familiar with it. This was. The smell of blood. 
I slowly stood up. The others looked at me, but I didn't care. Su Yiyun, who also got up, rubbed her sleepy eyes. Hmm, what's wrong, Shin? Am I home? Why would I be in your home? If you're awake, go wash your face. As Su Yiyun didn't want to separate from me, I carried her on my back as I walked toward the windows and opened one. The outside was silent and still. No, the silence was immediately broken by the smell of chemicals as a small firework went up into the sky. It seemed people from other classes were setting fireworks. Regardless, I knew that a monster had not appeared outside. Was I mistaken? Then, the door opened. When I turned around, there was someone completely unexpected standing there. It was the French international student and a few of the male students that followed her around. Hook, it's Chloe. It's Chloe Blanc. The guys that had been planning to go to other rooms stopped and quietly sat back down. The girl called Chloe Blanc then walked into the room with a smile. The guys in my room already passed out. Do you guys mind if I join you? Her Korean was extremely fluent. Of course, no one declined and Chloe Blanc naturally joined us. At the same time, Su Yiyun began to shake and whispered in my ear. I, I don't like her. How rude. We haven't even met before. Besides, you shouldn't say that while you're hogging such a hot guy. She sure had good hearing. Su Yiyun was startled and stuck even closer to me. The guys started to complain and Blanc shrugged her shoulder. In Chloe Blanc. What are your names? The people in the room took turns introducing themselves. After waiting for them to finish, Blanc gave me a glance. I answered her shortly. Kong Shin. Shin. What a cool name. It matches your handsome face. I can say the same about you. Empty words, but I'll gladly take them. Drinks went back and forth again. Just her presence seemed to be sweetening up the atmosphere. The guys that were eyeing Su Yiyun changed their attentions to Chloe Blanc, making it easier for me. However, because her gaze was fixed on me, I felt a bit uncomfortable. The other girls also found it irritating. She has tons of other guys. Why? Arg, annoying. It seemed word had gone around that she was in this room as a few more guys came in. Because there was a limit to how many people we could fit, we had to turn them down. Although they brought up wanting to change members, no one accepted. I, on the other hand, wanted to get some fresh air. When I got up, Chloe Blanc suddenly stopped me. Where are you going, Shin? Take me with you. I want to talk to you more. I sat back down. The gazes from the other students became more hostile. What did this French international student want from me? As I wondered, Su Yiyun's shaking got worse. After a few more drinks were exchanged, I finally asked her boldly. Chloe Blanc, what's your objective? She hesitated slightly, then looked around the room. Following her eyes, I also looked around the room. Most of the students were lying on the floor, or had hazy eyes. Almost as if they were zombies. Almost as if someone made them like that. She honestly replied. I want to kill you and take your vital energy, Shin. She closed her eyes then opened them again. Vertical pupils that appeared were showing that she wasn't human. Shit. I knew she had been planning something, but I didn't think she was a monster. Su Yiyun pulled on me stronger. Realizing what was in front of her was a monster, Su Yiyun had activated her super vibration mode. You can't run. Do you think I was just drinking here for fun? I already captured everyone in this room. With that, Chloe Blanc gracefully raised her hand. One of the girls looking hazy naturally brought a cup to her hand. She did it respectfully, with both her hands. It's too late for you too, Shin. She smiled charmingly. I heard the sound of clothes ripping as a pair of black wings shot out from her back. They looked like enlarged bat wings. She then opened her mouth as she let out golden light from her eyes. I'll introduce myself again. My name isn't Chloe Blanc, though I did come from the country you humans call France. In Blood Succubus, the owner of the dungeon that appeared in France. An event raid has broken out. 
B rank 20 man raid, Blood Succubus. Because you were at the location of the raid boss, you will be forced to participate. You hold the priority for the event raid. Unless you want to reveal its existence, other dungeon explorers will not be notified until one hour later. I gritted my teeth. For some reason, she looked incredibly charming. Succubus. A monster said to appear in men's dreams and devour their vital energy. The succubus in front of me had the terrifying ability to charm both men and women in reality. Although she was only a B-rank 20-man raid boss, her special ability was undoubtedly frightening. I was trapped in her status effect. Before it was too late, I had to use Orc Lord's war cry. Kook, I already used it. I had already used Orc Lord's war cry in my battle against Dullahan this morning. Not only that, but I had also used Dark Thunder Explosion, Dragon Skin, and Die Hard. If I couldn't solve my status effect, I could really die. I had to escape. That was the only way I could live. I tried to activate return, but it didn't work. My instincts were refusing to let me leave I did not want to separate from her. I did not want to be far away from her. Even though I knew I would die. With the same reasoning, I could not let the other explorers know. Return, elemental summoning, deific manifestation, and even going into the dungeon, her charm was strong enough to prevent me from doing anything. Gritting my teeth, I asked while I could still talk freely. Francis Gate should have disappeared. That's right, but I wonder why. When I woke up, I was in Paris. Unfortunately, a scary oldie named Michelle kept chasing me, so I had to run. I managed to reach Charles de Gaulle Airport and sneaked onto a plane. It turned out that it was going to Seoul. Then, when I was wandering aimlessly, I met Chloe. She gave me her knowledge, body, and even her existence. She was such a good kid. Increased chance of an event raid happening where event dungeons disappeared. I finally understood what it meant. Currently, the world was full of bosses that had escaped their dungeons when event dungeons disappeared. It was just that their characteristics determined whether event raids broke out immediately or they hid themselves among humans, like the blood succubus I was looking at. I didn't know you were a monster. What do you mean, monster, how rude. Look at me, aren't I beautiful? Which part of me looks like a monster? The part. Kook. Where you killed humans. You already killed today too, right? Oh. But humans kill other humans too. You shouldn't call me a monster because of it. What a mannerless man. But you aren't wrong. You see, I already took care of five rooms. After all, today will be my last day at this college. I wanted to consume as much vital energy as possible tonight. In truth, you're tonight's main dish. She stood up. Throwing the glass cup and shattering it, she slowly walked towards me. Her long, slit pupils shined with evil and charm. The pure and boundless mana you have, it's too tempting. Did you know, I'm the one who planned this MT? When my eyes met hers, I could not move at all. Without Orc Lord's war cry, I was powerless against status effects. I should have realized it sooner, so that I could have planned for it. I had relied too much on the floor master skills, and this was the result. I was too ashamed of myself. It was then that I realized Su Yiyun's trembling had stopped. She was now murmuring to herself. I'm as scared. But. You stay still. I'll eat you too, after I'm done with Shin. I if I don't do it. I'll die. Shin will. Die. To protect Su Yiyun, I frantically tried to think of a solution. How could I escape this charm? If I could snap out of it for just a moment, I could rip that woman to shreds. However, white noise kept jamming my head. An irresistible attraction to her enveloped me. Any methods that I could use to separate from her, I myself was rejecting it. Right, she was my everything. Separating from her would have little meaning. If she wanted, I could even give my life, so why should I resist? I smiled. Blood succubus also smiled. Her eyes opened wide as they let out a radiant golden light. I felt like forgetting myself and sinking into them. 
At that moment, Su Yiyun stepped in front of me and raised her trembling hands. She even took off her hoodie, which I had never seen her without. Her long, beautiful, night black hair fluttered like water. Then, the blood succubus left eye was ripped out. Chapter, 84 Kayak Pika Ruyue The moment the succubus screamed crazily, I regained my consciousness and yelled out Pika and Ruyu's names. My two elementals immediately made their appearance. Kayak. Master. Are you okay? Are you okay? Before I become weird again, pull out her other eye. Taking my eyes off the succubus, I yelled at the top of my lungs. Although I also needed to request help from the other dungeon explorers. As I didn't know if they would come immediately and couldn't think straight from the fear of being completely subordinate to one being, I could only yell out my simple command. I could have also called Pryuta using deific manifestation, but I had forgotten about my reliable master from the extreme fear I felt. Pika and Ryue seemed to have noticed how desperate I was as they flew toward the succubus without even replying. I couldn't see it. I didn't see it. Kayak. You bitch, it'll kill you. Bloody raven wing. Flame cutter. Frozen arrow. Thunder spear. Things exploded and ravaged through the room. Although shards flew at me, as they were only remnant pieces of the attacks, they could not damage me by much. The students being controlled by the succubus could have been injured, but I wasn't in a position to worry about them. I then started to think about what had just happened. When I was about to give up my life to the succubus, when I stood there without being able to do anything, I could still vividly recall the sense of helplessness. But in that situation where my vital energy was about to be taken away, the succubus I was ripped out. However, all the other students should have been under succubus control, and because they were ordinary people, they could not have done anything, even if they weren't under her control. Before the succubus I was ripped out, Su Yiyun had taken off her hoodie. It meant she had withstood the succubus charm longer than me. Not to mention, Su Yiyun wasn't next to me right now. In that case, there was only one answer. The one who ripped out succubus I was Su Yiyun. How? She should have had monster phobia, and even if she didn't, how did she rip out the eye of a raid boss? Of course, the answer was simple. Su Yiyun didn't have monster phobia and instead had a strong ability that allowed her to rip out the eye of a B-rank raid boss. Her stealth ability didn't just hide her appearance, it hid her ability as well. Everyone rise. Kill these damn things. At the succubus shrill voice, I snapped out of my thoughts and raised my head. The students that were watching blankly on the ground began to rise. Shit. In this place where lightning, fire, and ice flew around, their lives would be in danger just by getting up. No matter how desperate the situation was, I couldn't just stand and watch students throw themselves into a pit of fire. But what could I do? After a bit of thought, I remembered I had a way to stop them. Kayak. You used Vengeful Spirit's Whale. All enemies within its area become confused and feared. Weak. I can't see in front of me. I have to complete Master's orders. Hike, don't come here. Stop. Although they were being controlled by the succubus, they still had the physical abilities of ordinary students. After being affected by Vengeful Spirit's Whale, they fought each other or rolled on the ground. One by one, I hurriedly picked them up and threw them out into the hallway. I could smell blood rising from the hallway. She really killed so many people. Damn it, had no one contacted Guardian yet? Now that I thought about it, there wasn't anyone to contact them. This damned succubus must have charmed people the moment she sneaked into the college. Since this MT was started by her, it was likely the pension security cameras weren't working either. Past the open door, a thundering sound rang out. A chill ran down my back. This woman was calling her minions. To use the Dungeon Explorer communication channel that I had been forgetting about, I put my hand on my mouth. At that moment. Kayak. My eyes, my eyes. Master, that strange woman pulled out both her eyes. Her charming power disappeared. That woman is scary. Scary. Pika and Ryue flew back toward me. Her charming power disappeared. 
recalling the sense of helplessness I felt, I turned around carefully. There, I saw Su Yiyun fully revealing her pretty face and fluttering black hair, and attacking the blood succubus. She disappeared and reappeared here and there, while her hands were dyed red from the blood succubus blood. Su Yiyun's eyes glowed red, unlike normal. Using stealth, she hid herself from the succubus, then attacked with her fingernails when the succubus made an opening. Her fingernails clearly had mana imbued into them, giving them a red aura. Although slightly barbaric, she was flashy and strong. As for the blood succubus, even as blood dripped down from her eye sockets, she managed to detect Su Yiyun's location and threw magic at her. As expected of a raid boss monster. The walls were already destroyed and the windows were all shattered. If things got worse, the entire building could collapse. After taking succubus attacks, Su Yiyun was bleeding here and there. Although her attack power was strong, her defense was low. At this rate, they would both kill each other. Since I knew I no longer had to worry about blood succubus charm, I couldn't just stand here and watch Su Yiyun get beaten. I took out black earthen spear from my inventory. Although I considered using deific manifestation for a moment, I threw the thought out soon. What was I afraid of? I had to get revenge with my own hands. I shouldn't back away, especially after knowing I was strong enough. Pika. Got it. Without having to say much, Pika went into my spear. Possibly because she felt the fluctuation of energy, the blood succubus, who was still dripping blood from her two eye sockets, looked at me. It was truly a sight of horror. Thanks, Yiyun. You can rest now. Oot. Su Yiyun was startled by my voice, then obediently fell back. I was worried about her mental state from her sudden change, but it seemed she was okay. At the same time Su Yiyun fell back, I charged at the blood succubus. You. The blood succubus hesitated about who to attack between me and Su Yiyun, but in the end, she chose the one who was charging at her, me. Dozens of fireballs appeared in the air and flew toward me. Ruyues snorted. Ice wall. Although they were both B-rank raid bosses, there was a clear difference between the 20-man raid blood succubus and the 500-man raid giant iron boar. Given ample amount of mana, Ryu's ice wall stood strong even after receiving all of the blood succubus attacks. In truth, the succubus without her charm ability was like a tiger without its claws. There was nothing to be afraid of. I used divine speed. In the blink of an eye, I was in front of the succubus. Swinging my spear, I first cut off one side of the succubus' wings. It was because her wings were exuding an aura of charm. Although she wasn't strong enough to charm me without her eyes, there was no need to leave behind a potential source of danger. Quiak. W8. The succubus finally seemed to have noticed my strength. A dumb monster would have attacked without understanding the difference in strength and died, but the blood succubus, who was having a life or death battle with Su Yiyun just a moment ago, shrunk back like the mouse in front of a cat. Wait, wait, let me live. Please. I, I'll give you my loyalty. I'm just a poor succubus. That woman is the one who bullied me. If you save me from her, I can even give you my body. Don't need it. I interrupted her. I didn't want to waste any more time by listening to her. Who knew if she'd recover during that time and pull a fast one on me? I just wanted to live. I'll be loyal to you, so please, don't kill me. I won't kill that woman either. I was only a little excited because I appeared in a world like this. I, I'll apologize. My body will be quite useful. Your body, huh? Why yes. Once my eyes recover, it'll serve you with a beauty that no man can resist. I will do anything you want, so please let me live. I will be your slave. A succubus that can take the form of a beauty. What men wouldn't be tempted by being able to have such a woman? Her offer was indeed tempting and she chose her words well. However, she chose the wrong opponent. Then who's going to pay for all those that died? Pay. What do you? Buy. Why? Without a shred of hesitation, I severed the succubus head. 
The black earthen spear, which I had poured ample amount of mana into while waiting, had easily sliced through her neck. I caught the succubus head, which had flown into the air. Now that she was dead, she really wasn't much. I became frustrated, realizing I could have died from being charmed by her so easily. I would have to reflect on this time and time again. At the same time the succubus lost her life, the students that were rolling the floor stopped moving. They were no longer in her control and had fainted. In the next moment, a fanfare rang out. Event raid complete. With just one member, you succeeded in the event raid. This great achievement increases the rewards by an enormous amount. Your vastly superior rank to the raid boss decreases the rewards by an enormous amount. You completed an event raid and obtained one stat point as reward. You obtained blood succubus earrings. Leaving the messages behind for later, I turned around and looked at Su Yiyun. She was looking at me blankly, then realizing that I was staring at her, she snapped out of her daze. She held up her hands and saw the blood on them. Her lips and hands began to shake, which then spread to the rest of her body. It was the symptom that made me suspect she had monster phobia. And no, Shin. I it's not me. I it's not, s so don't be afraid. Afraid. After hearing that, I began to understand the real reason she trembled in front of monsters. She wasn't afraid of monsters. She was afraid of herself, who became exceedingly cruel when fighting monsters, and she was afraid of others who became scared after watching her. I retorted. What do you mean afraid? You were really cool. Plus, I'm the one who sent her head flying. Why would I be afraid of you for something like that? I was a bit sorry since my words might not have been the most comforting. However, they seemed to have worked as Su Yiyun's shaking became weaker. Her eyes, which still glowed red, grew bigger. See cool. I wasn't scary. Yeah, extremely cool, like a female warrior. Ah, uh, I'd still recommend you use a weapon though. But you were a lot of cooler than when you shook in front of a monster. Ah uh, really? I was cool. I nodded my head without hesitation. Since I was saying what I honestly felt, there was no reason to hold back. Su Yiyun had saved me when I was about to die. If I were a girl, I would have fallen for her valiant appearance. Su Yiyun started crying. Without showing any signs of doing so, she sobbed abruptly. Hick, hick. Uh, hey, what, why, did I do something wrong? Hick, Yua. She ran to my embrace and cried her heart out. It seemed I didn't do anything wrong. In fact, it was probably the opposite. I would be glad if she could let off some of the burden in her heart, but I was still flustered, as I could do nothing to stop her from crying. Other students in the building would soon realize what had happened. If we wanted to avoid being found out, we would have to escape soon. There was no other choice. I first called out to Pika and gave her a special order and ample mana. After Pika got out of the room, I put my hand on Su Yiyun's shoulder and comforted her. There, there, Su Yiyun. Don't cry. I don't know what happened in the past, but let's first wash ourselves off and get rid of the damn evidence, alright? Hick, you called me intimately before as just Yiyun. British, Lucan, or Korean, why did they care so much about how their names were called? All right, Yiyun. No more crying. Let's clean up and go rest, okay? I'll hear you out. Hick, hick, you. It seemed it would take a while before she would stop crying. I patted Su Yiyun. Yiyun, who was crying in my embrace and looked up at the night sky through the broken windows. The two moons were unusually bright tonight. Almost as if to signify that the world had changed. Almost as if to say there was still time before the sun would rise. Chapter, 85 I had asked Pika to destroy all electronics within and around the pension. As a lightning elemental, she was skilled in detecting electricity. It was something that only she could do. Smartphones, cameras, security cameras, monitors, etc. Not a single electronic device was spared. Although it required a lot of mana, it was easily solved with two bottles of mana potions. Unfortunately, even Yiyun and my phones were destroyed. 
Although the blood succubus must have put some effort into removing the evidence, I wanted to be sure. Pika was perfect for the job. As an elemental, cameras could not see her, and as a lightning elemental, she had talent in easily breaking electronic gadgets. What I was most worried about were the memories of the students that were controlled by the blood succubus. Depending on the circumstances, I might need to completely modify my plans. Thankfully, I managed to rouse and question a student, who could not remember anything. In fact, the student could only barely remember coming to the MT. I was glad I didn't need to silence all the witnesses. Ah, the student I woke up. I made him chug alcohol until he passed. I mean, slept. He would probably not remember the questions I asked. Next, we created our alibis. First, while the students were sleeping from the aftereffects of being under the succubus control, I made Ryue clean us up. As an ice elemental, she cleaned us as following. Eight, freeze. Like that, she froze everything blood, dust, etc. on our bodies except our clothes. We then wiped off and threw everything in the toilet. With that, we didn't need to take a shower or wash our clothes. After experiencing the power of elementals, Su Yiyun touched her body with a blank expression, then became excited. Amazing. I want one too. I hate you. Scary. After retorting to Yiyun, Ryue flew toward me and hid behind my head. She couldn't hear or see you anyways, Ryue. Drink this. We have to get rid of your injuries too. As I patted Ryue, I gave Yiyun a potion. It was the potion I chose when the floor masters didn't drop elixirs or the equipment parts one wanted. Since I couldn't give the potions from the floor shop to others, I had to give her one of these potions, of which I only had a little amount. What's this? A potion. You'll find out if you drink it. As expected, Yiyun made a fuss soon after. I ignored her and healed my own injuries. With this, we were perfectly clean. What? It would be weird if our surroundings were a mess and we were perfectly clean. Of course, it would. But there was a reason for us to be this clean. We had to pretend we were never here tonight. When people began to investigate, the people at the scene of crime would be questioned first. Although we might just be burying our heads in the sand, we had to try to avoid it first. People usually sleep in other rooms anyways. We should pretend we did that too. I in another room. With just us two. You you, I'm nervous. No, we're obviously going to be with others. Hey, why were you making that clearly disappointed face? Even as I was lost for words at her expression, I cleaned the room that became a mess from the fire, ice, and lightning. Although no one would find out I did it, it was best to get rid of as much evidence as possible. I also picked up the students I threw out into the hallway and threw them back in. With that, everything was more or less done. All right, now we just have to go to some other room, pretend to have fainted, and act surprised when we wake up in the morning. Shin, you're evil. It's for our peaceful lives, so cooperate. My plan was as followed. Tomorrow, people would freak out when they saw that people had died and that Chloe Blanc had disappeared. New Moon Agency would deploy Guardian to investigate without being able to obtain much information. At least, I hoped they wouldn't. I had used two elementals to get rid of the evidence. If they found dirt on me, they would reassess my ability as an elementalist. Anyways, I would then appear a few days later as Yan Wu. I would tell the New Moon Agency that I coincidentally met a succubus that claimed to be the owner of a dungeon beyond the gate, and promptly took care of her. Although the plan seemed full of holes, the succubus disguise ability was real, so I could just play around it. The whole world had to find out about this incident. They needed to understand that dungeon bosses had spread out across Earth, so they could prepare themselves for it. The things I had to be wary about were how to explain me running into the succubus who had left the pension, or the people from Guardian that would get on my back trying to get the corpse of the succubus from me. Of course, I would insist that I met the succubus by chance and I had no reason to give them the succubus corpse. Beginning from the succubus eyes Yiyun took out, I would not let even a single hair of the succubus fall into the hands of the government. Anyone that dared to covet my belongings would get a beating from me. I would have no mercy. For the record, 
I exchanged the eyes Yi Yoon took out for taking her out for fries five times. Although I thought I was taking advantage of her, she was the one who offered. Just like that, the succubus golden eyes ended up in my hands. I decided to give something to Yi Yoon later to make up for it. In fact, I already knew what to give her. It was time to carry out my plan. Yi Yoon and I found a room to go into. As the succubus charm had reached this place, everyone was lying on the ground fainted. We found a place to sit and leaned against each other. Once I sat down, the tension built up in my body released, making me sigh naturally. Hugh. I want to lie down and sleep. Give up. Yeah, I did. Who would find a nice place to lie down and sleep in this mess? I decided to be happy that I could at least be clean as I leaned against Yiyun. Just like that, we stayed silent for a little while. Yiyun was the first one to break the silence. You want ask? You can talk about it when you're ready. She went silent again, then as if to say everything she had been holding back, she opened her mouth again. You see. I fought against monsters in front of my family. Family, huh? Yeah. For some reason, whenever I see monsters, I get the urge to fight them. That time. Before I realized it, I was pulling out the monster's heart with my bare hands. I imagined a pretty girl laughing as she took out a monster's heart. It was indeed not the most pleasant image. In any case, she had an innate gift. An innate gift for fighting. Even while she was usually perfectly normal, whenever she saw monsters, she would want to shred them to pieces. Monsterphobia. Absurd. She was a monster slaughterer. I can't forget the way they were looking at me then. It was as if they weren't looking at a human being, much less their own family member. Even though I saved them, even though I was their daughter and sister. In the end, I couldn't stand it and left the house to live by myself. Apparently, ever since that day, she would freeze when she saw monsters because she remembered the way her family looked at her. I never imagined something like that could have happened to Yiyun. But the day I met Shin, watching you fight. I thought, wow, so you can be this cool and beautiful while fighting. What? I didn't hear that towards the end. Plus, I didn't think I was that cool. If I remembered right, I just pierced a pigeon with an iron pipe. A anyways. I thought good things would happen if I stayed with you. You should have said it earlier and asked for help. H how could I? It's hard for me to say it, even now. Sorry, I was too thoughtless. Yiyun stopped talking for a moment. I waited silently. Soon, she continued. But today, because you. Looked like you would get killed. I would have, if not for you. I wanted to continue pretending like I had monsterphobia. I didn't want to show you my ugly side. Like I said, you were cool. With a light smile, Su Yiyun continued. When the thought of you dying crossed my mind, I forgot my parents' faces for an instant. Before I noticed, with my hands. I was digging out that woman's eye. So you knew where to attack instinctively. I can't believe I didn't realize you had such talent before. As a martial artist, I'm ashamed. And because Shin kept saying I was cool. I forgot my parents' faces forever. Forever. You're sure you won't remember them for life? At my question, Su Yiyun nodded her head vigorously. From now, I think you'll be fine if I'm with you. Yup, I'm sure I will. Good to be of help. I was happy that such an ability user of such caliber could finally use her full potential. I was happier that that person was my friend, and I was extremely happy that she had stepped up to protect me. Though, because the amount of contact her body was making with mine kept increasing, I was feeling a bit uncomfortable. So take good care of me. Forever. Like I said, forever is exaggerating too much. Regardless, take good care of me too. As ability user comrades. Hee <laughs> hee. I really like you. Yeah, well, me too. Then, Yiyun suddenly shot up and held my shoulders. Her eyes, which had turned black after the fight ended, were expanded to a scary size. The shoulders she grabbed onto hurt. 
Then, she said some nonsense that I would never forget about for the rest of my life. Then is today our day one. No, that's a bit. I don't have any plans to date for a while. I have to run the dungeon. Yiyun paled and froze in place. In truth, I froze too. What just happened? Although I rejected her on reflex, did she just confess to me? What kind of a confession was that? That was the second confession out of the blue since the one from my third year of high school. Was it a prank? But I should have broken all the cameras already. I fell into a state of panic. Yiyun fell on the ground. I thought you liked me. That's called being overconfident. But you bought me fries. I think your standard of judgment has long passed a normal person's level. Although I liked her, I had never thought of her as a member of the opposite sex. To think that was what she thought this whole time, it seemed Yiyun has also been single her whole life. Ren, be happy. I found another comrade. DDD do you maybe have someone you like? No. Good. Then he'll wait. I can wait. No, that's a bit pressuring. Yiyun ignored what I said and openly looked relieved. When I was watching her, the back of my neck began to itch. I couldn't believe that a girl this pretty liked me. Of course, compared to the days when I was gorilla bodied, I looked much better now. But back then, I had once given up, thinking, in this world, it might be impossible to date without taking appearance into consideration. Just because someone said she liked me, I couldn't just say, oh, really? That's what I thought. I felt like I was dreaming, like I was floating among the clouds. As such, although I was a bit sorry, I couldn't accept her confession. Thus, I gave her an offer. I can't really say it's in its stead, but Yiyun. Why you want to start out as just friends? But we're already friends. No, it's not something dumb like that. Something dumb. There's something I want to offer to an awakened full of talent and desire to beat monsters. Looking at Yiyun who was frozen without understanding what I was saying, I spoke with a smile. Do you want to try becoming a first dungeon explorer? Chapter, 86 The next day, the entire pension flipped upside down. People found out that over 100 people had been killed. There were rooms where everyone inside was dead, leaving behind only dried up corpses, while there were people simply sleeping in rooms the blood succubus had not gotten to. Because of it, the incident became even more of a headache. Ruling out the possibility that this was done by a person, the professors and staff immediately reported the incident to Guardian. Then, they saw the traces of fighting in the room Yiyun and I were in, safely concluding that the incident was caused by a monster. However, they thought it was strange that no victims arose from that room. The guardians that arrived later on were convinced that a human had interfered in the incident, but as they did not have the authority to investigate, they had to leave it to the police through the New Moon Agency. The police, of course, disagreed with them slightly. They were sure that a monster had been behind the attack, and said that if a person was involved, that person must have fought the monster to prevent more people from dying. In the end, they could not find a lead on the truth of the incident. Because of the sheer number of students staying at the pension, they couldn't investigate each and every one of them. Had Guardian and the police agency had a more definite relationship of cooperation, things could have been different, but their relationship was rocky, to say the least. It was because the Guardians appeared and saved citizens from monsters in times of danger, which took away from the positive views the citizens had of the normal police. To be more specific, the police agency did not enjoy having to cooperate with the Guardian whenever monster-related incidents occurred, and Guardian likewise did not trust the police agency. As this had been going on since the beginning of Two Moon, the two agencies were only friendly on the outside, while they were no different than enemies outside of the public eye. We do have to be thankful though, since they just let it slide by. Thanks to their rocky relationship, we were able to return to our home safely. At the same time, I made Yiyun into a first dungeon explorer and taught her the things I knew. Even as she seemed confused, she listened to me. I thought she was more than capable of climbing the first dungeon with her excellent stealth ability and attack power, but she seemed happier to be doing the same work as me. 35th floor. It'll be there quick. No, that's impossible. Like I said, 
you need to grind. I can just level up quickly to make up for it. She was saying the same thing father said. Upon thinking about it, I thought that wasn't a bad idea. After all, with her superb ability, leveling up might be better. Giving up grinding and speeding through the dungeon was indeed something she could do. Though, of course, things would get harder the higher she climbed. I advised her to do solo raids if she could. She was overwhelmingly stronger than me when I was on the first floor. Her ability would only get stronger as she climbed as well. As such, she would have no trouble doing solo raids. I told her to at least consume one elixir of each type as they immediately raised stats. Yiyun then nodded her head in understanding. I told her the strategy for going through the lower floors and ways for her to get used to the dungeon as quickly as possible. However, she didn't listen to me and was just staring fixedly at my face. Hee hee, this is nice. I like it. What's this? Mm. Um, you know, this. Hi hi. Yiyun skirted around the details and laughed happily. I thought I saw the wagging of a puppy tail, but it was just my imagination. First, I flicked her forehead a few times for not listening to me properly, then explained again. However, it was of no use. She was laughing even as I hit her. For someone that was just rejected, I wondered why she was so happy. Since I felt like she would confess again if I asked, I didn't do so. My entire body felt itchy. Ah, by the way. I'm, I'm. For the time being, leave the Dungeon Explorer communication channel off. I emphasized again. Who knows if you'll slip something. Okay. Yiyu nodded her head as if she was just given a top secret mission. I was satisfied with that. Then, I told the other explorers about what happened last night. Yun Wawu, are you unhurt? Are you okay, Wawunim? Yeah, I'm fine. I wouldn't be talking in here otherwise. I'm going to go to the New Moon Agency to disclose what happened. Masterfordes SI, please back up my claims later. It'd be better if you can come to Korea. Hmm. Like I said, call me Wa. Ah, uh, mm, yeah. I'll try. To think all those event dungeon bosses could be hiding in various countries, how terrifying. You must have had it rough, Yun Wawu. Thanks for comforting me, Master for SSI. Then, Waya sent me a private message. Then can you come support me here too, Yun Wawu? We haven't been able to advance recently. You can even come as Thunder Knight. I'll think about it. If you can stop China from getting in the way, I'd be happy to go. I always did want to see Windermere. Don't worry, China isn't in any position to hold you accountable, and Britain sees Thunder Knight rather favorably. We call you a true knight. I'm sure everyone will receive you happily. Got it, but don't call me Thunder Knight. Just like that, we made a secret agreement of cooperation. Walker then joined the communication channel. Yun Wawu. You seem rather close to Masterford. Walker, I think that's just you being a loner. Walker SSI, Wawu Nim is different. He's Takamikazuchi Nim's incarnation. No, that's not right, Minami SSI. I did like the name since it sounded strong, but I wasn't Takamikazuchi, but Hermes. It's important so don't get it confused. Though I couldn't tell her that. A few days later, I visited the New Moon Agency as Yun Wawu, wearing Otta's secret and the Wraith Queen set. When I explained the circumstance to the manager, he looked at me like I was an idiot. You're talking about Francis Gate? I think you're going too far with your joke. Is that so? I opened the coffin I was carrying on my back, revealing the succubus corpse. I had temporarily stitched back the wing I cut off and her charming golden eyes. I looked into it, and it turns out this girl is an international student from XX College's business department. You know, a student of the school that had that recent massacre. Mm -hmm. Indeed, this monster goes above the normal standards. Not to mention, the corpse contains a considerable amount of mana. Yun Wawu SSI should have been A rank. Did you kill this monster alone? My ability must have gotten stronger. I claimed. She said she came from beyond Francis Gate. It's probably something to make sure of. 
I knew something was strange the moment those damned gates disappeared. It might be easy to just laugh it off, but you should know what the smart decision should be. After all, who knows if something like this will happen again. The manager became silent for a while, then spoke. This is outside of my jurisdiction. I might have to bother you for a little while longer, is that fine? I hope you can pay me the proper hourly wages. I retorted with a smile. That evening, S ranker Yun Wawu held a press conference that appeared on all three broadcast TV news channels. I thought New Moon Agency would take care of the press conference if I just reported the problem, but the so-called chief of New Moon Agency passed the baton on to me. His reasoning was that strength equal trust. It was possible, as Korea did not have an SS ranker. Although I was a bit nervous about going on TV, the mask I was wearing helped me relax. I first introduced myself, then explained about the event raid. Of course, I didn't use the exact terminology. The moment I explained my ability was martial arts based on lightning attribute mana, I received questions asking if I was Thunder Knight. These journalists sure did their jobs well. I spoke evasively, saying I wished I could be Thunder Knight, then continued to howl and when I met the succubus. When I revealed that succubus had told me she had come from beyond Francis Gate, a barrage of questions flew in my direction. How can we trust those words? If you don't want to believe them, you don't have to. I'm here to warn the world about a potential danger, not to argue whether I'm right or wrong. Do you have proof? There's no way to bring this succubus back to life, but I'm sure there are other monsters that can take the form of humans. I believe the world should be more alert. Do you have a girlfriend? You, follow me. Even after one of the carefully selected reporters got dragged out, the press conference continued smoothly. Just like the New Moon Agency's chief said, it was hard for them to ignore the words of one of Korea's 4S rankers. In truth, my goal wasn't to get them to take my words seriously, but to just let the world be aware of the possibility and stay alert. However, as the Korean media made a huge deal out of the press conference, the story began to spread to other countries like wildfire. The New Moon Agency also asked for my opinions a few more times, and even formed a new department with Guardian. Although they asked for my cooperation, I declined respectfully. Of course, when they asked if I could give them the succubus corpse, I declined a bit more violently. Mom, Appa is on TV. Come see. You know you can't tell your friends, right? Of course, Appa. Yua was purely happy that I appeared on TV and stared at it fixedly. Mother, on the other hand, tilted her head, seeing me disguised as Yun Wawu. Why does your jawline become so slender with that mask? It doesn't look good. I like it though. It's thin and nice. It's too thin. You're perfect the way you are now, son. I like the current Appa too. For now, I decided to record you as line. Father felt indignation that his son went on broadcast TV before him as a well-known martial artist, he had been on cable TV before. His eyes burned as he vowed to find an event raid boss. Father, we both went on broadcast TV before. Though we were both wearing armor. Wyatt kept her promise. After my press conference, she went on Britain's TV, supporting me in insisting that countermeasures had to be put in place. She had found the time to do so even while she was busy with graveyard over the lake. Although she apologized for being unable to come to Korea, I told her it was okay. Then, I decided that I would visit Britain soon. The British government officially requested aid from other countries' SS and S rankers. The situation had become too dire for them to worry about their pride. Though, no country had sent an SS ranker outside of their own country. In truth, Japan and America were both in trouble as well. For Japan, they seemed to care about their pride as they insisted they would take care of it on their own. As they only had a beer rank dungeon, it seemed it would not take long for them to take care of it. The real problem was with America's S rank field dungeon, Wyvern's Nest. It was a terrifying place where the S rank monster, Wyvern, appeared. Not to mention, as Wyverns had wings, they were constantly expanding their territory. People were worried that at this rate, other canyons near Page would become dungeons. Although America's SS ranker seemed to be holding on, they would soon have to borrow the strength of other countries like Britain. 
wyverns. I wanted to try hunting them. In any case, after making plans to visit Britain, my business on Earth had been taken care of. News, newspapers, and even magazines tried to focus their stories around Korea's 4th S ranker, Yun Wawu, but he was a rogue and they could not find any information about him. Whenever I worked as Yun Wawu, I used return, thus shrouding my identity in secrets. While the mass media was focused on Yun Wawu's identity, I focused on the dungeon. After all, in the dungeon, there was something I had to quickly take care of. Chapter 87 Blood Succubus Earring Unique Durability 8585 Equipment Limits Level 35, One Who Defeated the Blood Succubus Options Magic 10, Intelligence 5, Charm 15 When equipped, you will emit a scent that easily attracts members of the opposite sex. Although it was still great, the Blood Succubus Earring I was excited about didn't have the ability I hoped it would have as such, I asked Lin about what to do. What? Mental protection. As he looked at me with disappointment, I explained what had happened. When he heard I was charmed and almost killed by the blood succubus, his expression was quite the sight. You, did you really get charmed by something so weak? Are you an idiot? That's why I'm trying to find a countermeasure. After all, I can't stay like this. Kuhum. You, do you know what the best method is to protect your mind? I tilted my head. With a sigh, Lin explained. Your magic is the most important factor. The higher your magic stat is, the easier it gets to overcome mental attacks. Then, it's intelligence, followed by charm. I understand why intelligence would be important. But why charm? Charm doesn't just make you look pretty. It affects how others react to your presence. It doesn't need to be explained in detail, just know that having high charm makes it easier to defend against mental status effects. Then I guess he'll have to wear these earrings. But Lin, you can't raise charm with bonus stat points, only through equipment or title effects. Though, they do go up by themselves occasionally. Lin struck down at his anvil with his hammer and retorted. So raise your intelligence. Is. Is that the only way? Of course, there are other ways. Skill. You can learn a skill that protects you from status effects. How? I remember it being extremely tricky to learn on your own. With that, Lin made a circle with his thumb and finger. He wanted money. When I took out 5,000 gold, he smirked. When I took out 30,000 gold, he shook his head. In the end, he accepted 50,000 gold, which I took out with trembling hands. Then, he continued. Try succeeding on the 40th floor solo raid. You scammer. I just gave you an answer though. Lin hummed and continued hammering away. Although I gritted my teeth and watched him, there was nothing I could do. After all, he had not lied. At least, he had pointed out what I should do. Though, since I couldn't do anything about it now, I decided to set aside the countermeasure for mental attacks. When I was about to head out to find Dullahan, Lin stopped me. In truth, there's a third method. You can wear an equipment that has that effect. One that doesn't raise stats to defend against mental attacks, but one that can directly defend your mind. That's what I hoped the succubus earrings were, but they weren't. Do you perhaps sell an item like that at the floor shop? What are you talking about? You already have the material. I tilted my head, and Lin gave me an evil smirk. You, have you ever heard of the phrase, poison as medicine? You mean. The succubus corpse, give it to me. With a 50,000 gold deposit, it'll work on it. Lin, so that was what the 50,000 gold was for. Thank you. I was deeply touched and did not hesitate to show him my gratitude. Lin let out a few dry coughs and nodded his head. Then, he gave a very unforgettable follow-up. It's separate from the information fee I just received, so don't misunderstand. Ack. It was the first time since I met Lin that he got me so well. I reflected on my experience with the succubus greatly. Until now, I had been too easygoing. Never expecting to meet monsters in my daily life was one thing, but what was more important was that I panicked when I couldn't use Orc Lord's war cry when I wanted to. 
There were plenty of things I could have done before things had gotten too serious. Was I relying on my skill collector abilities too much? Why didn't I make use of all that I could? The biggest problem was that I did not use deific manifestation then. What was I saving it for? Wasn't it exactly for dangerous situations like that? Stupid, truly stupid. Why didn't I fully use my abilities? Was it because the enemies I faced until now were too easy? Was it because everything could be solved using floor master skills? I was truly stupid. Giving my all no matter who I faced was expected of a martial artist. Father had always emphasized it. Not to mention, even though I knew the abilities I was relying on had a once per day restriction, I panicked and became frightened when I couldn't use them. My judgment had wavered as well. If father found out, I would undoubtedly have to go through another thrashing phase. Luckily, I did not lose my life this time. In fact, it became a good opportunity for Yi Yoon to overcome her trauma and become a first dungeon explorer. Things had really turned out well. However, that didn't mean that such a loss was acceptable. Even I could not accept it. This failure was a good opportunity for me to overcome my weakness and grow. If I had realized it later, I might have regretted it a lot more. Everyone made mistakes. What was important was to not make the same mistake again. I decided to take this critical failure to heart, and to recall it whenever I found myself becoming lax. I vowed to change myself. That included changing my foolish old self that was too reliant on Orc Lord's war cry and did not pay attention to mental defense, and did not think I would run into monsters in real life. It also included becoming able to use all my abilities, not just the floor master skills, to their limit. Thankfully, I had an appropriate opponent. It was the strong enemy I had to face three times a day, Dullahan. He was strong and had techniques. He was a good opponent to use to push myself to my limit. The first time I fought Dullahan, I was too reliant on floor master skills. Although I won as a result, I didn't think it was a complete win. Of course, it was true that Dullahan's skill was cheaty, but what about when I first fought the Orc Lord? When I fought against the Orc Lord's cheaty war cry, did I have the pocket watch? Did I even have mana? No, the answer was no. I grasped each and every movement the Orc Lord made and his next movements, calculated the best trajectory to parry his attacks, and patiently dealt blows to his body. Although it took a long time to conquer him, I did it using pure physical ability. Although my vitality had reached zero a few times in the process, I was a lot more of a warrior back then than I was now. I didn't mean I would go back to how I was. After all, I was both a warrior and a dungeon explorer. I meant that I would not rely on any one ability and give my all in battles. Vowing to myself, I opened the door to the 35th floor master room. Fight me, Dullahan. You already defeated a being identical to me. Without stopping his horse from pawing the ground violently, Dullahan spoke as he aimed his axe toward me. I nodded my head and patted Ryue. As the bond between an elementalist and his elementals became thicker, he could communicate his intentions without having to say it in words. He could even directly transmit his thoughts and make the elementals move accordingly. Because of the shocking way Ryue and I met, the bond one shared with Ryue was as thick, or even thicker than the bond one shared with Pika. If I wanted to fight on Ryu's back, communication between us was key. Although I didn't think it was necessary until now, I had changed my mind. Not doing it when I could was simply stupid. I feel good, like I can do anything. If you let Master get hurt again, I'm going to smack you. I want. I like Shin more. I like him more. Elementals, I am glad that you like me, but now is not the time to fight. You're ruining my cool moment. I once again softly patted Ryue. I closed my eyes for a moment, then opened them. Be prepared, Dullahan. I'm not so thoughtless that I would let my guard down around a strong opponent like you. Come. No, but you don't even have a head. Stop. No more jokes. I passed my thoughts on to Ryue in my head. The path she should take and how fast she should do so were all outlined in my head. It also included how I would attack Dullahan. Ryue kicked off the ground without any warning and charged at Dullahan. 
I lowered my body on top of her and held my spear up. Dullahan also held up his axe. If I was strict and serious, his axe martial art technique was about mid-rank level 5. Since that was the average skill level of explorers on the 35th floor, he was truly strong. However, my spear technique was high rank level 5. Why was I evaluating him like I was a normal explorer? Because of it, my spear was intimidated and my attacks were less sharp. Overestimating the opponent was just as bad as underestimating your own strength. Having a higher martial arts rank and level did not just mean having stronger attacks. It meant I could overpower the enemy in technique. Without being hit by the enemy's attack, I would deliver a blow to him. That would be the start of my advantage. Hap. Foz. Kook. Last time, Dullahan had fully defended against my spear attack. This time, however, his awkward defense made his balance waver, and allowed me to deliver consecutive stabs. Kook. I'm not stopping. I did not pay attention to his head. With my consecutive stabbing, I aimed at the areas of the axe where his strength wasn't concentrated, then changed my focus to his arm. At the same time, I ordered Ryue to attack his black horse. Although Ryue fought well by herself, we had to work together to increase the synergy between us. You dare. You're going to throw it, right? As Dullahan pulled his axe back, I focused on stabbing Dullahan's wrist. At the same time, Pika used Thunder Arrow to attack the axe that was about to leave his hand. Every time her lightning arrows collided with his axe, the lightning energy traveled through the axe and caused Dullahan to twitch. While he couldn't recover his balance, I dealt more attacks. My beloved mount, blazed the enemy. Ruyue. Auu. As I thought, the black horse also had a special function. At Dullahan's shout, the black horse inhaled a deep breath. At the same time, Ryue swiftly poured ice breath on its face. After breathing in the freezing energy, the black horse coughed and fainted. Its throat must have frozen, preventing it from breathing. Dullahan, you were finished the moment you rode a living horse as an undead. Although Dullahan quickly got up and tightly gripped his axe, I delivered a great shock to his wrist using my spear. Ryue raised her front legs. Shining with snow white light, Ryue tried to stomp on Dullahan's legs and freeze him. An elemental. I've already heard that line before. After raising my spear up on Ryu's back, I activated heroic strike and sent my spear, which had turned into a white lightning, into its body. Dullahan had a material body, and obviously had bones. As such, he received 50% additional critical damage. Skullbreaker, what a cheaty title. I continued to stab Dullahan's body. Then, when the head he was dearly protecting with one arm glowed, I immediately made Ryue fall back. I had fallen to that once before. Sudden rise. It was a strange skill that made Dullahan's body stand up no matter what position he was in. At the same time, he let out a dark fog that paralyzed anyone it touched. If I hadn't fallen back, the tide of battle might have been overturned. Qua. As expected, the moment I made Ryue fall back, Dullahan shot up while emitting a black fog. In his hand was his ghostly axe. Although he charged at me and swung his axe down, Ryue dodged to the side while I attacked his legs, which still had some of Ryu's frost. Dullahan's body tilted and the axe hit the ground magnificently. Then, Dullahan gritted his teeth while he brought up his axe again. You aren't bad, human. If you're surprised by that much, wait until you see what's coming up. Lightly retorting to Dullahan, my eyes flashed with coldness. The spear I held up once again turned into white lightning and threatened him. Active battle skills were truly difficult to obtain. The active battle skills I obtained while climbing to the 35th floor were only Heroic Strike, Elemental Tempest, and Thunder Beast. Not to mention, Thunder Beast was more of a support skill than an attack skill, as it greatly raised my attack power. Other than these three, Dark Thunder Explosion, which was stored in my pocket watch, could count as one. As such, I had to make the best use of my attack skill to deal critical damage at the right time. Elemental Tempest was a large area of effect skill that used half of my MP, and Heroic Strike was a single target skill that used a large amount of HP and MP. 
Thunder Beast was comparatively better, but it had a 110 second limit, and I could not use my spear with it. It was then that I wondered. Was there a way to continuously attack like I was using Thunder Beast while still using my strong spear techniques? There, two skills had come to mind. The first was continuously using Heroic Strike. Without mana, it was impossible. There was no doubt about it. However, with mana, which endlessly strengthened and rejuvenated the body, continuously shooting out attacks that concentrated my entire bodice strength wasn't so impossible. The mana that should be used to add destructive power could be used for strengthening physical recovery. Although the attacks would then be weaker than a single destructive heroic strike, I would be able to attack consecutively with less mana cost. Determining that it was possible, I started to put it into action. Hero. You heroes always advance fast. Without knowing the days of despair that await you, laughing without fear and enjoying the blessing given upon you. Sorry, I don't care. No matter how much foreshadowing he threw out, I didn't care. It would appear when it was the right time, and I would overcome it. I wasn't so bored that I would worry about things that would happen in the future. But I will not yield. We will not yield. You bastards that threw me in here, hear me. I never offered my soul to you bastards. Like I said, I. Don't care. The air was embroidered with lightning. My muscles and will were focused on a single point on the tip of my spear. However, the mana strengthening the spear also split to protect, rejuvenate, and strengthen my body. To prevent my will from being disrupted, I concentrated. If I was really a hero, this much should be doable. Dullahan raised his axe, which flashed with a destructive aura. Right, I knew that someone as smart as you wouldn't only use that skill when your head was separated. Out. Burst. Consecutive heroic strikes. With my eyes opened wide, I shot my spear forward. At the same time, I thought. My naming sense sucked. Chapter, 88. In the blink of an eye, the white lightning stabbed at the axe lashing down. As Dullahan became super armored while he was using his skills, his axe would not leave his hand no matter how strong a force hit him. I quickly pulled the spear back and stabbed forward again. In the same spot I just stabbed, I hit again and again. As the technique used most of my mana for protecting my body, the HP cost decreased while the MP cost increased. Each time I thrust my spear out, I used about 3% MP and 1% HP. By the time my seventh attack hit, a crack appeared on his axe. Although Dullahan's eyes opened wide, I did not stop. Eighth, ninth. I can block it. You can't. Qua. Before my tenth attack went in, Ryue breathed out a large amount of freezing energy. Dullahan's lower body and his axe became covered in frost. Of course, the frost couldn't affect Dullahan in his super armored state, but it did all allow his axe to make an ominous cracking noise when my spear hit it. While Dullahan's eyes were wide open in shock, I delivered the eleventh and twelfth stabs. The crack on the axe became bigger. At the same time, it was just centimeters away from hitting the ground. The moment before outburst was activated, I gave Pika as much mana as possible. Then, I transferred the mana protecting my body to the tip of my spear. Just like that, I made my last attack. Break. Rubbish. The result, of course, wasn't rubbish. The moment the radiant lightning struck his axe, the crack on the axe expanded, making the axe shatter. After breaking the axe, my spear continued forward, striking Dullahan's chest. Kahak. Letting go of his axe handle, Dullahan tumbled on the ground. It seemed he received a huge shock, as he had even let go of his head that he had been carefully protecting. At the same time, the message I was somewhat waiting for rang out in my ear. You created the skill, White Lightning Consecutive Strike. With an exquisite control over vitality and magic, you deliver fast and strong stabs consecutively, then deliver a final uncontrollably powerful strike. For each stab, you use 1% of your HP and 3% of your MP, while the final strike uses 15% of your HP and MP. This skill can only be used by its creator. As the skill's creator, the skill level is adjusted to low rank level 8. You created a skill. 
White Lightning Consecutive Strike is the highest class spear technique, adopted from Heroic Strike. This skill, which is impossible to use without a deep understanding of vitality in magic, will make all enemies feel overwhelming awe and respect. You obtained one skill point as reward. Current skill points, 12. I had done it. That was the first thing I thought. The moment I delivered the final blow, I had felt the technique become a much stronger skill than heroic strike. Controlling my mana to protect, rejuvenate, and strengthen the body, while focusing my bodice energy to the tip of my spear, was hard to the point that I wanted to vomit. However, I had done it and the reward was extremely sweet. Not even the throbbing pain in my arm could take away from the happiness I was feeling. However, why did it become white lightning consecutive strike, instead of heroic consecutive strike? Qua. Having been separated from his head, Dullahan had lost his sanity and charged toward me. Now that he had lost his weapon, I was wondering what he was using as a weapon. Surprisingly, it was his black horse. That thing wasn't dead yet. Kia. You crazy son of a bitch. Dullahan grabbed the black horse's back leg and swung the horse at me like a sword with his brute strength. Setting aside the argument of whether the black horse was suitable weapon or not, its sheer size put enormous pressure on me. I first hastily fell back, then decided to test the second skill that could be useful in this situation. The second skill wasn't anything special. It was a fancier version of the spear extending technique I had been using for a long time now. I would make a spear blade made of mana and imbue the mana blade with elementals. It was a weaker version of Elemental Tempest. Elementals, come. Spin spin. Is it spin spin? No, but I'd like you to come into my spear blade. Though, you might get a bit dizzy. Are you cutting that rotting undead? It's going up, down, and swinging left and right. Roller coaster. It's a roller coaster. After that, the elementals crazily flocked to the mana spear blade. My spear was normally a little under 3 meters long. I had extended the spear blade by 1 meter through my mana, which extended another meter once the elementals gathered. It was like Sun Wukong's monkey wand. Using it, I slashed down at the black horse's body closing in on me. Every time the elemental mana spear blade collided with the black horse, small explosions occurred from opposing attributes. The skill I created without much thought was incredibly effective. We, fun. Explode. Yuck, I'm going to puke. Who, going up. Going down. Ignoring the elemental's voices, I swung my spear repeatedly, meeting Dullahan's black horse swings. As I swung my spear like a lightsaber, pieces of flesh were cut out of the black horse until it died and disappeared into particles. Dullahan continued attacking me without realizing what had happened. Without his sanity and weapon, he wasn't threatening in the slightest. I dug into his embrace and thrust out my spear. Be boom When the elemental spear blade touched Dullahan's body, it made consecutive explosions, unable to pierce through. The two-meter-long mana spear blade began to shorten. At the same time, the explosions made Dullahan fall back slowly. By the time the two-meter spear blade was entirely gone, there was a sizable injury on his chest. I continued to push my spear forward. From the repeated damage he took, Dullahan's defense had been worn down, and my spear pierced him easily. Die! After shaking my spear violently, I quickly pulled it out and kicked Dullahan. From the shock of having his chest pierced, Dullahan was completely vulnerable to the kick and flew back. I didn't miss this opportunity. Calling the elementals once again, I created a long spear blade. I then swung the spear toward Dullahan, who was far away. In the instant that my swing's trajectory lined up with Dullahan's body, I disconnected the flow of mana between my elemental spear blade and spear tip, causing the blade to fly out. I had separated the mana blade only and shot it forward. The experimental technique showed great results. The blade flew in the trajectory I aimed, colliding with Dullahan's head and causing a huge explosion. Kohuk. You learned the active skill, Elemental Blade. This outstanding skill, created by an ancient elementalist, extends the reach of the weapon with elemental imbued mana, allowing its user to attack several enemies or enemies far away. 
This skill uses 150 MP per second, and retrieving the skill returns 50% of the MP used. When the blade is sent flying for attack, the MP will not be restored. You learn this skill without anyone's teaching. The skill level is adjusted to low rank level 6. It's unfortunate that I'm not its creator, but it covers both long and close ranged attacks. What a perfect skill. Well, now for the fin damn it. Although I had not made any special attacks, a crack had appeared on Dullahan's armor. It was undoubtedly a skill. How did he have so many different skills? As it seemed too late to dodge, I thought I would have to use dragon skin, but remembered the heavy armor mastery skill I had just recently learned. Heavy armor mastery, when equipping heavy armor, your defense increases greatly, and allows you to move more easily. You can also increase your defense by imbuing your armor with mana. The effectiveness increases with skill level. Although Dragon Skin was an excellent skill, it had a drawback of drastically lowering my speed, making it hard for me to avoid follow-up attacks. Dragon Skin should only be used as a final resort. Deciding to test out Heavy Armor Mastery's effectiveness, I imbued a portion of my remaining mana into my Skeleton Knight set. At the same time, I dematerialized Ryue and put up an ice wall between Dullahan and me. Although it took a while to explain, only one. Seven seconds had passed since Dullahan began to use his skill. Immediately afterwards, Dullahan's armor exploded and flew out in all directions with black mana. Dozens of armor fragments flew through the ice wall towards me. Dodging what I could, I rushed toward Dullahan. Pubuk. With heavy impact force, the armor fragments stuck themselves on my armor, but it seemed the man imbued armor was effective, as the armor fragments did not deal a great amount of damage. Ascertaining my victory, I smiled. The Dullahan in front of my eyes did not have his weapon or armor, and was shaking with his head far away from him, trying to pick himself back up. You don't have to get up, really. Cool. As if to reply to my taunt, Dullahan groaned and wriggled his body. As it was disgusting, I decided to end it quickly. 1. Brain Strengthening Elixir. 2. Dullahan's Giant Axe. I wondered why, I really did, but Dullahan gave something called the Brain Strengthening Elixir. But why? Was Dullahan actually extremely smart? Even with his head separated from his body? Swallowing down the questions that arose every time I saw Dullahan's reward list, I chose the brain strengthening elixir and consumed it. You can think more quickly and your senses are heightened. Your intelligence and magic increase by one. Oh, lucky. That's already the second stat increase. In any case, I was happy with its effects. Not only could I raise my intelligence, which I felt was lacking, but I could also increase magic, which was always great to have more of. I almost felt the timing was too perfect. Though, it was about time an elixir raising intelligence and magic appeared. You won again and survived. When I left the battle room, Lin was smoking and staring at me, instead of doing his blacksmithing work. As he greeted me with a hint of disappointment, I shrugged. I realized I was lacking a lot in ability, so I tried a few things out this time. All in all, I think it was quite successful. You'll need to do two more battles like the one I just had and going to review the fight for a bit. Were there any unnecessary movements? How did Dullahan move and what was the most effective way of dealing with it? What about the black horse? What about the communication between me and Ryue? Pika's elemental magic. When would the skills I just acquired be most useful? There were tons of things to research. I sat down and closed my eyes to meditate, but Lin interrupted me. Desire to improve is good, but you should relax a bit and let your body rest. You'll hurt yourself if you overdo it. Thanks for worrying, Lin. No, now that I'm working on your equipment, I need to get my money. I don't really care if you die or not. You're such a son eh? What money? This. You only gave me the initial deposit, not the cost for the entire thing. You have to pay 100,000 more. I turned my gaze to where Lin was pointing with his chin. There, I saw the naked corpse of a woman, wrapped in a thin cloth it was the succubus corpse. Although it was wrapped with cloth, as it was see-through, the succubus naked body was in full view. 
even her head was perfectly sewn back, making her look like a sleeping woman. Of course, my cheeks flushed bright red. W. Watt. Why is she naked? What's up with that virgin response? That's a common way to take the spiritual power from its physical body. I've never seen that before. I don't know about Earth's culture. In any case, that's the most basic knowledge any monster artifact blacksmith should know. The parts one want from the succubus, its eyes and wings, I already have set aside here. The eye will be the core of the artifact, and I'm going to use the same method to take the mana out of the wings. He took out a glass bottle and showed two golden eyes floating around in an unknown liquid. The succubus eyes really did seem to have special powers, as they continued to glow inside the glass bottle. Turns out, this guy was a boss rank monster. That's why the succubus had a special magic power. You can look forward to it. I, am not sure what you're talking about, but I'm going to meditate. Ha, this is why virgins are well, I'm sure Nunim will be happy two virgins, how fitting. I didn't hear him. I didn't hear that draconian's words. Hypnotizing myself, I fell into meditation. Of course, for the next ten minutes, only the image of a naked woman popped up in my head. Damn it. Chapter, 89. You equip the Dullahan set. Your strength and constitution increase by 17. When the Dullahan set is equipped, you can use Outburst once per day. Your brain is strengthened to its peak. Your intelligence and magic increase by 3. It seems consuming more of this item will have no further effect. Who, it's over. I wondered why, but it felt like I had finished grinding in only a day. In reality, it had taken a little over a month to do so. Although I almost died a few times in the process, I managed to complete the grind without dying a single time. The sense of accomplishment made my confidence rise. More importantly, I got rid of my habit of trying to take out floor master skills whenever something happened. My mental protection was much better as well. I still thought my intelligence update was slow, but I would not make the same shameful mistake again as I did at the MT. I'm glad the set equipment skill is outburst. In the worst case scenario, it could have been sudden rise. That's creepy. Scary. Pika and Ryue shouted in disgust at my monologue. Someone on the floor getting beaten suddenly getting up. It was indeed something from a horror movie. I patted Pika and Ryue while laughing, and saved outburst in the 7 o'clock position. Even though I shouldn't rely too much on floor master skills, they were undoubtedly part of my strength. With these incredibly strong skills in my arsenal, I couldn't be unhappy. There were now seven skills stored in collector's pocket watch. Looking at the gems in the clock positions, I smiled. Tomorrow was the day I would go to Britain's Windermere. It was great that I could finish grinding the 35th floor before then. Starting from now, it was time to get to the 40th floor before Wyatt came to pick me up on a plane. Just when I was about to step on the staircase to the 36th floor, Ellos contacted me. Shin. We broke through the 30th floor yesterday. You that's really fast. It hasn't even been three months yet. You see, we got more party members. It would have been nice to stick to just the three of us, but we realized we shouldn't be so adamant about it. It's still fast. I learned a lot from you that day. The party members we added were explorers who had stayed on the 25th floor for years without being able to advance. Even if they couldn't break through the 25th floor, they had survived against the invaders during that time. Together, we challenged the giant ghoul, and though it's a bit embarrassing, we imitated you and managed to break through. We did get wiped out once on our way to the 30th floor, but we still managed to get here pretty fast. And I'm still surprised, but we managed to beat the 30th floor skeleton knight without losing any party members. We were together with a pretty amazing explorer though. Amazing explorer? Yeah. It was a young man named Ren. We only had seven people including him, but he complained about something not dropping and didn't want to wait for more. I almost thought he was you, with how calm he was. Ren. You finished grinding the 25th floor and were already on the 30th floor. He was really amazing. He still couldn't be compared to you, but his planning, movements, and claymore techniques were truly excellent. 
we were really shocked when he pushed the skeleton knight back in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Fighting against a floor master alone I didn't think there was another explorer who could do it other than you, Shin. Ah, uh, yeah. Thanks to him, we cleared the thirtieth floor in one go, and for helping my continent's explorers grow, his highness allowed me to meet our continent's hero. He even taught me a little. It was all thanks to you, Shin. No, it's the result of your effort. I wouldn't say it was because of me. I'm only taking care of myself, but you're also leading five other comrades. Ellos, you should be proud. Thanks, Shin. One day, I hope I can stand by your side again. You will soon. I couldn't tell him that I had already finished grinding the 35th floor and was about to head to the 36th floor. However, the moment my conversation with Ellos ended, Paludia called me as well, almost as if they had planned it out together. Surprisingly, the content was the same as well. I broke through the 30th floor. Without even a single party member dying. Kong Shin, where are you now? I broke through the 35th floor. Oh, I see well, it doesn't matter. I don't care at all, I was just asking. Although she sounded extremely disappointed, I didn't point it out and she didn't yield. Anyways. Don't forget, you said you'd come over this week with food from Earth. Yeah, I know. It'll bring lots. You said you broke through without losing a single party member. That's great. Good work. Ah, uh, mm. If you leave it to Paludia Gren Awernim, it's a piece of cake. Though a slightly annoying guy helped us. I suddenly felt a sense of uneasiness. Is that person's name perhaps? Ren. He said his name was Ren. He was really tall, very muscular, and had messy blonde hair. He couldn't talk while facing me. He kept blushing, so it was annoying. Ren. You couldn't look at Ludia because she was too pretty. Apparently, he's been helping explorers advance since the 25th floor. I hear people are calling him the Golden Lion of 30F. That's a very interesting nickname. On the 25th floor and 30th floor, I beat the bosses solo, so I didn't really meet any other explorers. Although the 25th and 30th floor has less explorers than the lower floors, there were still quite a lot of people stuck there. As a result of Ren carrying them through in my place, he had received an excellent nickname. I made up my mind to call Ren Golden Lion the next time I saw him. Thanking Lydia inwardly for letting me know this good piece of info, I ended the conversation. Then I received another message. When I checked who it came from, it was unexpectedly Yiyun. Shin, I'm not getting this compressing elixir thing. I tilted my head. Three weeks had passed since Yiyun became an explorer. Considering her abilities, she was rather slow. I was wondering why she was only just now contacting me, but it seemed there was a problem. Did you defeat it solo? Ah, uh, yeah, I did the first time and got a deific manifestation magic book. It said it was going to call someone. I got scared so I haven't tried it out yet. Try it soon. Whoever gets summoned might be helpful. So, you didn't clear it solo after that? No. I cleared it in a 10-man party, but it didn't come out. I tried again with 8 people just in case, but it didn't drop anything again. Then I tried with 5 people, then 2, but it still didn't drop. Really? Why? I didn't think Shin would lie to me, so I kept trying for 2 weeks after that, constantly changing the number of people in the party, but the compressing elixir never came out. The floor shop owner said he didn't know anything about it. Her trust in me was heavy. But I had fun. Orc Lord was an interesting guy. The people in my party weren't scared of me either hee hee, I'm having fun lately. Fighting the Orc Lord was fun. She really had an innate talent for this. With a bitter smile that couldn't reach her, I spoke. I'll ask someone I know why the compressing elixirs won't drop. Just wait a bit. Okay. I paused my conversation with her and thought for a while. Why didn't the compressing elixirs drop? What was the problem? As I couldn't think of any reason, I went and asked Lin. Lin was in the middle of inscribing something onto a gem radiating golden light. It seemed he was close to finishing the mental protection item I asked for. 
At this rate, wouldn't I break through the fortieth floor first? No, it was good to have more than one way to protect myself from mental attacks. If possible, I should try to get as many skills and items that helped. Am I distracting you? My concentration won't be shaken by just talking with you, so feel free. All right Lin, you see, I made a friend of mine from Earth into a dungeon explorer. She's an A-rank awakened from what I can tell. And? Her contribution should have been high enough, but compressing elixirs never appear on her reward list for defeating the Orc Lord. Do you know why? It's probably not just the compressing elixir. She probably isn't getting boss set items either. Lin said casually. I instinctively understood. Is there a problem with her? Like having an ability? Oh. So you already know. But what about me? I awakened my ability, but I could still obtain elixirs. You got your ability after you became a dungeon explorer. Not to mention, your ability is the type that grows along with your level and training. Of course your accomplishments would be acknowledged normally. You mean my friend's accomplishments won't be acknowledged normally? You think about it. What do you think determines what comes up on reward lists from defeating bosses? Lin asked me as he put the powder he shaved off from the gem into a separate bowl. After thinking about it for a bit, I answered. Don't better items come out if you defeat the boss in a more technical and overwhelming way? You're only partially right. You're missing one important thing. It's compared to your true ability. You mean, because my friend's strength is above the standard, her accomplishments can't be assessed properly even if she defeats the Orc Lord overwhelmingly? Exactly. Looks like you're starting to use your head. But compared to other explorers, my stats are also above the standard from compressing and strengthening elixirs. You're within the dungeon scope, so you're fine. I understand. In other words, things I gained from the dungeon system didn't act as a minus when calculating my accomplishments. On the other hand, Yi Yun, who became a dungeon explorer after already having an A rank strength, had strength that went above the dungeon standard. Since she defeated the Orc Lord with such strength, she could not get the appropriate reward from the Orc Lord. It was similar to how my superior strength lowered the reward of the B-Rank event raid. It made sense. She says she got the Deific Manifestation Magic Book and the title. Those are fixed rewards do I need to explain more? Yes. What floor does she need to get to before she can get proper rewards from the dungeon? I don't know. I don't really care how strong your world's A rank is. What rank are you? S rank. M. Mm, taking into account how strong she would get from level up stat bonuses and titles, probably 50th floor. Oh no, say goodbye to skin strengthening elixirs, Yiyun. It was a good thing I didn't tell her about them. With a bitter smile, I told Yiyun what I.D. just heard. Yiyun seemed rather fine with it. That's great. So I can just keep going up while defeating things alone, right? Yeah, but don't skimp out on opportunities to grow your ability. Stealth and what was it? Dagger technique. I got two wooden daggers when I entered the dungeon. I like it, since it's a lot cleaner than fighting with my hands. Ah, uh, I see. Anyways, make sure you level those skills up. You're going to regret it later otherwise. Thanks for worrying. See you later. Deific Manifestation. Don't forget to try it out. Okay. It'll catch up to you soon, so don't go too fast, okay? With that, Yiyun ended our call. Sorry, Yiyun, I can't do that. There's a bet on the line. By the way, Kong Shin. Lin was still digging at the gem as he spoke. That friend, she's a girl, right? One. Oh. A girl. Heh. Lin made an evil smile. Of course, I felt it was weird that a hero didn't have a girl or two. Cuckoo, Nuna might end up only staring at the roof again, Kukuku. We're just friends, so don't misunderstand. And don't talk like there's something between Loretta and me. Again. Oh. You're curious. You're curious, eh? Maybe Nunim has a chance this time. Ha. I, am not curious at all. Yep, I wasn't curious. Nope, not in the slightest. 
I only ask just because. And since that was the case, I stepped on the 36th floor staircase with a totally fine expression. A huck. That guy, he's quite agitated. I, I only missed my step, a huck. At this rate, your vitality will hit zero from hitting the steps before you even make it to the 36th floor. I, am going to break through the 40th floor today. For sure. 1. Pronouns are gender neutral most of the time. Although he said she in the translation, he hasn't actually revealed Yiyun's gender. Chapter, 90. Kukuku, it's him. A new one has come. The moment I commenced exploration on the 36th floor, I calmed down from the whispers I heard. The pathway was much wider than usual, and the walls even had windows, letting me see outside the dungeon. This was the first time windows had appeared in the dungeon. Furthermore, beyond the windows was a pitch black night and a purple colored moon. I touched the windows, curious as to what world was beyond the dungeon, but I instinctively realized I could not break the windows with my ability. Not that I would have anyways. What was more important were the voices I heard. I looked around once again. I saw something pale reflected in the windows. I closed my eyes and tried to detect any presences in the surroundings. However, I could not sense anything. It was almost like the time I first climbed to the sixth floor. The only difference was that I could not see anything this time. However, I had prepared for something like this happening. Pika. Thunder wave. Pika waved her folding fan, and along its trajectory a radiant golden wave undulated out into all directions. As I was growing as an elementalist, Pika's ability was also growing. When Pika used her skill, the surroundings became loud. Kook, an elemental. It's a stronger elemental than we thought. I opened my eyes and held my silver bone crossbow. At Pika's wide scope attack, the monsters that were hiding made their appearance. They were human apparitions, pale white in color. I somewhat knew what they were. They were right above the apparitions that I had fought from the 6th to 10th floor, the wraiths. These guys were ghosts. They were also undead monsters. Ruyue, come into my crossbow. Without hesitation, Ruyue dematerialized and infused herself into the crossbow. Soon, the white silver bone crossbow began to emit a blue freezing energy. I aimed the crossbow and started shooting. Although my crossbow marksmanship was only low rank, with the addition of mid-rank spirit aura, the bolts carried formidable power. Kick. He's shooting at us. Attack, attack him. Don't let him shoot. The ghosts created pale white balls in their hands and threw them at me. I assumed they were a stronger version of the ninth floor wraith ectoplasm arrows. In any case, Pika did not let them attack freely. The folding fan in her hand shook, and a wave of lightning once again undulated, shooting out bolts of lightning as it expanded outward. Just from the stray bolts, the ghosts took damage and flinched. Without missing this opportunity, I shot out bolts consecutively and shot down the ghosts that had been affected by Pika's lightning. As I often felt, Pika and Ryu's attributes really complemented each other well. When I took turns using their attacks, the amount of damage I dealt increased exponentially. The ghosts frantically ran around trying to dodge my bolt attacks, but became paralyzed after being hit by the lightning wave Pika emitted periodically. Once they were paralyzed, my bolts infused with Ryu's power penetrated their foreheads. One hit was enough to take care of most of them, and those that survived surely died by the second hit. When I killed them so easily though I had a mana potion in my mouth, the wraiths seemed to have realized the gravity of the situation. If we run, that arrogant man will kill us. Attack him together. One who disrupts our rest, become the sacrifice for our amusement. Ghosts flocked at me from all directions. Even without having to use provoke, they gathered in large numbers incredibly fast. I ordered Pika to increase the output of Thunder Wave and ran forward. Aiming my crossbow at the ghosts in front of me, I shouted. A ghost in here has 8th grade syndrome. Did you think I didn't notice, you damned ghosts? Appa, why are you lying on the couch? As I was about to take a nap on the couch, I woke up naturally from the voice of an angel. Yuo was in her school uniform and had her bag. It seemed she had just come back from school. 
Today was December 23rd. Although my college went on winter break after the finals, Yua was still in high school and thus had to go to school until the end of the month. Mm, Appa was in the dungeon until just recently. Appa is having a bit of trouble. I had wanted to advance to the 40th floor, but even after 10 hours of shooting crossbow bolts and Pika's lightning shower, I was only on the 37th floor. The sheer number of ghosts was one thing, but the difficulty also came from the fact that normal attacks could not hurt them. My crossbow marksmanship did level up a lot as a result, though. Most importantly, compared to the past, the pathway was much longer, to the point that it made me grit my teeth. Using the dash skill, I ran without rest while using elemental magic and my crossbow, but it had taken me over 10 hours to go through the 36th floor. If I was this slow, how would the other explorers fare? I could only grit my teeth. But Appa, if you're going to sleep, you should do it in your bed. Otherwise, you'll catch a cold. At Yua's question, I checked the time. It was four in the afternoon. It was about time to leave. Remember what Appa told father, mother, and Yua. That I'd be going outside of Korea for a few days to help a friend out. It was almost time to go, so I was just taking a nap. Ah, uh, right is it really not dangerous? Of course not. I can come back immediately if it gets dangerous, so don't worry. Though that's unlikely to happen. Seeing Yua's worried frown, I patted her head a few times and got up. After contracting Ryue, I became immune to the winter weather. I put on a black suit and took out and put on Ada's secret from my inventory. With that, I was done getting ready. HM, hiding my identity is going to be a pain. This time, I was going to Britain, not as Yun Wawu, but as Thunder Knight. As such, I made myself look different than Yun Wawu using Ada's secret. When I was Yun Wawu, my hair had a hint of grey. This time, I made my hair platinum blonde. As I wanted to make sure I would not be compared with Yun Wawu, I even made my body look a bit more like my real self. My eyes, which could be seen from beneath the mask, were made red. When I looked at myself in the mirror, a third person that wasn't Kong Shin or Yun Wawu was in the mirror wearing a suspicious mask. Perfect. I would probably have to use this opportunity to tell Waya my real name. She thought of me as her true friend, and she would realize that I'd been lying to a certain extent once she saw my appearance. Since she's smart, she would probably realize that the appearance I showed her the first time we met was false. What about Dad? Is he not going with you? He said he quit being Dark Knight. Not that he would be able to do so easily. Although I told him about Britain, he was currently rushing through the dungeon, saying he wanted to break through the 45th floor before the end of the year. I was 100% sure he wouldn't be able to do it, but I only wished him good luck and gave up convincing him otherwise. I'm worried if it's just Appa. Appa's strong. I went on TV too, remember? By the way, who's your friend, Appa? H. Hmm. Appa? Yua's eyes became sharp ever so slightly. Was Yua planning on asking this from the start? I tried to smile as I answered. The friend is British. I'm also going to Britain. Wow, how did you meet a British friend? H. Hmm. Ah, uh, you see, that person is half Korean. We met in Korea, and that person turned out to be an ability user. Appa, is that person a girl? How did she find out? There shouldn't have been any hints. Appa, you don't have to hide it or anything. The only difference is whether your friend is female or male. Huh, you're right, she's a girl. Hee <laughs> hee I knew it. Strange I never felt cold since I contracted Ryue, but my body was slightly shaking. Was there a cold controlling monster nearby? When I tensed and raised my guard up to the limit, Yua delivered an additional surprise attack. Appa, is the place you're going Britain's Windermere Lake? She got me. H how did you know? Hoo hoo, it's all the talk in the news right now. The dungeon that appeared in the tourist attraction known for its natural beauty, and the SS ranker Waya Mastaford who was summoned back to her country during her stay in Korea. A ah. Uh, I see. She's your friend, right? My sister might be much smarter than me, even with my now above 40 intelligence. When did you become so friendly? With someone so strong. Yua, 
Appa's going to be late. I'll explain later. You is a good girl, so I trust you'll stay at home without causing trouble. Ah, uh, Appa. Okay, I'll be sure to buy you a present on my way back. If something happens, remember to call me, okay? Appa, that's not fair I wanted to hear your answer. We met each other through work and became friends. I'll explain properly later, so study hard and wait. Okay, Yua. Okay. Yua pouted as she reluctantly answered. It had been a while since my obedient sister openly showed discontent, and I couldn't help but laugh. Now that I thought about it, she often showed such responses when I met with other girls, like that time with Yiyun. Was she jealous that another girl would steal her appa away? No, I knew it was impossible, but that's what I wanted to think. I stroked her hair a few times and left the house, heading towards the place we promised to meet. Platinum hair, red eyes, and mask. When I arrived at the location with an appearance even I wanted to punch, there was a limousine waiting for me. Masterford SSI sent me here. Then excuse me. Waya was an SS ranker. If that was hard to understand, I could put it this way. Waya was one of the seven most importantly regarded people on earth. Simply put, any nation would prepare anything she wished for, whether it was a limousine, private jet, or yacht. She could be said to hold omnipotent authority. Of course, the amount of responsibility she had to bear was equally big. Furthermore, Britain especially tried to fulfill her requests in order to cut her ties with Korea as much as possible. No matter how suspicious or irrational her requests were, they would fulfill them without objection. It was also why I was going to Gimpo International Airport in a limousine. The driver didn't say anything and neither did I. It was the same as I got on the private plane waiting for me at the airport. Only after I sat down in my seat did I finally let out a breath. This plane is going straight to Britain's Heathrow Airport. We will take off at 5.10 p.m., 10 minutes after the skunk plane takes off. After two moon, people were desperate to clear the monsters from land, ocean, and sky, securing routes for cars, ships, and planes to travel. As the ocean was filled with large number of huge, powerful monsters, a few harbors had to be given up, but humans reclaimed the skies rather easily. We had discovered a monster that emitted an odor detested by flying monsters. We had developed a technology that scattered this substance in the air and prevented it from dissipating for a fixed period of time. Skunk planes were the planes tasked with scattering this substance in the air and securing a safe route for ordinary planes to travel. Of course, this smell did not affect all flying monsters. The odor was useless against monsters like wyverns or manticores, but otherwise, the skunk planes did their jobs fantastically. It was a monumental victory, as human wisdom had defeated the monster's rampage. It was also why I could go to Britain on a plane. We will arrive at the Heathrow Airport at 1.20 p.m., London time. Afterwards, we will take the limousine waiting at the airport and arrive at the Windermere Lake District in four hours. The flight that had taken 12 hours in the past only took five hours now. This great improvement could, of course, be credited to the source of energy found after two moon, the bluestones. Monster remains were also being used as materials for core parts of planes, ships, trains, etc. All this had happened within a year of the two moon incident. Humans' ability to adapt was really every time the thought crossed my mind, I couldn't help but think humans of other worlds. Although their civilizations might be different than ours, they were still humans. What could have driven them to the brink of extinction? What had driven them to a corner? No matter how much I thought about it, I could not come up with an answer. We'll be taking off soon. Nodding my head at the flight attendant's announcement, I leaned against the flight seat. Although I was generally not sleepy, because of fighting Dullahan without getting much sleep and focusing on clearing the 36th floor, fatigue had built up in my body. Even sitting here and doing nothing made my body itch to do something, but I had no other choice. Since there was extra time, I had to make use of it to get some rest. Imagining finding myself in London when I woke up, I closed my eyes. A rank field dungeon I was looking forward to it. Chapter, 91 Even in winter, Windermere was beautiful. A few ships were tied to a dock and a silver lake was spread out beyond it. The nearby town was small and had clean, 
pretty roads. However, the people there had deathly pale faces and were mostly ability users. In the lake, a large tuna-like thing jumped up every once in a while, then disappeared back below the surface. Those guys, weren't they in the wrong place? This wasn't the ocean, it was a lake. You're late. I turned my head at the slightly piercing voice that called out to me. Waya, who was running towards me with a smile after I got out of the limousine, suddenly frowned. She must have realized my appearance was different than the last time we met. I wasn't just covering my face in a way that would hide that I was Yan Wawu. My entire facial structure, hair color, and eye color were different. It meant that I had a way of changing my appearance, and that the appearance of Yan Wawu I showed Waya before would have a chance to be false. In that case, it was normal that she would doubt whether my name even was Yan Wawu. You. Sorry, Waya. Why you? Waya seemed to have realized the truth from my apology as she clenched her fists. Then, she unclenched them softly. Ha, I understand. Thanks. He'll tell you more about it later. You know why I did it, right? If you lie again, I'm going to pull out your hair, and you'd better tell me properly later. Show me your real appearance too. Don't worry. Good. Well, thanks for coming. And for believing in me. After a light hug, we shook hands. Behind her, I saw three other ability users. As Wyatt greeted me, they watched us with curious gazes. Waya then turned and introduced me to them. He's Thunder Knight. Hey. Oh. Thunder Knight. That's him. How young. They each spouted awestruck words and stared at me fixedly. Waya then bragged without any hint of unhappiness. Didn't I tell you? That I was an acquaintance of Thunder Knight. Amazing, Mastiford. I didn't think you could really call him here. Not to mention, I didn't think I'd see the face of someone who never revealed his identity. Though, he's still wearing a mask. Without showing any signs of doubting Waya's words, the three ability users showed interest in me, seemingly with good first impressions. At their following questions, I tried to use my beginner-level English to barely respond to them. I was thankful I could understand them properly. British accents were difficult. Damn, Korea really needed to teach English on a conversation-level basis. The English I learned in my first semester of college was more helpful than the English I studied for the SATs. Oh, poor Brightman. Thunder Knight is quite handsome, and he's young. Ha ha ha. I didn't know why they were laughing. Even though I changed my hair to platinum blonde and had red eyes, since I didn't change my skin color, they should have realized I wasn't Caucasian. Even so, they treated me favorably. I was glad. Waya shook her hands as if to shoo away their useless talk, then introduced them to me. They were S-rank ability users. Mike Dellen, a man in his thirties, was a magician who could command over ten different kinds of water magic, and Paul Bacchus, a man in his forties, was a dual shield wielder. There was apparently nothing he could not block. However, I was surprised when I heard he could only strengthen shields with his mana. Since I couldn't imbue mana into my crossbow either, I imagined it was similar to that. That said, as long as he could wield mana, he should be able to wield other weapons if he practiced. Well, it wasn't something I should be concerned about. The last member was Emily Brown, a woman in her early fifties with well-aged blonde hair. She was the owner of the precious healing ability. Amazing, right? There are only ten S-rank healers in the world and Madame Brown is one of them. It's nice to meet you, Thunder Knight. Nice to meet you too, Madame Brown. I wanted to stop them from calling me Thunder Knight. What could I do? After thinking about it for a bit, I came up with a plan. You can call me John Smith. How about we call you T? Short for Thunder Knight. Please don't, Waya. Then hurry up and say your real name. Like I can say it here. Alright then, T. This girl, she really was angry. In the end, because of Waya, my nickname became T. In any case, I couldn't help but look at them curiously after being introduced to the three ability users. I didn't think everyone would come to receive me, but I'm surprised how distinguished everyone here is. 
wasn't there another S ranker? Why isn't that person here? That person's with the other SS ranker who's not here. Wow. But it's not even dinner time yet. At my words, Waya's face reddened slightly and she lightly kicked my shin. Then, as a result of kicking my leg that was stronger than steel, she held her foot and jumped in place. No, stupid. That S ranker is a man. He's just following Joshua Brightman around. Yuck, he's into men. That's even worse. You idiot. I'm kidding, kidding. There couldn't be that many ability users here, but it seemed factions had already developed. I was happy that Waya's side had more S rankers, but the member composition was rather strange. There were two long-ranged magicians, one person to block monsters' attacks up close, and one healer to heal them. It wasn't bad, but there was one thing missing. There's no one to kill monsters in melee range. Is that why you called me, Waya? In gaming terms, they were missing a close-range damage dealer. At my question, the three S rankers wore bitter expressions, while Waya let out a sigh. It seemed there was a reason behind it. Other than you, other countries sent their S rankers to help. Yeah, I know. Because I was annoyed with Brightman, I suggested that with the added people, we split our forces into two and explore the dungeon in separate ships. After all, that should be faster. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a good idea. When we were discussing it, Brightman agreed to it wholeheartedly, but when the other country's S rankers came, they all said they would only join Brightman's group. They said he was more trustworthy than me. I wonder how much that trust cost. Shoot, so why his side actually had less people? As expected of a chable. His scale really was different. To think he could make S rankers, who generally did not lack anything, come to his side. It probably wasn't just money that did it. Adults were scary. While I was wearing an amazed look, Waya's complaints continued. As a result, for the past few days, we couldn't even delve that deeply into the dungeon. With only Paul in the front, we shot out our magic attacks. And today, Brightman said, wouldn't it be bad to continue like this, Miss Masterford? How about we change our strategy? Arg. So annoying. I want to burn him up. As Waya complained, little balls of flame sparked around her. Paul, Mike, and Madam Brown, who could be considered her party members, nodded their heads as if they were also thinking about what happened. I asked. But not all of the S rankers went to his side, right? After all, they're S rankers. They shouldn't be lacking anything. Ah, uh, of course, there were people who wanted to join my party too but they were all schemers who were trying to do something with my fame, and the way they were looking at me. You you. I refused them all, saying I didn't need them. You really are a cool woman. Paul and Mike here don't have any ulterior motives. Unlike Brightman whose head is only filled with money and women, they know what's important, and that's thinking of our country first. Ah, it's the same for Madam Brown, of course. With her on our side, Brightman's side only has an A-rank healer. With Waya laughing as if to say it serves you right, I also responded with a laugh. I thought something was weird when you sent a plane so hastily. Then are we going there right now? I haven't fought any fish monsters before, so I'm pretty excited. In truth, my body was itching for a fight. After sleeping on the plane, I wanted to get some exercise. I mean, just look at that tuna-shaped monster. It was undoubtedly delicious. I was sure of it, 100%. Come to think of it, I hadn't eaten that boar in the dungeon's residential area either. I needed to drain the blood and dismantle it soon. However, after hearing what I said, Waya tilted her head rather cutely with a huh. Then, she spoke as she blinked at me slowly. What are you talking about? The boat's not going anywhere today. We were already on it for nine hours today, and it's almost time for evening tea. Work hour is clearly over. You're kidding. Yeah, I was kidding. But it's true that we aren't hunting any more monsters today. You only just came. There's jet lag to worry about, so you should rest. I was dumbfounded at Waya's words that seemed to say, don't overwork yourself and rest. I was thankful she was worrying about me, but did she really think that way? 
Are you treating me like a normal person after acknowledging me as an S-ranker? He's right, Masterford. The bodies of us melee-type ability users aren't weak like yours, who, as an SS ranker, faints often from anemia. Paul, who was a melee ability user like me, assisted me. Waya then retorted. I don't faint from anemia. I just get dizzy from using up my mana. You should watch how much mana you have left. You think that's easy? Was it because Waya's mana was too strong? It seemed she had a tendency to use it unsparingly. Because of it, she was getting anemia from mana exhaustion. As I felt the same way the last time I partied with her for the event dungeon, I decided to warn her about it this time. If you faint, your party members will be in danger. No matter how much mana you have, you need to practice controlling how much you spend. But I can't see my MP on earth. Don't rely on the gauge, rely on the feeling. You think that's easy. Can you do it? Isn't that obvious? Obvious. You, can you really do it? As we started talking in private messages in the middle, we must have looked like we were having a glaring contest to the others. Paul and Mike thought we were fighting and stepped in. I think you guys need to calm down. It's thanks to Masterford's magic that we're able to do so much with just the four of us. As her acquaintance, you should know how amazing she is. Of course I do, but she could be even more amazing if she tried. UK. At my words, Waya shrunk back. With how prideful she was, she should dislike others pointing out her flaws. The air heated up quickly. I was prepared for a ball of flame to fly my way. When I prepared myself for it, Waya unclenched her fists. Then, with her eyes burning like flames, she glared at me and spoke. If you can do it, there's no way I can't. Ha, that's more like it. This is what I liked about her. Someone who was proud but could understand her flaws could always increase her self-worth. So teach me. Don't tell me you can't. No, I can do at least that much. Good, then after dinner, come to my place. I can at least offer you milk tea. Got it. Hmm. Eh. Did I hear what I think I just heard? While I was standing there just blinking blankly, Paul, who had walked past me before I noticed, spoke while grinning. Wow, I knew something was up when she kept bragging that Thunder Knight was her acquaintance, but I didn't think the Mastiford would invite a man to her room. If Brightman found out, he would lose it. Mike, who was younger compared to Paul, placed his hand on my shoulder and advised. Be careful of Brightman, my friend. I don't know what that man would do out of jealousy. Um. Thanks for the advice. I retorted while taking Mike's hand off of me. Also, Madam Brown. Don't give me a thumbs up with that radiant smile. It's annoying. Chapter, 92. Compared to Korean people, British people were more relaxed. No, perhaps I shouldn't generalize all British people with just them. It could just be that the ability users here were like that. Was it because they were repeatedly hunting the same area for several weeks? They didn't seem concerned with clearing the dungeon anytime soon, as they ate dinner and sipped on red tea while they watched tunas splashing above the lake surface. Ah, uh, it's raining. It should stop soon, though ITLL come back later. Does it snow here too? When it gets cold enough. It's the same as in Korea. Waya had rented an entire residence in Windermere as her lodging place. Currently, it was just the two of us in a small room on the second floor of her residence. Waya was drinking red tea while blankly watching the rain outside the window. Her flame-red eyes were calm, and her smooth, fluttery red hair was the only bright spot in the undecorated, bland room. Seeing her holding her teacup, I thought she really looked beautiful, like she was a painting. Then, before I noticed, she turned to my direction and looked at me with half-closed eyes. Can you not stare at me so fixedly? Sorry. You were so beautiful that I lost myself for a bit. Hugh, I'm usually happy to get compliments, but because I've been getting them from people I hate recently, I'm sick of them. Sorry. You really are honest. I'm the one who's sorry for reminding you of them, but I didn't actually mean it in a flattering way. I know, and I know you're not that kind of person. 
That's why I'm annoyed with myself who can't come to like your compliment. Waya put down her teacup as she spoke bitterly. Brightman really was hated. Was that part of his plan? Whether positively or negatively, he was making her think about him a lot. No, not even the divine capture one. The world God only knows reference would think of such a method. I put away my useless thoughts and returned to the main subject. Then we should get started. How to check the amount of mana you have available and... Wait, before that, we need to talk about something else. Ah. She was right, there was something I had to explain to her first. With a bitter smile, I scratched my head. I closed my eyes and checked if there were any other presences nearby. I didn't think anyone would be hiding and did it as a precaution. But I couldn't help but ask Waya curiously. Waya, is anyone else living here with you? What? No. Really? That's weird, I can feel traces of someone that's not you. Maybe it's the people who lent you this place. Maybe. It hasn't been that long since I rented it. I'll check later just in case. Although I wasn't fully satisfied, it was true that we were the only ones in this house, for now. I took in a breath. And took off my mask. Wyatt quietly stared at my face. As it was a bit embarrassing to continue staring at her face, I turned my gaze away slightly. Soon, she nodded her head. You're much more handsome than I imagined. Just my type. Thanks for the blatant compliment. As I thought, you have black hair and black eyes. In Korean after all. Um, I had considered the possibility that you weren't Korean. Of course I am. By the way, my real name is Kong Shin. So your last name is Kong. Eh. She tilted her head, and I told her the truth. Kong Yunggung SSI is my father. You scammer. Ha ha ha. You you, you lied to me so easily. I can't believe you. Sorry, that's why I'm telling you now. It wasn't easy, you know. What, so you want me to be happy about it? Like you acknowledged me? No. Sorry. Wyatt complained for a little while longer, then seemingly calmed down. Ah, uh, wait, never mind. She placed her teacup on her plate so angrily that I almost thought the plate would break. I saw the number of dungeon explorers on earth increase to six. Did you do that too? Yeah, a friend of mine is an awakened. Don't worry, that person is trustworthy and talented, worthy of being an explorer. You you, so three out of the six are already. No, but considering your personality. I knew what she wanted to say. I don't plan on making an organization like you. It's just my friend and father. Not to mention, you could make someone an explorer if you wanted to. That's true, but. Can I trust you? Why would I lie? Ha, huh, I feel like I learned too many things just now. My head feels like it might burst. Don't take it too seriously. My father made me an explorer, I hid my identity in Earth's Dungeon Explorer communication channel, and I made a friend I trusted into a Dungeon Explorer. There's nothing more to it. I'm also revealing my identity to someone I can trust. It's too hard to accept it so simply. Waya put her head in her hands and looked like she was agonizing over something. Then, with a tired voice, she spoke. Whatever, I'll trust you. Thanks. Quiet. You made me doubt someone I acknowledged as a friend even for a moment. That's a very annoying and sad thing for me. You'll have to make it up to me properly. How? You said you would teach me. Before I master it, you'd better make time to teach me every night. Got it? This is your punishment. But it'll at least serve you milk tea when you come. Never in my life did I receive such acute punishment. I grinned and nodded my head. Yeah, got it. Why are you smiling? It makes you look sly. It's nothing. I'm just happy I got to know a surprising side of my friend. UUK. Waya seemed to be embarrassed by my words, as she threw the tea kettle at me. It seemed I would need to wait a bit more before I could start teaching her. From the 38th floor on, ghost knights appeared. If ghosts were the apparitions of ordinary people, 
Ghost knights were the apparitions of knights riding on their ghost horses. Watching them charge at me on their ghost horses was quite a spectacle. Kill the human. Living beings, taste the wrath of the dead. Like I care, move. More importantly, it was much easier to break through than the previous floors. Ruyue, run. Ao. As Ryue ran crazily, the wall of ghosts to my left and right were pushed back at an incredible speed. Meanwhile, I only looked forward as I swung my spear. Although there were also ghosts, because their numbers were low, I was perfectly fine just defending myself while running forward. Ghost knights weren't my opponents. I was happy that clearing the dungeon floors became easy again. While Ryue ran carrying me on her back, Pika watched out for the ghost's soul arrows. Compared to the 36th and 37th floor, this floor matched my style much more. Qua. Kill that rat. Stab your swords in his neck. As knights, well recover our besmirched honor. Come at me. Get in line. Cutting past the ghost knights as I charged onward mindlessly, I managed to break through the 38th floor in 5 hours, half the time it took me to clear the 36th floor. You became level 39. Perfect timing. Watching me gasping for breath, Lin threw something at me apathetically. I caught it and confirmed what it was. It was an earring, only one of what usually came in a pair. With two oval gems radiating a glowing gold, the beautiful craftsmanship made it more suitable for a woman than a man. I stared at it blankly for a while, then asked Lin. Lin, this is. See for yourself. Golden teardrop unique. Durability 9090. Equipment limit 1 who defeated the blood succubus. Options intelligence 5, magic 5, charm 15. Skill succubus pupil passive, wearing the earring amplifies your charm. You can resist mental status effects more easily, and there is a small chance it can reflect the status effect onto the enemy. Wow. This really is an amazing item. Is it? With that, Lin put out his hand. As promised, I gave him 100,000 gold. It was my turn now. So Lin, shouldn't you start making my other equipment? My weapon and the like. Once you break through the 40th floor, it'll do it without you having to nag me. Don't make me remember such painful truths when I'm collecting money. Lin, you should really be more honest. You already know it'll break through the 40th floor. You. Lin shook in rage while holding the bag of gold. It was only then that the emptiness I was feeling seemed to be filled. I couldn't help but let out a refreshing smile. Then, I equipped the golden teardrop. Since I was already equipping the power earring and blood succubus earring, I decided to say goodbye to the power earring, which only raised my strength by two. Eck, disgusting. You know, I agree. I didn't really care that the earrings were different. As they were both from the blood succubus, they went together quite well. The problem was that I was male, but with no other choice, I put on the earrings firmly. When I arrived at the 39th floor, the ghosts had disappeared and were replaced by specters. Of course, most of the enemies were still ghost knights. Without a care in the world, I raised my spear. Specters were apparitions known for their ability to possess people. As such, they charged towards me the moment they caught sight of me. Kiiki, it's a human. Control him. Stabbing yourself with your own spear will feel special. I dematerialized Ryue and infused her into my armor. Now, Pika was in my spear and Ryue was in my armor. What would happen if specters tried to possess my spear or armor? Yujia. Gayak. Cold. It's too cold. I can't move. They were electrocuted or frozen by themselves. Yuak, an elementalist. Elementalist. Run. When all the specters were chased away, the ghost knights that were charging stopped in their tracks. With a smirk, I raised my spear. They were slowly backing off. Of course, I didn't just leave them be. You became level 40. You obtained the qualification to challenge the floor master. You really are fast. You seem to be having trouble yesterday. Compared to the 36th and 37th floor, 
the last two floors were a piece of cake. I was nervous for nothing. I feel stupid just talking to you now. Hurry up and go to the fortieth floor. Then die and come back a week later. You really are blunt about it now. Even as I was dumbfounded, I made sure to buy plenty of holy water from Lin. I didn't know the identity of the fortieth floor master, but he was sure to be some sort of ghost. With holy water, I would have a much better chance. Wish me luck, Lin, so that I can get the dragon leather cape. Screw off. Yep, angry Lin was the best. Giving him a thumbs up, I climbed to the fortieth floor. As the fortieth floor wasn't any different in structure or the type of monsters that appeared, I got to the end without much trouble. When I was in front of the floor master room's unique black door, it was four in the morning. Since breakfast was at seven, I would be able to sleep for about two hours after defeating the boss once. Good. Nobody had taken the fortieth floor boss first achievement. There was sure to be a reason that no one had succeeded the 40th floor master's first achievement, even though the 25th through 35th first achievements were accomplished. First, I applied an ample amount of holy water onto my weapons. Hugh. I can do it. I had paid Loretta 50,000 gold for this info. I couldn't screw up here after doing so well until now. After taking in a deep breath, I opened the door with my black earthen spear in hand. Fight me. Eh. What was beyond the door was a dreary land that seemed to have been taken out of hell. There were a countless number of ghosts and specters, and also ghost knights that were ready to charge. Floating above them was an existence wearing a worn-down cloak and pointing a pitch-black scythe at my direction. Kikikik. It seems I will have to guide another dead soul. Chapter, 93. I can see why no one has cleared it solo on their first try. I smirked. Just look at that, there must be at least five hundred of them. While climbing the dungeon, if there was one thing I understood, it was that no matter how many opponents I was up against, there was a limit to the number of attacks I would have to defend against. The only difference was how many times I would have to repeat defending, attacking, defending, attacking. Furthermore, I had just run past a pathway full of monsters like them. Besides the scythe holding Reaper, there was nothing that could make me nervous. I swung my spear once and fixed my grip on it. Then, I pointed it forward. Come. You used provoke. All enemies will attack you with strong hostility. Suppress the living. Give pain to the explorer who ridicules death. Kiki Kiki. Kill him, kill him. Take his soul and possess his body. The monsters rushed toward me like a tsunami. After taking in a deep breath, I patted Ryu's back. It was the signal telling her to run. Ayuyu, pat me more. Later. For now, run. Ayuyu. Ryu e kicked off the ground. First, I needed to lower their numbers in one go. I raised my spear and thrust forward, using Elemental Tempest. After the skill had reached mid-rank, more elementals began to gather, truly making me look like I was wielding a storm. We. Spin spin. Kohaha, I've been waiting for this moment. Ignoring the elementals' voices, I shot it forward. In an instant, my elemental tempest swept through over a hundred apparitions, mostly consisting of the ghost knights that had been standing in the front. I took out a high-ranked mana potion and put it in my mouth. Then, I held the spear like a baseball bat. Elemental Blade. We, Roller Coaster. Let's go, let's go. Eh. W8. Not this one. We. The moment I yelled out, my spear blade extended to six meters and began to radiate rainbow light. I swung the spear at the incoming apparitions. With most of the ghost knights swept away in the elemental tempest, the comparatively weaker ghosts and specters couldn't withstand the elemental explosions and fell. BB Boom. You, elementalist. Die, die apparitions. Weak, im never getting on this one again. We. The ghost's death throes rang out along with elementals' cheers. However, in an instant, the apparition split through the middle and something swept over me. When Ryue quickly dodged, the ground behind me was marked with deep furrows as an explosive sound rang out. Don't uselessly die. 
I may need you all for other purposes. Kayak. The reaper cometh. The grim reaper has drawn his scythe. He would need them for other purposes. The reaper swung his huge death scythe, sending a blade wave forward. I dodged his attack, but did not attack him, as I was worried about what he said. Instead, I used Tempest to attack the apparitions again. Quiak. That bastard is shooting out storms. TSK, if that's what you want, then. As I thought. As if to fold space, the reaper's body flew toward me stealthily and smoothly. His movements were unusual, as if I was watching an old horror movie. Regardless, the result was terrifying. A large scythe big enough to cover my entire view flew as if to cut off my head. I clenched my teeth and poured out a vast amount of mana into the spear where Pika was in fuse, raising it up and blocking the Grim Reaper's scythe. Strong. Something popped out from his stomach. Frightened, I hurriedly jumped and dodged it. P.U.K. When I heard the sound and looked back at the position I was in, I saw a small scythe. Shooting out a scythe from your stomach, what the hell are your internal organs made out of? Unfortunately, I didn't have the time to dwell on such thoughts. He had shot out another blade wave dodging his attack again, I attacked the nearby ghosts with thunder arrow. Eck, he must think we are easy prey. Show him it's not true. I said, you guys stay still. We're still going to die. Sob, why must I worry about dying even after dying? When the apparitions flew towards me, the reaper stopped throwing his blade waves. As I thought, he didn't want the apparitions to die. Using tempests, I took care of the apparitions. Then. Qua. Feel death. Death roar. Grim Reaper uses death roar. The attack power of all undead is doubled. The defense of all living beings is halved. You resisted the status effect. The status effect has been nullified. Good, I was getting my money's worth from the item. Confirming that the Reaper's skill had not affected me, I raised my head. Excited about having their attack power doubled, the Ghost Knights were charging at me in a line. Facing them, I screamed. Kayak. You used Vengeful Spirit's Wail. Most enemies become confused and feared. Eh. Although I hadn't expected much, most of the Ghost Knights charging my way fell and began to fight each other. Why? This skill used to only work on weak monsters with low intelligence. Then, I remembered something. Magic, charm, and intelligence were important in protecting my mind. In that case, they most likely helped in my mental attacks as well. Although I thought it was likely, I couldn't brood over it for very long. The reaper was swinging his scythe in front of me. Kook, you're fast. I shall take your head. From the reaper's deep voice, I felt a chilling sense of danger. Hugging Ryue, I immediately used Talaria and flew into the air. Before I fully flew up, something had ripped my boots. Looking down, I couldn't help but shiver at the horrifying sight. Countless black hands had come out of the ground, trying to grab onto me. This was dangerous. If I was caught, they looked like they would drag me into the end of hell. The damage ID take aside, it looked intimidating. Yay! Shin hugged me. Master is feeling heavy, so hurry up and dematerialize. Ryue dematerialized and sat on my head. Gritting my teeth, I shouted at the Reaper. You son of a bitch, you said you'd take my head. The one that gets tricked is the idiot. The Reaper appeared in front of me again, but with Talaria, I did not lose to him in speed. Dodging his scythe just barely by falling back, I activated divine speed, poured white light into my black earthen spear, and threw it at him. I never missed my attack after using divine speed. After being hit by my heroic strike, the reaper flew back with his eyes opened wide. Seeing the black earthen spear that transformed into white lightning sending the reaper's large body flying dozens of meters, I clenched my fists and began to sweep through the apparitions again. You bastard, are you treating us like dust? Make that bastard regret it. But I feel like well regret it more. Pika, come back and help me clean them up. Although I wanted to quickly take care of the trash mobs and focus on the reaper, he flew towards me before I could even kill a hundred ghosts. 
he took out the black earthen spear stuck in his chest, then violently snapped it in half in front of me. Although the blade grew dull occasionally, the spear handle had never once broken, but he had done it. You son of a bitch. Do you know how precious that is? Koha. Without offering me any excuses, he shot blade waves toward me again. If I were hit by that ominous black pulsation, I didn't think it would end with just receiving damage. Dodging his attack, I took out the silver spear and aimed it at him. I saw the two halves of my black earthen spear falling. Was that reparable? It should be, right? The water in my eyes was sweat, not tears. I didn't think I threw it for no reason either. Even so, I decided to utterly destroy that bastard. I raised my spear, and aimed it at him. Then I dropped to the ground abruptly. It was truly a sudden drop. How did you know? Above me, the reaper's shout rang out. I raised my head and confirmed that he was standing in the place I was just in. Damn, just how many skills did he have? I won't tell you, you bast. Oot. Again. When I quickly flew away, the trajectory of the reaper's large black scythe cut through the air. I felt goosebumps on my back. I truly couldn't sense anything. How can you dodge my attacks? It's instinct, bitch. Gritting my teeth, I extended my spear blade using elemental blade and slashed at him. It seemed he was specialized for attacks, but had a weaker defense compared to normal floor masters, as my elemental blade dealt noticeable damage to him. I continued pushing at him to prevent him from teleporting to my back again. Elemental power constantly exploded and annoyed him. The worn down cloth he was wearing began to tear slowly. The Reaper screamed. Kia. Kook. Is it that attack again? Black hands shot out from my surroundings toward me. Flying into the air, I looked at the black hands that had covered half of the entire ground, and murmured with an astonished face. Crazy. Just how much mana does that bastard have? Kick. As I thought, if I stayed here dumbfounded, he would appear behind me again. As I had already seen him do it twice, I recognized when he would use that move and how he would strike his scythe. Lightly moving to the side, I dodged his scythe. Although his face was empty under his hood, I could sense his astonishment as black light fluctuated. I then grabbed his scythe, which had remained in the position he had struck down in. Dark Thunder Explosion I considered using white lightning consecutive strike, but that skill was most effective when my feet were on the ground. Not to mention, I was running low on mana. The mana potion's cooldown time had not ended yet either. As such, I chose to use Dark Thunder Explosion. Although I was on the lookout for scythes flying out of its stomach, but after being hit by Dark Thunder Explosion's initial lightning bolt, he had become paralyzed and was unable to attack. Heh. The corners of my mouth went up in a smile. In the air, a festival of lightning occurred. Quiak. Along with the reaper's scream, the black hands that had sprouted up from the ground trembled and elongated, but I, their target, was already in the air with the reaper. This. How was I supposed to defeat him without Teleria? It seemed I would need to do some research for a while. While I was thinking rather leisurely, the reaper danced in the air, continuously being struck by black lightning bolts. This skill also seemed stronger than the first time I used it. Even though it didn't use my mana, it had grown stronger according to my magic stat. Did the skills work with a different principle? It could also be because the ability of my contracted lightning elemental, Pika, increased. When the explosion ended, I poured mana into my silver spear and swung it at him. After being hit, the Grim Reaper helplessly flew through the air. The black hands on the ground had already disappeared. I landed along with him and took care of the leftover ghosts. Although I allowed myself to be hit by their soul arrows while I was fighting the reaper, I couldn't let a boulder be pierced by raindrops. Kukuku. I acknowledge you. Don't. Just die. The cooldown time ended and I could drink a mana potion again. Putting a mana potion worth 15 million won in my mouth, I lowered my body. Ryue materialized on her own and let me ride on her back. Compared to when he first appeared, the reaper was tattered. He raised his scythe. Then, he slashed the ghosts that had survived until now. 
Grim Reaper uses Soul Eater. He recovers 1% HP and MP for each soul he cuts with his scythe. Key, I'm finally free. My long journey has finally come to an end. As I thought, that's what it was. Although I diligently killed the ghosts, there were still about 200 ghosts left. I started killing the ghosts before the reaper could cut them, but he had almost fully recovered. Kuhu, despair, hero. Despair suits you more than hope. No matter how much you struggle, you cannot defeat me. You. While the reaper was blabbering on about something, I managed to take care of all the ghosts. I looked around the field, but could not spot any ghosts or specters. At the same time, however, Talaria had ended, meaning I could not fly into the air anymore. The reaper seemed to have realized this, as he swung his scythe and sneered. You can't run like a rat anymore. You can't recover anymore either. Spinning my spear, I reviewed his skills one by one. Blade wave, shooting small scythes out of his stomach, suddenly appearing behind me and swinging his scythe, and the black hands that shot up from the ground. Although I could block the first three, how was I supposed to block the black hands? After thinking for a bit, I made my decision. They'll just have to endure it with dragon skin. It's his cheaty skill that was at fault. It wasn't my fault. I'd think of a solution after I beat him once, so it was fine. Making rather disappointing excuses to myself, I stepped forward. Let's go. Chapter, 94 Although it was a bit embarrassing to say myself, I was a genius when it came to fighting. Simply put, I never fell for the same attack again. No matter how accomplished a martial artist was, there would be a limit to the techniques he used. All humans had set patterns to their movements, and once I saw them with my eyes and experienced them with my body, it wasn't too difficult to comprehend the movements and counterattack. However, it seemed other people didn't think like me. Even father made a surprised expression when I told him about it. Just like how smart students could solve application problems with one equation, once I saw and experienced a technique, I could understand and counterattack, no matter how the technique was utilized. My body was remembering it. It was a different story if I was too slow to dodge the enemy's attack even after reading its trajectory, but otherwise, I could deal with it easily. This was the same for floor master battles. Their skills had a pattern to them that was much clearer than human movements. Once I experienced it a single time, it would be weird if it hit me the second time. That said, it wasn't always possible to dodge them. Floor master's skills were all difficult, if not impossible, to avoid. I used dragon skin, shouting at the top of my voice. Ignoring the black hands that shot up from the ground, I shot my elemental blade at the Grim Reaper. Before he was hit by the elemental blade, Grim Reaper teleported behind me. I, of course, read his movements. Throw. I grabbed him and threw him on the ground, as if I was waiting for him to appear behind me. Pika and Ryue floated in the air and focused on the Reaper with their elemental magic without me having to order them. Meanwhile, the black hands flailed and tried to pull me underground. However, because my body was strengthened by dragon skin, the hands snapped while trying to pull on me. Seeing it, a thought flashed across my mind. Ryue, come into my armor. Ryue, who was attacking the Reaper with Pika, came into my armor. At the same time, I imbued mana into my armor and strengthened it. Then, as I thought, the black hands that touched the armor froze and began to snap. I had found a way to stop the black hands without using dragon skin. A gleam of success had flashed in my grim reaper fight strategy. Phew, you're screwed now, reaper. Reaper's scythe. The moment I declared confidently, a large shadow dropped down from above my head. As my body was bent from throwing the reaper on the ground, I dodged the attack by rolling. However, I was unable to fully dodge his attack and the shadow still struck my helmet, cutting it up perfectly. I was even under dragon skin's effect. With my bare face showing, I gritted my teeth. You son of a bitch, just how many skills do you have hidden? Since using his skills one by one didn't seem to work, the reaper seemed to have decided to use all his skills at once. The black hands pulled on me, the large shadow scythe dropped from sky, and a blade wave came flying my way. 
As I threw him down once, the Reaper didn't teleport behind me again and only threw out long-ranged attacks from a distance. He really was shrewd. I felt like I was fighting a cunning human. I'm ready. If that's your plan, he'll take on that challenge for a battle of attrition. I put another mana potion in my mouth and glared at the Grim Reaper swinging his side from a distance. You don't have mana potions anymore, but I do. First, I ignored the black hands, which could not affect me by much, and focused on dodging the shadow scythes and blade waves. At the same time, I left Pika, who was free, to attack the Reaper. I could stick close to the 35th floor master, Dullahan, and have a fierce close-range fight, but the 40th floor master, Grim Reaper, was completely different than Dullahan. They were polar opposites. One thing I could be sure of was that everyone would choose to fight Dullahan over the Grim Reaper. Without my elementalist abilities, it would really be impossible to defeat the Grim Reaper alone. You won't be able to defeat me, hero. If you're so confident, why don't you come fight me up close? Hey, don't attack just because you don't know what to say. I frantically dodged his attack. Pika also attacked him whenever there was an opening. Before I noticed it, the black hands were gone. The shadow scythes were also coming less frequently. Although the reaper was flying around quickly, swinging his scythe at me, I realized he had run out of mana. Ruyue, go help Pika now. Once I deactivated Spirit Aura and Ruyue joined Pika to attack, it became more difficult for the Reaper to dodge their attacks. Using the gap where the Shadow Scythe wasn't dropping down on me, I let the Reaper's blade wave fly past my shoulder and charged toward him. My silver spear shone with a light full of vengeance. As if. The Reaper teleported backwards consecutively. However, the moment his teleportation stopped, Ryue restrained the Reaper's movements with her ice shackles. He could have normally broken Ryu's shackles easily, but he was currently out of mana. He didn't have the strength to escape a mid-rank elemental's restraint. As he was about to swing his scythe, Ryu's shackles crept up to his arms and bound them in place. Although they wouldn't be able to hold him for long, they were doing their job for now. While I was running toward him, Pika naturally flew toward me and infused herself in my spear. I poured the momentum from my charge into the tip of my spear and thrust forward. Heroic strike. Quack. The reaper coughed out what looked like a black shadow from his mouth. It seemed similar to blood, but I dodged it just in case. When the shadow hit the ground, it dissolved the ground. Although I had expected it somewhat, his insides were full of poison. When I looked away thinking I really couldn't let my guard down until the end, a black shadow scythe shot out from inside the reaper's hood. He still had mana left over. This is the end. Divine speed. Sorry, but I knew you were hiding mana at the moment you let the shackles capture you so easily. Confirming that he had used his final move, I dodged the black scythe swinging down at me, and ran behind him. At the same time divine speed ran out, I saw the shadow scythe disappearing into the air. Kook, you slippery worm. Be happy, Reaper. I said as I considered which area in his back he would receive the most pain from. Today, you'll be the first Reaper to be killed by a slippery worm. You became level 41. You obtained the qualification to advance to the 41st floor. You became silver rank 3. You can now visit the residential area's recreational area. Ask the residential area administrators for more info. Amazing. You are the first in first dungeon's history to succeed in soloing the Grim Reaper on the first try. The dungeon will remember you as a great explorer. You obtained two skill points as a reward. You obtained a lifetime free voucher for resting place of angels. Current skill points, 14. Quest success. You succeeded in completing Draconian Lin's conditions within three months. Even while he grits his teeth, Lin will grant you the promised equipment. You obtained one skill point as reward. Current skill points, 15. You obtained the title, Grim Reaper Master. All stats increase by 2. This effect will apply even if the title is not equipped. You defeated the Grim Reaper alone. You obtained the special reward, Grim Reaper's Robe. You obtained 150,000 gold. You received the only reward left hidden for the first explorer. 
Congratulations. Your luck stat increases by one. Secret. Soul Guard Magic Book. Who? I murmured in an unexcited voice. I had no energy left in me. My helmet had been cut in half and my black earthen spear broke. My armor was in tatters from the reaper's black hands and his blade waves, and blood was flowing through its gaps. My hair was a mess and I was muddy from rolling on the ground. I hadn't been in such a mess since the days when I fought the orc lord. Although I wanted to collapse on the ground, it was muddy. I prevented myself from fainting using my extraordinary willpower and picked up my black earthen spear from the ground. It was quite cleanly broken. Shin was cool. Super cool. Master is amazing. Come here. You guys worked hard too. My elementals flew toward me like puppies. Hugging both of them in my embrace, I asked message Nuna to bring up the message log. When I read the part about recreational area, I tilted my head. I haven't heard about this before. I can get there from the residential area. Is it an upgraded version of the residential area? Although I wasn't sure, I felt it had something to do with the resting place of Angel's lifetime free voucher I got as a reward for completing the achievement. I would find out once I got there. I had successfully obtained the Grim Reaper Master title and the secret reward, Soul Guard. When I chose it from the reward list, a magic book appeared and flew inside me. You learn the skill Soul Guard Passive. Through deep spiritual meditation, you grow your soul's strength, defending against mental status effects and advancing the league of your existence. The effect will increase along with skill level. It's like Lin said. I really got a skill that protected against mental status effects. I instinctively felt that there was more that this skill was hiding. I would find out as I advanced. For now, I wanted to get my quest reward and go to sleep. Kook. Lin was smoking with his feet on the floor shop desk. After seeing me, he smirked. You're a mess. I thought I'd die. It was hard. But you managed to succeed. On your first try, alone. Well. Yeah. Hugh. Lin puffed out a cloud of smoke. He then set the entire cigarette on fire, making it disappear without even leaving behind ashes. Then, he threw something at me. When I received it hurriedly, it was a thin bracelet made out of reddish metal. Although it looked simple, its beautiful texture was captivating. I asked Lin. Your reward. I made it while you weren't here. I didn't think Lin would make do with just a bracelet. It'll teach you how to activate it. Lin got up from his seat and made a serious expression. It was like the expression of a great sage passing on his knowledge of ancient magic to his successor. First, wear it. Okay. There. All right, put the arm without the bracelet forward, then make it touch your collarbone. Then, raise the arm with the bracelet up into the sky. Oh. Ignoring Lin's obvious bait, I poured mana into the bracelet. In an instant, the bracelet radiated a strong light. The armor I was wearing disappeared and something else wrapped around my body. In less than zero. One second, I was wearing a different set of armor than before. Red, sharp, and metallic scales that looked like a red dragon scales were covering my body. The gauntlet was easy to move in, and the armor and boots were incredibly light. The helmet fit perfectly as well. When I glanced behind me, a red leather cape was fluttering without any wind blowing. It was super cool. So, Lin. I'm not sure how this works, so can you demonstrate what you said? You little. Just take the spear. Lin spoke with bitterness and threw a red metallic spear at me. Catching the spear, I thought Lin was quite funny. You unequipped Dullahan set. Your strength and constitution decrease by 17. You unequipped Black Earthen Spear. Your strength decreases by 5 and your dexterity decreases by 10. You equipped Crimson Dragon Scale Armor Set. It becomes bound to you. All stats increase by 10. Your strength and constitution increase by an additional 10 points. The chances of receiving a critical hit decreases greatly, and you return a portion of the damage you receive to your enemy. The effects of all charge type skills are increased by 
you equipped Red Dragon Felix's cape. It becomes bound to you. Your dexterity, magic, and charm increase by 15. You become immune to all temperature-based status effects. Three times per day, it protects its master from unforeseen attacks. You equipped Crimson Gluttony Spear. It becomes bound to you. Your strength increases by 30. Fire damage is added to all basic attacks and you have a high chance to burn the enemy. It evolves by consuming weapon type items. While equipping Crimson Dragon Scale Armor Set, you can use Crimson Roar once per day. Crimson Roar turns the air it reaches into blazing flames that attacks the enemies. As it burns everything other than its user, it must be used with precaution. This is. Just by changing my equipment, I felt a sense of omnipotence, like nothing was impossible. The stat bonuses I gained from Black Earthen Spear and Dullahan set was 49 points. Even if I excluded the charm and luck stat bonuses, that stat bonuses I gained now was 130. The effect was worth over 15 levels of growth. Of course, with this much stat increase, the update time would also be incredibly long. Even knowing that, my body was itching from the excitement. My body that was exhausted and ready to faint seemed to want to go on a rampage. Reaper. With this much stat increase, the amount of damage I could do to the Reaper would need to be counted with a different unit. Once it's bound to you, you'll receive the stat bonuses just by having the bracelet equipped. Ah, but you can't use Crimson Roar with the armor unequipped, so keep that in mind. Thanks, Lin. If you thank me now. My insides are going to flip, so don't. The equipment I received were all breathtaking. Although I knew I shouldn't just rely on my equipment, a warrior couldn't help but be happy when he received such good equipment. Also, that spear can absorb weapons. Absorb? What happens when it absorbs them? You'll find out once you absorb enough. Why don't you try it out? I immediately thought about my halved black earthen spear. When I brought it up to the gluttony spear, the black earthen spear disappeared surprisingly. At the same time, a message rang out. Crimson Gluttony Spear Absorbed Black Earthen Spear. Growth, 1%. 1%. It has to eat a hundred more. That's a lot. It must have been a pretty good weapon. I learned a valuable lesson. That I should not worry about the weapon's growth for a while. In any case, since I now had new equipment and a weapon, I had to take them out for a test. Forgetting all about sleep, I shouted. Lin, he'll come back after doing another boss fight. Yeah, yeah, go die. Taking Lin's words as a joke, I went to fight the boss again. I died. Just like that, I became unable to grind the boss for a week. Once I was chased out to the residential area, I calmly assessed what had happened. The stat update had only just begun, and I hadn't gotten strong enough to overwhelm the Grim Reaper. Although I said I felt energetic, my body was undoubtedly exhausted. Without being able to draw out my full ability, I got killed. Although I normally would have been able to think this far, I had lost my reason as the equipment I earned were too good. I learned the lesson that I shouldn't act based on excitement. One week was the price I would have to pay. Life really was a roller coaster. Author's note. Ha, I'm really crazy. 5,000 words. Wanted. 2. Finish. But. Why? I can hear the sound of my work increasing later. While in despairing, I hope everyone enjoyed today's chapter. It's been a while since Shin died. That's what happens if you let your guard down, thinking you got strong. No matter how high his intelligence gets, it won't update so. Chapter, 95. As an S-ranker who had come to Windermere because of Waya's request for help, I was treated very well. Because a field dungeon appeared, Britain had built a building for ability users at Windermere, where modern buildings had traditionally been avoided. Although it was an eyesore outside, the view from the inside was truly marvelous. It was especially so the higher you went in the building. Naturally, higher-ranked ability users were situated on higher floors. I received a room on the same floor as Paul and Mike from Waya's team. It was the second highest floor of the building, as the entire floor above mine was given to Joshua Brightman. 
For meals, I could eat at the hotel restaurant or order room service. After being kicked out of the dungeon, I came back to the hotel room for my mansion in the residential area. After a short nap, I chose to go to the restaurant. Paul and Mike both welcomed another guy joining Waya's team, and wanted to talk to me as we ate. So T. What country are you from? Like I said, don't call me T. And it's a secret, of course. Your guard is high, I see. I think you're Korean though. Right. Masterford always said her mother wanted her son-in-law to be Korean. Hugh. Letting out a short sigh, I rolled a piece of toast and threw it into my mouth. Nom nom. I'd like it if you guys didn't make our relationship to be like that. I don't really care, but Waya would probably be angry. Right. She would hate it if others forced her into a relationship without her knowledge. A voice that wasn't mine, Paul's, nor Mike's rang out. I drank my red tea. Ha. It's sweet. Of course, with how much sugar you put in. You know this is red tea, not milk tea, tea. Did you perhaps not hear me? As Mike and I were talking to each other, the voice rang out again. Hugh. I sighed and turned my head in the direction the voice came from. I saw a tall man standing there in a suit. He had a large body, halfway between the old and current me, and had short silver hair that was combed over with pomade. The two blue eyes on his angled face seemed to be glaring at me for some reason. Although I had heard he was in his late thirties, he seemed like he was in his twenties. In any case, the strong spirit that could be felt from his entire body proved that he was another SS ranker. He extended his hand toward me. I'm Joshua Brightman. Nice to meet you. Ah. Uh, mm. I can't say it's nice to meet you, but hello. I'm Thunder Knight. Why I invited me here. When I grabbed his hand thinking, this situation seems familiar, he really put all his strength into the grip like a scene from an old movie. For a moment, I seriously considered flipping him over, but I felt that reacting in such a way would be taking his bait, so I didn't. I heard you're an SS ranker. You really are strong. With your grip being this strong in handshakes, it must be hard having a normal life. Looks like you need to practice controlling your strength a bit. Ha! What an interesting fellow. I don't find you very interesting. You'll need to practice joking too. I retorted as I wiped my hand with a towel after shaking his hand. A young man behind Joshua Brightman became angry and stepped forward. He was blonde and had blue eyes just like Brightman. I instantly realized that he was Britain's last S-ranker. How impertinent, Asian. If you want to call me impertinent, you shouldn't bother me when I'm eating and screw off, Westerner. I responded coldly and tapped the teacup I was drinking from. At the same time, Paul and Mike burst into laughter. He got you good there, Tommy. Yep, not even dogs would bother a man having his breakfast tea. You should drink when you can these days. Eh, Tommy. Don't call me Tommy. It seemed all the S-rankers were familiar with each other. Interpreting their conversation as such, I calmly drank my sweet tea. Hmm, yep, I really did put too much sugar. Next time, I'd have to lower the amount to only 12 spoons. Then, the restaurant door opened. Given that the entire restaurant got brighter, it was undoubtedly Waya. Shin, T. I told you, we should eat Toj. Gek, Brightman. No, wait, is T. An actual name? Why is everyone saying it so naturally? I said call me John Smith. As I murmured unhappily, I shook the teacup that was now empty. It seemed why I didn't see it. Oh. You're beautiful as always, Miss Masterford. You're disgusting as always, Brightman. I'm here to talk to my comrades, so I'd like it if you can give us some space. You're sharper than usual today. Is that because of this friend here? I don't remember becoming your friend. I answered weakly and got up from my seat. After putting my teacup down on my plate with an audible sound, I continued. You're probably here because you were annoyed with me who's Waya's friend and getting in the way of your schemes, and that loyal dog is probably here so that you can test out my strength. Luckily, 
something annoying happened to me too yesterday, so I'd be happy to beat someone to a pulp, and, not to mention. Waya would probably burn up the entire building if she kept talking to you, and others would be annoyed with us if we kept taking up space, so why don't we take it outside? The restaurant became silent. Then, someone burst out into laughter. It was Waya. Ah ha 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 ha. What's that? Do you think he'd really do that? Not even a third-rate villain from a movie would think like that. I know, right, Waya? I was just saying it. I stared at Brightman as I said that. He smiled as if he found it amusing, and rubbed his chin with his hand wearing a white glove. You must be quite confident in your ability. Why don't you be my opponent for a bit? For a morning exercise, of course. An SS ranker like you shouldn't use your strength to bully weaker people. You must be joking. In truth, I wouldn't be able to beat the current Brightman, not without revealing all my skills at least. The sheer amount of mana his body was naturally emitting was enough to intimidate ordinary people. His body clearly showed signs of regular training as well as that overwhelming amount of mana. I wouldn't be able to inflict a fatal injury even if I used heroic strike. Of course, it would be my overwhelming win if I was just running without a direct confrontation. It was why I could be so cheeky. He's right, Joshua. You don't have to step in. It'll crush that arrogant Asian's mouth. Tommy stepped forward. Brightman pretended to be concerned for a bit, then nodded his head. It was pretty clear that this was his intention from the start. My, if you're that scared of sparring, there's nothing I can do. But you should be careful, he's a master of the sword. Sniff sniff. What perfume do you use? It's the same fragrance as the one I smelled in Waya's house. Since there's no way Waya invited you to her house, you must be using the same perfume as Waya. At my words, Brightman and even Waya froze. To be more concrete, the traces I felt in Waya's house was the same as the one I felt from Brightman. However, it wasn't Brightman. His ability wasn't one that would allow him to hide somewhere stealthily. One of his subordinates, however, could have such an ability. Of course, I already knew the answer. Thinking back to what I said yesterday, Waya seemed to have understood what I meant, and Brightman seemed to reach same conclusion. He frowned for an instant, but soon answered with a smile. Ha, that's impossible. It must be because I hung around Mastiford too much recently. That must be it, right? I didn't really like the smell, so I told her to stop using it. If you were using the same perfume, I was going to tell you the same thing. That's very presumptuous of you. This was enough of a warning. However, if the same thing happened again, I wouldn't be able to do much about you, but I could certainly take care of your subordinate. Brightman glanced over my words with a snort, and I also grinned. Ah, also, you shouldn't cling to her so much that her perfume would stain your clothes. As a man myself, it's a bit sad watching another man going after a girl who clearly hates him. It's only a matter of time before she opens her heart up to me. It's not something others should care about. Brightman, that will never happen, so please screw off. You're free to have your delusions, but as a friend, he has the right to care. Oi, Asian. Are you going to just blabber on? Stop barking like a dog and follow me out. Tommy was calling me. I didn't like fighting with words either. Because of my increased intelligence, I was uselessly talking more. I followed Tommy outside. It seemed people enjoyed watching a fight no matter what country they were from, as people followed us out, forming a circle around us. Shin, your ability is going to be shown for all these people to judge. Are you okay with that? If not, I can stop the fight. They'll find out how amazing you are from your results anyways. Don't worry. With his strength, he won't be able to draw my real strength out. I responded to Waya's worried message and gave her a wink. She smiled in response. She really was pretty. As I stood inside the ring made my spectators, I thought about how everything had turned out like I expected. Although it would be a performance, instilling my ability into their minds would help me in my time here. I hadn't fallen for Brightman's provocation without thinking. First, I took out white work gloves from my inventory and wore them. 
Then, I summoned Pika and infused her into the work gloves. Seeing the sparks flicker from the work gloves, Waya opened her mouth as if to say something, but didn't. Tommy took out a longsword that was apparently his beloved weapon, pointing it towards me. Ability users generally wore armor made out of monster remains, but he wasn't wearing anything. You're not wearing any armor. Will you be okay? You should be worried for yourself. I'm, mm, I liked his confidence. I nodded my head and reached into my pocket to take out a coin. Then, I realized I only had Korean wands. Waya seemed to have read my mind as she took out a ten pence coin and threw it over. After catching it, I asked Tommy. Do you want me to do it, or you? You can do it. Well start the moment it hits the ground. All right. Ight. I flicked the coin apathetically. The coin spun in the air. The moment it hit the ground. He was right in front of me. He really was fast. It seemed his ability strengthened his speed the most. The sword he raised up let out a strong light from the black mana imbued in it. It fell directly on my head. His technique wasn't bad either. About mid-rank level 4. I reflected on my mistake, thinking that he was a fool with only his body strengthened by mana. When the opponent was vastly weaker than me, it was hard to assess his strength accurately. No matter how fast he came at me, I would not be hit unless he struck me before I could respond. I thanked him inwardly for saving the trouble of having to run at him. I grabbed the arm he raised up with one hand and punched his stomach with my other hand. Sparks of lightning flashed and the clothes Tommy was wearing was burnt black. When I used divine speed and sent a few punches in less than a second, there was no more strength in his arm. I first bent his arm and took away his longsword, throwing it away on the ground. Then, I jumped on top of him. Although all this took a while to describe, it had happened in exactly one. Seven seconds. Wah. First, let's hit you a bit. From that point, I punched his face for 37 seconds before he could finally shout the word surrender. Even with an A-rank healer healing him, he won't be able to fight for a week. Thunder Knight, that was too much. The five of us embarked on a battleship that was a modified cruise ship. It seemed the old and kind-hearted Madame Brown didn't like that I beat up Tommy to such extent. Then, Waya, who had her arms stretched out to her side to enjoy the lake's wind, answered in my place. But Madame Brown, you didn't heal him. Of course, I thought he should take a beating too. Madame Brown is scary. I was quite happy. As the only melee attacker out of Britain's 4S rankers, he kept bragging about how he was the strongest. Really, how did you overwhelm him by that much? As a melee range ability user like Tommy, Paul seemed to be curious how I could deal with Tommy so easily. I answered Paul's question with a light laugh. When fighting monsters, things like strength and magic are important. But in a fight between two people, there's something even more important. Technique. Technique. I understand what you mean, but how? You're an awakened just like him. I learned martial arts even before that. For about 13 years. Ah, so that's it. Hmm, I still can't understand. Is how you move your body that important? I only block with my shield, so I'm not sure. You should know the force is different depending on where on the shield you're attacked. It's like that. Ah, now that you put it that way, I have a better idea. It seemed I could fit in better with this group after what happened this morning. I was quite content with it. But I'm worried about what Brightman will do from here on out. He won't stay still. Be careful, T. No, he can't harm me in the slightest. I announced. He isn't stupid enough to make a move on me himself, and I'm not afraid of anyone other than Brightman himself. If I had revealed my ability, it could have been a bit more dangerous. After all, his influence was strong enough to reach Korea. Annoying things could happen if he found out. Of course, as I was hiding my identity right now and only working as an awakened known as Thunder Knight, his influence was extremely limited in its reach. The best he could do was frame me for something I didn't do to decrease my fame and area of activity. For example, he could frame me for crimes like rape or murder. 
with the increased rate of crime from ability users, special ability user units were created to deal with them. If he could frame me for a severe crime like rape or murder, it could be fatal. There could also be other ways to bother me. After all, money and political power were strong. However, you can prevent that much, right, Waya? Humph, don't underestimate an SS ranker's strength. The British government can't ignore me. Even if I go around killing people, they'll cover up my crimes. Unfortunately, that applies to Brightman, too. That's true. So hurry and get stronger, so you can crush him, sure. It shouldn't take long. Look forward to it. When I answered her and smiled, Wyatt stayed silent for a bit, then returned a smile back. All right, they'll look forward to it. The others watched our conversation from the sidelines and whispered. They're dating, right? SH, let's just watch over them slowly. I used to be like that with my wife too. These spectators weren't just in Korea. Anyways, what have you been doing since a while ago, T? Mike asked me. Looking at the knife I was sharpening with a whetstone, I replied. Hmm. Oh, you're asking why I'm sharpening a knife? Oh. So you can wield knives too? That's something to look forward to. No. What is everything talking about? As I looked at the 8 meter long tuna breaching out of the water, I replied. Sashimi is best served fresh. While everyone was silent from being touched, I hummed and aimed the sharpened knife at the tuna. Today's lunch would be a tuna sashimi special. Author's note. I've given up. I can't just cut it in the middle. I had no choice. I can't just say look forward to the while sparks are flashing. I hope you enjoyed the chapter, everyone. I hope you finished the day with ICDS. P.S. 13 spoons of red tea. Did you get the reference? I used to really like that red tea drinking character. Chapter 96 A rank field dungeon, graveyard over the lake. There were three types of monsters that appeared here. First were the fish-headed, human-legged monsters that climbed on top of boats and attacked with their sharp teeth, the fishmen. As the weakest group of monsters at graveyard over the lake, they were the greatest in number. They swam freely in the lake, then suddenly jumped on top of boats and attacked the passengers. As melee attack monsters, they were also the monsters that annoyed Waya's party the most. The second were the shark-type monsters that resembled saw sharks, tooth saws. They had long upper jaw covered in saw-like teeth that seemed to be strengthened by mana as they vibrated like chainsaws. These monsters didn't jump on top of boats like fishmen, but approached boats with chainsaw sounds and poked holes in them. To prevent this, the cruise ship I was on was patched with the leather of the S-rank monster, Wyvern. Even so, it couldn't last very long against the Toothsaw's attacks. As such, we had to take care of them whenever we heard their chainsaw sounds. Although Waya's attribute wasn't the best for the dungeon, her SS-ranked flames could still burn their targets underwater. In other words, as long as they weren't left untouched as they attacked, they were easier to deal with than fishmen. The third and last were the most precious and popular monsters, melting tunas. Why were they called melting tunas? Because they were so soft and delicious that they melted in our mouths. They were so delicious that they were called the blessing of Windermere's dungeon. Even without bluestones, these melting tunas were said to be sold for 150 million one one. But you see, my magic roasts them instantly. My magic is a bit slow to cast. Useless people, Tui. You want me to roast you instead? Just wait there until my magic is finished. Oops, I accidentally said my thoughts out loud. Regardless, looking at the melting tuna that had jumped on top of our boat and splashed around, I asked the others. How do these things attack? They shoot water from their mouths. As soon as Waya's words left her mouth, the melting tuna turned its head towards me and shot out a stream of water. Mike, who was ready, blocked it with a wall of water. A thundering roar that shouldn't be possible from the collision of water rang out. I first wore a raincoat for sanitary purposes, then charged at the melting tuna. Hand over your Otero too and it'll cook you with the least amount of pain hook. What's wrong, T? 
I ran behind the tuna to its blind spot and swung my knife. Seeing the knife break the moment it touched its scales, my eyes opened wide. The knife won't go in. It's an A-rank monster. What did you expect, stupid? Damn it. I wrapped my arms around the melting tuna's gills. Although its constant struggling annoyed me, it couldn't overpower my strength, which was boosted by various equipment. When I let lightning flow into its body through its gills, the melting tuna stopped its water attack and began coughing. Good, it was working. I raised the lightning output and strangled him harder. Every time sparks of lightning flickered from my arms, the melting tuna twitched, its resistance becoming weaker. So that's Thunder Knight. My image of him is being broken. After wrestling with the melting tuna for a minute, I managed to kill it. However, looking at the smoked melting tuna, I realized I had made a fatal mistake. Oh no I grilled it. Ha, you're no different than me, T. Killed by a minute-long exposure to strong lightning, even the inside of the tuna had been grilled to perfection. Although I was glad everyone said it was tastier than Waya's roasted version, I refused to give up. Damn, since I couldn't just bring out my spear, there was only one thing I could do. I need to learn a sword technique and strengthen my knife with mana. Are you crazy? Kitchen knives couldn't penetrate melting tunas when they were alive or when they had just died. Knives only worked on them long after they died or when they were cooked to perfection. As such, I couldn't fillet the melting tunas like I wanted. Chewing on its delicious gill with its size, its gill was also huge, I muttered with resentment. Damn it, my tuna sashimi. It'll take you to eat some later, so stop whining. No, I vow to eat a fresh, living melting tuna. Nom nom. Stop eating that grilled tuna and kill the fish men. I was quite sad from being unable to eat the tuna sashimi that I had been looking forward to so much. Regardless, I had no problem killing the monsters in the A-rank dungeon, graveyard over the lake. I didn't even have to use Thunder Beast. If it was me from the time I killed the giant iron boar, I would undoubtedly have had trouble killing them, but in just a few months of leveling up and gaining battle experience, A-rank monsters died in just a few punches from me. I once again realized the importance of stats. Strong. Im unneeded. Same, but why so suddenly, Paul? We were only eating popcorn since a while ago. When Paul spoke dispiritedly, Mike responded with surprise. Hearing their conversation, I lightly smiled and asked. Why aren't more melting tunas appearing? Since that first tuna, we've only seen those disgusting fishmen or those tooth saws trying to poke holes in our boat like woodpeckers. There aren't that many of them. We were lucky to have seen that one. I turned a precious guy into a grilled fish. Since I already cooked the tuna, we couldn't sell it. Why I lied saying that Shed stored it using her extra-dimensional storage magic, and put it in her inventory. I didn't care, thinking I could always catch another one, but to think it was so rare if she didn't give me my share later, bloodshed would be inevitable. Striking my lightning fist into a fishman's body, I pledged to myself. After I stayed on the ship for three hours, I finally understood why Waya seemed to be crying every time she contacted me. This lake is really big. There's just no end to it. Was Windermere Lake always this big? Of course not. When it became a dungeon, the area strangely became bigger. That's why we aren't sure just how long we'll have to continue. According to other countries' reports, the number of normal monsters decreases significantly when the field dungeon's boss is killed but we haven't been able to find that boss. Waya threw another fireball into the water as she answered my question. The tooth saw that was trying to drill into the ship made its death throes and sunk into the water. Watching the tooth saw, I muttered. Shark fin. Don't. An S-ranker from China already tried it, and apparently the texture of tooth saw's fin isn't as good as other sharks. In fact, because it's so hard, ability users other than body reinforcement types can't even eat it. Did the Chinese S-ranker finish it? Did he say it was tasty? No, he wasn't a body reinforcement type ability user, so his teeth broke. Kook, so he at least tried, that S ranker. Giving up on the shark fin, I raised my head. It was already past four in the afternoon. The cold winter lake wind blew against my platinum blonde hair. 
looking at the town that was only a dot over the horizon, I murmured. Even going back will take some time. Yep, we're going to go back soon. So. You understand why I said it would take a long time, right? Yeah, you did well until now. Of course, since I'm here, ITLL be much faster. Huh, at least your confidence doesn't lose to an SS ranker. As Waya and I were talking, Mike nodded his head and remarked. You are indeed worthy of the name Thunder Knight. Waya took care of the tooth saws and I took care of the fish men. Other than when we met the melting tuna, Paul and Mike only stood by. As for Madame Brown, she had spent the entire afternoon enjoying the lake winds. According to her, it was better if she didn't need to use her ability. She really had the mindset of a healer. Although we encountered many monsters on our way back, no melting tunas appeared, and we didn't even catch a glimpse of the boss monster. When we spent over three hours to get back to the dock, the sky had turned completely dark. The sun wasn't out for long even in Britain's winter. Let's go get some drinks with dinner. Mike offered with his hand on my shoulder, and I gave him a thumbs up. Paul seemed to want to join in, while Madame Brown said her goodbyes and went back to her lodging. Waya then sent me a message as she gestured at me. Let's go finish the grilled tuna. Time is frozen in the inventory, so ITLL be delicious and fresh. They'll treat you to the ultimate wine. You know just what I want. Call. I exchanged glances with Waya and took Mike's hand off of my shoulder. Now that I think about it, I have to teach Waya how to control her mana. We'll have to drink tomorrow. That's not suspicious at all, hee hee. Mastiford's fans across the globe will cry. Paul, let's leave the young lovers alone and go out for a drink with just the two of us. All right, since that's the case, let's drink until dawn, Mike. Paul and Mike walked away with a huge misunderstanding about me and Waya. Since I couldn't be bothered with chasing after them and correcting the misunderstanding, I simply followed Waya to her lodging. When I was watching the countless stars in the night sky with awe, Waya opened her mouth. You've spent a day with them now. How were they? They're good people, right? Yeah. I think Britain's quite lucky. Although Brightman is here too, I was quite surprised there were so many people with camaraderie and clear hearts, even with their great strengths. At my compliment, Waya let out a dry cough and puffed out her chest. I wished she'd restrain herself a bit with how bountiful her chest was. I didn't know where to look. Britain is a great country. Ah, I like Korea too. There are many good people in Korea too. Plus, I love Korean food. My mom is a great cook. But still, I like this country, Britain. I think being proud of the country you were born in is a good thing. I replied with a bitter smile. She also responded with a bitter smile. Then, neither of us said anything. We arrived at her lodgings and opened the door. As Waya was about to go in without much thought, I stopped her. With a smile, I closed the door. As I thought, he didn't listen to my warning. Thinking that, I opened my eyes sharply and shouted. Ruyue, Pika, restrain him. Ao. The lodging was instantly surrounded by a wall of ice. A gasp rang out along with the sound of a window opening. A large amount of electricity sparked in the air. A black-clothed man trying to escape from the window had become enveloped in Pika's lightning curtain. The moment I heard his voice, I was reminded of someone. You can't run. After falling on the ground, the black-clothed man tried to escape without caring for the pain or injury he suffered, but Ryue froze his feet before he could move. With his feet frozen to the ground, he couldn't move in the slightest. Pika created a spear of lightning in the air. Master, do I kill him? Paralyze him for now. Don't let him take anything out. At my order, Pika sent her lightning flying toward him. As I expected, he tried to reach into an invisible pocket of dimension in midair. However, Pika's lightning struck him before he could take anything out. He trembled as he foamed at the mouth. Meanwhile, Ryu's ice crept up from his feet to his shin, knees, then waist. He was being restrained perfectly. Good, with this, he wouldn't be able to escape to the dungeon. I stood in front of him. 
It seemed he snapped out of the paralysis as he sent a fist imbued with blue light toward me. However, I likewise imbued my hand with white light and grabbed his fist. He flinched as he trembled. How disappointing. With that, I squeezed the fist in my hand. Crack. With an unpleasant sound, his finger bones snapped. His other fist instantly flew toward me shining with a strange light. Before what I expected was a skill could activate, I struck his elbow up. Crack. With another unpleasant sound, his arm snapped. Cook. I didn't think you were this kind of person. What? Shin do you know him? Seeing Waya standing still and blinking at me until the situation was taken care of, I was reminded how bad magicians were with using their bodies. On her shoulder was a small flame cat. It seemed she at least knew how to protect herself. I gave her six points out of ten. I answered Waya. Didn't you realize? Realize what? To prevent him from opening the door to the dungeon, I grabbed his other arm and bent it. Although he tried to resist me with his mana, my strength was vastly higher than his. He was undoubtedly a strong explorer, but I could so easily break his arm. Cool. Even after hearing his voice, Wyatt tilted her head. You, that's uncharacteristically cute, so it's forbidden from now. I calmed my heart beating because of her, and told her the answer. It's Walker. Edward Walker. Ah, Walker. So that's who it was Walker. Walker finally appears. And gets beaten the moment he does. But it was to be expected. Walker is an explorer from the third dungeon tiers. 1. About 130,000 US dollars. For the record, a sushi-grade bluefin tuna was sold for 173,600 for a 444-pound fish in 2001. So it's a very reasonable price for a good tuna. 2. The most expensive, fattiest, and most delicious part of a tuna. Chapter, 97. Waya's eyes opened wide. It was to be expected. She probably didn't expect Walker's name to suddenly pop out. But I was sure. The black-clothed man who was frozen up to his stomach was undoubtedly Edward Walker. I could tell from his voice. Seeing him use a skill, I became even more confident. I took off the mask he was wearing. A brown-eyed and brown-haired middle-aged man was revealed underneath. Although he was gritting his teeth and glaring at me, I didn't pay it any attention and grabbed his face. PZZT. Sparks flashed. This strong resistance made me confident. You even have an item that hides your identity. Like the one you're wearing. I already said I was sorry. I let Walker go. Since he could have the return skill like me though he would have used it by now, I broke both of his two legs to leave behind evidence that he couldn't get rid of. Although I wasn't sure how severe the state of his arms and legs were, that was not of my concern. Cook. Walker, sneaking into a lattice room is something only a piece of trash would do. Don't you think so? Cool. You see, I'm quite angry. It could be because I have a younger sister, but it doesn't feel like someone else's problem. I might be a bit harsh so start talking. First, I lightly punched his stomach. The mana surrounding his body undulated and a strong blue light shot out for a moment. From the resistance I felt against my fist, it seemed he was wearing an impact-reducing item, as it only reacted to physical impacts, not to lightning or ice. No, perhaps the item reacted, but couldn't win against them. I wondered how it worked. Was it a one-time use item? Or did it have a set number of uses? Perhaps it simply activated using his mana. To answer my question, I punched Walker again. He frowned, and at the same time, another blue light shot out. It seemed he was using his own mana. Deciding that it was best to deplete his mana before he could do something to escape, I punched him repeatedly. Don't even pretend to be someone else. Im Walker. Kook. Sorry, let me deplete your mana first. I won't resist. I don't believe you, so shut up. I beat him repeatedly. When the blue light subsided completely, Walker's pupils dilated. It was the sign that his lack of mana was affecting his mind. Kuk Yun Wawu, you brute. 
I was only inside the building. What, you were just trying to sneak a peek on Wyatt taking a bath? Did someone like you crawl into an SS ranker's lodge to play tag? If you're going to continue your nonsense, I can always hit you more. You, why would a dungeon explorer like you work under someone like Brightman? I, of course, judged that Walker was Brightman's subordinate and was acting on his orders. To be honest, it was rather obvious. Waya was also nodding her head in agreement. Would you believe me if I said I wasn't? When I raised my fist without a reply, Walker let out a deep sigh. You really are a brute UK. First, take off that item. Walker glared at me, then reached his hands out to unequip his item. Then, realizing that his arms were broken, he murmured something. Surprisingly, something thin came off of his face, and he became a black-haired, green-eyed young man. Although his facial lines were rather thick, his green eyes gave off a calming impression. Ah, give me that item of course. It's a floor shop item, so it's untradeable. Oh, I see. When I picked it up, it came in my possession without any resistance. He was lying. Ghostface unique. Durability 98110. Equipment limit level 40, magic 50. Option magic, minus 20, dexterity 15. Skill Ghostface, wearing this item will allow you to change your appearance into someone you've seen before. However, as the item uses your mana, you cannot use a portion of your mana while the item is equipped. The moment the item description popped up, I punched Walker's stomach again. As expected, blue light once again shot up. He was undoubtedly trying to do something, as he grit his teeth at my attack. You son of a bitch. You're the son of a bitch here. I depleted his mana once again and put Ghostface in my inventory. Can you disarm yourself next? I can't move my body. Heal my arm at least. Okay, they'll just take them off myself. Kayak, what are you doing when I'm watching? Just like that, Walker was stripped until even his important parts were showing why I screamed and turned away. I put some random clothes on Walker and burned his undergarments. Then, I checked his equipment and found what I was looking for. Here it is. Serena's Guardian Bracelet Epic. Durability 5511-120. Equipment requirement bound to Edward Walker. Others who equip it will not receive its effects. Options All Stats 10, Constitution 10. Skills Serena's Protection. Upon receiving physical or magical attacks that surpass its wearer's defense, it automatically uses mana to protect its wearer. Epic, huh? I didn't realize at first, but I also had epic raid items. My Crimson Dragon scale armor set, Crimson Dragon, Red Dragon Felix's cape and Gluttony spear were all epic raid items. As I didn't expect Walker to have such a precious item, I couldn't help but let out an exclamation of surprise. However, as I already knew, epic grade items became bound to their first wearers. Others who equipped them weren't able to enjoy their effects. As such, I ordered Pika to destroy Surina's guardian bracelet. It was a shame, but there was no other choice, since I couldn't equip it. No, do you know how precious that is? Walker, just shut up. I checked the rest of his equipment, but they were only rare grade at best. I put them together in a pile and burned them up. Walker bit his lips and cursed. You son of a bitch. No, you son of a devil. Now, let's hear your story. Like this? Your mouth isn't hurt. Why are you working under Brightman? Don't tell me you made him a dungeon explorer. Though, there's still only six people in Earth's dungeon explorer rankings. You think I'm crazy? Compared to him, the only thing I have going for me is that I'm a dungeon explorer. He doesn't know that I can go to a place outside this world and grow my ability plus, it just so happens that my clan has been serving Brightman's clan for generations. It really was a simple reason. Although I had doubts, why I seemed to have accepted it. It's possible. Hey, it's the 21st century. Shin, in this world, there are lots of people living lives you can't even imagine. That's okay, I understand. I looked at Walker and fell deep into thought. I didn't think I would beat Walker half-dead when I came over for dinner. It was so absurd that I felt like I was looking at an answer to a math problem without any work. 
Then why were you spying on Waya? You two are really quite friendly. Calling her Waya I've never seen Mastaford allow someone to call her by her first name. Walker, I thought you were smart. Perhaps, even though he understood the dangerous situation he was in, he might have wanted to show that his mind had not yielded to me. Or, he was simply comforting himself by telling himself that he had not completely lost yet. I didn't care either way, but I didn't have any intention of letting this drag out any longer. Did I have to resort to more violence? Walker seemed to have noticed what I was thinking as he hurriedly continued. As you can imagine, it was Brightman's orders. He said to observe and report everything he probably wanted to find something he could exploit. Not to mention, Yun Wawu though it's probably a fake name, you're also someone he ordered me to observe. He was quite mad that Mastaford let you enter her lodgings. Eck, creepy. Waya scratched her arms, likely from goosebumps she must have received. If I were her, I would have been creeped out too. Mastaford, you didn't let your guard down often. The only thing I could deliver to Brightman was a picture of you taking a shower that I took between the door gap. Kayak. Waya screamed and threw her flame cat at Walker. The clothes I took the trouble to put on him were burned instantly. Quayak. Waya, calm down. Murder is bad. Creepy, creepy, this is the worst. Brightman who ordered to take pictures of me secretly and Walker who carried it out. I want to kill them both. I'm going to kill them both. Be patient for now. I had something in mind. Unless you're really going to kill Walker, why don't you hear me out? Hugh, Hugh, Hugh. You have a plan. I'll hear it out. Waya breathed roughly and retrieved her flame cat. After half burning a man to cinders, the cat turned around and meowed cutely. I thought she'd refuse, but she regained her composure rather quickly. In the end, it seemed she was thinking the same thing I was. Really kook, you're letting me show very embarrassing parts of myself. Half-burnt Walker murmured as he gritted his teeth. As I had just finished talking with Waya, I replied to him, dumbfounded. You should have known this was going to happen if you were discovered. Right how did you pierce through my stealth? I was confident I would never be found out. Don't tell me you really thought I'd tell you all right, Walker, you have a few choices. Listen up. I raised a single finger up. First, you can go back to Brightman and reveal to the whole world that you're involved with him. You seem to be missing some conditions there. Of course, you'll use your real face and reveal what you did. Although Brightman is behind you, the British government cares for Wyatt just as much. I can be certain that ITLL be quite hard for you to have a proper life after that. Walker closed his mouth. I continued. Second, you can run away to the dungeon and never come back. It's probably better than the first option, though, it's still the same that you won't be able to live on Earth. Is there more? Of course there is. Third, you can betray Brightman and come to our side. You think I will? After what you just did to me? Walker asked me as if he had just heard the most absurd thing in the world. However, I nodded my head assertively. I think you will. You were only working under Brightman because you were born into it. If you thought about Brightman so much that you would always be loyal to him, you would have made him a dungeon explorer a long time ago. Someone who knows that would do this to me. What you did was unforgivable after all. Even if you can become my ally, you'll have to pay for your crimes. At my words, Walker became silent. Watching him, Waya burst out into laughter. Kukuk, so this is the Walker who cared for himself so much and didn't want to help Walker, your actions frankly disgust me, but it's not unforgivable as you didn't make Brightman into a dungeon explorer. Although I wanted to end you no matter what Shin said if you cooperate wholeheartedly from now on, I can stop myself from ending your life. You should know this is an incredible mercy on my part. Someone who couldn't notice me until now shouldn't be so arrogant. UK. After making Wyatt speechless, Walker turned his gaze towards me. Walker was certainly a dungeon explorer, as I could see his body naturally healing as time went on. I can't escape from him. Even before he became an ability user, the power and money he had was enormous. As long as I'm in Britain, I can't escape his reach. Even if I can go into the dungeon, 
it would be the same when I come out. Unless I plan on living in the dungeon forever like you said, I can only be loyal to him. The only way I could resist him is not letting him know that I can turn him into a dungeon explorer. Setting aside the question of whether or not that was really the only way why can't you just leave Britain? Were you listening to me? There's no way to leave Britain without him finding out. Why don't I give a very simple example? During the event raid, you could have left for another country and stayed there. You were just scared. Admit it. You didn't have the courage to change the way you lived. Hugh. After a short sigh, Walker revealed his true thoughts. As long as I was loyal to him, I could have anything I wanted. You're right. Being able to thoughtlessly work under someone is indeed comfortable, and I grew used to it. Participating in a raid and running away. I don't know how I would live after that. I was working under him the moment I was born. There wasn't a single time where I acted on my own accord. The reason you only laughed at others in the communication channel and never participated, was it just a defense mechanism? No, that was because I simply thought you guys were idiots. It wasn't a defense mechanism or the like. If jumping into danger on your own volition isn't stupid, what is? You're doing exactly that right now. This guy, even if his boat is a mess, his mouth is alive I decided to give him the ultimatum. Walker, make your decision. This is the last chance to change your lifestyle. If you agree, they'll separate you from Brightman completely. Pledging your loyalty and living for Brightman for the rest of your life, or living in the dungeon without being able to come back to Earth. I can at least offer you a better lifestyle than that. Walker hesitated for a long time and finally answered. Hearing his answer, I grinned. Chapter, 98 The dungeon's residential area was packed with people today, as always. However, I headed straight to my mansion. I wasn't going there to rest, but to visit the fairy garden through the fairy spring. In the pavilion on the way to Loretta's log cabin, I saw someone I had not seen on my last visit. Lin. Oh, if it isn't Kong Shin, the crown prince who died on the fortieth floor. I knew he would make fun of me. But why was he here? I gave him an inquisitive glance. At the same time, I noticed someone next to him. It was a cute girl with cat ears on her head, who was shaking her long tail slowly. It was Locanyan. Hello, Nyan. Hello, Locanyan. My name isn't Locanyan, it's Loka, Nyan. I see, Locanyan. Kaya. After making fun of Locanyan, I turned my attention to Lin. Just like always, he had a cigarette in his mouth. Thanks to your vitality hitting zero, I became free for a week, so am enjoying my sweet vacation. I see. Well, you must be tired from making all that equipment for me. Thanks again, Lin. You really hate losing, don't you? Lin Nyan, Loka Nyan made cookies, Nyan. Eat some, Nyan. Everyone liked it, Nyan. As Lin's hand holding his cigarette shook, Locanyan pushed a plate in front of him, which had cookie-like things piled on top of it. Were they items? I mean, they looked just like poison items. Ah, uh, I was wondering where everyone went. Loka, you sent them away, I see. That's rude, Nyan. Everyone shook because it was so delicious, Nyan. Everyone said they'd bring them home to eat them, Nyan. There's this much left after that. Damn, they should have taken a bit more for me. Don't say that, Nyan. Try them, Nyan. I put in lots of love for Lin, Nyan. I don't need them. Ah, uh, I know. All right, Lin, have a nice day. Locanyan, I'm cheering for you. Hey, wait. Kong Shin. Ooh. You're a good guy, Nyan. Goodbye, Nyan. I had no intention of trying out cookies that would make even a draconian tremble in fear. Putting an end to Lin's attempt to get me to try those cookies, I wished him luck and headed to Loretta. I ignored Lin's scream that I vaguely heard behind me and spat on the ground. A girl was trying to give him handmade cookies. It was a situation straight out of a manhwa. Not to mention, the girl was a cat-eared beauty that embodied the word cute. I hoped he would eat them and explode. When Loretta first saw me, 
she welcomed me as she flapped her long ears. However, her ears drooped more and more as I explained the reason I was here. You want to learn a sword technique? To slice monsters for sashimi? My long and sad tale that no one could listen to without crying was cut off in the middle by Loretta. Then, she looked at me like she was looking at an idiot. You're an idiot. She said it. Why don't you make a hand knife and imbue mana into it? I don't have the confidence to control it carefully. Not to mention, it's illogical to fillet a fish with your hand. Why can't you put mana into your spear? I'm trying to hide the fact that I use spears. You're okay revealing that you can suddenly use swords. I'm just learning it today, so it shouldn't matter. There's a better method than that sweaty and brutish method, Shin Nim. When I heard Loretta's words, I became slightly uneasy. Sure enough, she took out a glowing blue kitchen knife from her pocket. A kitchen knife forged by a master craftsman, able to slice all food ingredients, even if they are monsters, without having to know even the basic of sword techniques. Its name is All Crusher. It's not allowed to crush everything. If you buy it now, it'll throw in burnt to white ashes, a magical pot that can heat all food ingredients to the perfect temperature. Both the kitchen knife and the pot have weird names. Also, it's not allowed to burn things to white ashes. Don't be surprised, there's more. Drug, a magical seasoning that can sublimate the taste of any food with just a single sprinkle. If you eat it once, you might get addicted and never be able to escape it. Drug? Is that a narcotic? It isn't, right? This mind-blowing combination of items is only 99,900 gold. They're only 99,900 gold. Just say 100,000 gold. From my heart for Shin Nim, the 100 gold is a service. Seeing Loretta make a heart with her two hands, I really considered flicking her forehead, but held myself back. Instead, I took out 100,000 gold and gave it to her. No, I just need 99,900 gold. Then he'll give 100 gold more as a service for my heart for Loretta. Oh oh. Loretta's ears flapped wildly. I only gave back the gold she discounted, but she was incredibly happy. This elf really liked money. Then, Loretta spoke as she gave me the items with a blooming smile. Okay, they'll serve you some tea, so stay for a while. Hoo hoo, Shin Nim is quite skilled at bargaining. Hmm. Ah, uh, tea time with Loretta is good too, but there's something I want to ask. I put the kitchen knife, pot, and seasoning into my inventory, and tried to make a serious expression to explain what had happened today. That I had met another explorer as an enemy and that he was currently restrained. Although Walker had agreed to betray Brightman, I had just beat him up severely, and it wasn't so easy to trust Walker, who had spent his entire life under Brightman's orders. I needed a way to ensure he wouldn't change his mind. After listening to my story, Loretta made a thinking hmm, then rummaged through her pocket with a small exclamation. Something perfect for Shin Nim is right. Here. Soul Contract. It had a very dangerous sounding name. Let's see, since you've made more than two achievements, you can buy this too. It's pretty easy to use. You write the content both sides of the contract should keep with your blood. It doesn't matter what language you write it in. After that, say that you'll form a soul contract, and the contract will activate. That's it. It's that simple. Ah, if either person violates the contract, the other person will take his soul, so be careful. This is a really dangerous contract. But you need something like this, right? Loretta rolled the soul contract and gave it to me. It's one million gold, but since no one's bought it for 500 years, they'll give it to you for 500,000 gold. That's the manufacture cost. A 50% discount, wow. It's still expensive though. All right, here. Dullahan gave me 100,000 gold each time I defeated him, and as I had defeated him over 80 times, I wasn't short on money. Even with the price I paid for party member scarecrows, floor master battle vouchers, potions, equipment repair costs, and the equipment crafting cost I paid to Lin, I still had about 7 million gold left. That is, I could spare 500,000 gold with only a light burden. Thanks for your purchase, customer. Thanks, Loretta. 
I knew coming to you was a good idea. I, am Glad to be of help. I if you there's anything troubling you, you can always look for me. As long as you pay for it, I can even make something I don't have. No, I'll try to get Lin to take care of most of my needs. I'm here because my vitality hit zero. I did meet Lin, but I couldn't bother him during his date. So you won't come over anymore? Loretta's ears drooped down. It was cute in a way, so I wanted to keep watching her, but Loretta's depressed appearance startled me, and I was making an excuse before I noticed it. And no. I meant I won't visit Loretta only when I have something I need. He'll come over often, as long as it doesn't bother Loretta. It doesn't bother me at all. In fact, I'm almost bored to death. So please come over a lot. No, if you're that bored, do work. Aren't you the guild master? When I came back after some tea, Walker was crawling on the ground with his body and mouth wrapped in boxing tape. Walker, Caterpillar suits you well too. Mm. His talking annoyed me, so I shut him up. Waya was glaring at Walker with a reddened face. I first took the boxing tape off of Walker's mouth. Puha. He coughed out a mouthful of breath and complained. Damn it, I was only curious if Mastiford and you, Quayak. Walker, are you perhaps just stupid? Walker became a burning caterpillar and was wriggling violently, but I decided to leave him be until Waya calmed down. When Walker was letting out a slightly smoked smell, I showed him the contract. All right, let's organize the content of the contract between us. You really are thorough. You even prepared something like this. What meaning is there to a contract? Don't tell me you think you could restrain me with the law. No, and I'm not trying to restrain you. This is a soul contract, just something that gives me your soul if you break the contract. Don't worry about it too much. How can I not worry about it? I'd rather be restrained by the law. But you have no choice. Damn it, no. I'm not doing it. What, so you were planning on breaking your promise? Waya spoke with a low voice and made a flame in her hand. A white flame. It was an incredibly hot flame. Walker seemed to have noticed how dangerous it was, as he swallowed his saliva. Then he silently pulled the contract toward him. Clause 1. Edward Walker it was his real name will not be able to directly or indirectly harm Waya Eleni Mastiford or Kong Shin, and this applies to their family, relatives, and friends. Well, of course, but I'm a bit worried just what direct and indirect encompasses. Simply put, you're not allowed to curse. Also, if you try to peek on me again, your soul might go flying from the mental stress I might take. I won't do it. Clause 2. Kong Shin will safely take Edward Walker to Korea, and help him live a free life given that he does not violate the first clause. But what's your plan? It won't be easy to avoid Brightman's eyes. Don't worry, I have my ways. Clause 3. Edward Walker will carry out the following missions in exchange for not revealing his perverted actions publicly and privately. First. Destroy all information about Waya Eleni Mastiford in Brightman's possession, and use his ability as a dungeon explorer to assist her to the greatest extent possible. Also, before Waya Eleni Mastiford gives her permission, do not appoint anyone as a dungeon explorer. Second. Guard Kong Shin's younger sister, Kong Yua, perfectly. It's exactly what it says. Brightman that bastard has a picture of me taking a B.A. bath. I hate it. Get rid of it all. Also, when I make my dungeon explorer organization later, you have to help. You'll need your authority to appoint a dungeon explorer then too. That's my condition. No, I expected the first mission. Yun Wawu, or rather, Kong Shin. What do you mean guarding your younger sister? What are you talking about? I'm only accepting you to our side because of it. I said as I glared at Walker. You see, my young sister is dangerously cute. Although I installed some safety devices, we live in a dangerous world. When something happens to my young sister and she's in trouble, I need someone to protect her until I get there. Your stealth ability and physical ability is perfect for a guard. You. Just for something like that. Something like that. 
The fist I raised up flickered with lightning. Should I kill this bastard? Why aside and stopped me? You only need to guard Shin's younger sister from morning to afternoon, so you'll be free after that. You can be in the dungeon or whatever then. What dungeon did you say you were from again? The third dungeon. Damn it, my daily life is going to be completely gone. Ah, you're so noisy. You'll be free on the weekends. Just think of it as a job. Kook, a job of secretly guarding some young chick. I'd rather stay in the dungeon for the rest of my life. Shin, don't kill him. I was already punching Walker's face, but thankfully, he didn't die. Humph, you'll understand when you see my sister. In fact, you'll be thankful that I gave you the opportunity to guard such a pretty and cute reincarnation of an archangel. Cook. She's that pretty. If you lay a single finger on her, you're dead. It'll rip you to shreds and burn you to cinders. It'll bring you back to life, kill you again, find you in hell, and turn you into powder. I it's in the contract. I know even if you don't threaten me. Clause 4. When requested by Waya Eleni Mastaford or Kong Shin, Edward Walker will participate in event raids and event dungeons. This clause takes priority over the second and third clause. That's it. You sure ask a lot of me. You don't like it? Want me to give you a salary too? I don't need it. I don't need you bossing me around even more. All right then, repeat after me. I form a soul contract. Hugh. Damn it. I form a soul contract. The moment we made our announcements, the soul contract floated up into the air and burned splendidly. Walker felt pain immediately afterwards and rolled on the ground. Quack. Ah, uh, maybe you can't curse us inwardly either. I heard your heart starts to hurt when the contract is about to be breached. If you continue, your soul will fly out, so be careful. Take it back, damn it, take it back. Quiak. I wasn't sure how long it would take for Walker to calm down, but it was none of my business. After finishing my business with him, I got up from my seat with a refreshed mind. Waya looked up at me with curious eyes. Where are you going? After dealing with Walker and even going to the dungeon to get items, we didn't even have time to eat dinner yet. Hugh, Waya, there's something I have to do. Something really important that I have to do right now. I don't know what it is. But do you need help? No, it's something I have to do myself. All right. I'm off then. I might be late, so you can eat first. Oh okay. Good luck. Even as she waved me goodbye, Wyatt tilted her head curiously. I left her lodgings. The town and lake were both completely dark. There was no one in sight, and far in the lake, a melting tuna was breaching over the water. Checking again that no one was around, I equipped my crimson dragon scale armor. In my hand was the all crusher. Melting tuna sashimi. Wait for me, I'm coming. The next morning, there was a report of a strange monster running above the lake waters borrowing Ryu's power, screaming to attract monsters provoke, and calling down storms to slaughter them elemental tempest. Thankfully, they hadn't seen me slice the melting tuna for sashimi. Author's Notes Can that be called freedom? Author's Thinking Walker has joined the party with Soul Contract. Bambadabam. You obtained a good assassin to put to work. PS1. The hard to describe cookies, Nairuko, crawling with love reference. 2. The pot's name burnt to white ashes, referenced from Ashida no Joe's famous scene. Chapter, 99. Walker carried out his mission swiftly and precisely. Although he looked pathetic when I was beating him up, his stealth ability was truly good enough to trick an SS ranker. In just two days, he brought us all of the data Brightman had on Waya. I destroyed or burned everything that I couldn't bring. There isn't even a single word or photo left of you. Walker assured us. Since neither the contract nor his personality made it likely that head lie, Waya quickly burned everything in front of her and nodded. All right, good. But he will definitely find out I was the one who did it. Simply put, I just burned the bridge connecting us. Good, Walker. 
You can now stay in the dungeon until I'm done with my business here. You can come with me when I go back to Korea. Even if I use my stealth ability, Brightman will find out if I leave the country with you. He's watching you closely. You already know, right? There won't be any problem. Don't worry. I don't want him to discover my identity either. He doesn't know how I came here, right? No one here knew you were coming until you arrived at Windermere. Masterford was thorough in hiding her tracks. Hoo-hoo, <laughs> it wasn't much. Waya was wearing a proud smile. Of course, as Waya was an SS ranker, it wasn't weird that she had allies that could hide from Brightman. It's fine then. When I go back, they'll be using my own method. You can come with me then, Walker. Your method, huh? You must have a special skill. Yep, exactly. So you can just focus on the dungeon before then. Ah. I almost forgot. Walker, here. What's? This is Serena's guardian bracelet. Walker grabbed the bracelet I held out and his eyes opened wide. Ah, it's a bit different. Lin said he added something to it. But how? Didn't you shatter and burn it? Mm, yeah, but it seems the important parts were fine. It's a reward for doing your job well and for all the work you'll do in the future. In truth, I took the remains of the broken bracelet to Lin at Fairy Garden, thinking maybe he could make a new item. As the important parts of it were still okay, a new bracelet was made using First Dungeon's monster drop items. The resulting Guardian bracelet was even better than the old one, but unfortunately, it was still bound to Walker. Although I thought about breaking it again, since he would be in charge of protecting my sister, I decided to give it back to him. Cool. I thought I'd never see it again. Walker looked touched as he rubbed the Guardian bracelet on his cheek. I tried my best to ignore the rather disgusting scene. Since you're the one who broke it in the first place, I won't thank you. But I can promise I will do my utmost to fulfill the contents of the contract. Although we wouldn't ever come to like each other, Walker's hostility toward Waya and me seem to have lessened now that he got his bracelet back. After equipping the Guardian bracelet, he went back to the dungeon. According to him, he was on the 44th floor. By the way, Shin, what dungeon are you from? You said you weren't gold ranked yet, right? But since you overwhelmed Walker like that, are you perhaps also in the second dungeon? Waya asked casually. I also responded casually. I'm in the first dungeon. What, why are you in the first? Even I'm in the second. Yep, I knew she'd get angry. My father is a first dungeon explorer. Since he appointed me as an explorer, I'd naturally be in the first dungeon. UUK, T that means your friend is also in the first dungeon. Right. Yuugu. But I'm stronger. I want to be in the first dungeon too. No. You should give up. I won't. It'll become platinum ranked and go to the first dungeon. I raised my head. What do you mean? You'll become platinum ranked and go to the first dungeon. You didn't know. The way to go to a higher ranked dungeon. This is the first time I've heard about it. As I wore a dumbfounded look, Waya began to explain. I only found out after I broke through the 65th floor. In the second dungeon, you'll become a platinum ranked explorer after the 80th floor, and if you complete a certain achievement on top of that, you can become a first dungeon explorer with your level adjusted. What's the achievement? I don't know. I looked at her like she was an idiot. She seemed to have noticed what I was thinking, as she pinched my arm, then writhed in pain with her hurt fingers. However, she soon continued triumphantly. But you know, if it's an achievement, it's probably something like that. I already have one. Hoo-hoo, burning over half the monster in the dungeon floor at the same time. I even got a title, Incarnation of Agni. Amazing, right? Agni. The god of fire from Hindu mythology. T that's amazing. I couldn't bring myself to tell her that I had a god's true name. Did you get an achievement yet? Ah, it's fine even if you haven't. It's just that I'm too amazing. I think you're skilled too. Plus, you'll continue to get stronger, so you'll have lots of chances to obtain an achievement. 
I completely ignored her consoling words and continued. Waya, I don't know what achievement you have to make to become a first dungeon explorer, but I'll tell you the achievements I've made so far, so you can refer to them. Achievements, plural. First, breaking through four floors in seven hours. Are you human? Second, challenging a floor master alone on your first try and defeating him. The achievement is better if you're the first one in the second dungeon's history to do it. You. Really? Really? Even if you aren't the first, defeating a floor master alone still counts as an achievement, and beating an event raid with few participants also counts as an achievement. But they aren't anything big, so I doubt those will be it. Obtaining a god's true name can be a great achievement. Since you already have Incarnation of Agni, you might be able to obtain Agni's true name if you try harder. Like if you could burn all the monsters in a dungeon floor at the same time. Hugh. Waya, who was listening to me silently, became dispirited. Then, she blurted out. I'm jealous. You really are honest. You you, I hate it. I hate myself and I hate you. Why am I jealous of you? Our dungeons are different and our battle styles are different. But still. I'm jealous. Seeing Waya play with her hair, not knowing what to do, I asked. So, are you just going to stay jealous? Of course not. God's true name, right? Defeating a floor master alone. You you, just you watch. I'll achieve them and become a first dungeon explorer. Prepare yourself. Now will be the only time you can talk so arrogantly. Got it, Kong Shin. Ooh, she's fired up. I answered her enthusiastic words with a smile. I really liked people that weren't overconfident. I liked hardworking people even more. Good luck, they'll be cheering for you. Don't cheer me on with such a kind face. My hostility is disappearing. You shouldn't be hostile towards your friend. As I answered Waya with amusement, a question suddenly popped up in my head. If there was a way to go from the second dungeon to the first dungeon. Where could I go from the first dungeon? After I joined Waya's team, our hunting speed more than tripled. As I easily took care of the fishmen that were causing the most problems for them, it was only natural. Furthermore, every time I screamed on the ship, monsters flocked toward us, allowing us to take care of them in one go. Amazing. How can T's voice provoke other monsters? I don't know, maybe they know I'm strong, so they're coming to fight together. I gave a half-hearted reply and punched a nearby fishman. Waya, who could surmise the reason, grinned and sent her fireballs flying without saying anything. Just like that, four days passed. By the time I stored over ten melting tunas in my inventory, the lake had begun to change. Simply put, the monsters became stronger. The number of fishmen decreased, and the number of melting tunas and tooth saws increased. Although it was a very good thing for me, it was undoubtedly an unusually change. Then, on the seventh day after I arrived at Windermere, while we were fighting melting tunas and tooth saws wildly, our ship came face to face with Brightman's ship. Although there were only five people on our ship, Brightman had seven people on his. Besides Tommy, who was on the ship even though he still hadn't fully recovered, Brightman was the only British ranker. I knew they had an A rank healer, so four other S rankers had come to aid Brightman. Miss Mastaford, you've been doing extremely well lately. We only have elites. You and I aren't close enough to be chatting like this, so why don't you turn your ship around and leave? Hugh, how cold, even though I'm always thinking about you. You're always thinking about me, you say. That's really, really creepy. Brightman flinched, seeming having sensed something from Waya's sizzling voice. Then, he continued. By the way, Miss Mastaford, I forgot to put a collar on my pet dog, and he ran away. I'm looking for him, but I can't seem to find him. He's a brown-haired dachshund. Have you seen him? I don't know why you're asking me about your lost dog, Brightman. Ah, uh, I don't know about a dog, but I did see a black cockroach in my house. I instantly burned it to cinders. Ah, uh, I see. My bad. Then, Brightman glared at me for some reason. What, why are you looking at me? 
Waya seemed to have noticed who Brightman was looking at as she snorted. Then, she lowered the tone of her voice and growled at Brightman. Brightman, I'm warning you. If you overstep your boundaries, I'm prepared to do the same. I'm proud that you are British, but I'm disillusioned the more I interact with you. You're one of the superhumans representing our country. You should know what that means. Understood. Ha ha ha, you're funny, Miss Mastiford. Of course I understand what that means. Miss Mastiford is also a superhuman representing our country. Don't you think we're perfect for each other? I'm telling you to shut up before the number of superhumans representing our country is reduced to one. Brightman was the one who ordered Walker to observe Waya and even take pictures of her secretly. Just like I thought when I first obtained the evidence of Brightman's wrongdoing, the British government would most likely refuse to do anything that would harm Brightman. It didn't matter what crimes he committed. Although I didn't know it at first, Brightman supposedly had an overwhelming influence over the British government and Guardian. Since he had political power, monetary power, and military power, it was understandable. In other words, although they were both SS rankers, Brightman had a higher standing in Britain. There were undoubtedly many supporters of Waya, but it was probably only to the extent that they didn't get in the way of Brightman. No matter how much Waya loved her country, if Britain continued to ignore Brightman's overbearing actions, Waya might lose her patience. That was what Waya was warning him about. Miss Mastiford. How can you say that? As fellow British nobles, aren't you embarrassed? Embarrassed? Would someone who knows what embarrassment is do what you've been doing? TSK. Miss Mastiford, you weren't like this before. As I thought, you shouldn't hang out with people outside of your class. Waya made a huge flame and threw it. It hit the water between our ship and Brightman's ship, exploding with a thundering roar and making an enormous amount of steam rise up. Don't. Insult. My. Friend. Although her voice wasn't loud, her voice reached my ears clearly. At the very least, they're better than a piece of trash like you. Brightman, if you really are a noble, if you really think about Britain and its future, you should screw the hell off and not involve yourself with me. Dig open those filthy ear holes and let my words stick in your mind. I want ever like a scumbag like you. I never did and I never will. So turn your ship around and screw off, you oldie. What a beautiful speech. If I do say so myself, her speech from just now should be placed above Chichil's commencement speech. She managed to pack her spirit and intentions into such a short speech. No, Mike, that's too much. I'd say it's about on the same level as Steve Jobs' commencement speech. You guys shouldn't make fun of commencement speeches like that. You'll get arrested. As I clapped, I warned Mike and Paul who were saying some nonsense drivel. When they both gave me a thumbs up, I got the strong urge to break them, but I restrained myself. However, rather than making Brightman turn his ship and leave, her shouting and flame seemed to have first called something. Oh Ong. For a moment, something created a strong vibration in the water. Whoa. Mike. The moment something popped out of the water, Paul quickly pushed Mike away and blocked that something with his shield. Thanks to Paul's timely defense, we were able to see the thing that was vibrating so strongly. It's a saw. A really big one too. As the words left my mouth, I created a specially large thunder arrow in my hand and threw it forward. When it hit the eye of the giant tooth saw, which was about to break through Paul's shield with its sharp saw snout, the giant tooth saw screamed and fell back. So you could use lightning outside of just your fists. Before that, take care of him. He has to be the field dungeon's boss. Although normal tooth saws were large too, just this guy's body was over 20 meters long. Naturally, his saw snout was several meters long too. With that huge saw and its unnaturally strong vibration, it was possible that the ship would be cut in half. Wyatt gritted her teeth and created flames in both her hands. Looks like you'll need my help. Just don't bother us, Bryman. Although Wyatt shot down Brightman's offer immediately, as the boss of an A-rank field dungeon could easily kill a ranker, refusing his offer wasn't necessarily the best idea. Waya naturally became quieter, and knowing that, Brightman moved his ship forward towards us. Master, careful. 
About what? I can hear a singing voice. Other people will hear it soon too. Singing voice. Protect your mind. Hearing Pika's warning, I circulated per Yuta circuit, when a thought suddenly crossed my mind. That giant tooth saw charging at us to cut our ship probably wasn't the one singing. In that case. There are. Two bosses. The moment I murmured. La 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 la. I began to hear a beautiful female singing voice. It was the kind of heavenly singing voice that charmed whoever heard it and made even the most tearless person cry. It was the singing voice that gave this field dungeon the name, Graveyard Over the Lake. Author's Note Upping Walker's Goodwill with a Carrot and a Stick Method And a slight foreshadowing to go with it. Will British rankers other countries rankers our MC be able to kill the field dungeon's boss safely? Look forward to the Chapter, 100 La 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 la. Uh, whoa. Brightman's ship was the first to have problems. Its helmsman fainted, and the ship, which was heading toward us slowly, suddenly sped up greatly. Our ship's helmsman was the next to faint, giving us no chance to move our ship. There was no doubt that the singing was attacking our minds, just like the voices of the sirens that attacked Odysseus on his way back to Ithaca. Mike, do something. Shit. There's not enough time. Oh wind. Thankfully, someone on Brightman's ship seemed to be able to wield wind, as a strong wind suppressed the motor that had gone out of control, diverting Brightman's ship away from us. However, after changing directions, they were charging towards the giant tooth saw. Hey, ramming it with your ship isn't going to do much damage. Stop saying stupid things and start chanting, Mike. Paul yelled at Mike and ran next to me. Then, the singing voice once again rang out. Eh eh. Paul made a stupefied voice. Come on, S rankers, you should be able to endure some mental attacks. I urgently shouted in a loud voice. Everyone snap out of it. The next moment, Paul, who was staggering, stood back up. His eyes were clear and unconfused. Wow, your shouting voice is amazing, T. My mind feels clear, and I can feel strength surging through my body. I feel like I can even smack that guy to death with my shield. You exaggerate too much. Just focus on blocking that thing's attack. Waya, do you know where the voice is coming from? You'll find out. Since I had already revealed Thunder Arrow, I decided to use Pika's abilities freely. Pika, please. Leave it to me, Master. Thunder Spear. A large spear of lightning formed in mid-air, drawing everyone's attention. I ignored their gazes and threw the lightning spear at the tooth saw. At the same time, I realized something important. Brightman's ship was still charging straight at the tooth saw. What, why haven't they recovered their consciousness? Oh, so your shout really did have a special power. The moment Paul let out an exclamation of surprise, I realized. They weren't my party members. Madam Brown. I'm already on it. Mind recovery. Madam Brown spread her arms out and used mind recovery magic. A few of the people on Brightman's ship raised their heads. Brightman was, of course, one of them. Kook, what is this voice? Brightman, turn the ship around. Paul shouted. Brightman and the other rankers realized the situation they were in and ran to the steering wheel. At the same time, the tooth saw began to move. Towards us. Eh. Hook, it must be because you attacked it, T. Cook fine, it'll take care of it. Because of the sheer size of the thing, I wasn't exactly sure what to do, so I decided to take care of it in an orderly way. First, its eyes. Then, its frightening saw. With that, I threw a second thunder spear at its eye. Kia. La la la. The singing voice once again rang out. At the same time, hit by the thunder spear, the tooth saw screamed and swung its saw blade randomly. Then, it saw Brightman's ship, as Brightman and the others had once again fallen in a daze to the singing voice. Not only did they fail to turn the ship around, this time their wind magician also lost his consciousness. Come on, don't you guys have a healer too? Oh no, they're too far from us. 
We'll have to go there ourselves. Ack, so annoying. La 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 listen to my singing. If it's singing, you should do it at a concert. I retorted angrily and once again threw a thunder spear at the tooth saw. Waya also shot a huge fireball at it. Come over here, you shark bastard. Done. Ocean Guidance. Mike finished his magic at the perfect moment. Surprisingly, the rough lake waters began to roll artificially, and Brightman's ship began to move toward us. Boo, Mike. Ha ha ha, this is the power of my magic. The magic's name is Ocean's Guidance, but... Lala why aren't you listening to me? La la la. The girl's voice was changing slightly. Throwing a thunder spear at the tooth saw, I asked Waya without facing her. Waya, did you find it yet? Ah, sorry. I missed it because I was attacking the tooth saw. Alright, then let's just finish the tooth saw before it appears. Madam Brown, when that ship gets closer, use that recovery magic attack. Leave it to me. When my attack stopped for just a moment, the tooth saw vibrated its saw blade strongly. Just when I was wondering what it would do, it stuck it beneath the water. Then, waves began to rise up violently. Come on, this was a lake, not the ocean. The waves rolled strongly, and Waya fell in the middle of shooting out her flames. Before she dropped her flames on the floor and caused a disaster, I jerked her arm and held her in my embrace. Are you okay? I'm not okay. How are you okay? Because I trained. Paul seemed to be hanging on, while Mike was floating in the air. Levitation. I heard about that magic before. Waya, didn't you say you were originally a magician? Can't you use levitation? I can hold me like this for a bit. Got it. Supporting her with my chest and one arm, I used the other arm to continue throwing thunder spears. The problem wasn't our ship, but Brightman's. We managed to get it to approach our ship with ocean guidance, but because of the violent waves, the ship had stopped in the middle and was now trying to spit out its passengers. When I told the others about it, Mike responded. It's probably easier to get them to come to our ship. The ship's too heavy, it's hard to drag it from so far. Hey, say that earlier. Waya shouted in annoyance and threw a fireball. Immediately afterwards, the bottom of Brightman's ship exploded and the ship cleanly flipped over. However, there was a problem. The tooth saw was charging at us. In its path were the people that fell overboard from Brightman's ship. Mike, hurry. That guy's timing is impeccable. La 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 you don't like my singing? I don't want to hear it. How rude. The owner the voice responded to me for the first time. Waya also made her move. Using levitation, she floated up into the air. Then, she stretched her arms towards the tooth saw and shouted. Two rays of white flames shot out from each of her hand, spiraling together and forming a thick white line. The next moment, the tooth saw's eye exploded. As my thunder arrow had already destroyed its other eye, the tooth saw lost its vision. As a result, it was now acting more violently. Kwong. Ak, shut up. Because of you, I can't sing. Weren't you guys friends? Kook, no, I can't listen to her. She might charm me again. I tried to ignore her to the best of my ability and shouted at Mike. Mike, hurry up. They're in danger. I know, I'm hurrying. Ait. Paul jumped into the lake. It seemed he was going to go save them in person. It was a good idea. I threw another thunder spear at the tooth saw, then jumped in after Paul. Die, die, die. Waya shot out white flames repeatedly. As an SS ranker, each of her attacks dealt critical blows to the tooth saw. Although some of them missed their mark, every time the attack hit the tooth saw, it writhed in pain and swung its saw violently. Seeing its blood spread through the lake water, I felt a sense of foreboding. Immediately afterward, Paul, who was on his way back with people in his embrace, looked in the water and shouted. Damn it, T. Tooth saws are flocking toward us. I was just thinking that might happen. Hurry, Paul. Go up first and protect the others. With two foreign S rankers in his embrace, Paul jumped onto the ship. 
I also saved the two S rankers that came to help Britain and threw them onto the ship. Although Paul signaled me to come up, I shook my head. Come up. What about the others? If we leave them, they'll die. If they're going to be killed, they'll be the one to do it, not some monsters like them. But it's dangerous down there. I ignored Paul and asked Pika. Pika, can you see the weakest person among the people floating there? Yeah. Can you make your lightning not work on that person only? If it's just one person, I can do it. Good, then we're going with max output now. I took in a deep breath, and gave all my mana to Pika. I deactivated spirit aura without anyone noticing. Although it wasn't as strong as when Pika was materialized, Pika could still make full use of her power. Floating up in the air, Pika opened her folding fan. Her golden eyes flashed. Thunder wave. In an instant, the surface of the lake was dyed golden. Kayak. The large tooth saw screamed, then became paralyzed. At the same time, the violent waves stopped. Using this opportunity, Waya raised her hands and shot out an especially large fireball, and the tooth saw exploded without leaving behind a trace. Although it had lost its two eyes, it still should have had ample health. Even so, Waya's fireball had obliterated it so cleanly. It was slightly terrifying. Her firepower was indeed excellent, but her flaw was that it took a while for her to gather it. Then, two of the three people left floating on the lake, Brightman and Tommy, trembled. I believe you guys can endure it. Though, I'd be fine even if they didn't. Finally, the tooth saws that were flocking from the smell of blood fainted from Pika's strengthened thunder wave and floated up to the surface. Just from a glance, there seemed to be more than two hundred of them. The people on the boat made awestruck exclamations. No way. Thunder night, amazing. I quickly swam. Although it would have been good if all the tooth saws were dead, my elemental magic wasn't that strong yet. If I couldn't save Brightman and the others while the tooth saws were unconscious, things would become more gory than what happened in the movie Jaws. I didn't want to see such a horror film, nor did I want to experience it. Most importantly, if they died, Britain would be troubled. I first grabbed Tommy and the A-rank healer, and threw them onto the ship. Then, I heard the voice again. Kayak. It hurts, you're so mean. All I did was sing, and you bully me like this. She was hurt by Thunder Wave, too. So she was hiding inside the lake. She was the reason I was in this mess, so what was she going on about? When I looked around the lake in the middle of rescuing Brightman, her voice rang out again. In going back. Hero is a meanie. Other kids are going to come kill you. Bay. Other kids will come kill me. I instinctively retorted, as a word I couldn't ignore was mixed in her statement. That's right. Because we've been told to kill the hero. I didn't know where or how she was talking to me, but her voice reached my ears clearly. In any case, she was told to kill me. By whom? Why? Plus, how did she know I was the hero? Just what is a hero anyways? Hearing the word I hadn't expected to hear, I froze for a moment. I felt bad because you were getting bullied, so I was going to play with you, but you electrocuted me. Bay, Bay. I don't care if you die now. W8, talk to me. Where are you? I'm not coming out. If you're going to apologize, you better bring me some apple pie. With that, I no longer heard her voice. Damn it, don't just disappear after saying that. Where am I even going to get an apple pie? I was dumbfounded. She didn't even reveal herself, and disappeared after saying what she had to say. However, my party members on the ship were staring at me like I was acting strange. What are you talking about? Apple pie. You guys, did you not hear what the owner of the singing voice said? Hmm. We didn't hear anything other than the lalas. Then she only transmitted her voice to me. There was just too much to wrap my head around. Before my brain overloaded, I hit my head. Right now, I had to use my body, not my head. I had to save Brightman, even though I didn't want to even touch or see him. Before he became a corpse in graveyard over the lake. I'm sorry that you have to do this. 
You should be. Couldn't those magicians levitate other people with their magic? Even as I bluntly answered Waya, I swam toward Brightman. Then, I held him in my hands. It was then that he opened his eyes. Then, he punched my face. As I did not expect him to open his eyes, much less punch me in the face, I did not resist his punch in the slightest. Plus, it hurt. Although I was used to pain from all those years I spent as a dungeon explorer, the pain I felt now ranked among the highest. Just from a single punch, my body rose up from the water and flew dozens of meters back. Kayak. Brightman, what are you doing? No, damn it. Waya was shocked and Mike cursed. Hmm. Why Mike? In the middle of flying, I turned my head. As it had been a while since I experienced being unable to control my body, I actually enjoyed the refreshing feeling. Brightman, I won't kill you gracefully, you son of a bitch. When I turned my head thinking such idle thoughts, I surprisingly saw a melting tuna. It was an extremely large melting tuna. It was even bigger than the giant tooth saw from before. Not to mention, this one's body was entirely red. It seemed at least three times as strong and fast as the giant tooth saw. Continuing to hide my strength seemed dangerous. The moment I tried to summon Ryue, the melting tuna opened its mouth. Without a chance to do anything, the melting tuna swallowed me whole. 